Prologue I woke up at 5 a.m. on a Saturday morning, drenched in cold sweat, I don't even remember the dream I had. All I know is that it went south real quick and that I woke up right as it did. Knowing that I couldn't get back to sleep I dragged myself out of bed and headed for the shower. I just stood there for a few minutes letting the warm water cascade over me in an effort to gather some energy before I got on with all that I had planned for the day. As I grabbed my morning cup of coffee I sat down at the table and started to look through all the letters that came in yesterday, and oddly enough not a single one was bearing any bad news. While this may sound weird to some that looking through letters for bad news and not finding any being a surprise, let me explain. Ever since I can remember every night I had a nightmare there was something that day that went really bad or was supposed to go really bad for me. I somewhat started putting it together in middle school, seeing as after every bad dream there was a surprise test that I was not prepared for. That's not to say that I had a bad dream before every surprise test it was just those that I had not studied for. By third grade I learned to trust my gut a bit and sometimes took sick days after bad dreams and lo and behold I was missing out on some surprise tests. When I told my parents, bragging about my so-called powers, sue me I was eight, all they told me was that it was a coincidence and I mostly agreed with them and tried not to put too much faith in it. I still did last minute cramming and had cheat sheets after every dream because why tempt fate? but it was all superstitious and not something I took seriously. That is until the day in my senior year of high school when I had the worst one yet. I woke up with a headache and it just wouldn't go away. The weird thing was that it happened on a Sunday and I thought I had nothing to worry about. That was true until I heard the doorbell at 7 p.m. and opened the door to two police officers that informed me my parents were in a car crash with a drunk driver and they didn't make it. They had been in a crash with the son of some important politician in the local community who managed to pull some string to get him off with just probation. As I ransacked the letters and found nothing in there I relaxed a bit, at least I wasn't getting evicted, so instead I went to my PC and started looking through emails. Maybe there was a clue in there about how my day could take a turn for the worse. And there it was an email from my boss telling me that they no longer needed my services and that I was being let go. The jewelry store I had worked at for the past four years just fired me out of the blue. Well I say that, but I suspect it had something to do with an argument I heard last week between the boss and his wife. Now it wasn't an all-out yelling match and I only picked up a few words outside the room, but it was enough for me to figure out what had happened with today's email. She had come to ask her husband to do a favor for her sister. I picked up something about a nephew needing a job from her side and something about a lazy good for nothing from him, but I guess nepotism still wins out in the end. After I learned just how unfair the world was I started to just focus on becoming someone who couldn't be just swept under the rug, I focused a lot on my studies and got into a college to study architecture with a partial scholarship and used all my free time studying or playing video games. They were the only outlet where I could enjoyably interact with strangers without spending the first few hours being an awkward introvert. It was also what I had planned on doing for the rest of the day to blow off some steam. I was pretty upset about losing the job, but I was two months away from finishing college and having to look for a better job anyway, so I was mostly just upset at why I got fired more than the fact that I got canned. After a full day of bad luck playing online I decided it would be fine to just go out to a bar and handle my anger by jumping in the bottle, since I was free tomorrow anyway. I was tripping my way back home, after running out of cash drinking cheap vodka at the bar, when all of a sudden an angry voice started yelling at me. Give me all the cash you got. I felt a strong grip drag me into an alley, and I felt the barrel of a gun pressed to my head. With a small chuckle, my inebriated self decided that the best response was thanks for helping me look, the barkeep told me I was out. Clearly that was not the answer, the mugger was looking for as next thing I know I feel a fist hitting me in the jaw. The mugger then grabs a hold of my wrist and tries to wrench the watch off. Drunk as I am, I lose my balance and go tumbling over. I fall right on top of him and the next thing I know I hear a bang. As I am floating in that darkness I see my whole life flash before me over and over again. It was then that I realized that the poor needed to work hard from the very beginning if they were to ever have a chance at making something of themselves. 
My early happy years with my family were the only memories I did not regret though looking back I was disappointed in myself. I had been so carefree back, then doing nothing but messing around playing video games. The only productive part of my whole childhood had been learning to speak and write Chinese, and even that I had done just to placate my mom, who insisted I learn a second language, so I picked the first one I could find that nobody around me would understand. After the accident as I decided to get my life on track, I had barely a few months in which, through a lot of hard work, I managed to get my partial scholarship. This led me to neglecting everything else like my diet and exercise that then lead me to gaining weight and having a poor social life through my college years, with barely a few one-night stands in the parties after end-of-term exams, comprising my social life as the job working to pay the rest of my tuition and housing drained me of all my energy, to finally getting killed in the back of an alley one night. I had lost track of how many times I went through the loop while I was floating in the void when I heard the words. What do we have here? A mortal soul, traveling through the void, I wonder how you managed not to get pulled back into the river of rebirth. I could hand you over to be put where you belong, but I so despise contacting death, may as well let you there all on your own the normal way. As the last word ended I felt like I was spinning no longer knowing which way is up and then I lost whatever consciousness I had had in the void. Chapter 1 I woke up to being surrounded on all sides by what I thought were giants. As the bright light and loud sounds confused me, I felt myself being picked up and lowered into water, then being tightly wrapped up in something as I was passed from one giant to another. This one just held me to her chest and smiled at me. I had tried moving, but found I had no strength being wrapped up as I was. I had tried talking, but only weird cries came out from my mouth. Through it all the woman holding me was heaving in deep breaths, but seemed happy. As I continued to struggle and shriek I felt myself getting more and more sleepy until I just blacked out. It had taken me two weeks of doubting my own sanity to come to two conclusions, one that I had been reborn, and let me tell you this is the one I think has a lower chance of being what happened, and the other that the shot I took to the head had not killed me but left me mentally insane. But I decided that since there was nothing I could do about the second choice I might as well go with the first and treat this as me actually being reborn. The first thing I realized about being reborn is that all the stories you read about it happening put one hell of a good spin on being a baby. Being unable to move on your own, lift your own head or control your bowels is something I was happy about not remembering my first time around going through all this. All the previous knowledge and understanding I had did not help me with the instinctual need for food or suppressing the instinct to ask for that food by straining my vocal cords to the limit. The only issues with my methods being that they were identical to the ones for asking to get changed from sitting in my own filth. Luckily enough my mother seemed pretty adept at telling the difference between the two quickly and has always handled it efficiently. It has been around a month now since my birth and I was starting to get an understanding of the consistency of my new family. In this world I was not an only child, far from it in fact as it seemed that besides my parents I also had an older brother who looked to be about fourteen, and an older sister aged about seven. Without understanding the language, however, everything I heard seemed to go in one ear and out the other, the best I could figure out my brother's name was Tom and my sister's Judy. As for my parents from the similar forms of address I was guessing they were calling my parents different words for mom and dad and hadn't been yet able to figure out their names. Having to take twelve naps a day as well as everyone always baby speaking to me made it hard to try and pick up the language but I figured out mom and dad in another day and had wanted to try to surprise them by speaking. My plans all went out the window however when I figured out that for that my vocal cords were working and I could scream for all I was worth. My new body's tongue and lips didn't have the muscle memory in order to create the sounds I wanted. That night as I was trying to figure out how to speak everything changed. I was staring blankly in concentration at the wall of my crib when in front of my eyes a block of text appeared. Status Name, Ajax Level 1 Experience, 0 out of 100 Traits, Child, Divine Witness Health, 20 twentieths. Mana, 70 seventieths. Stamina, 5 out of 10. Vitality, 2. Strength, 1. Endurance, 1. Dexterity, 1. Intellect, 25. Wisdom, 16. Mind, 7. 
perception, 4, stat points, 0, skills. Nothing made sense, it wasn't that I didn't know what this was, I had read enough stories that I had tried in those first two weeks for more hours than I'm comfortable admitting to try to bring up something like this, but nothing worked yet, now it pops up out of nowhere for no discernible reason in the middle of the night. The fright sends my infant instincts into overdrive and I start bawling my eyes out. It takes seconds for my mother to come into the room, disheveled as if she had just woken up, and check if I am hungry or in need of changing. When she reasons that I am not in need of food or a new cloth diaper, she starts to worry. I next see my dad coming into the room sleepily rubbing his eyes as he listens to the worried torrent of words coming from my mother only to say a soft calm reply. As soon as he finished his words, my mom get a look of realization on her face after which she calms down and puts sways me to sleep. Naturally, I try to resist. After she successfully calmed me down, I try to figure out what happened and what is the status. Unfortunately, my past few hours of learning to speak combined with the drowsiness from calming down from a tantrum lets her gently put me to sleep without me figuring anything else out. Sylvia POV The sound of Ajax crying woke me up, looking out the window lets me see it must be the middle of the night, and I slowly get out of bed and walk over to the baby room next door. Thomas and Judy are managing to sleep on the other side of the house, so I hurry to quiet him down, before he wakes them up. I reach in the crib and lift him up to check if he needs to be changed, but that doesn't seem to be the issue. Afterwards, I try to feed him, but it seems that he isn't hungry either. It's at this point that I start to get worried. Yes, babies are known to cry for no reasons, but this is the first time Ajax has done so. I don't know what's happened. He's not hungry, and he's clean, he just won't stop crying. I worriedly tell Sam as I see him enter the room. He looks at me with tired eyes and seems to think for a moment, then calmly responds. It's the first day of summer, his status must have just unlocked, and it scared him. Hearing the logical reason I realize that yes it does make sense. Being awake at all hours to feed the baby, I had lost track of days and didn't notice that today was the first day of summer. I instantly relaxed and started to calm Ajax down, then put him to sleep. Chapter 2 I wake up to a few rays of sun getting through the window and try to twist my head to get the light out of my eyes when I remember the scene last night and I'm instantly awake. I tentatively try to pull up my status and sure enough, the same thing as last night appears. Status Name, Ajax Level 1 Experience, 0 out of 100. Traits, Child, Divine Witness. Health, 20 twentieths. Mana, 70 seventieths. Stamina, 10 out of 10. Vitality, 2, Strength, 1, Endurance, 1, Dexterity, 1, Intellect, 25. Wisdom, 16. Mind, 7, Perception, 4, Stat Points, 0, Skills as well as something I didn't see last night. In the small bottom left of my vision is a small blinking dot. I focus on it to see what it may mean and am presented with a message. Trait warning of misfortune found, trait FX future sight. Future sight is not the domain of mortals, trait forcibly removed. Removed trait has left a hole, survival without a trait is impossible. New trait granted by it hashtag dollar percent carrot. Trait Divine Witness Gained I try to think close and the message disappears. I also try bringing it up again and find I can't do it. This leads me to the decision that all actions on my status are permanent. Next I focus on the trait child and a new message is presented to me. Child Temporary Trait Status points cannot be allocated. Incremental increase of all stat points by 10 throughout the duration. Stat points do not affect aging. Gaining skills grants experience. Leveling skills grants experience. Crafting experience gain stopped. Killing experience gain stopped. Upon expiration or removal trait apprentice is gained for half the duration child has persisted. Time remaining, 150 cycles. Closing that, I focus on my other trait. Divine witness, permanent trait. Affinity with all skills greatly increased. Ease of leveling skills increased. 
Ease of forcibly gaining stat points slightly increased. Stat points gained per level increased by 2. Skill level limits increased by 50. This trait cannot be forcibly revealed. I then try to focus on health, but nothing happens. That seems to be the case for all of my other stats. They come with no explanation, not that I don't find them self explanatory. With that out of the way, I reread through my two traits and focus on one part that bothers me when compared to all the games I have ever played ease of forcibly gaining stat points slightly increased. I try to figure out what that could mean, and my status changes in front of my eyes. Status Name Ajax. Level 1. Experience 0 out of 100. Traits, Child, Divine Witness. Health, 20 twentieths. Mana, 70 seventieths. Stamina, 10 out of 10. Vitality, 2.00. Strength, 1.00. Endurance, 1.01. Dexterity, 1.00. Intellect, 25.00. Wisdom, 16.00. Mind, 7.00. Perception, 4.00. Stat points, 0. Skills. Ah, uh, I see, so increases in stat points don't count until they reach a full point, but their progress can be tracked, which leads me to my next question, what did I do to increase my endurance? The only thing that stands out to me is that my stamina went from May 10th to October 10th. So simply using and regenerating stamina increases my endurance, that doesn't seem all that bad. Reasoning that there is nothing else I can do I start struggling and flexing my legs and arms hoping that by doing so I will not only strengthen my muscles to the point that I can crawl so that I have some mobility but that I also use up some of my stamina. Sure enough 20 minutes later I am at one stamina and too tired to move any more. but my mind is still wide awake and alert. So I do the only thing that seems to make sense, try to focus on myself so that I can feel for my mana. After all of spending and regaining stamina gains endurance, similarly spending and regenerating mana must increase a stat as well. Two hours later, I finally feel a strange energy inside of myself and am jilted out of my concentration. Pulling out my stats now gives me something different. Status Name, Ajax Level, 2 Experience, 50-200. Traits, Child, Divine Witness. Health, 20 twentieths. Mana, 70 seventieths. Stamina, 2 out of 10. Vitality, 2.00. Strength, 1.00. Endurance, 1.01. Dexterity, 1.00. Intellect, 25.00. Wisdom, 16.00. Mind, 7.00. Perception, 4.00. Stat points, 22. Skills, Meditation LVL2, Sense Mana LVL1. The thing I notice is that I no longer need to focus to sense the mana inside of me. I then try using the mana for something, but that is where I get stumped. It goes to reason that, for something to regenerate it must be used up first, but other than feeling my mana, I don't seem to be able to do anything with it. It takes 5 minutes of exertion, to finally get my mana to release from me, and am prompted that I have now gained the skill, Mana Expulsion LVL1. Sadly, my focus on releasing mana also helped me release something else. Fuck it, if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. So with my victory of having learned how to sense and reduce my mana being left with only 10 seventieths I give the house the morning wake up cry that I have soiled myself again, all the while thinking that after all my hard work I could go for a meal. Chapter 3 It has been 7 cycles since I gained my status, at least according to my child trait and I have found out that each cycle has 36 days. In this time life seems to have gone on all around me. My mastery of the local language has been increasing and I have learned that my parents are called Sam and Sylvia, that my older brother is very interested in me for some reason while my sister seems to just be following him around all day. My mother seems to be a seamstress and my father a blacksmith, but on to more important news it was just yesterday that I had found enough power to crawl. It has been a worthwhile achievement and I am looking forward to exploring my new home. 
Being satisfied with myself, I pull up my status screen to see my improvement. Name, Ajax. Level, 5. Experience, 150 out of 800. Traits, Child, Divine Witness. Health, 20 twentieths. Mana, 15 out of 80. Stamina, 5 out of 30. Vitality, 2.53. Strength, 2.08. Endurance, 3.02. Dexterity, 1.79. Intellect, 26.03. Wisdom, 18.07. Mind, 8.76. Perception, 4.50. Stat points, 88. Skills, Meditation LVL9, Sense Mana LVL7, Expel Mana LVL6, Mathematics LVL3. Of all that I have figured out in these months is that first of all stats get harder to increase as points go up, edurance having increased to 3 from constant workout, but mind only to 8.76, despite working for longer. That vitality is extremely hard to level and that the points from my child trait seem to be gradually given through a drip feed having given half a point in all my stats in about half 7 and a half cycles out of 150. Other news I have found out is that this world also has days of 24 hours, so there is a small victory in that and that their seasons also last three months or cycles as they are called here. Besides the longer months though the big difference comes from this world having five seasons, besides the usual of spring, summer, fall and winter, they also seem to have the season, called and dollar hashtag percent asterisk. It is not a word I have learned yet, but it does seem to be a word also used for something else as I have heard it in another context. One of the things I did figure out is that this world named its seasons after its gods, and that each season is named after the god that is said to be empowered at that time. Which makes sense seeing as I was born in spring, and he is also the god that gave me my other trait. Meaning that the scrambled letters in my other trait mean spring, the language looks so weird written down that I dread having to learn how to write it. But if I learned anything in my last life, it's that putting in the work early and not taking shortcuts is the way to the top. So my foreseeable future seems to be crawling and exercising my muscles learning the language and spending my mana. It has now been 32 cycles since my rebirth and a lot has changed. I can fully understand the language and am capable of speaking, though I refrain from making any really intelligent sentences and am trying to seem like the usual three-year-old or I guess two-year-old as in this world the years are longer. That's going to take some getting used to though at least now it makes sense why the child trait disappears at 150 cycles, it's when I would be 10 years old. Tom is approaching that age himself and will be 10 as the next cycle hits. That's another weird thing about this world as the trait changes only happen on the first day of every season everyone's age and birthday is counted on only on that day, meaning there are only 5 days a year where anyone's birthday is celebrated. That's not to say that the population birthdays are equally split among the five dates. Based on my experiences in these past years, I seem to be in a medieval world somewhere around the year 1000, but then again I was getting an engineering degree, not a history one, so I could be off by quite a bit. Suffice it to say that there is not much technology around here. The fifth season that is between fall and winter is death. Yeah surprised me too, but I found out pretty quickly as to why that is. See here winters are only slightly colder than fall, just enough to turn the rainy fall season into the snowy winter season. During death, however, the temperature drops drastically and winds are constantly howling, though there is no precipitation, thank gods, it would be hail. So what are people to do for entertainment for three months mostly spent inside to hide away from the cold? Given what I've overheard trying to meditate and expel mana at night, my parents are trying really hard to get me a younger sibling to add to the two older ones I already have. My stat increases have been getting better, and despite my brother's attempts to keep me confined to his care I have made some progress exploring the house this let me find out that my father seems to be a blacksmith and that my mother seems to be a merchant and housewife on the side. He creates while she sells and takes care of everything else. After almost 33 cycles of training my skills and stats have improved considerably. Name, Ajax. Level, 7. Experience, 1650-2100. Traits, Child, Divine Witness. 
health, 40 fortieths. Mana, 75 slash 150. Stamina, 53 slash 100. Vitality, 4.09. Strength, 7.53. Endurance, 10.60. Dexterity, 7.14. Intellect, 29.35. Wisdom, 21.63. Mind, 15.54. Perception, 6.24. Stat points, 132. Skills, Meditation LVL 24, Sense Mana LVL 22, Expel Mana LVL 21, Mathematics LVL 15, Stealth LVL 5, Drawing LVL 8, Athleticism LVL 2. The difficulty of gaining stats forcibly seems to be getting harder doing the same things over and over. But at least with my newfound mobility I was able to finally gain some extra points in perception, though gaining them by having my nose assaulted when I found the outhouse is not my most pleasant memory. Increasing my vitality seems to be an exercise in futility as my only increase outside of the child trait is 0.09, so I am guessing I'll have to ask my parents about that once I grow a bit older and it would be acceptable for my age to ask questions about stats and skills. What I am looking forward to next is my brother's 10th birthday coming tomorrow, as I will be there to see what happens when the child trait becomes apprentice. For all my complaining about him and the fact that I developed the stealth skill so I can escape him and explore something outside my room I am finding myself thinking of these people as my family more and more as time passes, and I am not sure if those are my genuine feelings on the matter or if I my thinking is affected by my child body. Chapter 4 I woke up early as I usually do and spent the next few minutes emptying out my mana pool before going doing the same to half my stamina and then continuing to make progress on my next big challenge, walking. It's far too often that I find just how many things I had taken for granted in my past life at the age of 24, but not having the muscle memory to walk makes learning to walk similar to walking drunk out of your mind without the added inebriation stopping you from noticing you just about kiss the floor every few steps. My frustrating exercises come to a close as my mother comes to get me ready telling me that my brother has left home and that we, and by we I mean her while I am put somewhere in her line of sight, can begin preparing for the party we are having for him tonight. As I am sat at the table working on my drawing as I found that to be the best way to get my dexterity to increase and regain a few of my skills in design, I start to smell the food cooking not five feet from me, and it smells better than anything else I have had in the past three years. What's that? I ask trying as hard as I can to be cute in the hopes that she will answer me in detail instead of the bland answer, just food. It smells so good. That is meat from a monster that was LVL 20 according to the merchant I bought it from. My mother answers like it's nothing. Am I a monster? I ask freaking out on the inside that there are monsters in this world forgetting entirely that a polar bear would have been a monster to people during the Middle Ages. Yes silly, unlike humans all animals that level past level 19 gain access to mana and start to form a mana core inside them. That mana circulating their body makes them stronger and in most cases taste much better and be more nutritious. My sister actually answers me, with a tone of voice that makes it clear that she had asked the same question before mother got me from my room and probably many others, and is now making it seem like she is the sage of all knowledge. This information takes over my mind as I start thinking about all sorts of high-level creatures and how they could evolve like that. With the information of my past life as well as the bounty of fiction I have read in my teens about fantasy stories I start to wonder about what their existence could mean for this world. Are humans not the dominant species on this planet? Does killing them grant a lot of experience? Can they be tamed or are they always aggressive? Can they learn skills just like we can? Wow. That looks really good, Judy exclaims as she is looking at the paper I am drawing on. Without realizing it as my mind was wondering about all the possibilities of monsters, the drawings which I had purposely made look like child scribbles before now had started to look a lot more like the designs I was doing for my architecture courses. It's not too much since it started only in the middle of the drawing, but enough to get my mother to look over and look at me surprised. Did you get the drawing skill? She kindly asks me. Trying to hide her excitement. 
drawing, but he's only two. I only got that skill last year, when I was six inch my sister sounds equally impressed and jealous. Why yes. I stutter knowing I might just have blown my cover, that combined with my new knowledge of the existence of monsters is praying that normal kids can gain skills early, and this doesn't mark me as a changeling or something to burst at the stake. Congratulations darling. You'll do well to level it up as much as you can before you're 15 after that it will stop giving you experience, my mother says, while not only calming me down about my sudden slip up and also making me wonder what she means only up until I turn 15. My wondering is cut short by my father entering the house and announcing he's on his way, is everything ready? Yes the stew only has a few more minutes until it is ready, did you finish his sword? Yeah, it's right here, I hope he'll like it. My brother entered the house, to find our family wishing him a happy birthday. He doesn't seem surprised at all, telling me that he knew what our parents were planning, but seems very happy regardless of it being a successful surprise or not. After all the well-wishing and idle conversation is over, as my mother is going to set the table, my father pulls Tom aside and starts questioning him. So did you make up your mind about what you wanted to do? Yeah, I talked with Vex, and he said I can tag along with them to get to Les Sis when he leaves. This was all news to me. Where was Les Sis, who is this Vex, and why is my brother leaving? As my mind is running 100 miles a minute, my dad's next question fills up a few of the holes I had. You're sure you want to be a guard? If you changed your mind about becoming a blacksmith, I can train you myself. Yes, dad, I'm sure. We both know I have been helping out and even with you trying to teach me in the past, I still don't have any skills for the hammer much less blacksmithing. He says like it was the 50th times they had the same conversation, which considering he was planning on leaving the village it probably was. You don't have to worry unless this is less than two weeks travel on a merchant caravan it's not like I'm planning on going to the capital to become a mage. A smirk forming upon his lips as he is looking at my sister, who was drawing closer to eavesdrop on the pair. A bit of a sore spot for her as we'd all been made well aware in the past year that while my sister finds magic to be the best thing there is, she has yet to gain any mana skills. Mother says that it's very rare only one in fifty people is blessed with mana and that is a skewed statistic as most of them are nobles, the chances of a villager having access to mana is more like one in five hundred. My sister seems upset at hearing that, but I figured that both my parents and my brother have been trying to gently let her down, as she only has three more years herself, before she has to make the choice of what path she wants to travel down. Chapter 5 After dinner, my mother picked me up and after clearing the table, and we at my dad's request we all sat down around the empty table. Now son I know you made your decision about what you want to do, and I respect that however, there is one thing that I feel that I must do before you become an apprentice. He says that because in this culture a person becomes an adult only when they no longer have either the child or the apprentice trait. This happens at 15 years old or around 22 to 23 years on earth. That might seem a bit old for a medieval structure that their technology shows, but considering that the message on my child trait suggests that after it is over my stats will also affect my aging it doesn't seem that bad. What I am about to do now is something you must never do unless you trust the people around you with your life. I am about to show you my status and try to explain to you my choices. That is all my father said before the block of text became visible about four inches in front of his face. Name, Sam. Level, 35. Experience, 4500-64000. Traits, Health, 2500-2500. Mana, 250-250. Stamina, 500-1200. Vitality, 250. Strength, 250. Endurance, 120. Dexterity, 180. Intellect, 25. Wisdom, 25. Mind, 25. Perception, 45. Stat points, 0. Skills, frowny face hammers LVL 60, blacksmithing LVL 49, precise blow LVL 32, axes LVL 30, mining LVL 25, running LVL 20, reading LVL 10, Heat Resistance LVL 10, Writing LVL 5. 
now I will advise you as my father advised me, despite the fact that you have no mana and that you will most likely never have mana regardless of how much above 11 you intellect wisdom and mind stats or you should probably push them up to 25, as that is where it is believed that the bonus to things like memory enhancement and quick thinking and other such limits are. It probably seems like a big investment now, and I am not saying that these are your first points to put in just that these are something you are looking to have by the time your apprentice trade ends, or a year after. Everything else I chose has been for the purpose of making me a better blacksmith, the strength and dexterity to work the metal as I wanted as well as enough endurance to last in the forge. That is when my mother took over. My stat points look a bit different. Name, Sylvia. Level, 30. Experience, 13200-48000. Traits, Merchant. Health, 3000-3000. Mana, 250-250. Stamina, 500-1200. Vitality, 300. Strength, 110. Endurance, 110. Dexterity, 110. Intellect, 25. Wisdom, 25. Mind, 25. Perception, 110. Stat points, 0. Skills, haggling LVL 40, mathematics LVL 30, cleaning LVL 28, cooking LVL 27, sewing LVL 20, reading LVL 20, writing LVL 19, lower price LVL 17, raise price LVL 16, good deal LVL 10, running LVL 10, drawing LVL 5, contracts LVL 3. As you can see without all the need for that much strength and dexterity, I mostly focused on my vitality and raised my perception a bit more. As a merchant and someone who grew up in the city, not to mention the work around the house, I picked up a few more skills than your father, however mine are not as connected nor are they as high level. Mother, what does the merchant trait do? My sister asked, seeming very confused that an adult would have a trait. The merchant trait is one that increases my skill level up speed slightly in all merchant skills and also increases the LVL cap on the skills from 100 to 120. If you have a trait then how come we don't? My brother asked, himself seeming surprised at my mother having a trait. That's because for the most part traits are not hereditary, my dad told him. Most part? I asked, forgetting for a second that this was all supposed to go over my head. They seemed to think I didn't understand the expression instead of questioning his statement. Yes there are traits that are not hereditary, and while traits in and of themselves are rather uncommon there are some traits that can be guaranteed or even earned. For example, the knight trait can be earned by anyone who is knighted and increases the limit of all combat weapons skills by 10, whereas the noble baron duke archduke and royal all increase the limit of all skills by 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 they are however titles that can be lost with the position they represent. My father said, smiling kindly at me. That's not to say they are exclusive. While a person can only have one permanent at a time traits can evolve and evolve to accommodate this. For example, should I become a baroness tomorrow, my trait will evolve to baron merchant and it will give me a slight increase leveling up merchant skills as well as a 20 increase to the limit of all merchant skills and 10 to the others. So the limit of skills is really 160? My sister said, having lifted her hand up counting on her fingers. No, apparently regardless of the trait nothing increases skill limit past 150, and that is known from a few rebellions where the new king had previously had a trait, the limit is still 150, but they do keep their slight increase to leveling ease. The limit of non-nobility traits is also an increase of 50, the difference is that they don't come with an increase to the speed of getting skill levels, and that the higher the increase is the more specific it is. For example, a hammer expert would get 10 to all hammer-related skills, a blacksmith would gain 20 to blacksmithing, and military smith would gain 30 to all weapons and armor smithing skills, while an armor or weaponsmith would gain 40. What about the natural 50? Those are extremely rare and too specialized to be as useful, it would be something like a swordsmith, 
The downside is that while a swordsmith may get blacksmithing to 150 with enough hard work, the skill would also get warped by how he leveled it all the way up and be capped at 100 for anything other than swordsmithing. My mother said. That however is only true when it comes to working as a crafter, and even those can find success. It just takes a long time for their specialty to beat out older established crafters. Most such people get picked up by a noble family willing to invest in them so that they can get access to 150 skill crafter items. Most of the other specialists often find success, but they are always pulled into nobility either by marriage or a work contract, and it's not like there are many of them anyway. In our kingdom last, I heard there are only four openly known about and maybe three times again that many hidden away, so around fifteen in a kingdom's worth of people. My dad patiently explained to my curious sister. It was times like this that I was glad for her inquisitive nature that mirrored my own. So of course I then made the crucial mistake of yawning rather loudly. Mother got up to go and put me to sleep. Signaling that this was all the conversation I was going to be listening in on tonight, a rather upsetting juncture since I plan on working on skills as soon as possible, not in eight years. Chapter 6 The sun had barely started rising, a few rays making it through the window as I finished exhausting my stamina and mana. I crawled out of bed wanting to continue to practice my walking. I had no problem walking for a few weeks now, but still had the bad habit of tripping when I picked up the speed even a little and I tried to turn. I would love to practice outside, but apparently I wasn't old enough to spend time alone outside. I noticed something strange as I tripped for the third time that day when I caught sight of something being placed on the other side of the wardrobe. I found it odd as the wardrobe was making a small triangle with the corner of the room and it made no sense for something to be in that triangle as it would be hard to reach but not a great place to hide something as anyone searching for it would find it. A bit of stretching and crawling later, I pulled out a potted plant with a small, faded X scratched on the pot. I take my time examining it. After all common knowledge says that X marks the spot, and why would anyone put a plant somewhere where there was no light, especially one as green and as vibrant as this one, surely there must be something special about it. Thirty minutes later, and I was no closer to figuring out what was so special about this plant when my mother came in to wake me up. It was a bit earlier than usual, but today we were sending my brother off to become a guard. Morning Ajax, how are you this morning? Hey, when did you bring in a pot from the garden? I know they aren't that rare, but those medicinal plants still sell quite well in this region as they are hard to grow without a lot of care. Taking up the pot in one hand and me in the other, she takes me into the kitchen and sets me down at the table with the flower pot by side. My dad and brother were both going through his pack, making sure he had everything he needed as my sister was setting the table. She looked especially pleased with herself for helping mother prepare breakfast today. And to be honest, she was starting to get the hang of it. I hadn't found any shells in my eggs the last two times. Sylvia. I thought we agreed we weren't bringing any more plants in the house, I know it's a bit cold for some of the species, but you can't me that looks like a plant that needs specific care. My dad complained, but an analysis of my memories tells me that what really bothered him was the plants she had tried to get him to keep in the forge as it was usually a lot hotter there. They had that argument when mom pretty much started an indoor garden and a compromise was reached. I didn't bring this one Ajax did. He was playing with it in his room this morning, she said indignantly, clearly a little upset about the accusation. I couldn't really fault them for arguing, both were really stressed with Tom leaving to be a guard so they were both a little on edge. I'll take it back, I was supposed to watch him anyway, my brother quickly said, taking the plant outside and returning a few seconds later. The rest of the morning continued with both parents fussing over every little thing, Evidently in this world being ten years of age is the equivalent of college. The children usually take their first step out of basic education on their chosen career path. Some of them still live at home others move to live with their teachers in the shop where they'll learn, but for the most part they stayed in the same place where they lived before a few minutes away from their parents. My brother was doing the equivalent of a full-time study abroad program by leaving to become a guard in the city. All right, now dad please listen. I know you didn't accept Johnny as an apprentice hoping I'll change my mind, and you'll most likely accept him now so I want to make sure that this practice sword you made for me three years ago is for Ajax, 
With how much energy he has he will probably start using it as soon as his hands can grip the handle. It served well as my first sword. It would be great for him too, he said, taking one final swing with it before sheathing it, giving it to my dad and attaching his new one to the belt. I will need to pay close attention to where dad puts that blade, because I saw a sword skill in my future. I was almost midday by the time the merchant caravan was ready to depart, with my mother trying her hardest to embarrass my brother by being as reluctant to let him out of a hug as the squirrel from Ice Age to let go of the nut, I finally saw him get up on the cart and look back with what I think was a bit of uneasiness and trepidation, before that changed back to his usual self-assured grin mixed with excitement. I was honestly more upset than I thought I would be, but I guess I was underestimating how much I have come to care for my brother. Not to mention that with all the fuss this morning was the first time I learned why they were so reluctant to let him leave to become a guard. Apparently guard is a very special position as you are employed by the kingdom, it doesn't work as usual apprenticeships do. Here you negotiate up front for the whole position, since they always have something to do even for the most useless guards, you negotiate your salary and employment for the next 10 years, at least as an entry-level position. You basically have no option to quit and desertion is not looked well upon, with punishments for doing so ranging from a heavy fine with one year of service left to execution at anything over four years still left. The upside, on the job training from high-skilled people, every day for the first year and as often as you want to attend after that from high-skilled people lets you put as much work in your skills as you want as long as you do your assignments. A full wage starting while in training, something unheard of from any other type of apprentice, even if it starts to fall behind what crafters can do when they have 9 or 10 years of experience. It also comes with free meals and shelter in the barracks as well as a full set of equipment every 4 years, the last of which you can keep even if you choose to leave. Once you complete your first 10 years you can negotiate for further employment, your new contract being highly dependent on your performance for the last 10 years. Tom, POV. I took one last swing with my sword before I sheathed it, hearing that satisfying schnick and then gave it to my father, before I tied my gift to my belt, knowing this sword was probably much better than anything they would give us as part of the standard set as a guard. Not to mention that with me having a sword I can choose an axe or a hammer or a spear besides the shield meaning I can get the instructors to teach me how to use a shield and sword as well as a shield and something else and dual wield offensive weapons. After all there were always a few instructors at each barracks surely I could find one that I can get along with and that would train me. Dad assures me that he will not sell my old blade and will keep it for my brother by putting it back in the house. As he is doing that I see Ajax's eyes follow the sword. He has that same look in his eyes as he does every time before I lose track of him and spend the next ten minutes looking for him. But I let it go, and together we head for the caravan. After a long goodbye, I climb in the caravan full of smirking faces, knowing that for at least the next few days I will be the entertainment, thanks to my mother, but I can't hold it against her. I take one last look out towards the village and wonder if I made the right choice, before going back to this strange feeling I had all morning, well that's not right, not all morning it started right after I took the flower pot back into the garden. I still wonder how Ajax managed to sneak past me after all I don't remember losing track of him once outside the house, not to mention he picked the one plant three times the size of any of the rest of them. That's when it hit me, I knew that plant. I knew it because about two years ago, I hid it behind the wardrobe in Ajax's room in an attempt to keep my sister occupied when Ajax was being born. I hid things all around the house and must have forgotten about that one and all the excitement with him being brought home. That X I put on the pot had been staring me right in the face. But how did that plant manage to survive? I know those plants are tough being able to survive two cycles without water or sunlight, but they still need a lot of nutrients to grow while doing so. And I had placed that there years ago, growing that big, with nobody taking care of it made no sense. Not only that, but it looked a lot more vibrant than any of the plants mom had sold in the previous years. Chapter 7 It has been almost three years since I said goodbye to my brother, and I find myself in the garden tending to my little pet project. It all started with the silly superstition that X marks the spot, and I was convinced that there had to be a treasure there. Don't judge me, 
If there is one thing that I figured out throughout all this time being reincarnated is that while my thought process may take advantage of my previous knowledge my body does not, meaning that my emotional reaction was the same as any other child, meaning I was absolutely overexcited and convinced I was right. Surprise surprise I was wrong. I can't say it threw me through a loop because the revelation that the ex was something that my brother did to keep my five-year-old sister occupied while I was being born makes sense. What doesn't is the fact that said not only survived but also thrived. I regret to say that it took me four cycles to figure out a reason that had anything to back it up, but in my defense my proof was outside and I wasn't really allowed to spend that much time outside until I turned three. My discovery was the vibrant plant life around my window that lost more and more of its shine as it went further and further away. Seeing as they were all the same plants, and that the wind always beat into my window instead of away from it, and that the sun rose from the side meant all the plants were given the same amount of water and sun. Only thing that made sense to me was mana. The further away from the house they were the more diluted the mana I released into the air was, which did make sense seeing as how the plant in the room basically lived off of my mana alone. My new project was a garden, an idea I barely managed to sell to my mom and its difficulty should not be underestimated as I got a merchant skill just for being able to convince her. Apparently kids should be out playing until they approach the age of 10 with no worries at all in this world. As much as I would like to say that it was my past experiences that led me to make the choice to keep true to my initial plan of raising my stats and skills as my main focus even through the heavy temptations of slacking, it's not really true. I took pretty much every chance I found to do play around, thing is in a medieval society and stuck in a young body, there pretty much was nothing else for me to do, even the activities kids my age did take part in I found myself trying to use to improve either my stats or my skills, the things that distracted were my sister and her friends. While kids in this world were pretty much layabouts that all changed as being 10 approached, seeing it was like making the change from early middle school to college. They were forced to adapt quickly if they were to survive in life. That mixed with the fact that my only non-running and athleticism skills I could level up were drawing, reading, writing, and any other household skills I found myself spending a lot of time with them trying to improve myself, beside mana of course, but I still didn't feel comfortable showing that to anyone yet. Gardening was the latest in that list of skills that I found myself practicing. The only difference was after I was basically given a tutorial on how to do it. I started experimenting with releasing my mana right on top of my little spot of the garden three to four times a day in my early years and one to two times as of late. One thing I can say is that I was having results, these plants were growing two to three times faster than any other that were planted, I can't yet tell if it's because the solid I planted them on has been infused with mana over the last three years or that they are being given mana as they grow. Maybe it was a mix of the two but I didn't really mind all that much as far as I was concerned this was a success. There was one big change that happened ever since my brother left for less sis, and that was that Johnny was now my dad's live-in apprentice, meaning I got moved into the same room as my sister and he took my old room. This made it so I got most of my mana practice during the day with little done at night, mostly an end-of-day meditation and quick release of all that I managed to meditate back. I did not like Johnny at all. In my opinion he was not really someone who was interested in smithing like my father and he mostly decided that smithing was the safest way to become someone important in the village, then used the fact that he was a friend of Tom's to get his apprenticeship. It wasn't so much that he wasn't willing to work, it was that he wasn't willing to try to push himself to improve his skills. Instead of taking the trial and error way of doing things over and over to get something right res melting it so it came out just right, he would always be begging to just have it spoon-fed to him the way to do it, despite being repeatedly warned that this would slow down his speed in leveling the skills and lower the amount of experience he got for each creation. Besides that he also hung out with Dirk, the headman's youngest son. They were the same age and where Johnny was lazy, Dirk thought the world owed him just because his dad was the village headman. It was a good day when I found out that the headman had an older son, he was grooming to become the headman after his passing. All this I learned from Alana, the headman's youngest child and only daughter. Despite being almost a year older than Jenny, they got along very well. They both bonded over the fact that they both had wanted to use mana yet neither had been gifted with it. 
although Jenny wanted to become a mage and Alana a healer. Sam POV. I was starting to get worried. Ajax seemed to be more interested in doing house chores instead of playing with kids his own age. While being able to do chores was good I couldn't help but think that this would not be good for him later on. After all, Jenny had grown up with Tom as an older brother and as a result had been a bit tomboyish, had it not been for the fact that she got along so well with Alana over their mutual misfortune of not having mana I was worried the girls would not have made any friends at all. But once Alana took the space left by Tom's departure, she seemed to mellow out a bit more. Tomorrow, I am going to start teaching Ajax some smithing. He needs to learn how to do something other than housework. Hopefully, he is different from Tom and might enjoy crafting. I told Sylvia as we were laying in bed. I won't say I am not worried by his habits, but are you sure it's not a bit too early to start with that he is not even six years old yet? She answered back in a worried tone yet her soft smile showed that she more or less agreed with my decision and was happy I chose blacksmithing over sword fighting like I did with Tom when he went through the same thing, albeit to a lesser extent using Sylvia as a role model which led to him going off to become a guard. I had learned from my mistakes I was going to start him off with something nice and safe and go from there, we might just make a smith of this one yet. This thinking about children's future lead me to thinking again about the issue the headman brought up at the last meeting, that our village healer Karen was starting to grow old and with so little work to do here she didn't have the strength to stay for longer than the next six years or so before she would head to the city where here talents could be better monetized. With no children with mana being born in the village training a new healer didn't seem to be in the cards, the last mana-born child had been invited by the local noble house to visit their home and got an apprenticeship that same trip. She came back home to pick up her family and off they went. Of course I understood why there had been a drastic increase in how far the nobles would go in order to recruit somebody with magic, but I don't think we had yet felt the effect this would have on remote populations such as our little out-of-the-way village. But there was nothing I could do about that, I had better get some rest and focus on starting Ajax's training tomorrow. Chapter 8 Clang 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 I got used to hearing that sound over the last five cycles. Dad apparently decided that it was time for me to learn something outside of housekeeping and started me off with blacksmithing. I heard that my brother started with swordsmanship, but I guess he wanted to steer me more towards the crafting path rather than fighter one. Surprisingly there was a lot more to blacksmithing than I ever thought possible. It wasn't that I underestimated it since I did watch a lot of reality TV back on earth one of which was forged in fire so I knew a little of what to expect but blacksmithing back on earth and doing it in this village was a lot different. First of all here we were mostly dependent on mining our own ore and cutting down very specific trees to use for fuel to heat the metal smelting our own ingots and only then could we finally get to hammering our creations into shape. This was also the first time I found myself being bad at something I tried in this world, not in the fact that I didn't unlock the skills for it but simply because I didn't have the strength required. There was a reason that people who had jobs that required physical work only took apprentices only after they had moved past the child trait and were allowed to allocate their stat points. The upside of me being so much weaker and having the skill was that it made the difficulty of actually getting something done that much higher. One thing I understood in these years of messing with my skills is that the harder and more complex the actions taken the quicker they level up your skills. Other than that I also figured out that getting skills to level up got harder with every level and that you could pretty much only do the same thing over and over to level the skills for each 10 level window, meaning mundane repetitive daily skills got level from 1 to 10 relatively quickly, but without any innovation you weren't going to be seeing level 11 unless you put years more work in the same activity. Clang. 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 Just a little bit more. I was almost done with this. I was using my dad's detail hammer to get any work done as it was the only one I could swing, not that the nails I was making took much detail or care to create. As I finished the final nail I felt the skill level up again. Even with that not being something all that uncommon for me to level a skill I still felt myself grinning like I always did when my skills leveled up. So I pulled up my stat screen to see the progress I made. Name, Ajax. Level, 10. Experience, 
4150-10,000. Traits, Child, Divine Witness. Health, 70-70. Mana, 150-210. Stamina, 40-180. Vitality, 7.22. Strength, 15.36. Endurance, 18.9. Dexterity, 16.7. Intellect, 33.84. Wisdom, 25.02. Mind, 21.73. Perception, 14.14. Stat points, 198. Skills, Meditation LVL 32, Sense Mana LVL 31, Expel Mana LVL 31, Mathematics LVL 20, Stealth LVL 13, Drawing LVL 30, Athleticism LVL 31, Running LVL 20, Reading LVL 20, Writing LVL 20, Sprinting LVL 10, Cooking LVL 14, Sewing LVL 10, Cleaning LVL 10, Haggling LVL 2, Gardening LVL 19, Manipulate Mana LVL 6, Water Aspect Mana LVL 5, Fire Aspect Mana LVL 4, Air Aspect Mana LVL 6, Earth Aspect Mana LVL 4, Inject Mana LVL 3, Mana Farming LVL 2, Axes LVL 14, Hammers LVL 10, Mining LVL 5, Lumberjack LVL 5, Smelting LVL 3, Blacksmithing LVL 3. My stats looked like I expected them to. The increase in the difficulty of raising them was definitely non-linear as I barely got any increases outside of my child buff increases intellect and wisdom whereas perception basically doubled. Vitality was the odd one out. I hadn't yet managed to find a way to get that one to increase at all. I started with 2 got 5 out of my child trait all I could force was 0.22 and despite it not forcibly increasing I knew the later I got started at doing that the harder it would be. In terms of my mana, I guess it came down to experimentation, meditation, sense mana, and expel mana have barely leveled in the last year, whereas they got to 30 pretty quick. That's how I figured out repetitive easy activities using skills were definitely not the way to level them more than their share of the 10 levels. The clearest indicator for this being axes, I was using a pickaxe to mine and a normal axe to chop trees, letting this one level past 10 fairly easy, while hammers have been there for the past cycle and a half as I kept making nails. Playing around barely summoning a drink of water, helping soften the earth to dig, cooling myself down with a breeze and lighting a fire with my mana seems to have helped it with getting to 30, but my most recent breakthrough on that front was instead of just expelling the mana near my small patch of garden and hoping it sticks to my plants I could directly inject the mana into them. This came with various levels of success, injecting too much and you would kill the plant so it took some trial and error before I got the hang of it and as I did I got the mana farming skill. This year, the plants in my garden were looking better than the ones my mother was growing. The one thing that had me confused was the required experience for level 10. Had it followed the pattern so far, it should only have cost 8,900 instead of 10,000, so I was going to be keeping an eye on that to see what else could or would change, but maybe it was just a difficulty spike for making it past level 10. Dad the nails are finished I dutifully went to show them to him. I enjoyed blacksmithing and with how much my parents were pushing for me to go more towards the crafter route I most likely would be doing so. Despite this I still kept the amount of skills I had a secret. Not that it was hard since how many people would care about the training a five-year-old would do, and not like it showed in the quality of the nails I made that I had gotten the skills, not much you can go wrong with there. So I decided to push my luck a little bit and try to get some more information out of my dad about what the norm was in this world. So after my usual evening run, I started as we sat down for dinner, I went on a fact-finding mission. Mom I got a level today, I went about bragging, hoping this would open the way for me to ask things related, without seeming too obvious. As for why I asked after my usual run, well that was because everybody and their mother in this village had figured out I had a running skill. It wasn't that hard to put together considering the five-year-old doing laps around the village every day. Congratulations Ajax, my mom was ecstatic and my dad seemed proud if a little down, most likely about the fact that I got my level from running and not blacksmithing, yet he also heaped on the praise. 
Johnny was taking one of his days off and went to visit his parents, and Judy was visiting Alana, the two had gotten along even better after Judy got past her child trait, both had discovered at least a bit of an affinity for trading, so they were both taking lessons from mom on that front. This meant that it was only me with my parents tonight. What is the usual level for someone my age? My question seems to take the wind out of their sails. Most likely since this is the first time I had brought up leveling, and they probably thought I was level 3 at best and didn't want to upset me. While there is no real set level for kids at your age, as everyone discovers their skills when they get to try out the activity, but for the most part, after the child trait ends all kids are level 4. She said with a bit of trepidation, clearly not wanting to upset me or lie to me either. On average, kids are level 5 with the stronger ones being level 6, and the lucky ones who discovered their set of skills early being level 7. Nobels managed to get their kinds to level 8, and in extreme cases level 9, inch my dad said matter-of-factly as he went back to eating his food, thinking nothing more of my question. Oh of C course you shouldn't be discouraged by that, you are only 5 you have a lot of time to get your levels, he quickly followed it up after receiving a look colder than the Arctic from my mother but I was too preoccupied to listen to the rest of the conversation. I just found out that even the best of the best nobles didn't make it to my level in ten years, and I was only five. And as happy as this made me, it also made me very paranoid and more convinced of the fact that I should not go around revealing my level or skills to anyone. I didn't want to end up kidnapped or killed over that information. I even felt quite guilty as I got the skill deception for pumping my parents for information. Chapter 9. The plants were more growing better than I ever would have expected, and I was experimenting to find out if the input also played a part in how well mana farming would play out by having the same type of plant being infused with my mana to capacity, and it being watered by normal water, mana infused water, and mana conjured water. I had just finished watering the last plant when I see my sister enter the house. Well, I say see, but it's more exactly here. You won't believe it. She came screaming to mother from fifty feet out, getting some of our neighbors to look out their windows to see what all the racket was about. What is it? Mom says to her as I also enter the house to see what could possibly have my sister in such a good mood. What happened that made you come home running and screaming? Mom says clearly a bit annoyed at her. Me and Alana were checking out what old man Craster brought with him this time when I spotted an odd piece of ore. I asked him what it was, and he said he had no idea she rapid fire started in on the story, and it was a bit hard to understand every word as she was clearly very excited about it. I don't know why I was attracted to it, but I asked him how much he wanted for it, he wanted one silver, but I managed to talk him down to eight large copper coins. This conversation instantly told me that I had a massive gap I should look to get fixed as soon as possible. How does money work here and what are things worth? I can't believe I spent almost six years and even started considering a career as a crafter without once considering money. By the look on my mother's face, the news my sister brought didn't excite her as much telling me she was most likely scammed into buying some junk ore. You paid how much for a piece of ore, my mom said in that quiet calm voice of hers that promises the sky will fall on your head. It was barely more than a whisper, and yet I knew for sure I could have heard her on the other side of the house as a shiver traveled up my spine. I, I, it's not like that. My sister defended herself and stuck to her guns, despite being a bit intimidated. I cracked it open, and this is what was inside. She then pulled out two bright green gems the size of pebbles, and my mom's eye instantly shot open. Well, those are real emeralds, I'm sorry sweetheart, though just because it worked out this time doesn't mean that you should be trying to make such risky buys in the future, she said quickly reigning in her enthusiasm in order to finish her lecture on impulse buys to my sister. Yes mother, I know that, but that's not what has me this excited, I got the skill, opportunity sense, right after I finished buying the ore, her excitement going right back up to where it was when she entered the house, practically yelling there at the end. My mom went through a series of emotions in about half a second, from confusion to recognition to pride and then to what I could only guess was dread as she instantly moved to cover my sister's mouth with her hand. S-H-H-H-H-H-H. You can't be yelling about things like that, her voice is quiet and filled with fear. Darling, do you not remember what we talked about when you got your apprentice trait? 
I told you not to show or tell your skills to others unless you absolutely trust the with your life and here you are screaming you got a rare skill. Are you trying to get yourself taken away? Nobles are always looking for people with rare skills to get into their service, especially now, who else knows you got this skill? Nobody yet, Alana and I separated and when I got it I rushed home to tell you, she said while her face turned a little pale as she finally got a grasp on the situation at hand. But you should make sure it stays that way. As for you Ajax the fact that your sister has a rare skill does not lead this house, do you understand me? She said to me in a more serious tone than I ever heard her use. Yes mom, but is her skill something like having mana? I asked trying to get to understand how rare was having mana compared to the gift my sister had. That's hard to say, you see darling skills are split into different tiers. There are common skills, uncommon skills, rare, epic, legendary, and supposedly mythic skills. The ability to use mana comes in the form of mana sense and expel mana, both are very rare, but they are still uncommon skills, whereas your sister has a rare skill, she seemed to have calmed down a bit and pulled me over to the table and started giving me a lesson on skills. You see skill tier represent not only how hard they are to get but also how specific they are, she said, and stopped seeming to think how to explain this to me, well you father will tell you this a bit later anyway, and it's not like everyone doesn't know it already, so for example, let's use your father, he has the common skill hammers, and from it, he developed the uncommon skills blacksmithing and precise blow. You see all attainable skills are for the most part common and uncommon, with a few rumored rare ones, the rest of the skills come from the skills on a previous tier, becoming more specified. Sometimes a skill comes from the combination of more than one skill like having blacksmithing as well as sense mana, and expel mana would result in mana smithing which is a rare skill. The reason you sister should be careful is because she unlocked a rare skill so young it means she has a good chance to use it to gain an epic skill in her life and nobles want to grab as many user of epic skills as possible. Despite the fact that I have a low-leveled rare skill I it's not as important because of the fact that it took me long to barely unlock it. What about legendary and mythic skills? I am euphoric with all this new information I was getting. Legendary skills are kingdom treasures. Not even most of the best in their field in the kingdom are thought to possess one just the geniuses. As for mythic skills, they are stories of heroes from the past or tyrants that supposedly had them, and not a single person alive today has one, she said with a far-off look, most likely remembering those stories. You see, sweetie, all skills get harder to level as you get them higher, and every ten levels there is a big jump. However something else is used to determine what rank a skill is, if it was just how often it appears sense mana would be counted as a rare skill otherwise. You see common skills follow the 10 level difficulty jump increase and that's it, uncommon skills however have a test, not much is know about it since it is not openly shared, but it's said that every person has a different way of getting the skill to break through to level 75, rare skills are even more restrictive having tests at level 60 and level 100. Epic skills do so at level 50 and 75, people speculate that 100 as well, but nobody has confirmed that, most likely because getting an epic skill to 100 is more a dream than a possible reality. I don't know anything about the legendary tests, let alone the mythic ones so don't ask. She winds down her lecture, cutting off my questions right as I was about to ask them. Judy is sitting in the chair opposite me her behavior, the complete opposite of what it was when this lecture started, then she was fidgety still overcome with energy at her achievement, clearly having heard about the classification before, but at some point mom must have started explaining something she hadn't heard about yet or something she mustn't have been paying attention to back when she was being taught as now she had a focused look on her face, most likely thinking about what skills she could try to use at the same time to unlock other skills. After all affinity with one skills meant you most likely also had affinity with other skills that linked to it, the only counter. Example appearing to be, if you have no affinity for another base skilled required. Mom, do you have a book that lists known skills and what their tier is? I ask thinking that having some path trees opened up to me would be a good thing so I don't have to discover everything by trial and error. Sadly no. After the last small rebellion ten years ago, the king decided to remove such knowledge from easy access to prevent people grouping up so many skills all under one leader. 
If you want to find out now about what curtain skill will lead to you have to become an apprentice to someone who has had the skill for a while and knows them. She said looking a little sad, I think I'm not the only one interested in getting more skills. This interest in knowledge and creativity that I have, I find that it's not based on who I used to be back on earth, sure that is a big influence but I can see some of my parents reflected in me. The person I was back on earth, the unlucky lazy person who suddenly woke up died in that alley. I am Ajax, who I was will always be part of me but, in order to thrive in this world I need to let who I was be all in respect to the knowledge I have gained. My emotional and moral decisions will be those of Ajax, raised in this world to Sylvia and Sam, brother to Tom and Judy. On this day, I made the decision to rise as high as I can not for the sake of who I used to be, but for the sake of who I am now, where I am now and for those that are important to me. Chapter 10 For the last few weeks all of our neighbors have been wondering why Judy came running home barely ten minutes after going to see the caravan. Let me tell you that having them by that it was all because of her finding the two emeralds in an odd piece of ore was a hard sell. But the way Judy sold it I almost believe she either got an acting or deception skill out of it. There were only three people that didn't quite seem to believe it. Alana, Johnny, and Dad. Alana might not really believe what she was being told and I can't be sure that Judy didn't come clean to her best friend but from the looks of it either she understood that it was none of her business or their friendship ran very deep from both sides and she does know but has not spread it further even to her own family. Dad, I think is sure that something else is going on, but he just doesn't know what else, and has convinced himself that he actually not knowing is if not better for the family at least it's safer, and has left it alone after the talk the night the day it happened. And that left us with Johnny, who was having fishing expeditions so large and so often trying to find out what had happened they could have put fish on the endangered species with that kind of dedication. We mostly dealt with it by playing dumb, but I could see that it was starting to grate on both mom and dad that he was being so nosy. The problem was if they asked him to leave on account of this it would be pretty much the same as admitting that something was going on, and he seemed to know that too. This led me to harvesting my little garden a bit earlier than I would have liked. After all this was going to be my pocket money, and I wanted to at least be able to put a bit aside for a rainy day. After all, if he was taking a close look at Judy now, with Tom being the best fighter among all the kids his age, how long would it be until he started poking around in my business? So with all my plants collected and ready, I went to my mother in the evening, knowing I would get a much better result if I was going to talk to her about the worth of what I had and at least gain some understanding of money. I waited until dinner was over and everyone else went to their rooms while I volunteered to help clean up the table. As soon as we were done, I pulled mom off to one side. Mom, I harvested all my plants today, and I would like some advice on how much they are worth so I at least have an idea on what I should sell them for the next time the caravan comes in I ask her. You already harvested, but it should still be another cycle until they are ready, I know we agreed that you will be the one to handle your corner, but we shouldn't just throw away money like that, she says. Her experience in growing these herbs, for years upon years showing through. I know, but I think mine looked ready, I say as I go to my room and bring out two sacks of herbs and give them to my mother to inspect. She looks at me with pity at first, but as she starts pulling out more and more plants her expression changes to confusion, then suspicion, the outright disbelief as the plants in front of her now are not only decent enough to be harvested, but most likely bigger more vibrant and more potent than any she has harvested in the years before. I push down the smirk I feel coming on and listen to her as she finishes going through both sacks. You grew all these in that small little corner I gave you? These are amazing, just these would probably be worth more than the rest of my garden. She seems both proud and a little conflicted at the fact that her almost six-year-old son managed to do more than her with less. Well first of all I think we should go through how the denominations work. First we have the different metals that make up the coins we use, iron copper silver gold and platinum. Each of them have normal and large coins, each large coin is worth 10 of the smaller one and ratch higher metal coin is worth 10 of the large of the previous metal, she patiently explains to me placing 6 different coins on the table in front of me, 3 large and 3 small. Pretty much the denominations in this world are each higher value is 10 times the previous one, so one large platinum coin is worth 10 platinum coins or 100 large gold coins. 
1,000 gold, coins 10,000 large silver coins, and so on all the way down to iron coins. Now in a small village like our most buying and selling involves iron coins with some of the more expensive things going into copper. Silver is what is used for family savings as well as for when farmers are selling part of their harvest to the city, gold and platinum coins are not something we concern ourselves with. Next she runs me through what my plants should be worth, about one and half to two large silver coins, after all they are very nice specimens. Next she explained to me that I would probably be able to get one large silver coin for them if I am lucky at the caravan. After all merchants have merchant skills, no way they are going to give a six-year-old a fair price for something. Still, I think this would be a good experience for you, she says with a bit of hurt in her eyes at the fact that she will let me go alone as we agreed all those cycles ago when she let me set up my garden. After that, we carefully stored the plants back in the bags and we both went to sleep. I am feeling a lot better and not at all worried about how this sale is going to go now that I know what my product is worth. I don't see why I would accept an inferior price. The next morning was a chilly one, with a thin fog coming down, nothing that would last for more than another hour or two, so I set about doing my usual mana and physical exercises, replacing the gardening portion with some more mana control until I see it reach as low as 30 in the corner of my vision. The UI is, I think, one of my most useful interactions yet with this system. Yes, it may well have taken quite a bit of focus and willpower to convince myself that I could see my health, stamina and mana in the top right corner of my vision like I did in the games back home, but it all worked out in the end. While everything in this interface seems to be set in rules, like a message once close cannot be opened again without re-triggering the action that made show up in the first place you can influence the system to work in your favor. For example, I can introduce a new command to minimize the message instead of closing it. As I was doing my laps around the village, I made out the caravan coming down the road towards the village through the mist, so I decided to go take a quick look at it and maybe eavesdrop a bit. Maybe I can get some way to mark up my plants a little bit. Looking out from behind a tree, I am surprised to see Tom walking at the front of the caravan towards the village in a decent suit of armor with a big flat shield strapped to his arm. Not being able to make anything else out clearly through the fog, I decide to go welcome my big brother home and find out why he is back here. Hey big brother, what br- dash is as far as I get after walking out towards him from behind the tree, before I see a flash of movement and feel the ground slip from under my feet. Turns out stealthing close to a guard and suddenly pooping out from behind a tree to talk to them with no warning is a good way to get a shield to the face. I feel myself lying down against the tree, my vision darkening quickly and a ringing in my ears. Did he just call you big brother? A melodious voice called out. The rest of the commotion was lost to the ringing. The last thing I saw was my health showing 30 of 70. Everything going black and drifting off as I heard Elzanoff. Chapter 11 Tom, POV The two weeks trip to the small village open caves did me a lot of good. I was still a little worked up from what had happened, but at least most of my anger had bled out and I was only left with a lot of restless energy from just sitting in a cart. Technically, I was here for protection, so when the fog came in a bit denser I went to the head of the caravan, to lead the way even though I knew the chances of something happening this close to the village were close to zero. All my thoughts changed when I got the distinct feeling that I was being watched. It wasn't something new to me. After all as a guard in the city patrolling the street, you always have a few people keeping their eye on you to act as an alarm system for people doing the shady business. The problem was here there was nobody to watch me. Everyone was either talking amongst themselves or on watch duty themselves and looking at the forest. I only had this feeling one time before in my life. At the end of my first year as a member of the guard I took the optional posting of joining the hunting guard. You need to have 10 cycles of experience before you can sign up and the money is good for going out into the forest to protect a couple of nobles while they hunt for sport. I still get nightmares from the LVL-19 wolf that jumped on my back that day. That incident is what marked my decision to remain as a normal patrolman and focus on honing my skill through dedication hard work and time instead of going for the faster method of leveling by putting yourself at risk. After all, experience earned was a result of three things. First how demanding is the activity? 
Do you have to spend every resource you have or can you keep doing it for days on end with no issues? Second, how difficult is the activity for you? Taking on an evenly matched opponent will give less experience than if you take on that same opponent with no mana or better yet a craftsman making a knife he made a lot of times before levels from his last one. The one he makes after with increased stats will be worth less experience since it was easier to get that result. The last one is risk, and it's pretty self-explanatory, the higher the danger, the more experience. You fight an opponent in a spar, or to the death, the experience will reflect that. My small brush with danger made it clear to me I was not built to be able to take the danger, so a steady long road was the way for me. I was now on edge, I hadn't taken those assignments before specifically because I didn't want to go through that again and now that feeling of being watched came back. I was looking through the fog but couldn't tell where I was being watched from. All of a sudden something moves from the tree to my left, I hear the crack of a twig and I swing my shield feeling a solid contact. I look at who I hit and I see a young kid that seems strangely familiar. Alzanoth, Kate, says from behind me, casting a healing spell on the kid I just flattened. Tom, why would you shield bash a kid who just called you big brother, she asks with a mix of confusion and anger. Then I processed her words, he called me what? I take another look at him and yeah, he does resemble Ajax. A profound sense of guilt comes over me as I pick him up and start carrying him towards the village thinking of the best way to explain this to my parents and Ajax himself. Still, I swear, if this kid doesn't have a stealth skill, I'll eat my left boot. Ajax POV My head was pounding as I started to shift, finding myself in my own bed. The last thing I remember is seeing my brother's shield coming towards me and hearing a strange word afterwards. So I tried sitting up, finding surprisingly that while I still had a pounding headache I didn't feel any pain from the actual hit I took and my health now said 70-70. Good you're awake, I hear in a soft sweet voice. I look up and I start to consider just how hard my brother hit me. Standing on a chair next to my bed reading a scroll is a blonde young woman, with cat ears and tail. I know that beast kin are a part of this world, same as dwarves and elves, but knowing something exists and seeing it are two very different things. How are you feeling? Does your head still hurt? She asks while she moves up to check on me. Who are you? Kate, I'm your, that's as far as she got as my mom, came in through the door, looking worried and a little out of breath. Ajax, how are you feeling? Does your head hurt? Can you remember what happened? And the questions just kept coming, this has to be the first time I have seen my mother distressed, ever the composed calm merchant, this new attitude threw me through a loop. After about a minute of non-stop questions, she pauses to take breath so I see my chance. Yes mom I'm fine, I think Tom hit me with his shield, I'm not sure what happened after that I quickly threw my brother under the bus, after all I haven't seen him in almost four years and the first thing he does is try to brain me. I was just teaching you not to sneak up on someone in a fogged up forest. Tom said from the doorway with his trademark smirk, though some concern for me, still showed in his eyes. Just kidding, he quickly puts up his hands as my mother's attention switches from me and she turns on him. How is he Kate? He gonna make it? Yeah he'll be just fine. So, why did you take it upon yourself to see if my head is hard enough? I ask my brother, a small smile working its way onto my face. Small hang up from a run-in with a wolf in the fog a few years back, you should probably not use your stealth skill within arm reach of me. He tries to brush it off, but from the look in his eyes I think it might be a bit more than a small hang incident he makes it out to be. What stealth skill, mom asks, looking from my brother to me, confusion, clear on her face. Same one he's been using, since I was looking after him before I left, I wasn't sure back then if he had one but seeing him get so close to me without anyone in the caravan noticing is a dead giveaway. He calmly digs my grave, completely oblivious, to the look of, for the love of God, shut the fuck up. That, Kate catches, but only gives me a look of pity as if telling me she can't help. So you've got a stealth skill do you, mom asks, and I find a sudden interest in inspecting my feet. Is that why I can never find you when I want to deliver something to Mrs. Alina? It's not that I don't want to help you deliver, it's the 30-minute revelation of how I remind her of her son, that she gives me every time I murmur under my breath, 
lucky enough she doesn't catch that and seems to have regained her composure. No matter, we can add that to the list of things we need to talk about, right now, dinner's getting cold, let's all go eat. She nods towards the door and herds me out after Kate and Tom into the kitchen where Dad and Judy are setting the table for six, it seems that Johnny won't be joining us this time, which I am glad for. The last thing I want is that gossip getting wind of me having a stealth skill. Chapter 12 How is life in the city? Judy went on to question my brother during the meal. It's very different, going from a village where everyone knows each other to a place filled with strangers that look out mainly for only their own family. It took some adjustment, my brother answered. I look forward to seeing the way of life your brother described in the days will be staying here. Thanks again for welcoming me into your home, Kate said as we finished up the food. We had kept the conversation light while eating, but now it was time to talk about more serious topics. With everyone having eaten and relaxed, it looked to be a pleasant evening. So Tom, what brings you here so soon? Dad asked the same question that went through my mind the first time I saw him. Well, it all started about three years ago, as the first year finished I took up a shift in the hunting party where a wolf took a mouthful of my forearm. It's then that I met Kate, as she was the medical trainee for our barracks. We had both joined up at the same time yet had never met before and we both grew fond of each other, he explained as he draped his arm across the beastkin's shoulders. Everything went for the next year and a half, up until the point that Baron Nestor's third son took an interest in Kate more specifically her high proficiency with healing magic and tried making a pass at her several times. He clearly doesn't put any stock in the changes implemented eight years ago and was trying to force her into his employ and when we both put up a public resistance he decided to set up an incident, the result of which got us both suspended for one cycle. As suspended guards we can't take any other jobs and we are not provided with the food and shelter for the duration of the suspension and the guard can't give us anything harsher as Kate is one of only two healing requirements in the last three years and the more talented one of them. What happened eight years ago? I ask, everything else in the story makes perfect sense to me, a noble wanted something that was not his. He got told no, so he abused his authority and connections to be petty, but what was this change really interested me. You see Ajax, you know that we live in the kingdom of Grinder, and the royal family, in an effort to improve relations with the Republic, went through an inquisition to ensure all non-human servitude to the noble houses was voluntary. Needless to say, quite a few of them have yet to adapt to the new idea that they can't forcibly collect talented non-human for their houses. This all made sense, after all large parts of the continent were still left unexplored, there were a total of nine independent kingdoms, for where the dominant race heralded supremacy over all others, one with an even mix of all ruled by a council, and four with a majority race and supposed equal rights for the rest. But then how come there isn't a war going on? I couldn't figure out what stopped the supremacy kingdoms from fighting one another, constantly. That's easy, they don't want to fight their own kind? Kate said it was the most obvious thing in the world. Why not just attack the others directly? There has to be another way to get there, besides going through their own allied kingdoms. There is, but nobody is dumb enough to take it. Kate laughed. Honey, us humanoids may be the strongest societal species, but deep in the forests, lakes, mountains, or caves separating the kingdoms, you can find all sorts of monsters. The mountains keeping dwarves and beast kin from each other have a dragon ruling over them, mother explained it to me. Yeah, maybe they could kill a path through, but nobody wants to do it because of how much it will cost in lives to do so only to open the war. As such everything has been at a standstill for the last 500 years, dad said. At least for now, we are approaching a new rule, Kate mentioned offhandedly. What does that mean? I am confused. In the next five years, all the monarchies will pass along to the next heir. It happens every 600 to 900 years, depending on how long the current rulers live and how strong they are. Tom lays it out for me. It was very risky for the royal family to make the changes they did so close to a coronation. I hope it doesn't cause a rebellion. On that ominous note, everyone else went off to sleep. After all, they hadn't laid in bed for a whole day like me. That night I was thinking of the political situation, 
especially in the Republic with their Council of Five, you see the Council had a spot for a member of each race that made up a big percent of its population. While all races could interbreed with one another both Dwarven and Elven customs rejected breeding with other races. Not to say that there weren't half-elves and half-dwarves, just that there were very few of them, so the council always consisted of a human, an elf, a dwarf, a beastkin, and a half-human half-beastkin. So far, there hadn't been any problems with this, but this kingdom was still new, less than 800 years old, while that may seem like a lot, it translates to about 1,200 years on earth, it still has its interceptors alive, the original members of the factions that came together are still around and some of the strongest people, if not currently in power they still overlook and stomp out corruption. As I wrap my mind around leaders surviving for so long and idealists stomping out corruption, I spot my bag of herbs sitting in the corner of the room and remember my original plan for the day to go sell them. Confident that I will have no problem doing it tomorrow, I pull up my stat sheet to see if I got a skill for being laid out though I suspected I didn't. Name, Ajax. Level, 10. Experience, 4150-10,000. Traits, Child, Divine Witness. Health, 70-70ths. Mana, 210-210. Stamina, 166-180. Vitality, 7.52. Strength, 15.36. Endurance, 18.9. Dexterity, 16.7. Intellect, 33.84. Wisdom, 25.02. Mind, 21.73. Perception, 14.14. Stat points, 198. Skills, Meditation, LVL 32, Sense Mana, LVL 31, Expel Mana, LVL 31, Mathematics, LVL 20, Stealth, LVL 13, Drawing, LVL 30, Athleticism, LVL 13, Running, LVL 20, Reading, LVL 20, Writing, LVL 20, Sprinting, LVL 10, Cooking, LVL 14, Sewing, LVL 10, Cleaning, LVL 10, Haggling, LVL 2, Gardening LVL 19, Manipulate Mana LVL 6, Water Aspect Mana LVL 5, Fire Aspect Mana LVL 4, Air Aspect Mana LVL 6, Earth Aspect Mana LVL 4, Inject Mana LVL 3, Mana Farming LVL 2, Axes LVL 14, Hammers LVL 10, Mining LVL 5, Lumberjack LVL 5, Smelting LVL 3, Blacksmithing LVL 3. As I suspected nothing had changed, until I saw it, my vitality burst from 7.22 to 7.52. Losing and regaining that 40 health gave that much of an increase. To be honest, I should be kicking myself for not seeing it sooner, after all, mind goes up fastest when I spend and Reagan mana, and the same is true for endurance with stamina. Could it also have something to do with the fact that I was healed with a spell? What was that chant she used? Alzanoff, I'll have to try this out at some point, having some healing magic on stand by isn't the worst idea in the world regardless how harmless living in a village may seem, with a plan starting to take shape in my mind about somehow grilling Kate for all she knows about magic in her remaining time here I fall asleep, perhaps for the first time in five years, with a full mana bar, just thinking about all that I have ahead of me tomorrow. Chapter 13 I was a bit hyperactive as I made my way to the caravan. Tom and Kate decided to join me, Kate to meet any of my brother's friends that will surely be there and Tom, in his own words, to see me get ripped off. I couldn't understand how that was going to happen, since I knew the worth of my goods and even had a haggling skill. I pulled up my screen looking to see if the exercise from last night had worked as I wanted. Name, Ajax. Level, 10. Experience, 4200-10,000. Traits, Child, Divine Witness. Health, 70-70ths. Mana, 210-210. Stamina, 180-180. Vitality, 7.52. Strength, 15.36. Endurance, 18.9. Dexterity, 16.7. Intellect, 33.84. Wisdom, 25.02. 
mind, 21.73. Perception, 14.14. Stat points, 198. Skills. Common, frowny face mathematics LVL 20, stealth LVL 13, drawing LVL 30, athleticism LVL 14, running LVL 20, reading LVL 20, writing LVL 20, cooking LVL 14, sewing LVL 10, cleaning LVL 10, haggling LVL 2, gardening LVL 19, axes LVL 14, hammers LVL 10, deception LVL 1. Uncommon, frowny face meditation LVL 32, sense mana LVL 31, expel mana LVL 31, sprinting LVL 10, mining LVL 5, lumberjack LVL 5, smelting LVL 3, blacksmithing LVL 3, mana farming LVL 2. Rare, manipulate mana LVL 6, water aspect mana LVL 5, fire aspect mana LVL 4, air aspect mana LVL 6. Earth Aspect Mana LVL 4, Inject Mana LVL 3. I managed to segregate my skill, this also meant that if anyone got a look at my stats, they could make a killing selling the information. What has you so worried? Kate asked me. It's not going to be as bad as they said. She tried cheering me up, thanks. I mumbled, maybe you can help take my mind off it. How did you heal me yesterday? Oh that, I just used the healing spell Alzanoth, she brushed off my question. So anyone with mana can become a healer, I try a different angle at getting the information out of her. Pretty much, but how effective or efficient your spell is is dependent on your knowledge and experience, she finally gives me something to go on. So that's how magic works. I exclaim like I made a breakthrough. Oh no silly, there are three different ways to cast magic and mages tend to specialize in one of them. It's not that they can't do more, but they are counterintuitive to one another, she went into teacher mode, you see casting is done with what we call divine language, no records show we came to know it, but casting only works in that language as such getting spells is hard and why apprenticeships are so restrictive, other than some very basic widely known spells everyone does all they can to keep theirs to themselves. So Alzanoth is the healing one? No Alzanoth is for small regeneration and a beginner spell. I can't go around disclosing my other ones as the rules of my contract state. Playing around with the divine language is also too dangerous for anyone to attempt outside of wartime desperation. After all one wrong syllable and instead of cleaning the wound, you could clean the body of blood. Okay, so messing with casting magic is not something to be done. I reinforce that in myself that I will not be playing Russian roulette trying to learn that language. Yeah, Zapspec and Luxem make up the other three widely known spells, healing, cleaning, and light, then there is the runic magic. Unlike casted magic, this is much more rigid as you need certain conductive materials and patterns to get a specific effect. Humanic control doesn't influence anything except the magnitude of the spell, depending on how much mana you put in. They are rigid, but it's much safer to experiment with modifying runes though her displeasure at runic magic came through a bit in her tone. Lastly we have control magic, this uses no chant or other items, it is high level mana release and manipulation, while its power output is well below the other two it makes up for it in speed and flexibility, but with the control and deep understanding of the actions you are taking required nobody really uses it. She pauses as if thinking of what else to say. Oh, come on stop boring him with all this magic nonsense, he's here to make money, my brother oh so helpfully butts in. It takes my full concentration not to swing for his jaw. How am I supposed to ask about magic now, without revealing that I have mana? Luckily enough for him we arrive at the market, and he darts away to speak to Johnny and Dirk. As they arrive along with us, he takes the initiative to introduce Kate. Not wanting to just hang around as they all catch up I head up to the herb vendor, to see what I can get for my hard work. Hey kid, what can I help you with? He asks me with that salesman smile. I am looking to sell these. I say as I lay on the table, he is using the bag of herbs. He rifles through the bag and I see his eyes expand to the size of saucers for a brief moment before returning to their disinterested look. And how much would you like for all this, he asks. Now I know about being lowballed so I also will try to highball him. I was thinking around 40 silvers I wanted 25 and would take 20 so that seemed like a good starting point. 
40 for these, no kid, how about 10, he instantly goes on the offensive. I open my mouth to reject that, but I find I can't speak a word. The only thing that I wants to come out of my mouth is to accept the bad offer that was just given to me. It takes me slapping myself across the face to regain my composure and answer. 30 I managed to get out, clearly to the surprise of the vendor. Apparently customers slapping themselves is not a common occurrence, but hey, if it gets me more money I'll do it. He regains his composure and answers back with a simple 15 the way he looked at me having changed. Try as I might I couldn't manage to do anything other than accept his offer and ended up letting it go for 15 silvers, I took my payment while numbly all day while reflecting back on the interaction, so this is how skills affected non-physical confrontations, I could feel having gained some skills just from that interaction alone, that was the only thing that helped me write off my loss on the sale and got me to move further in the market looking to try my hand at now lowering the price others set on their wares. Where'd you go little brother? Tom caught up to me, joined by Kate Dirk and Johnny. Managed to sell my plants. I tell him. Really how much did you manage to get for them? Fifteen silver coins, I answered dejectedly. Fifteen. Mom only comes back with around twenty-five and she usually sells double what you bright, he exclaims. Yeah, but she said what I had was worth around twenty, maybe twenty-five when she looked at them two days ago. In my focus at getting to the bottom of merchant skills, I let that crucial bit of information just slip out. And where did you get plants like that? Dirk asked, while Johnny looked at me with greed in his eyes. I transplanted them from the forest and have been taking care of them for a year now. I quickly lied that I grew them from scratch and am hoping my deception skill will swing things in my favor. They seem to have bought it, but as of late more and more of these slip-ups are happening. I need to start being more careful of who is around me when I run my mouth. Well, what's done is done, all that's left is for me to go spend my newly earned cash. When a cart filled with seeds catches my eye. Hey sir, what kind of seeds are these? I asked the merchant. I have different kinds of seeds, food medicinal, even some poisonous ones, he answers before he turns around and sees who he's dealing with. Oh, what can I help you with kid? I was looking to buy some medicinal plants that would sell well and try planting them I think honesty might be my best bet here and closing down a deal while he is flustered about selling poison to a child would work in my favor. Sure these ones here are quite rare and they sell well but they are very hard to grow, I would rather recommend these other ones he shows me his wares. How much would it be for a bag of the first ones? I could let it go for five silver coins, he says, as I feel the same pressure settle on me once again, though much weaker than before. Is it because of my own skill improvement or maybe his skills aren't as high, most likely both. I'll give you three, he answered back, his expression becoming more rigid. Clearly he feels my own skills taking effect. Four is all I hear back and the pressure mounts considerably, it takes every ounce of willpower I have to squeak out a three and half. His composure breaks out into a smile, and through his laughter I hear, ha ha ha, I like you kid, all right, three and a half it is. The rest of my trip though the merchandise I do nothing but question the price and try to work out my skills on things I can't afford as such getting my skills a workout and not being able to buy things from lack of funds. Chapter 14 Spending a whole day bartering and losing did a lot in terms of bringing me down from my high horse about being special. Well yes, I was an extreme talent in terms of children, if the skills of common merchants that through these parts is enough to stifle me like that I clearly need to get a lot stronger considering that there are people who count their age in centuries not decades. The idea for tonight was to question my brother as well as my father in order to help me determine what kind of path I wanted to pursue. Out of the gate, one as a runic mage or caster mage was out of the question it would get me noticed way too quickly and end up with me forced to accept a lifetime contract that gave me options as any other type of crafter or fighter, even as a farmer should I want to considering I could downplay my mana farming skill. So after dinner, while mother and Judy were out with Kate, I went in to start planning my future. Hey brother, I was wondering what being a guard is like? He looked up from his drink at my question, with an intrigued look on his face, while Dad just about choked on his. WWH where is this coming from Ajax? 
Dad is starting to look panicked that I might follow in my brother's footsteps. Yeah little brother, didn't you already start your training in blacksmithing? He smirks at me knowing that he was the reason I started off with blacksmithing as opposed to swordsmanship. It's just that after spending a day selling and buying things at the fair I thought about what job I might do in the future, as much as like blacksmithing it isn't something that I can see myself doing for the rest of my life I answer, all the while looking at my father as if to convey to him that as much as he might want me to follow in his footsteps it isn't going to happen. You don't really need to be so worried about that, with skills in drawing running and stealth you can always become a messenger. And those are always needed, brother, seems to think that this is a great future, and while I understand the importance of a timely delivered message in times of crisis, even thinking about being a career errand boy sends a shiver up my spine. Dirk even told me that his dad was relieved today when he told him about your stealth skill, since this village didn't have a messenger to send should something happen, he blindsides me with something that I am very surprised to hear, where the hell did they learn about my stealth skill? How do they know about my stealth skill? I hadn't told anyone about that until today. I thought the ability to read another person's status was extremely rare. I am downright panicked at this. Do they know about all my skills? Tom POV. Ajax freaks out when he hears about the opportunity to have a calm peaceful life with a guaranteed job and few responsibilities. I instantly start feeling very guilty about having leaked out his skill to both Johnny and Dirk at the time it didn't seem that big of a deal. N.O.T. they don't. I may have let it slip out that you have it. My voice runs out of volume towards the end of my sentence. I see a look of relief instantly take over him, morphing an instant later into one of rage, that just as quickly turns into something that seems like the mask of focus our strategy instructors get on their faces when they play each other in those weird strategy games, and ends up with a look that all but screams he has a plan in mind and from the way he is eyeing me, I think it doesn't bode well. BB but I don't well want to be a messenger. His eyes start getting wet and it feels like a dagger to my heart for having ruined his future. I'm sorry Ajax, is there any way I can make it up to you? I try to placate him before he may burst out crying. I'll end up sleeping in the forest if mom and Kate come back to find him crying because of me. I catch the small smirk that flash on his face before he looks up at me. All signs of it gone is face a picture of innocence, really, you'll help train me in all the weapons you learn to use, while being away. Maybe if I get a skill in one of those it will make it easier for me to pick a different career. And there's the ploy, he basically signed me up as a full-time instructor for a full two weeks, the question is how do I get out of this without causing a shitstorm to fall on my head afterwards. Right as I figure my way out and open my mouth to answer. I see it in his eyes he knows I have my ticket out the door opens, and in walks mother, Judy, and Kate. I see him through a look at the door, before he beats me, by saying you won't do it, do what? Kate asks as she comes to take a seat, by my side. After he told Dee Dash, that's as far as I let him get out before I quickly cut him off, the little brat he was ready to throw me in front of the cart, yes I might have done the same to him, but mine was an honest mistake, we were supposed to be brothers. Of course I'll do it. Kate POV. Spending the afternoon being given a tour of the village by Sylvia and Judy was a lot more enjoyable than I would have thought. After being raised in a city to a poor single mother I was so shocked to see how strong the bonds between these people were all the way out here in the forest. Despite not being family they all knew and helped each other without looking for an angle. Having returned home I find my lover with a defeated look on his face and his brother Ajax with the same one he had as he was leaving the market despite not being able to buy anything after that bag of seeds. Everything okay? I ask him after we retreat to our room for the evening. Yeah, it's all fine. I may have spilled about Ajax's stealth skill without asking him about it and he has me training him in everything I know about weapons until we leave. Sorry I won't be able to take you to see caves this village was named after he tells me. It's not a big loss, I don't find caves that interesting in the first place so spending more time connecting to what could turn out to be my only family in the future, seeing how my mother died two years ago was a much better way of spending my time, especially since I found myself feeling welcomed and liking these people. Don't look so down. Come here, I'll make it up to you, I call to him in a sultry voice from the bed as I pull aside the blanket. Sam POV. 
I can hear some suspicious sounds as I pass Tom's room and call it a night as I get into bed. Is everything okay? Sylvia looks at me concerned, my facade of being indifferent to Ajax not continuing as a blacksmith must have fallen. I'll be okay, it's just that Ajax has decided not to become a blacksmith, he even roped Tom into training him how to fight, all because he doesn't want to be a messenger. I let out a sigh at how powerless I feel, hmm, if he just doesn't want to be a messenger I could try talking the rest of the crafters in the village into trying him out as an apprentice before he turns ten, Lord knows they all owe me a favor or two from all the times they had me help them out with selling their wares after a dry spell in their income she comforts me with an idea I hadn't even considered. She's right, just because Ajax won't become a blacksmith that doesn't mean that he won't be a crafter there are many professions that he could take up. My mood instantly perks up as we cuddle to go to sleep, what would I do without you? I murmured before I fell asleep. Chapter 15 the last two weeks I was put through my paces by my brother and Kate, both seeming to have made it their mission to ensure that I was ready to become a guard should that be something I wanted. Between the two of them I was always doing something whether it be training with a weapon or being healed up from all the bruises I get getting on top of my blacksmithing and gardening every day was filled to the brim. Having the luxury of an off-duty healer nearby also meant that my brother felt a little more free in roughing me up. This ended with me needing a healing session after every spar, though it all did wonders for my skill, as did haggling with my entire net worth on the line it seems. Name, Ajax. Level, 10. Experience, 9950-10,000. Traits, Child, Divine Witness. Health, 8080ths. Mana, 230-230. Stamina, 200-200. Vitality, 8.86. Strength, 17.03. Endurance, 20.11. Dexterity, 18.77. Intellect, 34.49. Wisdom, 25.97. Mind, 23.06. Perception, 16.33. Stat points, 198. Skills, Common, Frowny Face Mathematics LVL 20, Stealth LVL 16, Drawing LVL 30, Athleticism LVL 14, Running LVL 20, Reading LVL 20, Writing LVL 20, Cooking LVL 14, Sewing LVL 10, Cleaning LVL 10, Haggling LVL 9, Gardening LVL 20, Axes LVL 23, Hammers LVL 17, Deception LVL 5, Sword LVL 7, Shield LVL 6, Bow LVL 7, Spear LVL 9, Throwing LVL 8. Persuasion LVL 4. Uncommon, Frowny Face Meditation LVL 32, Sense Mana LVL 31, Expel Mana LVL 31, Sprinting LVL 11, Mining LVL 9, Lumberjack LVL 9, Smelting LVL 8, Blacksmithing LVL 8, Mana Farming LVL 4, Increase Price LVL 4. Lower Price LVL 6, Chanting LVL 4, Rare, Manipulate Mana LVL 8, Water Aspect Mana LVL 7, Fire Aspect Mana LVL 5, Air Aspect Mana LVL 6, Earth Aspect Mana LVL 6, Inject Mana LVL 5. I was one skill away from hitting level 11 and my stats looked monstrous, normally kids have maybe one stat in the 20s before adding points too if they worked hard. I was barely age 7 so all my stats were still due another 3 points from natural increase, being on track to have all my stats except vitality exceed the 20 mark. Do you think this will be enough? Tom asks me as I lay there getting patched up by Kate, what do you mean? Actually confused by his question. We both know you most likely won't go into a crafting profession, no matter how much mom and dad push for it. They'll likely have you try apprentice at every one in the village before you turn 10 just on the off chance that it you may follow it, so you won't have time to train like this much after I leave. So do you think that we managed to cram enough into these last six weeks for it to be enough to give you a head start? He benevolently smiled down on me. His answer surprised me. How long had he known that I was planning to be a fighter? I still hadn't decided what kind or what I would be fighting, but I knew I wanted to be able to grab my own fate, which couldn't happen if I wasn't strong enough to be able to choose what I wanted. 
That night, when I asked him to train me I made the plan to grab as many skills as I can before I turn 10 and take the next three years to decide if I was to be a guard or a soldier, maybe an enforcer. Turns out mom and dad would help me with getting me every small apprenticeship to get the basics on all of them. I then got the sudden urge to duck, so I did, Kate Palm whooshing right where my head had been. She has been doing that for the last four weeks, claiming it could help me get the prized skill danger sense but two weeks and I convinced myself she just likes giving me a swipe to the head any time I pissed her off, usually by going off into my own world thinking about different things. Hey! What was that for? I asked the surprised beastkin, did you get it? She gets all excited like a kid on Christmas morning, knowing he spotted the game console hidden in the car after the last shopping trip. To which I just give her a smile and say nothing something we had long agreed upon being the routine whenever she asked me about my skills, and she accepted that I was playing everything close to the vest. A familiar blinking light in the corner of my vision drew my attention. That was something I hadn't seen in seven years, so I pulled up my status to see what was up. Name, Ajax. Level, 11. Experience, 0 11,000. Traits, Child, Divine Witness. Health, 8080s. Mana, 230-230. Stamina, 200-200. Vitality, 8.86. Strength, 17.03. Endurance, 20.11. Dexterity, 18.77. Intellect, 34.49. Wisdom, 25.97. Mind, 23.06. Perception, 16.33. Stat points, 220. Skills, common, frowny face mathematics LVL 20, stealth LVL 16, drawing LVL 30, athleticism LVL 14, running LVL 20, reading LVL 20, writing LVL 20, cooking LVL 14, sewing LVL 10, cleaning LVL 10, haggling LVL 9. Gardening LVL 20, Axes LVL 23, Hammers LVL 17, Deception LVL 5, Sword LVL 7, Shield LVL 6, Bow LVL 7, Spear LVL 9, Throwing LVL 8. Persuasion LVL 4, Uncommon, Frowny Face Meditation LVL 32, Sense Mana LVL 31, Expel Mana LVL 31, Sprinting LVL 11, Mining LVL 9, Lumberjack LVL 9, Smelting LVL 8, Blacksmithing LVL 8, Mana Farming LVL 4, Increase Price LVL 4, Lower Price LVL 6, Chanting LVL 4, Danger Sense LVL 1. Rare, Manipulate Mana LVL 8, Water Aspect Mana LVL 7, Fire Aspect Mana LVL 5, Air Aspect Mana LVL 6, Earth Aspect Mana LVL 6, Inject Mana LVL 5. After opening my stat, the blinking stopped and a message appeared in front of me. Child trait has been upgraded by leveling past level 10, despite its restrictions. Trait child prodigy gained. Well, that was unexpected, so there was a bonus for doing something like this? I quickly focused on the child prodigy trait to see what had changed. Child prodigy temporary trait. Status points cannot be allocated. Incremental increase of all stat points by 10 throughout the duration. Stat points do not affect aging. Gaining skills grants experience. Leveling skills grants experience. Crafting experience gain stopped. Killing experience gain stopped. Upon expiration all stats increased by 2. Upon expiration or removal trait apprentice prodigy is gained for half the duration of any trait with child in the name persistent. Time remaining, 45 cycles. So two extra stat points in each section as well as what I think an improved version of Apprentice is, this means I'll have to ask what the usual Apprentice description is and compare them when the time comes. Hey, don't blank out on me to marvel at your status. Kate exclaims with mock outrage as this time she does lay the light smack on my head before we head towards the house, to have one last dinner together before they leave for the city in the morning their suspension ending around the time the caravan that arrived yesterday is set to return. I'm going to miss you too, I mention as we all head in the house. 
Well, don't say it like we won't see each other again, Kate cheerily jumps into her chair at the table, I'm sure we'll see each other again before too long. Her mannerisms sometimes really do remind me of a cat, it becomes especially pronounced when she is showing affection, as I discovered while practicing my stealth skill, following them around. I'll see you both in a few cycles, it'll be your turn to show me around then, Judy says, doing her best to keep a cheery mood, despite how much we all know she got attached to Kate in the time she spent here. And she wasn't the only one Alana was about to burst into tears yesterday when she was saying her goodbye, only her father's proposition for her and Judy to join a caravan in a few cycles for a trip to the city and back to gain experience as merchants put a stop to it. You're welcome back here anytime, Kate, mom, said as she was bringing the food, just you kids, try to be make sure you don't give me any grandchildren before your duty to the guard is done. Her loaded statement caused both Tom and Kate to go red in the face. Come on mom, how could you say that in front of Ajax? Just remember that you are 14 now and I am 28, your mother 27, and while I don't and would never regret having you, both of us might have had a much more stable and secure life had we waited until our initial apprenticeships had finished before starting our own family, father sagely nodded. We don't want to control your life, but we do want you to learn from our experiences and hopes your own life could be better, mom said as she took a seat and we all started eating. The next morning, after my brother's departure I was introduced to the village leatherworker who agreed to try and teach me for a few weeks to see if I had any talent for the craft, much to the dismay of the headman who was dead set on me becoming the village's new messenger. My excuse of not wanting to become a messenger, combined with my denial of getting any skills for any crating job I apprenticed would be my life for the foreseeable future. Chapter 16 for the last two years and eleven cycles I had been a blacksmith at first until my mother could arrange for me to get someone to take me on as an apprentice, two more cycles not much, I was then a leather worker, an alchemist, a farmer and let me tell that was a surprise not in that there was profession for it but in the respect that I didn't get any of the skills associated with farming. Before that I got everything, add to that my trait and I thought such a scenario was impossible just goes to show what I know. Where was I? Oh yeah my last job, as a butcher proved to be one of the most rewarding in terms of skills, not in so much of what we used since after all it was mostly knives, for cutting and a hammer for some of the bone work. That's not to say I didn't keep practicing the skills my brother taught me or worked in secret with my magic, I just slowed down on both a bit due to lack of time. Name, Ajax. Level, 11. Experience, 2400-12100. Traits, Child Prodigy, Divine Witness. Health, 130-130. Mana, 260-260. Stamina, 250-250. Vitality, 13.27. Strength, 21.60. Endurance, 25.80. Dexterity, 20.90. Intellect, 36.68. Wisdom, 28.26. Mind, 26.87. Perception, 18.63. Stat points, 242. Skills. Common, frowny face mathematics LVL 22, stealth LVL 21, drawing LVL 30, athleticism LVL 20, running LVL 22, reading LVL 20, Writing LVL 20, cooking LVL 20, sewing LVL 20, cleaning LVL 12, haggling LVL 19, gardening LVL 20, axes LVL 29, hammers LVL 21, deception LVL 15, sword LVL 10, shield LVL 10, bow LVL 10, spear LVL 10, throwing LVL 10, persuasion LVL 10, unarmed combat LVL 12, knives 20, skinning LVL 10, Tanning LVL, 10, Dismantle LVL, 10, Uncommon, Frowny Face Meditation, LVL, 35, Sense Mana LVL, 36, Expel Mana LVL, 37, Sprinting LVL, 13, Mining LVL, 10, Lumberjack LVL, 10, Smelting LVL, 10, Blacksmithing LVL, 10, Mana Farming LVL, 10, Increase Price LVL, 10, Lower Price LVL, 10, Danger Sense LVL, 1, Leatherworking LVL, 10, Alchemy LVL, 10, Mana, Milling LVL, 6, Precise, Cut LVL, 10, 
Precise, Blow, LVL, 10. Rare, Manipulate Mana LVL 15, Water Aspect Mana LVL 10, Fire Aspect Mana LVL 10, Air Aspect Mana LVL 10, Earth Aspect Mana LVL 10, Inject Mana LVL 13, Spot Weakness LVL 4. Upgrades Precise Blow 9-10 Hammers 20-21 as I started picking up all these skills in order for me not to miss something I added and upgrades at the bottom of my stat page, it wasn't all that hard just took a bit of focus and it now tells me all that changed with my skills since the last time I looked. I got up to go to breakfast, Judy was with Alana on a merchant route, both of them turned out to be very good at it and they were picked up by one of the merchants that had us on a regular route to learn the ropes, they were both planning on moving to the city to try make it big to both the headman's and Johnny's dread. Johnny had a pretty big crush on Alana and when shut down would take a run at Judy, though neither would look at him twice. That added on to the things he and Dirk said about my brother and Kate meant me and them got into scuffles pretty often. To the point where Johnny didn't stay over any longer. Yeah, mostly it was me provoking them into giving me a beating so I could practice my healing and get my vitality to rise. Self-harm was not only less efficient, but also something I would have not felt comfortable doing. It led to a pretty robust unarmed combat skill. The surprising part was despite me always picking the fights the village liked me more than Johnny as they took me for being young and dumb and protecting my sister's honor. I wasn't going to look a gift horse in the mouth and just went with it. How are you, Ajax ready to give hunting a go? Mom asked with faked enthusiasm. This was the one part that always left me feeling guilty for days. Seeing the look on my parents' faces when I kept switching what I was doing while telling them it wasn't for me. Luckily, that ended today as I decided hunting was going to be my best bet for training before going into the world at large. The good experience fighting and low oversight of what I kill in the forest should be perfect for me to fuel my growth before I go. I was genuinely more excited to see my parents' reaction to learning I got the skills for hunting than I was for getting them in the first place. I wasn't even worried I couldn't get them like with farming since I already had stealth bows and running and they were all required skills. I have a feeling this will be the one. I know I was optimistic about the others too, but this one really does feel like it would stick. I try to help them with the feeling of helplessness they have over my presumed situation, but the pity in their eyes just deepens. I'm sure it will be son dad tries to go along with it, but he had the same opinion about everything else I tried, though he was right about all but the farming so I guess I shouldn't call him out on it. I put my dishes away and look out the window to see old man Hatchet walking towards the house. I quickly put my boots on, collect my knife, sword and bow, and I'm running for the door. He's here, I'll see you again tonight, I toss a quick goodbye to my parents as I excitedly head for the door. Have a good day out there, Dad says back keeping against hope a positive outlook on my situation. Be careful out there, Mom calls out from the other side of the house. She always was worried for my safety, this combined with the fact that no hunter owed her a favor was the reason this was my last profession to go for. At least from her way of looking at it, I always thought this was the one to save for last since I would stick with this. As I go out the door, not wanting my teacher to think me lazy and having to go drag me out the house, I catch a glimpse of Johnny talking with Dirk by the smithy, both giving him the stink eye. Five days ago. Hatchet POV. The air was brisk as I walked out the butcher's shop having delivered the deer I caught, the light was almost gone when I heard a scuffle happening from the back of the next house over. And you thought you had what it takes to be a hunter. You'll probably just run up to a bear and get killed, that is if you could even find one willing to take you with him. The voice sounded familiar, but I couldn't place it, I had lived here for a long time, but I mostly kept to myself. Reaching the edge of the house someone bumps into me, it's Dirk the headman's son next to him his loyal dog Johnny, and on the floor a bit roughed up is Arax, I think his name is, hard-working kid though a bit quick to let his mouth loose when it's in his best interest to keep it shut. Looks like he got himself another ass kick. Why someone like doesn't learn I can't fucking put my finger on, he has been doing so for the past three years, with his discipline and determination he should be able to get a handle on that temper of his. Better watch where you're going old, or else the clueless idiot tries cowing me, 
thinking just because his dad's the headman I'll kiss the ground he walks on. This attitude is going to get him killed in a year or two tops from the look of the arrow grouping I saw on the trees the kid on the ground is practicing on religiously, or else what? I looked down on the short brat with a menacing glare, I didn't let city guard captains intimidate me, I sure as hell wasn't going to let some teen do it now that I retired. Do you not know who I am? He throws me a sneer. I let out a long breath to calm down and move to just walk away. I came to this out-of-the-way place for a calm life. One idiot wasn't worth making it harder for myself. You think you can just run away, he says, grabbing my shoulder, glee in his voice thinking I was afraid and not just too old to deal with shits like him. Now I want to pay him back, but it's not worth the hassle I will get if I give him the beating he's clearly asking for. The I catch sight of the kid's face on the ground, he's looking at Dirk the same way I did before he started running his mouth at me, and I get an idea. I'm the lead hunter for the village, see what you dad does to me, for just walking at night, I grunt out to him, before going around closer, to the boy on the ground. Hey kid, you want to be a hunter? Go home see if you can keep your nose out of trouble for four days, and I'll take you out with me. The look of outrage on Dirk's face as I walk away is worth the trouble of putting the kid through his paces. After all I was beginning to think hunting was a bit dull of late. Maybe this will be a bit more exciting. Chapter 17 Hatchet POV I walked towards the blacksmith's house, I didn't know much about him other than that he and his wife came here, quite a few years ago very young and expecting a child and that they were both quite talented in their fields, considering how high they climbed in this backwater while raising a child, then another, and now a third. At the gate I saw the headman's son and his friend both lazing about as per usual. The brat tried to get his father on my case for the incident five days ago, but all he could do to me was ask the hunters to go clear out the stretch a bit away from the village, meaning I had to sleep a night outside, not something that bothered me at all. The kid, Ajax, came out the door, he had his bow on his back, sword at his hip and the dagger tucked behind his back, he then walked up to me clearly familiar with their weight on him from the countless hours of practice he had put in. Thanks for agreeing to take me on. I'll do my best to meet your expectations, he eagerly parrots to me, probably the same phrase he said to each of the people that took him in for a few cycles as an apprentice. Cut the crap kid, we both know I took you on as a spur of the moment thing, so how about we make a deal you try not to get yourself and more importantly me killed out there and I'll try to teach you as much as you can learn about being a hunter, what do you say? I cut straight to it as soon as we are out of your shot of lazy number one and two. Yeah I can work with that, he answers back with a self-confident grin. This was not what I was expecting the old hunter to be like when he agreed to teach me a few days ago, but hey, beggars can't be choosers, and I am pretty sure he knows more than all the rest of the hunters in the village, probably combined. As we head into the forest, the way he walks changes, and I lose track of him, despite looking at him not three feet in front of me. Hey! Keep close and stop standing out, I hear from my left and I instantly spot him before activating my stealth skill and try my hardest to follow in his footsteps as well as keep an eye on him while giving him a nod. We wander the forest like this for a little while. He stops and points me towards a small patch of earth with a few scratch marks in a small pit and the dug-up earth right next to it. Wolf tracks is all he tells me and then starts following what I think must be other tracks the wolf might have left. As he is moving, I am trying my hardest to keep my stealth up, keep track of him and scan the route we are taking for any of the marks he is following. Not too much later, we reach a small clearing in front of a cave that must be used as the den for the pack. With only one wolf hanging around, I take out my bow, and as I move to draw back the arrow, I feel an iron grip on my wrist. The fuck do you think you're doing, kid? He is looking at me like I am a few marbles short of a full sack. I think we can take it out, I answer, after all isn't that what we came all this way here for, right? Hmm, so bloodthirsty when you can't even gain experience from the fight, take another look at how big the den is, no way this pack is big enough to even attempt to attack the village. He shows me how small the cave is and that there is deer carcass with only one of its legs eaten down by the entrance. In nature there is no such thing as open territory unless it's worthless, we kill these wolves something else, we'll take their spot and that something may have a bone to pick with the village. 
I can't disagree with his logic and swing my bow on my back. Before he signals me to move back and I see him doing something as he follows me away from the cave. He must be masking our tracks, no point to tell the wolf something out here might be hunting them I realize. Not a surprise for your age, but you really need to start thinking about more than just the next step. Getting into those fights again and again, wanting to take out a harmless pack, look at least to what the direct consequences of your actions will be. You got lucky, the village looked at your fights as defending your sister's honor and didn't shun you. I bit back my retort about knowing what I was doing and raising my vitality, unarmed combat skill, and proficiency with healing magic. After all from his point of view my head must look hard enough to crush rocks with. Here, see these are good, they also keep you awake, so try not to eat them when you're on your way to turn in for the night, he said, handing me a handful of berries, as well as pointing out the bush he took them from. Careful of the ones that look the same, but come from a bush with round leaves, those ones will make you sleepy and sap you of your energy. It's a very bad idea to get them mixed up. I give him a nod and wonder what evolutionary process led the plants to look almost identical but have such a different effect, when I spot what I think is a hoof mark and I point it out to him. Not bad, now see if you can find a trail to what made the mark, I'll even give you a hint the foot was pointing in this direction when it made that mark he was pointing towards the right. It takes me a while, but I think I see a pattern in the way the earth is pressed on and I follow it through the trees. As soon as I make it through a bush I hear a resounding crack, as I feel a branch give way beneath my foot. An instant later, I felt a sharp smack in the back of my head. Fuck sake kid, stealth or even if you do track the deer that left this it'll know you are near before you even catch a glimpse of it. His voice sounded fed up, but the small smile on his face gave away the fact that I was going in the right direction and he was happy with that. I ain't proud to say that we moved about as fast as a snail while I tried to track the path of the deer and he also had to point out to me two times that I had lost the patch and moved me back a little to pick it up again, but a few hours later, we finally caught sight of the damn thing, calmly munching on grass. I pull out my bow and take aim, I feel my breathing slow my heart rate pick up and I release the arrow. I nail the deer in the neck and don't even get to celebrate as I see it stumble back from the power of the shot before a second arrow hits it between the eyes. Not a bad shot kid Hatchet praises me while lowering his bow. Got it right in the neck. Then why did you take a shot, calling him on his bluff? Because animals don't need to wait to gain the power from levels, and while I think the about level 5 deer might have died from that shot it would also have done so from blood loss a couple miles from here and I didn't want to spend another few hours chasing dinner. He gruffly remarks. That wasn't bad tracking there, to find it from this far away, even if you did lose the trail a few times. He was right, and right as I found the deer I had gained the tracking skill. That thought alone made me happy. After all this time I could actually celebrate gaining a skill with my family. I was looking forward to tonight. On the way back, we found some of those sleeping berries, and I picked a bush or two of them and packed them in my, well I want to say backpack, but it's more of a back sack. Didn't you listen when I told you those aren't the ones you want to pick? I swear young people it all goes in one ear and out the other, he mocks me after waiting for me to clear both bushes, for good measure, thinking this is a teachable moment. I would bet money on that. I know, I'm planning to sell these to Mr. Finian, he's been complaining about the merchants bringing sleeping drafts hiking the price on him I smile knowing I can also gouge him for just a little under what they sell. Should have just been a fucking merchant like your sister you clearly think like one, he shook his head but still let out a good-natured chuckle at seeing my smile. Probably figured out I wasn't going to be giving Finian that much of a price break on the sleeping berries. Just make sure to tell him not to eat more than five at a time if he wants to wake up the next morning. You can rip off your neighbors all you want, but I don't want their death on my hands just because you wanted to make some money. The rest of the way back was silent, here you can take this in, you shot it first, he passed me the deer. I guess you could say he wanted to make me look more promising than everyone thought I was, but I'm almost sure he just didn't want to have to take it to the butcher and spend another thirty minutes discussing the price with him. Chapter 18 Walking into the butcher's shop I knew my way around, I had been working here for the past few cycles. Everything was just as I left it, the shop was just barely something that can't be called a mess, with a system to everything's location, 
just a system I couldn't make heads or tails of in all that time. The only way I know it was a system was that I was told I put things in the wrong place. The hell are you doing only showing up now, kid? He called out to me, as he picked up this habit about a cycle after he took me on to start drinking as the sun started going down knowing I would take care of everything. Never mind, just get here and get to work. I had never liked working here, the skills gained were very useful and I didn't mind the work itself but I couldn't stand Denix as a boss. He was Johnny father and never liked doing something for free, despite all the times my mom helped him in the past it took my dad mentioning something about how his son was his apprentice for him to agree to try helping me, I don't work here anymore sir. I told you that yesterday, I just came by to get this deer butchered. I'm going to be a hunter and this is my first kill. I felt my lips form into a smirk at my own accomplishment. Denix however didn't see it that way, despite how much he complained when he first took me on it seems he not only got used to but even liked having unpaid help around the shop. If you could please butcher it I have to drop Hatchet's share and then get the rest home. Hunting in the village was a bit different than how I expected it, hunters usually went off in pairs, Hatched was the exception before because of his skill, they went off every four to five days outside of hunting season and when they left they went with a food order or scouting order. On a hunting order most of the prey went to the village with the hunter just getting first pick on his share of the haul, but on scouting as usually one didn't find any game on those routes you got to keep all of it. Yeah, yeah I'll get you your share of it in a second calm down it seems he didn't realize that this deer was to be split between me and Hatchet who graciously said that I could keep most of it to celebrate my first catch, wanting only the back left leg for superstitious reason, as he put it. I was on a scouting trip today, I say excitement starting to overwhelm what little patience I had wanting to get back home to celebrate. I'll be taking all of it back I could feel the shit-eating grin forming on my face and despite my best efforts I couldn't seem to stop it. He looked grim at that news, clearly the other hunters still came up empty as they had been for the last ten days, this was also the reason why we were sent to scout that specific route today, while the missing game didn't affect the village yet it would soon if things kept going that way. But we found nothing, or I should say I found nothing, and if Hatchet found anything he didn't share it with me. HMPTH, first kill in ten days and you're taking it all for yourself, Kids these days, they don't care for anybody but themselves, he said with scorn, knowing full well it was tradition for hunters to take home their first kill for themselves even if it came from a food outing. He took the cleaver and barely got it to go halfway through the neck with a sloppy chop. The hell is wrong with this thing? He exclaimed, clearly not having expected that much resistance from the carcass. Hatchet said he thought it was level 5 and that that's why it managed to make it all the way onto our scouting route, I answered his most likely question, as for someone of his strength and skills even with a sloppy week, strike most of the things we got delivered, would have split down the middle, he didn't have to aim careful full blows like I did when I tried to do the same. He kept grumbling things here and there while he worked on the deer, but I tuned him out, after all nothing good would come from him I was sure of it. A short time later, I took the nicely butchered deer and went to drop off Hatchet's leg afterwards I headed back home, more than one or two villagers took notice of me, but nobody approached me in the somewhat dim light. As I neared the front door, I could hear my parents talking, but I couldn't make out the words. It took me a full minute to figure out a way to open the door without knocking, but I wanted to see their reactions to me walking in with the game on my back. Ajax is that you, how did it? My mother couldn't finish her sentence as she looked at me with the deer on my shoulders, surprise clear on my dad's face, but the biggest reaction came from Judy and Alana as both their jaws dropped to the floor. Definitely worth the time to open the door myself instead of knocking. I got my tracking skill today, where should I put this? I say giving it my all to maintain a straight face to make this seem like an everyday occurrence. My sister was the first to come to her senses what you got there little brother? A deer that happened upon our scouting tack I slip in the information that I could keep all of the spoils I brought home and we wouldn't have anyone showing up tomorrow asking questions as to why I didn't share. That small chat was all the time it took for my mom to regain her composure, she had something that looked like a mirror but I couldn't be sure since I hadn't seen one before in this world, 
but she put it on the table and came to help me put the deer in the cellar where it wouldn't go bad until tomorrow when she would most likely salt it, took a small part of a few choice cuts to cook for tonight's celebration and we came back into the kitchen. What is that? I said pointing to the mirror that was turned face down on the table. It's a hashtag percent at hashtag dollar dot. My sister said, the word sounded odd, but then again it was probably new and added to the language recently seeing how I hadn't seen one in all these years, they are rather rare in the city, but one of the big merchant companies gave me a big discount on it. I think they want me and Alana to join them after we gain enough experience. I picked it up and for the first time I saw what my new face looked like. Not to sound shallow, but I looked good. I had a strong jaw, high cheekbones, inky black mid-length hair and icy blue eyes with a full beard starting to come in. How come my hair and eyes are different from yours was the first thing that slipped out after I took a look at myself. I didn't t have mother's golden hair like my sister's or dad's brown locks like my brother, not only that all four of them had green eyes. The hair you got from my dad, father told me. He always complained that I got my hair from mother. As for your eyes, they come from my mother, mom, followed up. Now tell me more about this tracking skill you got, did it finally happen? Are you going to be a hunter? There was a bit of fear in her tone as hunting wasn't exactly a safe profession, but it was one that would keep me close to home unlike my brother and sister. Yes, it all started with us tracking a small wolf pack. I explained the whole story of us following the wolf pack, me picking up the deer tracks, Yes, I left out the two times I got lost, and then how we brought it back to the village. Looks like all that work you put in every morning with what your brother taught you is finally paying off, Dad, said a bit torn between him having been wrong about me practicing every morning being important and happy that I finally had a path in life I wanted to follow and was somewhat good at. The rest of the evening was spent enjoying the small feast and ended with me going to sleep in my old room and Judy and Alana taking the bigger one. All throughout the night I had kept an eye out to see if there was something more going on between my sister and her friend, Sumi Alana is smoking hot and what would you think about when you were say 15, I am surprised I hadn't started thinking about this sooner seeing how my growth spurt came in faster and I was already 6 foot 6, one of the tallest in the village. Chapter 19 My morning started the same as it always did. I woke up, got dressed, picked up my weapons, and headed outside to start my training before the rest of the house woke up. Though I did start with the bow this time and increased the time I put into it, after all if there was a precise cut and precise blow there had to be a precise shot, right? I was just about done with my training and getting ready to head to the smithy to straighten up my arrows and do some maintenance work on my sword and spear when Hatchet just popped up next to me from what seemed like thin air. You kid got nothing better to do at this hour in the morning? He sounded pissed off, like I was wasting something precious, but little did he know I had already spent one childhood playing around and that led to me to deficits I couldn't make up for regardless of the hard work I put in, I wasn't going to make that mistake a second time. I want to be ready for anything I answer back with a bit of indignation in my voice at being rebuked for trying to improve myself. HPMH, listen to him wants to get better. For the next few cycles, you're going to be dead weight in any kind of situation. Do you get that kid you'll only be slowing me down? You'll be better off learning to climb that fucking tree than shooting arrows at it, he scoffed at me and took off back towards the village. I'll admit I was a bit flabbergasted at his attitude and it took me longer than I would admit to, but I realized, after a bit of cursing his whole ancestry, that the old man was actually trying in his own way to teach me that I should learn to climb a tree just in case something did happen while we were out in the forest. Why can't he go about teaching me like a normal teacher? I mumbled as I spent the next two hours climbing every tree in sight, the small reward for my hard work being the climbing skill I got after a particular tall tree where I had to jump just to grab onto the first branch and swing myself up the rest of the way. The realization that I was dead weight even after all these years of training took its toll on me. I didn't even think fondly at going to Mr. Finian's house to sell my berries and instead put all my frustration in swinging the hammer in the forge working on my straightening up my arrows. As I was done I realized I was way too close to the forge, the shirt on my back was soaked with sweat and the heat resistance skill I got from a happy accident, years of working in here and one pissed off morning I just got it without even trying. 
I wasn't yet to the level of sticking my hand in the fire just because of that, but I did think about raising it so in the future I could do just that. Even if in this world it wouldn't be something unheard of it would be something that kept me tied back to my old world that seemed to have been just a dream at this point. Walking out of the blacksmith shirt and weapons in my hand I pass by Alana who seems to have woken up. She looks at me with a strange look on her face, I don't think I've seen her make that face before, so I rearrange my list of things to do, to wash and then breakfast. While I was grabbing my late breakfast mom was teaching Judy how to salt meat so that it would last using the deer I brought it. They both seemed happy to have an excuse to do something together, telling me that while my sister was close to finishing her apprentice trait, she was not quite ready to leave home like my brother did. After eating more than I thought I would need, clearly the climbing had taken a bigger toll on me than I thought it would, I pulled my sister off to the side while my mother went to store the meat. What Hatchet said about me only getting in his way still ate at me a little bit, despite me thinking it was just his way of telling me to learn climbing and not a dig at me. Hey Judy, can you tell what the apprentice trait says? I ask her after we are alone, sitting around the table. Why, you'll just learn it yourself in a few cycles anyway, she responds, not knowing that no I wouldn't actually, and this was also a good time to get a baseline for the trait and see how much my improved version meant. It's something that Hatchet said to me today when I was training, he said I would be dead weight for the next few cycles and that I would be better off learning to climb trees than swing a sword. What happens when the child trait runs out? That bitter old man, can't he think of a better way to teach someone? She mumbles under her breath, clearly picking up on his objective, much faster than I did. Well usually we all learn exactly what the apprentice trait does when we earn it, but just to put your mind at ease, I'll tell you now. But you have to promise not to tell mom or dad I told you early, dad takes pride in preparing us for what we are about to go through. A silly little slime appeared on her face as she thought back to her big night and probably to Tom's as she might have stayed till the end back then. All right deal, I won't breathe a word of it I say, placing my hand over my heart as is custom for making a vow. You don't have to take it that seriously, she laughs, slapping me lightly on the shoulder. Anyway, the apprentice trait goes like this. Apprentice, temporary trait. Status points allocated increased by 10%. Aging stopped for the duration. Ease of forcibly increasing stat points increased. Experience earned for doing skill-related activities slightly increased. Ease of adapting to increase in stat points greatly increased. Fertility slightly increased. Status becomes harder to reveal or approximate making appraisal and scan abilities harder to use. Time remaining, 75 cycles. This was quite the reveal, one that I looked forward to comparing to my own upgraded version in a little while, but one thing did stick out to me like a sore thumb. Slightly increased fertility, slips out of my mouth as I wonder what use does that have? My sister goes a bit red in the face, haven't you noticed, as you stopped growing these last few months? Haven't you started to feel a bit funny? She questioned though, was clearly uncomfortable with the topic. I realized that she was right. It seems that in this world, with the help of this system humans, and I suspect other humanoid races evolved to fully undergo their growth period before looking to reproduction leading to a lesser sex drive in the early prepubescent years and increased growth with a faster end to growth and a higher sex drive, presumably. I hadn't reached that part yet, but I was close, and if it was a bigger sex drive than adolescence I might have a few issues. Ah, uh, I awkwardly said, clearly not a topic for discussing with your sister, thanks for sharing that with me. The apprenticeship not the other thing I made a mess of the conversation and my sister seems to be looking for a different topic to move on to as I am. Hey, you want to go with me and see how much we can get off Mr. Finian for these berries. They are supposed to put you to sleep and as long as you don't eat too many they aren't dangerous according to Hatchet. I offer her an out. I'll split the profit with you 80 to 20. Why are we still sitting here then? She exclaims while her red face regains her color a calculating look taking over, with a smirk playing on her lips. And the split will be 75 to 25, and be happy I let you keep that much for using my services. I don't say anything, despite likely having merchant skills equal if not higher than her own, after all this seems like it will be an enjoyable way to spend time with my sister and I haven't seen her in over 30 days. Plus with her handling the negotiation I won't have to lowball the offer to hide my merchant skills. 
she'll easily be able to charge twice as much as I would without raising suspicions. How many of these berries you got, and how many does it take to put someone to sleep? She asks me as we make our way over towards Mr. Finian, who is about to become a lot poorer by the look on my sister's face. Chapter 20 Hatchet POV This kid is a born fighter. From the moves I spotted him pulling off and the speed and power he had throughout his training, I would say he has all the skills not only unlocked, but probably quite a bit above 10. He is a natural born fighter and is wasted on being a hunter in a backwater village like this one. But that is not what I'll focus on, I can see that it's his parents that are trying so hard to keep him close to home, not something unusual when it comes to people so young, with experience you will find that letting go a bit earlier will give them a better chance to grow. The kid has all the signs of being able to go out to the city and join the Adventurers Guild, with all those weapons skills unlocked, he must be at least level 6 no way a group won't pick him up as a porter and he'll more than likely work his way up. A tremor works its way through my whole body at that thought and I am reminded of my own past. Hatchet POV Twenty years ago The dark was all-encompassing. Me and Luna, the only ones who managed to even make it out of the warren of whatever that thing was deep in the forest. We need to take a break, and you need to let me take a look at your shoulder, if it's poisonous you could be dying and not even know it, she argued thinking about my potential safety, but I knew better than to stop. Didn't you see the scratches on the wall when it picked us off? Whatever that thing is doesn't hunt by sight or or sound, it hunts by smell. We need to get as far away as we can and preferably over some water. I managed to force out a stern tone out of my tired body feeling like I could collapse at any moment. If only we had taken our time to investigate that this thing had killed off all the other predatory animals this deep in the forest, we would have known to turn back, but having gone five years without a failed contract or a serious injury had left us overconfident, a group of fifteen adventurers, and only the scout and the healer make it out. Hatchet POV The chances that this kid actually stays in this village are close to zero, but so are the chances of him leaving before his apprentice trade expires. Sure he might go visit his brother in the city, but nothing longer than a cycle or two. In that time I'll make sure he won't grow up to make my mistakes. I signed up at the age of ten became a porter and specialized so much with that in mind that I couldn't become a proper fighter and a scout was all I could manage. He'll be different. I'll make sure he gets his foundations built properly to support him. After all, if nothing else, he might be able to get a message to Luna when he makes it out in the world. Hatchet, what's this I hear about you and the kid keeping a whole deer for yourselves, the headman sneaks up on me as my mind wanders. You changed me to that scouting route and we both know it's tradition for hunters in training to keep their first kill, I answer back a little disgruntled about being questioned for no reason. He's not going to be a hunter, we already have too many of those around here, I need him to be a messenger, as such he has no claim on the spoils, his face is getting a bit redder. He always was good man though a bit greedy, he did look out for the best interest of the village, even if it did come at the expense of the individuals. I don't know about that boss man, kid got the tracking skill in one day and this morning he was working on his climbing, that with the bow skills running and stealth, sounds like a hunter to me, I put a bit of salt on his wound. After all, he does tend to play favorites as long as there is no detriment to the village and all the rest of the hunters are friends with his darling baby boy. He did what? Damn it, and he was the only option we had for a messenger for at least another year, I sure hope the old fool doesn't retire before we can get a new one trained, he mumbled under his breath as he started to walk away, oh, and before I forget you next trip out will again be a scouting mission, this time heading on the other side of the village, need to make sure nothing from the deep forest started making its way towards us. The old hypocrite complains so much about me giving the kid a shot at being a hunter despite his own son having the skills to be a messenger, but no how could his precious boy be anything other than a merchant working to take his spot as headman, this despite him having the diplomatic skills of a skunk at court. Getting home I find myself going back through my old gear and mommitos I have from my days as an adventurer. Sure we weren't the top, but we made it pretty high up there getting a gold badge and were almost qualified for a platinum one. The more I look through the more I regret how badly I had messed up during my apprentice phase and how I might not be retired out here in this backwater if I had taken more care and put in a lot more effort when I was young. 
effort young Ajax was putting in hand over fist. I might as well start getting ready for this second scouting mission, it's not like food will be a problem for me with the deer leg I prepped yesterday I mumbled to Chip, my messenger pigeon that I kept for emergencies, keeping him secrete because pigeons didn't naturally travel to this part of the world and having one to deliver a message could be very important, even having one could be used to show off standing to visitors. Chip, Chip, he whined at me. Yes, yes, you big glutton, don't worry I won't forget to feed you, I tell him as I pass a small plate through the bars on the cage, and then sit back down near the trunk of my old gear. The light catches a small glint on a certain medallion, and I bring it out, to reminisce. It was the last thing Luna gave to me, before she started her own healing clinic, after returning from that godforsaken hunt. If you really insist on going take this, I owe you one so if you ever need anything remember you can always come to me, her worried eyes still reminding me of the only real friend I had left in this world. I guess twenty years is quite a long time. I should look into getting a message to her sooner rather than later, I'll just have Ajax deliver it, with that look in his eyes, no way he stays in a small village, like this one. I chuckle to myself as I feel myself drifting off to sleep. Chapter 21 over the weeks have seen a new routine settle in. Every four or five days I would join Hatchet in going on a hunt for game or just scouting. We weren't that lucky to find game on a scouting mission after that first time. That's not to say that our time was just spent walking around. He had me on high alert and also running drills of how to react to whatever could show up. Now with my level of strength all this basically amounted to something I could fight head on and he will just watch over me something that I could only let him keep busy while shooting arrows at and retreat. My first retreat option was climbing up a nearby tree, my second was running away, and my last was running by jumping from tree to tree, all depending on what we stumbled upon would be useful according to him. This along with a detailed explanation of the flora found in the forest and what it can be used for or what its presence means made the missions very enjoyable, we even found some rabbits and deer when hunting for food. On my day staying in the village I would go through my usual training in the mornings, practicing with all the weapons I knew how to use as well as my climbing. After that most of my day would be spent keeping up with the other skills I learned in the last three years as well as tending to my garden. My merchant skills were getting quite the workout thanks to my sister and Alana who decided to wait until after my spring finished next week. They seemed to have already started making quite a bit of profit off the caravans that came in the village just by acting as middlemen between the caravan merchant and the village populace. The new addition to the menu that made it last that much longer was the chase as I called it, releasing a rabbit into the forest and after giving it a head start using my tracking skills to run and grab it. Hatchet found it funny the first time he found ass in the air with my hand up to my shoulder in a rabbit burrow. But after I explained to him what I was doing his expression changed to an impressed one. You know that's not a bad idea, sure when you are chasing something you usually have time to look for tracks, but the ability to spot and read meaningful information from tracks when running could come in very handy, his words weren't empty, he even started to add fake tracks near the area, I let the rabbit loosen so I would not only have to identify the tracks, but also guess how long ago they were made. Hey kid, you ready for the scouting mission? Hatchet called out to me. Yeah, just got to go put this guy back in the cage, I said holding up the rabbit before I took off at a run towards my home. Hey mom, I said as I picked up my gear after putting the rabbit back. You're going already? Mom asked looking up from the shirt she was sewing back up for dad. Isn't it a bit early? Yeah, but apparently this scouting mission takes us a bit closer to the deep forest, so Hatchet said he wanted to make sure we were getting out of there before the light even starts to thin. Okay, but be careful out there. Just because something hasn't shown up around here doesn't mean it's not out there in the deep forest. Mom told me, the past few cycles of nothing happening to me letting her calm down, that being a hunter wasn't that dangerous. And she wasn't wrong. It's just that those things that could be out there was why we were going deeper in the first place. The game has been getting rarer as time passed and nothing was happening near the village so we had to investigate what could be affecting it from further out and if we needed to send a message to less sis in case something really was going on. What do you think we will find all the way out here? I asked Hatchet as we made our way deeper and deeper. 
What could have an effect on the game yet stay clear of the village? Lots of things could do it. We're not only out here to figure out what it is, but also look for sign if it is something bigger, and this is only a mild effect off it. What do you mean by that? Well when something big happens it also affects everything below it more or less, in the forest a big change deep inside could cause a group of hunters much less dangerous to move closer to the village and as a result we would share the same hunting grounds without actually running into each other. Aha! Now that looks interesting, he exclaimed and started following a set of very hard to spot tracks that seemed very odd to me. He didn't mention anything about them and I couldn't put my finger on what made these tracks different from any other I have seen before. It didn't take long for us to reach a clearing with Hatchet leading the hunt, but the closer we got to whatever had made these tracks, the more these tracks felt odd to me somehow. The latest had a soft purple smoke lift from them. But since Hatch didn't mention it, I let it slide as well. There it is. Damn, kid, get up in a tree quietly. Now. His stern whisper leaves no room for argument, draw an arrow, but don't shoot unless it tries to run away, was the last thing he told me as he started circling to get a better angle. Getting up in the branches, I get my first glimpse of what we are hunting, seeming to be a slightly bigger than average wolf, but that's not what worries me. What does is that I get a clear reading from the wolf thanks to my mana sense skill. Hatchet shot an arrow at the wolf and then followed up with a charge, holding his axe in his hand. His surprise attack seems to have worked and he definitely had the upper hand, the wolf quickly realizing he was going to lose made a run for it. I slowly aimed knowing I would only have one shot before it got to the trees and my line of fire would be obscured. The arrow I released hit the back lack right in the join sending the wolf crashing head first into the ground, letting Hatchet catch up and with one final swing he buried the axe in the skull of the beast. I quickly pulled up my stout window to see what had changed as I felt something right before I started climbing the tree. Name, Ajax. Level, 12. Experience, 2950-12100. Traits, Child Prodigy, Divine Witness. Health, 160-160. Mana, 260-260. Stamina, 250-250. Vitality, 16.27. Strength, 21.60. Endurance, 25.80. Dexterity, 20.90. Intellect, 36.68. Wisdom, 28.26. Mind, 26.87. Perception, 18.63. Stat points, 242. Skills, common, frowny face mathematics LVL 22, stealth LVL 21, drawing LVL 30, athleticism LVL 20, running LVL 22, reading LVL 20, writing LVL 20, cooking LVL 20, sewing LVL 20, cleaning LVL 12, haggling LVL 19, gardening LVL 20. Axes LVL 29, Hammers LVL 21, Deception LVL 15, Sword LVL 10, Shield LVL 10, Bow LVL 10, Spear LVL 10, Throwing LVL 10, Persuasion LVL 10, Unarmed Combat LVL 12, Knives 20, Skinning LVL 10, Tanning LVL 10, Dismantle LVL 10, Climbing LVL 5, Tracking LVL 4, Heat Resistance LVL 1. Uncommon, Frowny Face Meditation, LVL 35, Sense Mana LVL 36, Expel Mana LVL 37, Sprinting LVL 13, Mining LVL 10, Lumberjack LVL 10, Smelting LVL 10, Blacksmithing LVL 10, Chanting LVL 10, Mana Farming LVL 10, Increase Price LVL 10, Lower Price LVL 10, Danger Sense LVL 1, Leatherworking LVL 10, Alchemy LVL 10, Mana Milling LVL 6, Precise Cut LVL 10, Precise Blow LVL 10. Rare Manipulate Mana LVL 15, Water Aspect Mana LVL 10, Fire Aspect Mana LVL 10, Air Aspect Mana LVL 10, Earth Aspect Mana LVL 10, Inject Mana LVL 13, Spot Weakness LVL 4, Residue Recognition LVL 1. New Tracking, plus, mana sense, dash, residue recognition. Upgrades. 
Climbing 1-5. Tracking 1-4. Hmm, this information made me both giddy and relieved, I had gotten a new skill, and according to the new system I tried to implement, that apparently worked, my status would tell if any skills were used in the creation of my new ones. It took a load off to know that it hadn't been a mistake not to tell Hatchet the odd feeling the tracks had given me. Had I done so, I would have revealed that I could sense mana, and not only that I could even tell if mana had been used even after the effect was over. Chapter 22 What was different about this wolf? I questioned Hatchet, just because I knew the thing had mana didn't mean I knew much else about it. That was your first beast-type monster kid, he blandly answered as he started bagging the wolf to take back to the village, all my prior knowledge of games telling me monster parts would sell for quite a bit. Now while not all monsters have mana, all beast-type ones do, and that separates the animals from the monster. Don't all monsters have mana? It would make sense that they would. Most do, but there are some that don't, a few insect type don't have mana, the same can be said about massive fish types that are fully based on size, just because a monster doesn't have mana doesn't make them any less dangerous, some fungus type monsters take control of other species and in doing so make them a lot stronger, turning into wolf type monsters with no mana, it is very important to make sure every time you fight a strong beast type monster that you didn't see use any mana that you Check yourself for possible sign of infestation. This one here had some wind claws he used so we should be fine. If the rare type of controlling fungus that can access a previous mana connection got him we are dead anyway. That was a lot for me to process and I just stood there trying to absorb all the new information. Seeing me try to comprehend what he just said Hatchet carried on inspecting the clearing. Clearly he was looking for something specific. What are you searching for? Any sign of where the rest of the pack of this one might be, he said pointing at the wolf. They aren't solitaire creatures, few reasons why one is young as this would be alone, but I can't find any marks to single the presence of another. After twenty more minutes spent in the clearing, he determined that he was indeed a lone wolf. So, what now? We go back to the village with the wolf? No, a single wolf couldn't have caused all this, monster or not. We go a bit deeper now that we have a trail, to see if we can get a hint on what happened. The trip proceeded a lot slower than we had up to this point, we weren't taking any chances, with carelessness. Hatchet stopped right next to a mangled tree, clearly something suspicious had happened to it, even I could tell that much. Fuck, we got to get out of here I know what happened, a quiet harsh tone came out and we were both headed straight for the village. We didn't make it more than five steps before I caught on to why he was so on edge. The conspicuous tree was there to draw our attention and we had just ran into whatever had set up this ambush. The squeaks came from about five pony-sized rats. They all looked a lot like they would fit right in with four turtles to train in martial arts, but they all had different odd implements, hammers, axes, arrows all made of stone. Kobolds, keep clear of them, was all the advice Hatchet gave me as he moved faster than I have ever seen him charging the one with a staff in the back. I didn't have a chance to see what else he was doing as one of the kobolds, the one with two axes, came towards me. His small stature made him quick as I drew my sword and took the shield off my back, trying to create distance between us like Hatchet told me, but the little bugger was quick. I managed to parry the first swing and blocked the next two with my shield when something different happened. I felt the presence of magic around the kobold, but it was different than the wolf, where the wolf had constant magic pouring into his claws to give them an effect the kobold's magic came in small bursts, targeted at his feet, and I could see the earth move to help him get a better step. He darted off to the side and then the same thing happened again, this time, the magic infusing into the axe. Its connection with my shield rang out in the forest with a bang, I could see where the stone dented my shield without chipping at all, and my whole arm went numb from the force of the impact, hanging limply by my side with the shield out of the way. Knowing I wouldn't be able to stand up to another such blow, I went on the offensive, swinging my blade towards the thing's neck, only to have it intercepted, but that was something I expected as I switched my swing and managed to leave a sizable gash on its leg. Odd grayish blood pouring out followed by high-pitched screech. Thinking to press my advantage I took pressed on the offensive looking to force it to put weight on the injured leg hoping it would trip, 
when I felt the same magic for around its axis once more, and when it met my blade the power knocks me off balance, the axe coming from my chest as I twist the sword to intercept it the power of the blow sending it skidding across the grass. The kobold raises its first axe once more looking to finish me off, but stumbles as he takes a step on his injured leg, making the blow fall short. Combined with my own fall backwards, to dodge it only leaves a small cut on my forearm. Its beady eyes stare at me, promising death, as his other axe is raised ready to remove my head. His forehead exploding with an arrowhead emerging took me by surprise, brain scattering on my boots as it fell to the floor. Looking up I see Hatchet in the middle of four dead kobolds, a bow in his hand, as he quickly dashed to me. Not bad kid, I didn't expect you to stand up to a kobold before you spent any stat points, even if was just about to brain you, but his grin fell off his face as his eyes landed on the small cut on my arm. Did you get that when falling? All amusement was gone from his voice. No he nicked me with his axe, before tripping on his wounded leg I answer him. Proud that while I lost I at least managed to land a solid blow, it hardly hurts at all. It doesn't matter whether or not it hurts. Kobolds use poisons from underground on their weapons, he clearly didn't know how to help me as he started going over the corpses, I suspect looking for an antidote. I did the only thing I could to start sucking out the poison, before plunging my own knife into the cut to make it a bit deeper. The next step was the one I knew would hurt as I retreated behind a tree and put my other hand over the wound focusing on bringing forth my fire magic and cauterizing the area hoping that will clean up the poison. I wasn't prepared for the pain that came with it and I let out a sharp cry of pain, followed by grabbing a stick and lighting it on fire, in case Hatchet tried to figure out how I cauterized the wound. In a flash Hatchet was in front of me inspecting both the stick and my wound. Not a bad plan, since he only nicked you at the end, sucking out anything on the surface, then deepening the wound and burning it all should limit exposure. How did you think to do all that, clearly skeptical of the approach he hadn't taught me? My brother's lover, Kate, is a healer for the guards, and gave me a few tips on how to deal with all different type of injuries when I was resting between rounds of my brother training me for once I didn't have to lie. I didn't mention that this particular method was for healers who could then speed up the healing of the burn and resistance to the poison with their magic. Fine, let me wrap it up and let's head to the village I know. We need to get a message to Lessis. This isn't something our village can deal with. He made a plan, though the skeptical expression told me my use of magic might not have gone fully under the radar as he started wrapping up my arm. What has happened? I asked, trying to move to a different topic. Most likely one of the kobold clans in the mountain had a population surplus so the chief sent one his offsprings with a part of the population to get their own clan started. When there is no more space in the mountain, they travel through the forest, looking for another series of tunnels to occupy, he answered while finishing up my bandage, and we both took off at a run towards the village, though not before I grabbed the quiver of stone arrows and stowed it in my pack. This was just one of the scouting parties. There should be another three or four hundred of the rats deeper in the forest and among them some higher levels, nothing a small village can deal with. The good part is that it will most likely be five cycles before they move close enough that the village enters their hunting grounds since kobolds are notoriously slow to move outside their tunnels plenty of time for the baron to dispatch a contingent of knights and soldiers to go deal with them. While listening to him I also kept an eye on my health bar seeing it slowly drop lower at a very slow pace 73-130 when we left the ambush site to 72 now. Telling me that I hadn't gotten all of the poison with my little self-immolation trick. It was then that I felt myself receive a new skill, poison resistance LVL1, that I figured I would be okay, and that the longer this poison was in my system the higher this new skill would level. Chapter 23 the trip back to the village was quiet as we were trying to get there as fast as we could without attracting any more attention to ourselves than we already had from running through the place. My mind wandered back to the magic the kobold was using and how he used quick bursts of earth to help his speed and strengthen his weapons when attacking without using a continuous infusion like the wolf had. Not paying attention I crashed straight into Hatchet, who had suddenly slowed down, probably spotting something I had missed. I know you just got out of your first fight kid, but pay attention to your surroundings, he didn't sound very upset, but his voice was still firm, conveying the message that in this forest I was one moment of carelessness away from death with my stats, 
Here chew on these they should help your body fight off the poison, he shoved some leaves he ripped off the plant into my hand. I put one in my mouth and instantly tried to spit it out, the bitter taste overwhelming me. My eyes squeezed shut, but I felt a hand over my mouth, keeping the foul leaf in. Yeah, yeah, I know it tastes like the sole of your boot, but I told you to keep away from the kobolds, so think of it as your punishment for failing, he lightly chuckled, without letting me go. Don't swallow it just chew on it for a few minutes, then you can spit it out. I nodded, and he took his hand off my mouth. Ugh, if for no other reason than to never have to taste this again, I'll find a way to level this poison resistance skill, clearly trusting Hatchet, with my new skill, was a good idea. I didn't want him to think of me as dead weight, and sharing my new skill would at least build some more trust between us. I definitely didn't just tell him about it so I wouldn't have to chew on another leaf, definitely not. You got poison resistance out of it, eh? He scratched his beard as we started moving again, a small file of smoke visible in the distance showing we were close to the village. Well at least all the pain of that burn on your arm won't be for nothing then. Why did you go for the cobalt in the back, was it because of the staff? I asked him, seeing as we were so close to the village, there was less danger in talking while running. Nope, had nothing to do with the staff, he had a container of mosquitoes on his belt. Clearly he was some kind of disease magic user, definitely something I didn't want you to have to deal with even if he was low enough level for it not to pose much danger to me. This obviously surprised me as I had thought the gem on the staff had marked him as a magic user that needed to be dealt with. Then what was with the gem on his staff I asked him, bringing the orb I picked off the end of the staff thinking it had some value. That is most likely an enchanted object to help him control the insects better but it's by no means required for it. Not good for much, highest price you'll get for it will be from an engraver, who already knows how to carve the same rune just so his competition can't grab it, and that's if you go to a city, he told me clearly aware that he was stomping on my hopes of it being something valuable. Now head on home and go to sleep, you still have poison in your body, and the adrenaline is about to run out and you'll crash. I'll go, inform the headman of the kobolds, he lightly pushed me in the direction of my house. At home, I found nobody in the house, but by the time I entered I was already feeling dead tired, so I just grabbed a few pieces of fruit to eat and headed to bed to crash. The sun's rays woke me up the next day, looking a lot later than I usually woke up. A cold bowl of soup on the nightstand by the bed told me that my parents found out what had happened to me and let me sleep last night. I drank down the soup and got up to go to my usual training. Even if I was to start a bit later today, I was feeling fine, the burn on my arm reacting well to the healing I used right before going to sleep. As I exited my room I found my parents as well as Judy and Alana all sitting down at the kitchen table, their eyes on me as I exited my room. Morning I sheepishly say before trying to extricate myself out of the situation I'll go get started on my exercises. I didn't make more than a step for the door when mom cut me off pulling out a chair for me, sit. She then filled my plate with food and continued as I sat down for breakfast. Your father and I have decided that you will join your sister for her trip to Lessis. What why? I quickly try to think of a way out. We're not saying that you can't be a hunter, but with the kobold so close, we decided this is the best for you. As such you'll make the headman happy by playing the role of messenger and let him think you might be turning to that career after your experience with the kobolds. This also presents a perfect opportunity for you to visit Tom and Kate and we both agreed that you will not be going back in the forest before you unlock your stat points and have a better chance to defend yourself her explanation calmed me down quite a bit and I found myself agreeing with her. The plan sounded well thought out. It not only got me off of the headsman's shit list but also gave me a chance to see what a city was like and to visit Tom and Kate. I wasn't thrilled about the lost time, but on our way back Hatchet did mention that he would most likely have to go without me for a while anyway, so whether I did my training on the road or here it didn't matter much. Oh come on little brother, you could at least make it look like spending time with me isn't a punishment Judy managed to make me crack a smile at that as I inhaled the food in front of me, clearly a lot hungrier than I thought. I didn't say anything though I defended myself against the allegations. You look like they just told you to go help clean the horse stalls, she fired back not letting me get a solid footing in so I did the only smart thing left to me, 
I kept my mouth focused on eating and conceded this round. You can go do your training for the day, but since you're leaving in the morning with the caravan make time for tonight to have a chat with me. After all you'll have your stat points unlocked on this trip and I need to talk to you about it dad said while getting up to head back to the forge after his lunch. I nodded my head, stuffing all the remaining food in my mouth and also headed for my room to grab a new pair of clothes seeing as I was only wearing a pair of pants, realizing how badly I messed up my initial excuse of training while wearing this. Quickly changing and heading out the door, my sister and mother were still sitting at the table talking with Alana, probably something to do with their reason for the trip as merchants in training, but all the while Alana's eyes followed me out the door. Training today started differently, with me taking out one of the arrows I looted from the dead kobolds yesterday and giving myself a very small scratch, hoping to raise my poison resistance and as a way to progress my vitality along with the rest of my stats. I also started chewing on one of the leaves Hatchet gave me yesterday just to be sure I wasn't doing anything stupid and then started my to go through my usual training. Looking to train up you poison resistance Hatchet announced from behind me as I was just about done with the last set of climbing exercises. He was coming out of the forest, clearly he hadn't taken the day off like I had. That's a good way to get yourself killed, just where did you stick this arrow? His voice was cold, but I could see signs of worry in his eyes. Just a light scratch here, I showed him the thin line I made with the arrow close to the wound from yesterday, and I chewed through about four of those leaves you gave me yesterday. His expression warmed some when hearing that, but his voice didn't. Next time you get it in your head to experiment with things that can kill you, how about running it past me first? I tried to, but I couldn't find you, and since I am leaving with my sister first thing in the morning for less sis I didn't want to miss out on that much time leveling up this poison resistance, especially if we have to deal with kobolds again later, I answered back to him though the looking for him part wasn't exactly true save for a quick glance on my way to my training spot. You and I won't be dealing with the kobolds, level 30 and above soldiers led by at least a few level 50s will be cleaning out the kobold problem. Don't be in such a hurry to get yourself killed, he shook his head, I'll have a new leather chest piece made for you from the wolf's hide by the time you come back. That with the stat points unlocking should help keep you on even footing with whatever we find in the forest after the soldiers clear out the kobolds. That was all he said to me as he headed towards the headman's house, probably to give a report of his mission, and I headed back home to have a conversation with my father. Chapter 24 On my way towards the house I made a quick stop by the alchemist's place, after all the amount of increase the poison resistance skill would gain would be too specialized if it all came from a single type of poison so it was best that I would get some recipes before I left on the two-week journey to Les Sis. Evening I greeted as I entered the shop slash lab. Ajax, what are you doing here? I thought we agreed alchemy wasn't your calling. He didn't seem that surprised to see me despite his words, was it the encounter with the kobolds that made you rethink past paths? It isn't so much that I am rethinking past paths, but Hatchet told me that kobolds are known for using poisons on their weapons, so I was wondering if perhaps you would know some mild poisons I could make with local herbs, or the ones you know I grow in my little backyard garden I decided to go with the straight approach. After all this man could from the sound if a potion was bubbling wrong I wasn't about to see if he could tell when a person lies. Poisons, hmm, nasty business, but for a hunter I suppose that it would fit. Sure, I can show you a hemorrhagic one as well as a mild nerve toxin, you can even get a more powerful strain of the nerve toxin with some of those plants you grow. He stumbled over to a cupboard and started taking out beakers as well as a few dried plants. A few hours of carefully learning how to make the poisons with step-by-step -step instructions and notes I was stepping outside, happy to escape the moist warm air that permeated the shop following my lesson. Just remember, these are weak poisons if you want them to have any effect on something like that wolf hatchet carried back to the village it will take a lot more than what you can lace on a blade or arrow, maybe if you made it with some of those plants of yours the wolf would start feeling numb after 10 seconds in the area around a cut, but the downside is if you hurt yourself you'll they'll work on you. The alchemist sent me off with a final warning just as the last rays of sunlight were drawing to a close. With everything ready for my trip tomorrow, I headed home ready to see what wisdom dad had for me prior to my stat points unlocking. The pale light of the candles flickered from the wind tunnel when I opened the door, for once it was only mom dad and Judy. 
It wasn't so much that Alana spent all her time at our house as it was that she and Judy were inseparable with them spending time together both here and at her house, something the headman and dad both disapproved of, but they both quickly changed their tune when they doubled their starting coin pouch in one cycle after they started joining the merchants for round trips to Les Sis. Getting in late their Ajax, are you still feeling weak? You shouldn't push yourself so hard after a fight mom was already out of her chair and dragging me over to sit and have dinner. No, no, I just spent the last few hours learning how to make some poisons. My most recent encounter with them showed me they aren't to be underestimated. I assured her while holding up my ARM to make a point. Is that why you sell so bad? Judy wouldn't let something like this get past her, despite the annoyed look I flashed her. What I'm not saying is that it's a problem, I'm saying you better wash H before we leave tomorrow. What did he tell you about poisons? Dad questioned clearly, a bit surprised I was leaning back towards alchemy. The rest of dinner revolved around me explaining to them the lesson I just received. Even Judy seemed interested though, that was more because now she had a good excuse, in her mind, to overcharge alchemists buying these ingredients for making dangerous substances. After dinner, Dad pulled me off to have the talk with me. We sat down alone around the table. Now usually this is something we would discuss the night before you experience your child trade ending so that it is fresh in your mind, but since that is a luxury we do not have doing it now we'll have to do. Was all he said before he opened his status up to me. Name, Sam. Level, 38. Experience, 10,000 slash 75800. Traits. Health, 2700 slash 2700. Mana, 250 slash 250. Stamina, 600 slash 1400. Vitality, 270. Strength, 260. Endurance, 140. Dexterity, 190. Intellect, 25. Wisdom, 25. Mind, 25. Perception, 45. Stat points, 0. Skills, frowny face hammers LVL, 65. Blacksmithing LVL, 57. Precise blow LVL, 39. Axes LVL, 30. Mining LVL, 25. Running LVL, 20. Reading LVL, 10. Heat resistance LVL, 11. Writing LVL, 5. Now I will advise you as my father advised me. Despite the fact that you have no mana and that you will most likely never have mana regardless of how much above 11 you intellect wisdom and mind stats or you should probably push them up to 25, as that is where it is believed that the bonus to things like memory enhancement and quick thinking and other such limits are. It probably seems like a big investment now and I am not saying that these are your first points to put in, just that these are something you are looking to have by the end of your apprentice or a year after. It was the same speech he had given my brother, but that was not something I should be pointing out seeing as I should have been too young to remember it the first time around. His status had remained much the same after all these years, having gained only three levels, and his blacksmithing skill having increased by a few levels. Next I will tell you something about stat point. You see while they may only be affecting you in term of full points there is such a thing as partial points. When investing a free point into one of your stats all you do is bring it to the next highest number he started with something I had already guessed, but it was still good information nonetheless. Now the apprentice trait will give you a 10% increase to all points spent, but this means that if you spend the points one by one you will lose all of this bonus, you want to spend points while under the apprentice trait in multiples of 10 as such you will gain that extra point now this was crucial. Spending the points incorrectly would have meant that not only do I waste the partial points I had worked so hard for, but also the bonus from the trait. Next you should try to plan out what you plan to increase to how much over a longer period of time, usually a few levels ahead. You see the apprentice trait will make it easy to increase your stats without spending points, but to do this you will need to not increase them with free points for a while so you don't just round up the attributes you worked hard for. As such you should spend your initial points favoring one stat that you will focus on and then not spend points to increase it for the next few levels, as such you might be able to push it one or two points up for free. Do you understand what I told you? He asks, a bit uncertain, clearly this is as far as he prepared his speech. 
Yeah, I understand, I answer leaving aside one of the questions I had about all this that had been bugging me ever since Judy showed me what the apprentice trait did. He looked visibly relieved. Maybe Tom had asked some questions he wasn't ready for and he had expected the same of me, but I didn't want to put anything more on him and any other questions I would have I could bother Judy with so I headed off to wash myself before turning in for the night. Since tonight I wasn't as tired as yesterday, I just stayed in bed spending a lot of my mana repeatedly casting Elzen off to heal the burn on my forearm. Most of the discomfort was gone and the wound looked nearly healed when I reapplied my bandage after the wash. I would of course keep it in place for another few weeks, but had to make sure to take it off before we reached Kate as I was quite sure that she would be able to figure out why my large burn had healed so well in only two weeks' time. As sleep claimed me, I was thinking about all the opportunities one would have in the city as I will most likely already be done with the child trait before we reached it unless we made very good time heading there. Chapter 25 Me Judy and Alana were on the way to the market. As soon as we turned the corner, we could see the caravan packing up and getting ready to move on to the return trip to Les Sis. The three of us must have looked comical, me being quite a bit taller and more muscled than both of them, but they both carried bigger bags on their back than me, something not all that surprising since they must have had strength stats easily two or three times my own. Ajax is good to see you again. I have mostly packed up, but seeing how much you brought, I'm sure I can get some things unpacked for you, the merchant who usually buys my herb greeted me with a sleazy smile, his eyes fixed to my luggage. I'm not here to sell this time, going to pay a visit to my brother and less sis, so I'll try to sell these in the city, no need to pay a transportation fee if I'm going there anyway. I answered back not looking to give away the fact that I was on this trip, because my parents wanted me to be away from the village for a while. He must not have liked that answer, because his smile soured, and he got back to work without another word. Wow, that ruined his mood quick, he must have been making bank on those plants of yours, when we get to the city I'll show you where you can sell them without getting ripped off, my sister reassured me while Alana was talking to the owner of the cart we were boarding for the next two weeks. It didn't take long for us to get going, and since most of the merchants knew me as the impossible kid who always wanted to argue and not buy anything, from my time raising my skills on them. Word that I was along for a visit to Lessis spread quickly, and I was promptly ignored by all. So what are going to do for the next two weeks? I asked my sister thirty minutes into the trip already bored from just sitting in a slow-moving wagon. We have to stops on the way where we will probably spend a day, but other than that, this is what the trip will be like all the way there. If you want to stretch your legs you can walk beside the caravan or try to find something in the forest off the trail. Just don't wander, because nobody is going to wait around or look for you. Her response told me that she saw through my boredom, but her warning made it clear that I shouldn't be too far away. I took off my bags and hopped off heading towards the woods a bit out of sight to begin my training, or more specifically to try to recreate what that cobalt had been doing with mana. I tried to focus the mana release into feet to start off with after all that must have been easier than doing so with a weapon. A few hours and most of my mana pool later, I had made no progress on actual results, the only thing I could be sure of was that my mana seemed different from the cobalt's. Not just in how it had affected him, but even in the way it felt. Deciding that there wasn't much more I could do, and that I should probably return to the caravan soon I decided to empty out my mana pool with my usual exercises so that the mana exhaustion would let me sleep away the time on this trip. While going through my usual creation of fire, water, and air, everything was ordinary, but when I got to my earth aspect, my mana suddenly appeared a lot like the cobalt's to my senses. I quickly decided to try to augment my steps with earth mana, to see if I could make myself move faster. The first thing I noticed when I attempted that was the feeling I recognized for getting a new skill. Sadly I didn't get a chance to enjoy the feeling as instead of giving me a more sure footing or increasing my speed I felt the ground instead give way forming a small crater under my foot leading me to tripping and falling on my face. The fall was other than embarrassing and not something I could even pay attention to in the aftermath of my success. Sure I didn't get the effect I wanted but the activation felt similar to that of the cobalt, mana being released and quickly used to imbue something for an instant. While I was very much looking forward to training my newfound path in using mana, the fact that a small patch of unsure footing landed on in the dirt made it abundantly clear I need to go get some rest and let my mana recover. 
Returning to the caravan and hopping back in the cart and getting settled to sleep I noticed my sister's face suddenly inches from my own. Where the hell were you and what were you doing? Her tone sounded angry. I tried to hunt around to see if there was anything near the road as well as practice my tracking skill I responded to the impromptu questioning. Well next time, how about you pop back every two hours or so, I was this close to going to look for you, she said, picking a twig from my hair. Okay, okay, I'll do that tomorrow, I said lying down to sleep, in the same position that I saw the night crew were doing knowing I will sleep for quite a bit longer tonight, restoring my mana pool and meditating after I wake to fill up the rest of the way before starting my new training sessions tomorrow. When I woke up in the morning it was still fully dark, but I could feel something pressing down on my left side, a small glint of moonlight revealed that to be Alana, snuggled up to me. I wasn't going to complain about a hot girl cozying up to me, but then reined in my hormones and started meditating looking to be training my augmentation in a few hours. Alana moving is what finally broke me out of my meditation, there now being a bit more light I looked around and saw most people were waking up even the day driving crew. I don't get how they do it, sleep all day, drive all night and then when we get to a village, they are all ready to trade I comment looking and the sleepy merchants swapping places with their tiered looking night counterparts. While they swap every stop, if you were driving at night on a way to a stop you're driving during the day leaving the stop, that's how most partners do it. Alana explained it to me. Yeah unless you're the newbie, they are teaching, in which case you get all the night shifts, my sister, groaned awake, from opposite me. I got lucky, me and Alana joined together and we got to split the nights for the first three years. I don't know how people can drive all night and expect to be able to learn something the next day. While she complained a lot and didn't seem to take things seriously both Judy and Alana showed promise, with the merchant organization they had joined cutting their training days short from five years to three and signing them up as low-level merchant duo. No doubt that rare skill of hers was paying dividends and I suspected Alana had one of her own to keep up with her. Well I'm going to see if I can't catch something fresh for breakfast I hopped out of the cart and made for the woods, my thoughts with all sorts of different ideas to change how I manipulated my mana. Ideally, I would learn how to get any desired effect, but I wasn't kidding myself that my progress was going to be slow. Chapter 26 The last two days I got a really good feeling for imbuing my steps with earth mana to get different effects. Right now, I could push myself off the earth to increase my speed, very similar to what the cobalt had done, this was the thing I had best gotten a hold off, alongside that I was training to create small 3-inch deep holes or ridges by infusing mana. So far, the ridges could only appear 20 feet away from where I was, this was nothing substantial, but it could cause problems if used correctly. As I was focusing on getting a small ridge to form two feet from where I stepped my danger sense rocked through me from my back left side so I changed my intent to a quick step and rolled out of the way as a boar charged, grazing me on my left leg as I dove. The boar was a bit bigger than the ones I had seen before, but my mana sense filled me with relief as I sensed nothing from it, yes it might be higher level, but this was still a beast and not a monster. As the boar slowed and tuned it prepared for another run up. I was ready for this one however, and even with a bruise I could feel forming on my leg I was able to dodge out of the way completely, sadly the speed of the boar made him too fast and the swing I took with my sword missed by inches from his back legs as he zoomed past me. Something interesting is that danger sense didn't flare this time, meaning it would only alert me of dangers I wasn't aware of, this was something I would need to explore for what counted as aware of. Would me seeing the attacker count or did I also have to know his intent? This question was for another time, however, as the boar huffed, clearly annoyed by his miss. My hand swiftly went to my back as I rose to my feet, never once taking my eyes off the boar, going for my bow thinking that if I put some arrows into it. My hand grasped air as I realized that while training I had put my bows and axe beside a tree and now there was an angry boar halfway between me and them. I inwardly cursed as I whispered out Alzanoth, starting the healing process on my leg. As the boar ran up for his third charge I decided to try my magic, putting my foot down to rise a small ridge two feet in front of him. The tactic worked as the boar's front left leg met unexpected resistance and the charging beast was now sent into a sprawl. I took the opportunity and took a good swing at its back leg hoping to slow it down. 
The blade hardly drew blood as it swished down on the leg, something I was definitely not expecting, marked clearly by my danger since breaking me out of my surprise in time to dive away from the boar's tusks as it swung for me. I inwardly cursed myself for failing to resharpen my blade in the last few weeks. It was on my to-do list the day I was going to get back from my scouting mission, but between the cobalt fight and dealing with the aftermath of the poisoning I forgot to do it and it looked like it was going to cost me. I had no way to actually enter the thing, so tiring it out seemed to be my only option. What would run out first its stamina or my mana, this wasn't something I was willing to risk. My next thought took me back to the increased power the cobalt's weapons had when infused with magic and thought that was my way to victory. On the boar's next charge I repeated my trick with the ridge, this time it seemed he was expecting it as it only slowed him down instead of sending him to the ground. The opening was there, however, so I infused mana into the blade trying to mimic the feeling I had when the cobalt infused his weapons. Suddenly, I felt like my hand held a sledgehammer not a blade and I could barely get it in motion as it threw me off balance with a boar charging at me. Dropping the blade and rolling to the side was my only choice as the boar's tusks passed far too close for my liking from my shoulder. On the boar's next charge I didn't even try to slow it down instead speeding myself out of the way and quickly moved to pick my sword. My next move was to focus on my spot weakness skill, to try and find a soft spot to try cutting into it. Sadly besides the eyes and the neck this boar seemed to be uniformly built and those spots were too close to the reinforced snout for me to have a good chance and slicing them. How could I kill this thing? Experimenting with the weight of my weapon might work, but it could also get me injured, but then again what other choice did I have? The wolf. If slicing was my problem, then the monster wolf might have the answer I needed, after all his use of mana was constant, but all it did was use wind mana to increase the sharpness of its claws. I focused on recalling the feeling I got and then tried combining that with the application to a weapon I got from the cobalt, the result was a slow drain on my mana though my mana sense informed me of a small sheen of wind mana now covering the edge of my blade. The drain was a lot smaller than what a step it would take, but the cost would add up to the same in about 7 seconds of use. As the boar went for me again it simply jumped over the small ridge I formed, barely breaking stride forcing me to spin out of the way awkwardly arching my sword to try getting it to make contact, to see if there was any improvement to its sharpness. The blade cut a decent size gash into the back of the boar, clearly marked by a squeal. With blood running down its back the boar turned back towards me with fury-filled eyes. My refusal to let it simply run me over clearly upsetting it. I also felt my mana go fall to a quarter from this battle and training before it. I needed to end this in the next few charges before mana exhaustion slowed me down too much. As the boar ran towards me this time I chose to not rise another ridge but instead form a small pit in front of it. The eyes of the boar widened as it looked at the ground in front of it expecting a ridge to form only to see it dip. It repeated its first performance and crashed head first into the ground. This time however I wasn't about to waste my chance as it crashed to a spot and stepped in towards it and brought my blade down on its exposed neck. The cut was clean and a river of blood flooded out in the wake of my sword but that wasn't enough, I was sure of it as I followed it up a long slice across its stomach hoping to bleed it out. Not wanting to take any risks, I jumped away from it. The boar swayed heavily as it got its feet under himself again, all the while blood continued to flow from his neck and I could see his insides peek out from the long gash on its stomach. The distance between us was small, so it wouldn't have a chance to pick up any speed and he knew it as it started looking around for a way to escape. This was not something I was willing to allow however as I stepped in close and swung for the eyes hoping to keep it moving and losing blood. Our dance continued for about 20 seconds before it finally collapsed. This led me to my next question, what should I do? This boar's hide was too thick for me to have killed with my sword and if I brought it back to the caravan it would bring up some unwanted questions, but then again I also didn't want to leave a perfectly good boar out here to spoil, especially since bringing it back would mean I could eat it. In the end I went to pick up my bow and shot two arrows into the carcass. They would serve as pretext for how I brought it down to slice. Now came the hard part, carrying the big heavy chunk of meat towards the road, 
Thankfully when training I ran ahead of the caravan and kept moving forwards every 20 minutes, meaning I didn't have to be chasing after it with the massive increase in weight. Might as well get on with it, I said to myself as I pulled out a large rough strong piece of cloth and rolled the future bacon onto it because there was no way I was lifting it off the ground and then started dragging the thing towards the trail. As I made it to the trail I realized my fight with the boar had been longer than I thought as the wagon was already passing through. Back so soon? Judy, who was walking beside our cart, called out to me. You usually check in every three hours and now you're back in one. Did you find a rabbit to chase and he gave you the slip after a good sprint? Dot. As obnoxious as her question sounded, my regular chasing of rabbits back home and heaving breath had set me up for it, the boar still being out of sight as I huffed and pushed forward with a cocky grin on my face. Nope, I just didn't want this to get spoiled. If you help me get it up in the cart, I'll let you have a bite. I answered back after a few steps shifting to the side to reveal the boar. Chapter 27 Judy POV. It happened again. Not for the first time something strange happened around my little brother. I first noticed it with those plants he was growing in his small corner of the garden, now he may have put a lot more time into a fewer number of plants than mom did but getting a better result on the first time was unnatural. Killing this boar, that some of the other merchants seem to think is above average level for a boar should not be something a kid who had not turned 10 yet should be able to do, especially after wounding his dominant arm not four days ago. Now wait just a minute, who said he is giving away this meat for free? I jump in before the vultures can pick away at the bountiful resource that is the boar. I'm sure my brother will be more than happy to sell you enough to cook for yourselves today and sell the rest tomorrow when we reach our first stop. Hopefully by the end of this trip he might deem to trust me with all the things he has going on, after all it seems Tom slipping out that he had a stealth skill seems to have done a number on him, I still remember the dread that showed on his face when he learned that his skill was out there. The rest of the trip was fairly uneventful, though I had to be a lot more careful when going to practice as some of the merchants took it upon themselves to spy on me for a bit the first few times after I brought back the boar. As for my practice it was very fruitful. Not only did I get better at handling keeping the wind enchant on my blade, I even learned to use the earth weight augmentation to its fullest. True, it was not exactly the most useful ability to use when wielding a sword, but considering that the weight changed for a very brief period of time it did wonders for a hammer swing. I was still working to find an application for fire and water as those were much stronger elements when used in larger amounts and power rather than small short bursts. Not having witnessed anyone or anything ever use the elements also limited me in working with them for now. The two towns we had passed through on our way over seemed like nothing special. The building looked very much like the ones in our own village and besides spending the day at the stall my sister manned while we were there with her trying to get a cheaper price to sell for a profit in the city nothing much changed. We were about six hours away from the city when my desire for something to replace the boredom was answered in a way I had not imagined or could have hoped for. In the middle of the road, right after a tight corner, lay a fallen tree. One that looked to have been cut down rather than fallen by looking at the clean cut at the base. The merchants seemed to have come to the same conclusion as I had as they all sprang into motion to get the carts turned around and head back to find another road that led to the city. Alas, they were not quick enough as a rough voice came out from behind a tree. Look at this boys, what do we have here? What was clearly the leader of the bandits commented in a fake surprised voice. You folks look like you're in need of assistance. We are perfectly fine, just turning around and we will be on our way, the lead merchant of the caravan said in an unsure voice. We're not looking for any trouble. Now who said anything about trouble? Did you hear me say anything about trouble? His voice taking an even more ridiculous tone than before. No, I didn't hear anything like that boss, one of the other henchmen replied with an evil smirk on his face. There were about twenty bandits, we outnumbered them two to one, but I somehow doubted me, my sister and Alana were in the minority in not being a match for a bandit. My eyes were going from one thug to another trying to check for a weak link in their formation in case I had to grab Judy and make a run for it. After taking a full look around the encirclement I didn't have a single idea as to where the best path of escape would be, 
except I knew for certain it wasn't anywhere near the leader, he was definitely one of the strongest as even the rest of the bandits gave me a wide breadth. As I was looking between the bandits to figure out which one could be the weak link I got a new skill, judge threat. Now every time I focused on a different person I got a strange feeling, sadly none of them were good, so I couldn't exactly tell what they meant as I didn't have a baseline, so I turned towards the only other person in the caravan who was younger than ten, the six-year-old son of a different merchant. The feeling I got from him was comfortable, someone I knew I could beat, with my new baseline formed I turned back to looking through the bandits to see if I could better spot a weak link. It wasn't much, but I could feel a lot less power, coming from three of the ones blocking off the way to the right. All of them felt like they would put me through the grinder, but that their grinder would be running a lot slower than the others. The worst feeling of them all didn't come from the leader, it came from the guy behind us all close off the way back to the village. He felt like he could take on any two of the others, any three if the leader wasn't one of them. With him behind us all watching our every move instead of talking I didn't feel great about our chances. Stop this at once a loud voice proclaimed coming from behind the bandit leader. You are all under arrest. The voice belonged to a city guard with a much fancier uniform than my brother had, behind him were fifteen other soldiers all with better looking uniforms, though not as important looking as their leader. Men don't let them get away, these lot have already hit three other caravans. We won't let them disrupt Les's trade any further, the captain announced, thought I am not sure why he would bother in doing so loud enough for all of us to hear, was he that self-important? Capture those that surrender, but let none get away. And there it was, the reason for all his grandstanding, he was looking to make his own job easier by threatening the bandits with death without actually saying the words. The severe man looked like he was in his late thirties or early forties though in this world age isn't something you can base off of looks with the way increased stats affected it. As he finished his speech two bandits, both part of the three weak ones I spotted for my escape plan, took off running towards the woods. They didn't make it more than three steps before they each took two arrows from crossbows. This seemed to be the end of the fight as the rest of the bandits took a look at the two bodies before looking down at the ground defeated and resigned, even the stronger one behind us seemed to be in no mood to fight, his face ashen, despite his clenching fists giving away his frustration with the situation. The remaining bandits were rounded up rather quickly after that, all of them were shackled with thick iron chains that radiated magic in a way I've never felt before. A more focused look at the chain showed some weird symbols engraved in the metal, this must be the runic magic Kate told me about, the third and final way to use magic and the widest spread as it required very little skill to use but quite a lot to create. As the soldiers rounded up the bandits I took a quick look at them with judge threat and found them to be at only a slightly higher level than the bandits themselves, half of them inferior to the stronger bandit that had blocked off our escape. As the bandits were all being led off the commander of the soldiers also finished his words with the lead merchant and went to follow his men. As he was leaving I decided to check just how strong he was. After I focused on him I was filled with dread, none of his own men compared with him in terms of strength, I could feel my face pale a little from the pressure. At this he stopped and spun a frown sporting on his previous stern but neutral face. A judging glance that wandered until his eyes landed upon me at which point his frown deepened for a moment before his eyebrows shot up in surprise. His previous frown was quickly replaced by a smirk as he shook his head good-naturedly and turned back around to march towards the city. Chapter 28 As we broke through the trees I finally got to take a better look at the city, besides the gate I could somewhat make out for the last two minutes. If I was to describe it I would say it looked a lot like Helm's Deep, with the gate being centered instead of off to one side. At least it did so when I was moving towards it, no doubt unlike that fortress this one was not just put into the side of the mountain, but it covered the entire pass closing off the small circlet of forest I had grown up in. I knew this city was in fact a lot bigger, but I could see nothing but a few tall towers beyond the walls. Why are the walls so big? My thoughts slipped out softly as I was admiring the biggest construct I have seen since being reborn. They are there to keep out any manner of beasts Alana, hearing my whispered question, responded. Yeah, that and the fact that it had to withstand beast waves when they first cleared out most of this place for habitation meant that they needed high walls for defense. 
My sister finished the explanation. As the caravan approached the walls I could see the gates open and a squadron of people lightly dressed in guard uniforms similar to the one my brother had marched out towards us. After the last reaction to my new skill I didn't dare try it out on any more guards, it might be considered rude and I didn't want to bring any problems to my brother along with my visit. The checkpoint passed us relatively easily with the cart driver having spoken with the guard we got let in with a simple look as well as a quick examination of the wares we brought in. Clearly this was standard protocol from the bored look on both the merchants and the guard's faces. So where are we going first? I asked as we entered the city. We should first make our way to the barracks. Last time we were here, Kate was looking to buy herself a house and move out of the barracks with Tom. Being a healer seems to make some nice money on the side. Judy took off with me and Alana following close behind her. After that we'll see if they have enough space for us, or at least you since we can probably get a place to stay from the company like last time, and we'll go from there. The city was a lot cleaner than I would have expected to be in medieval times, it was by no means clean but there wasn't much more than a bit of thrash here and there. Something I was attributing to magic as plumbing was definitely not invented yet. The closer we got to the barracks the more guard troops I spotted patrolling the streets. They were formed of simple three-man squads, with four beginners, like my brother, and a higher-level leader. I didn't know why they wouldn't just let new guards handle something like this by themselves, and I planned to ask my brother some time in the next few days after I got settled in. The barracks consisted of a compound with a big building as well as a smaller more luxurious one attached in the middle and a big walled-off compound from where we could hear the sound of armor shuffling and weapons meeting. Clearly some training was going on. My sister walked in the smaller building and went up the counter, clearly she had done this before. Hi, I'm here looking for my brother, her joyful voice, not betraying the fact that we had been on the road for the past almost two weeks. Hello there, what's his name, a board receptionist answered back while taking out what had to be roster books. Tom she responded and the clerk got to work looking up the name. You're going to have to be a bit more specific, we have two Toms he said while leafing through the book, clearly he knew his fellow guards and this was a rotation roster of some sort and he was looking to see where we could find my brother at this time of day. He joined about eight years ago, that should narrow it down my sister provided some identifying information. In this world only nobles and rich merchants got to have a last name meaning everyone else had only one. This was something that I could see causing some confusion in cities. There wasn't another Tom six months ago when I last came looking for him. Yes, a new recruit came in three months ago with the latest group of FRESH unlocks. The receptionist thought aloud as he started to slow down on flipping through the pages. Here we are Tom. You're lucky he's just finishing up his round of training. If you want you can go through the yard his group should be done in a few minutes. After she thanked him, the three of us headed for the door, we were pointed to and exited in a large courtyard split into a big half and another half split into two. On one half was a neat grouping of soldiers all following the same workout training with nothing all that interesting happening. What caught my eye was the five people off on the other side of the training yard throwing sleeps at targets, besides a big tent that seemed to be where the guard healers did their work. The one thing all the mages had in common was that they all wore shawls around their face to cover their mouths, probably as an extra precaution to prevent their spells from being heard when they were used. We had settled in on a bench and watched for a little while before a booming voice came from a man who exited the administration building from the same door we had previously. That's enough training for you lot, get on with your next task and make way for the next group after yelling out his announcement he turned around and went back into the building. The soldiers all stopped their practice and headed for the same door. As they passed past the bench they threw interested looks at Alana and Judy and some questioning and envious looks at me as I sat beside them. Judy, Alana, it's great to see you again, Tom's voice, came from a soldier who broke away from the pack and started removing his helmet. Ajax, is that you? Hey Tom, I waved to my brother as Judy went in to give him a quick hug, which she disengaged from quickly. I could probably use a shower after almost two weeks of traveling, she commented as Alana also gave him a hug. He also gave me a hug, which is where it became obvious just how much I had grown in the last few years since I saw him, 
as I was now taller than him, despite feeling like he could crush me with his hug if he wanted to. While I just finished training, I was about to go wash before I went on patrol, so don't mind it, he responded. So you're busy. Okay then, I'll bring you up to speed tonight. Quite a bit has happened in the village since last time I came, Judy proposed. Yeah, that would work great. We'll have dinner, and I can show you the place, Kate, and I got Tom's face broke into a smile with that declaration. Yeah, speaking of your new place, me and Alana have accommodations with the company. Any chance you have a spare room for Ajax? Yeah, he can stay with us, we have a spare room. In fact, why don't you come with me now to see the place? It's only a short walk from here, and then you can go take care of everything else while Kate helps get him settled. She has a time off today, he offered as he swung the bag with his training equipment over his shoulder. Sure we can take a small detour. Chapter 29 the walk to my brother's, or I should say Kate's, house took no longer than two minutes. The place looked like a small shop with a living floor built on top. Here we are, home, Tom said as he opened the door. We have to organize our supplies. They will have been delivered by the time we get there, Alana said. Yeah, we'll meet you here tonight, Judy followed as the two headed off. This is a pretty big place. You've got more room here than we do at the house in the village, I commented. While the ground floor is for Kate's healing business, she makes quite a bit on the side now that has has leveled up a bit and has some extra mana, it's how we could afford this place, he followed me in. We are closed right now, I heard Kate as she was coming down the stairs. Oh, Tom, who were you talking to? She entered the room as she finished speaking and looked at me surprised. Ajax. Yeah, he came with Judy and Alana on their trip to the city, and I said he can stay with us in the spare room. Might as well, we're not using it for anything yet, she grinned back at him. I have to go wash a bit from training, then I have to go on patrol, you mind helping Ajax settle in? He quickly got out while making for the stairs. Oh, and Judy and Alana are coming over for dinner to catch us up on what's happening in the village. Yeah, that will be no problem. Come upstairs Ajax, she smiled at me, boy, have you grown since I last saw you? That was quite something seeing how I was now taller than my brother by two inches, as I followed Kate up the stairs. Their guest room was plain, having nothing more than a bed and and a small cupboard where I could put my clothes and weapons, not that I needed much else since I only brought my plants and those were with my sister's merchandise as she offered to have them appraised along with everything else she planned to sell. Feel free to make yourself at home, I have a few supplies I need to make sure are stocked, Kate said after I got into the room and then left me to it. It took about twenty minutes to put everything in the same order I had at home. As I was doing all that I heard my brother exit the bathroom and walk past my door in a different, cleaner uniform. I'll be back in four hours and then you can bring me up to speed as to why you decided to join for this trip so close to the end of your child trait that will happen in two days, he waited in front of the door, clearly offering me a chance to tell him if there was some sort of emergency happening in the village that caused me to get sent at this awkward timing. It can wait till tonight, I reassured him. He went on down the stairs, said his goodbye to Kate and was out the door. As for me, after almost two weeks on the road, I probably smelled worse than my brother, so I grabbed a change of clothes and headed for the bathroom. Twenty minutes later, now that I was clean and changed I headed downstairs where I found Kate reading a book. She looked up as she heard me come down, closed the book and put it back on the shelf. So what is it that you do in this shop? I asked the one question that had been eating at me. After all my brother told me that people in the guard weren't hired by others while they still served to prevent corruption. I just offer faster wound healing with my excess mana, she responded. Unlike how it was when I first started as a healer for the guards, with me growing in levels the past few years and having more flexibility when it comes to my shifts, I use my spare mana to speed up healing of people who want their wounds or illnesses to heal faster. Why specifically offer to help speed up the healing process? This didn't make much sense to me as healing all wounds seemed to be a much better business model. Yeah, you wouldn't know about this coming from a village, but in pretty much every city in this kingdom, the healing union handles all lethal cases. They also charge practically nothing for the healing, 
and can afford to since they are funded by the nobility, the only thing left to offer is a service to help speed up the process. Since they heal anyone of anything lethal, they don't have the resources to completely remove all traces of the wound or affliction, they just do enough so that the body will recover by itself. This was a very interesting piece of information, it also explained why people who had mana were so hounded by specific nobles and not the crown, with this healing union caring for the masses all that was left was private personal healers. But then who will be willing to pay for it? Nobles have their own private healers, and everybody else would just have to wait for a bit. Something was still not adding up, the poor would have no reason to pay for a healer to speed things up if it cost more than they could make working that time. Yes but adventurers will usually lose a lot more money by waiting it out than I would charge to fix them up. And this doesn't get in the way of your duties as a guard healer at all? Nope. Since I have my shifts in such a way that I have three days in a row free, I always finish on a day like today, when I just recuperate my mana. With my curiosity satisfied, I went and crashed for the rest of the time until dinner, the last two weeks of sleeping in a cart having caught up with me so I took a nap until dinner. Sleeping in a real bed felt a lot better than I remembered and I was out like a light. So, what is it that you all coming here this time, my brother asked as the five of us sat down to eat. I'm sure you noticed the four platoons that left the city today, my sisters got out through bites of food. They are all heading towards the village, apparently a group of kobolds have exited the mountain cave so mom and dad thought it best to not risk Ajax going hunting in the woods with them there before he got his stats unlocked. Kobolds near the village? A bit of panic seeped into my brother's voice. They are a few months away from actually making it to the village, they move slowly outside their tunnels apparently, so the soldiers will reach the village and clear them out long before anything can happen. This seemed to relax my brother, so he turned to me, well that's okay then. I have tomorrow off, so while I suspect you and Alana will be in meetings, as you usually are the first day after you get here, is there anything you want to do Ajax? My sister and Alana nodded at his statement. I'd like to try and go hunting here near the city, to see what that is like, I remember you saying guards sometimes went with a hunting party, any chance you can show me where, excitement filled my voice at the prospect of seeing a different hunting ground. I did get a letter saying that you actually managed to find something you were good at, so hunting, yeah I think I can manage that but aren't you getting your stats in two days? Are you sure you don't want to wait until my next day off in six days and go then? Dot. His question was quite an obvious one, so I debated it a bit. I haven't hunted here before, so I want to have a go once before my stats change so drastically, I can compare the difference. After all, I'll be here, for a month at least, until the soldiers return. I made my case, while hoping I wasn't a bother to my brother. Especially after that run-in with the bandits. What bandits? Kate asked, Tom frowning at the first remark he heard all day about said bandits. Half an hour out from the city we had a run-in with a group of bandits, but they all got picked up by a regiment of guards, before anything came of it Judy waved off the questioning stairs. That rest of dinner was quiet, as we all finished our food and before Judy and Alana headed back to their accommodations. I went to bed so tired that I skipped out on my usual mana exercises, before sleep. Chapter 30 As I woke up it took me a few seconds to remind myself where I was, why my bed was different than my usual one but not made of wood as it had been for the last couple of weeks. I got up feeling restless, the long hours of comfortable sleep refreshed me from my journey and now all the excitement of knowing tomorrow I will finally unlock my stats was giving me a rush. I quickly slipped into the bathroom before heading downstairs where I found Tom and Kate eating breakfast. He was dressed in hunting gear whereas she was fully outfitted in her guard healer uniform. The trip must have done quite a number on you, a nap yesterday, and still slept in so late today, Tom started needling at me in between bites of food. Leave him alone, he still hasn't gotten to put any points in his endurance, Kate came to my defense. It's all good, today should be the last day, before I get to not be considered a child I took a seat and also started eating the eggs and bacon. Well unlike Tom I don't have the day off, so you two be careful out there. The forest is plenty dangerous, she warned them as she headed for the door after giving Tom a kiss and me a hug. 
It's not like I'm taking him outside of the protected zone, we won't find anything stronger than a level 4 out there. Tom answered. The two of us finished breakfast a few minutes later and in ten minutes he cleaned up while I got myself into my own hunting outfit and we were out the door. On the way to the gate, Tom stopped by one of the shops. Let me check if Vinny is running low on anything we should keep our eye out for while we are out there. Now he is a real alchemist that regularly deals with potions and poisons, not like what we had back in the village only making an antidote or two inch he said, stepping inside the funky-smelling shop. I wanted to correct him that our own alchemist did in fact know how to make things beyond antidotes, but even in the few months I spent with him all we did make was antidotes and a sleeping remedy, so I can tell where he would have gotten that idea from. As I stood there waiting for him to come out, I felt someone bump into me from behind and almost knocked me over. Getting my balance again, I turned around and found a rather short man with the biggest head I have ever seen glaring right at me. Watch where the hell you are going, he growled out at me. As I was about to tell him he would do well to do so himself since I was standing still, I felt a hand press the back of my head forward slightly and my brother's voice came from behind me. Please excuse my little brother sir. He hasn't yet unlocked his stats so his perception is still low. Was all he said as he started to drag me away from the seeming placated man, what was that all about? I asked him after we put a bit of distance between us and the man. That was Sir Lenford, third son of the Baron, my brother whispered back after a quick look around. That was the Baron's son? I asked incredulously, but lowered my voice quickly at my brother's quick sign. What is wrong with him? Lenford was, for lack of a better way of saying mediocre, he had no real potential, but he was born two years younger than the Viscount's eldest son. In an attempt to foster a better connection, they removed his child trait three years before it would have expired, in an attempt to foster a friendship between the two. Tom explained as we passed through the gate, with nobody looking at us twice. You can remove the child trait early? I wondered why wasn't that the norm if it was possible. Yes and no, he answered back yes there are ways to remove a child trait early, but they only know to the nobility by royal decree to stop child labor. The downsides of doing it are almost never worth it, not only does it shorten the amount of time your apprentice trait has, it also removes the protection offered and stats affect your body sooner messing with your growth. You saw him back there, short with a head twice the size it should be, and as was only removed three years before it should have been this made me quickly agree with the fact that removing it early might not be the best idea. But wouldn't the gifted nobles also benefit from having it removed early? Maybe not three years, but I almost didn't grow at all in my last year. No, the gifted ones always try to upgrade it. Upgrade it? Yeah, if you manage to get a skill to level 50 before the child trait expires the trait changes to child genius and whatever skill you worked on, this then improves the apprentice trait to give increases to that skill and others derived from it as words brought me to a complete stop. How come this is the first I am hearing about it? I asked indignantly, had I known about that I might have been able to reach it with one of my mana skills, but it was too late now. I only learned of it last month, news finally got out here that seven months ago, the prince managed to unlock the trait, he is the only known to have done so in the last two decades, he said, confused, as to why the information had ruined my mood. Anyway here we are, you can start hunting now. What do you mean, aren't we hunting together, this new information, bewildered me. Oh no, anything in this place is way too weak if I was to hunt it, add to that I am a guard. You go do your job hunting, and I'll do mine, to make sure nothing kills you, he grinned at me. Well, sadly for whatever inhabited this forest, it was about to become the focus of my frustrations over missing an upgrade to my trait as I started looking for tracks of game. I was only slightly distracted and had to stop to fire two arrows to get myself to calm down so that I wouldn't miss my opening shot on anything that would run away should I miss. The first few hours went decently well, I had bagged three rabbits, nothing too impressive. Sadly, this wasn't enough to work out my frustrations, so I got pushing faster and harder trying to find any marks of some big game. I got my wish as I spotted marks from a deer and took off after them with my brother leisurely keeping pace with me not helping me keep my cool. 
We had followed the tracks for ten minutes before they overlapped multiple times in front of a tree, clearly it had run around the same trail a few times, probably chased by something so I hurried up to inspect it hoping to be the first predator to catch it. Hey wait a bit, I want to grab some of these leaves, my brother called out from behind me as I stepped close to the marks and knelt down to inspect them. As I was running my fingers over the tracks trying to find the last direction it went, in my danger sense sprang to life, so I instantly turned around wondering what had triggered it but found nothing. A split second later my brother crashed into me and shoved me out of the way as I saw a large feline drop down on him right where I had just been. The cat drove its fangs right for his neck as he quickly went for the dagger at his belt. He wasn't fast enough as the cat bit down, just before he drove the knife right through its skull, I saw the lifeless feline, detached from his neck and blood, started to run. I instantly jumped to my feet, hoping I would make it in time, reached him and started casting. Alzanoff. A massive look of surprise crossed both our faces as we stared at each other, both on the forest floor. It barely broke through your skin? I was flabbergasted, I saw it bite down. You can use magic? His words slipped out mechanically. Chapter 31 Tom POV We both stood there, him on his knees, hands an inch from my neck and me on my ass. The cougar lay a foot from me, dead, my knife still embedded in its skull. For about ten seconds, we just stared at each other, neither finding the right words. How did it barely scratch you? Ajax finally broke the silence I saw it bind down. I know I saw it bite down. Yeah, it sure did I answered him after a few seconds it's also a level 3, maybe a weak level 4, I have 16 or 17 levels up on it and it also had to bite through leather, I know it's nowhere near as sturdy as my guard armor, but it's not cloth either. More importantly, you can cast magic? He just stood there awkwardly, shifting his gaze guiltily to the side. He wouldn't say anything but I refused to let this drop after all he used a healing spell, a healing spell he could only have picked up from Kate using it when we were training three years ago, even if he only practiced it by himself he had to have been able to at least sense mana then to be able to learn it. Yes, I can, he eventually responded. If you can cast any healing magic you should have been able to at least sense mana if not chant three years ago. You learnt that spell from Kate I confronted him, a little angrier than I would have liked to be, but his mistrust of me, despite spending all that time training him was fueling the fire. Yes, I did, he answered back, with more conviction in his voice this time. And you couldn't have told me about it at that time? I sniped back. I didn't tell you about my stealth skill at that time either, yet somehow, after you knocked me out, half the village knew about it, he lashed out. I wonder why would I not tell you about a pseudo-rare skill after that, mom made it very clear when Judy got her rare skill that those were meant to be kept to oneself. The last part of his retort started out sarcastically but changed to a bit of regret towards the end. I just stood there feeling guiltier than I ever remembered. Yes this was my fault, at least partially, I did inadvertently let it slip out to Johnny that he had a stealth skill. The only reason I did that though was because I freaked out after I laid him out. I was carrying him towards my childhood home unconscious when Johnny popped out of the smithy, seeing me carrying him he asked what happened. I blurted out that I slammed him with my shield, then mentioned his stealth skill to defend myself and frame the situation as the accident it was. I'm sorry about that. I didn't mean to reveal your skill, it's just I panicked, I had slammed you with my shield after not seeing you for five years. I didn't want it to seem like I meant to hurt you. I rambled on, not sure what I could say, what I should say. Clearly I had hurt him, I hope you can forgive me for that. But being able to access mana is so much bigger than a stealth skill, even without money you could have gone to learn how to use it at the healing union for free. Not even nobles can take you from there. Even as the words left my mouth I knew they weren't all that true, at least not anymore. With more and more healing nearing the age of retirement and beastkins elves and dwarves having been released from slavery not even those schools were safe anymore, aside from the one in the capital. I don't want to be a healer. Yes, I picked up a healing spell, because it is useful, but healing isn't something I can do, being so weak, despite being so important, I'm too. I'm too, he seemed stuck, 
as if he couldn't quite find the word he was looking for. I'm too paranoid for that, he mumbled out, I barely managed to hear it despite my enhanced senses. Parnao ed, what is that? I tried repeating the word. He looked up, a mix of shock and fear. Was my being able to hear him, despite his low mumble, something that was disturbing to him? Yes, someone overly afraid of unlikely outcomes he calmed down a bit. I let the weird word go. We had more important things to talk about right now. So nobody knows that you can use magic? I checked to be sure. No, I was careful, always making sure nobody could see me when I practiced my spells, he confessed. Spells? You know more than one? I exclaimed. I can do the three Kate showed me when I pestered her about it, healing, cleaning, and the light orb, other than that I focused mostly on manipulation and casting without chance, he explained, seeming to calm down the more he talked. He even created a small flame atop the palm of hand without speaking a word. You can use pure manipulation? That was somewhat impressive if outdated, chanting and runic magic were the only two used nowadays, runic for speed and chanted for versatility, pure manipulation could do both, but was highly inefficient costing up to four times for the same results according to what they taught us in the guards. It's not like I had anyone to teach me either runic or any more chants either, so I did the best I could, he seemed a bit frustrated as he answered that. That was when another fear gripped me. You didn't use any magic in the city, right? No, I was too tired from the trip, otherwise I usually practice a bit before bed, he didn't seem to get my worries. Why is there some kind of magic detection field around the city? He seemed curious about this. That's good, I breathed out a relieved sigh, to answer your question, no, there isn't any kind of a magic detection field around the city. Those are expensive to maintain and outside the capital and the three archdukes' residential cities, there are none in this kingdom. What I was worried about was you using it in my home or around the garrison, you see there. My voice trailed off, another possibility flashed in my brain, so I quickly changed to that, did you ever use magic near Hatchet? His eyebrows shot up and he took a step back as I had closed in and put my hands on his shoulders demanding an answer. I made sure not even he was anywhere near when I practiced my magic his response was confident, but, he was near me when I got slashed by a kobold and I healed myself. Why? Did he say anything to you? I pressed further. No, but now that you mention it he did seem a lot more relaxed about the poison after I did despite me masking it as just patching it up. That should be fine then, if he didn't say anything and just let you go, despite a perfect excuse to kidnap you, he must not care about it, though I suggest you talk to him about it when you get back, I calm down. Again why? And why should I not be using magic in the city if there is no magic detection field? He was getting a little frustrated with me not answering his questions. Mana detection, the two words instantly got through to him it's a common skill, also one of the talentless skills, Everybody can unlock it, all it takes is constant exposure, to magic, it's why the few mages and healers we have practice right next to the training field with us, after about ten years of daily exposure anyone, beside people having mana sense, will unlock mana detection. This was also why groups were made up of three trainees and one senior, they needed someone who could detect magic. But how do you know Hatchet has that skill? Why would you be worried about him and not anyone else in the village? Ajax seemed a bit skeptical of all this. No way anyone else in the village has been exposed to that much magic, but as I told you mom sent me a letter about Hatchet agreeing to train you as a hunter. When I found out I looked into him, asked around, I found out he used to be an adventurer some twenty years back, he quit after a job went sideways really bad, but before that he was a middle-tier scout in a big city. No way he survives that without a way to sense or detect mana, it was common sense. Unlike our little corner of the world, where we only run into monsters underground or sparingly in the forest, because of the enclosed space between the mountains, out there monsters move more freely, a scout without either of those skills will be useless. I guess we should head back, he finally said after thinking about what I told him. Are you stupid? I smacked him across the head, Jimmy and Arthur saw me when I left the city. We're not going back until you heal this little scratch on my neck so I can conceal it under my collar. What? 
He seemed surprised. We look out for each other, no way I leave in the morning fine and return with a half-heeled bite mark on my neck, Kate will learn you have magic tonight when she sees it, but I trust her not to spread it around I huffed and pulled the knife out of the cougar. Now come on might as well catch that deer while we wait. Chapter 32 Our hunt continued for another two hours. We mostly spent them in silence, both of us focusing a lot more on our surroundings from our encounter with what he told me was a cougar. Though both of us were also thinking over everything that we discussed in our conversation, looking at it from my brother and my family's point of view, I was being paranoid. This is something that I should fix. Finally, we reached a clearing where not one but two deer were grazing. I silently pulled out an arrow and lined up the shot. I couldn't get a clear view of the second one since it was behind the first, but there was little doubt in my mind that I could bag both without help from my brother. As I drew back the bow, I focused on the weak spot shown by my skill and focused. I wasn't yet ready to add a wind bonus to a projectile, so I based fully off of my physical skills. As I breathed out and released the arrow, I felt myself gaining another skill, piercing shot. Unexpectedly my arrow didn't just down the first deer, but went cleanly through its neck to lodge itself in the neck of the second. My brother's eyebrows shot up as I used, judge threat, on them to find that they were both very weak, probably level one or two at the most. H. How did you do that, magic? My brother said. No, I just got the, piercing shot, skill. I said, deciding that keeping my skill from my family wasn't the right way to go unless I got a mythic skill. We approached the deer as they were downed, looking to put them out of their misery. A blur of movement caught my eye as another cougar jumped out of the tree lean and headed for our prize. My brother went to draw his sword, but I held out my hand to him. This one's mine I said with resentment in my voice, judge threat, put the feline at level 4, but with this being an assassin-type beast unlike the bruiser boar, I liked my chances now that it was forced out in the open. Are you nuts? It's a higher level than the previous one, he said. Yeah, now that you know about my magic, might as well see what I can do with it. As the words left my lips I pulled back the bow again and shot aiming to cripple a leg. The cougar was aware enough to react to the attack, but not quick enough to fully evade it, getting a deep cut in the leg but still not having the arrow hit the joint as I had hoped. As I moved close I pulled out my shield and my hammer thinking that a crushing blow would be more effective than a slash with her weaker skin. But, while my plan was sound, the cougar also finished her assessment of me, deciding to go for light scratches aimed towards my legs. For the next twenty seconds it circled me quickly getting swipes in here and there, but barely breaking skin. It made its mistake as it tried to jump on my back as I used, mana augmentation, to help me spin faster to shield bash it down, taking advantage of having finally landed a blow after my arrow, I took a firm step to close the distance as well as use earth manipulation to secure her other leg in the earth before going for a massive swing at her head. The feline pulled its leg out of the earth a moment before the swing connected, right as I empowered the hammer increasing its weight, but her already injured leg gave out from the pressure leaving her unable to dodge. The hammer blow killed it in one hit, leaving a massive hole in its skull. I then went to go heal the scratches all over my legs. Don't do that, my brother said as he thumped me over the head. I can hide my wound being healed, but if you heal those, how will you explain that? Just leave them, Kate can patch you up once we get home. With that settled, we each picked up a deer, me barely supporting the weight on my shoulders and him carrying it over one shoulder like it was no big deal as we headed for the city. You know that wasn't bad. You might really make something of this style of using mana, he said. I just gave him a tired grin and redoubled my effort to get home before dark. At the city gate Jimmy and Arthur didn't seem at all suspicious and waved us through congratulating us on our good fortune. We didn't take more than four steps inside the city before a gruff voice sounded out. Tommy, boy is that you? The voice was apparently one he recognized as his hand caved in the skull of his deer a little as he quickly spun and performed a salute. Commander Grievous, sir, he said with strict military discipline. I thought you were on your day off, not spending it with that wife of, he trailed off as he caught sight of my face as I also turned to see who my brother was speaking to. Just my luck, it was the same guard that led the assault on the bandits, 
the one that felt when I used judge threat on him. Well, 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 who do we have here? You know my little brother commander? My brother answered in a composed voice, but his face showed how confused he was. We didn't make any introductions, but you should really look into teaching him a few manners, using evaluation skills, judge threat, if I was not mistaken, like that is considered rude, he said, his tone changing from strict and overbearing to teasing. You did what? My brother's tone marked it clearly that I was in the wrong, a feeling that became increasingly clear, as he decided to dump the second deer carcass on my back as punishment. I apologize profusely for my brother's rudeness, Commander, he is only turning ten tomorrow and is still a child. Let me also say thank you for helping him as well as my sister with the bandit's ambush, he said while performing a small bow. That's not really my fault, I had just gotten the skill looking for a weak point in the encirclement. How was I supposed to know that others could tell when I used it on them, let alone that it was considered rude? None of the bandits or the other soldiers seemed to notice it. I defended myself, a little childishly, hoping that might get me off the hook. Just turn ten you say, he said as he scratched his scruffy chin. And how come he is in the city, is he looking to follow in your footsteps and join the guard? The man's interest in me put me on edge, clearly having, judge threat, this early marked me as a person of interest. Oh no sir, he is going to become a hunter in the village we were born in, my brother said, nipping any recruiting in the bud. If he's going to be a hunter in a village, why come here right as he is about to unlock his stats? For the first time, the commander's self-assured expression turned into one of confusion. Our village is the one near the cobalt issues that came in yesterday, he was caught in a small altercation with a group of them as they were discovered and our parents decided to send him here until they were taken care of. My brother covered for me, not mentioning me being wounded which would probably lead to my magic being exposed. Damn shame, if he's your brother, he must have had quite the potential here as well. Oh, is that why you are carrying around those deer? Did you take him out to see what the game is like here close to the city before he unlocked his stats? That's a good choice, it will let him adapt better, but I still suggest he shouldn't go out alone until he reaches at least level 10, he said. My impression of the commander was improving the longer the conversation continued and I planned on questioning my brother on who the man was as soon as I got the chance. That was my plan as well, sir, my brother said. Speaking of training, sir, do you think you could allow him to use our compound? He'll even it out by also cleaning full time when he does. My brother volunteering me for cleanup duty wasn't something I appreciated, but a chance to hang around all those mages and healers to see if I can get a better hold on some more mana affinities as well as practice the rest of my skills more than made up for it. Hmm, while that's not against protocol, it's not exactly something we want to be advertising, I'll tell you what, if he cleans for two days he can also practice on the second day, he said. Thank you very much, sir, he saluted again and I would have joined him as well, considering all the possible gains I could make from that, if it wasn't for the fact that it took all my strength to stand while holding the two deer. The commander started to turn to leave, he didn't make it more than two steps before he turned back I almost forgot the reason I called out to you. His voice was once more the same serious tone it had been at the start of the conversation. The eighth just came in this afternoon, he said in a low voice. I didn't know what that meant, but clearly my brother did, as he frowned at the news. Patrol or hunting? he asked. Hunting. Do we know what? A vampire, high level 2, over 70 apparently. Chapter 33 As Commander Grievous walked away, I was very worried about the presence of a level 70 vampire in the city. My brother respectfully saluted, then picked his deer back up and started walking. You didn't mention you met Commander Grievous, my brother said. I didn't, I responded, he was just the leader of the guards who got us out of the jam with the bandits, who is he anyway? He is one of the five commanders in this city, but the others are mostly there as political favors to the Baron, he whispered while looking around to make sure nobody was eavesdropping. While I can't say he can beat the warden for certain, I think he would be favored. After I am done with my initial ten years, I hope to be able to find a position among his staff. He is very neutral when it comes to dealing with nobles, mostly leaving it for the other commanders, but he takes care of his own people. 
If it wasn't for the eighth coming to the city, he would be in contention, for the strongest person here. The reverence in my brother's voice didn't inspire much confidence in my secret being kept, but at least from the sound of it this commander was a fair hard-working, if a little uncaring person. I left the matter at that. After all, I was acting suspicious, and the man did give me permission to use the guard courtyard after everything was cleared up. I also had more important topics to get on with. Okay, the eighth, who are they? I asked. Before this royal family came to power, they were a strong, if reserved, noble house. Their one peculiarity was that their house had always had thirty people split into three groups of ten that worked exclusively for him the strongest people at the house's disposal. Eight hundred years ago when they claimed the crown, they extended the search for people into the entire kingdom and raised the number from thirty to one hundred people, he said. So these are the eighth group? I said. Yes, it's rare to see them in an out-of-the-way city like ours, after all as long as the king is in the capital, so are at least six of the numbers, with the tenth always accompanying the crown prince or princess. If they weren't hunting this vampire, I doubt they would have bothered to pass through here. Right, the vampire, how are you so calm with a level 70 beast roaming the city? It might be level 70, but vampires are very peculiar creatures, I have a book with information on them if you want to know more, but suffice to say, he is very weak, for his level, my brother said, trying to calm me down. As I was so focused on our discussion, I never realized we got to the house until he opened the door for me. I stepped inside and waited for him to lead the way into the basement, where he then proceeded to hang up his deer, then mine with buckets underneath, to let the blood drain away. I know you spent some time in a butcher's shop, you think you can handle these two tomorrow, or do I have to take them to the local? He asked. Yeah, I can handle them. I said. We both headed upstairs, where I could hear Kate, Alana, and Judy talking as well as smell what would most likely be a delicious dinner. As we entered the room, the discussion stopped. Unlike Kate, who smiled and got up to greet Tom, Judy frowned and crossed her arms as she turned towards me. And when were you going to tell us you can use mana, she said, frustration and anger clear in her voice. Alana didn't look upset at all, but she didn't seem surprised either so she clearly also knew. Kate on the other hand dropped her jaw to the floor as Tom looked from Judy to Alana. And you knew, she said as she now turned her anger, to Tom. Found out myself on this little hunting trip, he said as he pulled down his collar, to show the almost healed marks, where the cougar bit him. What happened? Kate asked as she then mumbled something to finish off what I had started. Just a weak cougar got the jump on him, I got him out of the way, but it managed to nip at me, before I killed it. He freaked out, and cast a healing spell. My secret was clearly known, I didn't blame him for telling the truth. How did you find out? Alana and I went to talk to our company's quartermaster. Imagine our surprise when he started asking when we met a mana farmer and if we managed to secure a contract with him, she said. That's when it clicked, on our way here we found out that the merchant I was usually selling to was just selling everything he bought off me on the way to the city for a good profit, so my herbs never made it here before. Judy offered to have them inspected along with her own merchandise as well as help me get a good price for them afterwards. I didn't think it all the way through that upon inspection, something that wasn't an issue before. My use of mana in growing them would be brought to light. What did you tell him? I finally said after a long pause. Alana told him we were just holding the plants for a friend, which is technically true but you might want to be a bit more careful in the future or at least tell us about things like this up front. The anger seemed to leave her body as she closed the distance between us and wrapped me up in a hug. I understand not telling anybody about mana, but at least be more careful. What would I do if my little brother got rounded up? She held me there for a few seconds, a time in which I felt extremely guilty from having kept my skills a secret from her. Before she let go and Kate worked her magic on the cuts and scrapes my own cougar left on me. Sorry, I said sheepishly after the scolding mom gave you about your rare skill, I thought it best if nobody knew about me. I then turned to Alana, thanks for covering for me, any chance you could not tell anyone else about this. Tell anybody else about what, she asked as a small smile spread on her face and she threw me a wink. Thank you, I said as I pulled her into a hug. With that out of the way, 
how did the hunt go? Kate said moving to switch the subject to something lighter. Besides the small scramble you had with a cougar. Managed to bag three rabbits and two deer. They are hung down in the basement. I'll gut them tomorrow. I said, happy about the new topic. That's quite the catch, nice work out there hunter, but Alana and I are expected to dine with the company's bigwigs tonight, so we'll see you all tomorrow. Judy said as she made for the door. Alana took a quick look at me before moving to follow my sister. I'll escort you and head back this way with whatever squad is patrolling the area my brother quickly offered before they had a chance to leave. There's no dash, my sister started to say, before Tom cut her off. There's a vampire in the city, I will be escorting the both of you. His tone made it clear that he wouldn't entertain an argument. My sister just nodded, neither she or Alana looked all that worried, but I bet that would change if they knew the thing was level 70. The three of them left, while Kate and I had a quiet meal. My brother joined us halfway through. After we were done, we all headed off to sleep, deciding that we will have time to talk about everything in the month or more I was staying. Tomorrow was the big day for me. I was glad to be out of mana and stamina from the hunt or else I don't think I could have fallen asleep from the excitement. But before I turned in for the night I opened my status to get one final look at the child trait and all the hard work I put in these last ten years. Name, Ajax. Level, 12. Experience, 5350-12100. Traits, Child Prodigy, Divine Witness. Health, 160-160. Mana, 260-260. Stamina, 250-250. Vitality, 16.50. Strength, 21.70. Endurance, 25.85. Dexterity, 21.03. Intellect, 36.70. Wisdom, 28.32. Mind, 26.98. Perception, 19.01. Stat points, 242. Skills, common, frowny face mathematics LVL 22, stealth LVL 21, drawing LVL 30, athleticism LVL 20, running LVL 22, reading LVL 20, writing LVL 20, cooking LVL 20, sewing LVL 20, cleaning LVL 12, haggling LVL 19, Gardening LVL 20, Axes LVL 29, Hammers LVL 21, Deception LVL 16, Sword LVL 13, Shield LVL 10, Bow LVL 10, Spear LVL 10, Throwing LVL 10, Persuasion LVL 10, Unarmed Combat LVL 12, Knives 20, Skinning LVL 10, Tanning LVL 10, Dismantle LVL 10, Climbing LVL 5, Tracking LVL 4, Heat Resistance LVL-3 Poison Resistance LVL-4 Uncommon, Frowny Face Meditation LVL-36 Sense Mana LVL-39 Expel Mana LVL-39 Sprinting LVL-13 Mining LVL-10 Lumberjack LVL-10 Smelting LVL-10 Blacksmithing LVL-10 Chanting LVL-10 Mana Farming LVL-10 Increase Price LVL-10 Lower Price LVL-10 Danger Sense LVL-5, Leatherworking LVL-10, Alchemy LVL-10, Mana Milling LVL-6, Precise, Cut LVL-13, Precise, Blow LVL-11, Judge Threat LVL-2, Piercing Shot LVL-1, Rare, Manipulate Mana LVL-18, Water Aspect Mana LVL-10, Fire Aspect Mana LVL-10, Air Aspect Mana LVL-10, Earth Aspect Mana LVL-10, Inject Mana LVL-14, Spot Weakness LVL-4, Residue Recognition LVL-1. Epic, Mana Augmentation LVL-5. New. Poison Resistance 0-4. Judge Threat 0-2. Piercing Shot 0-1. Sense Mana plus Expel Mana plus Inject Mana plus Manipulate Mana dash Mana Augmentation 0-5. Upgrades. Meditation 35-36 Sense Mana 36-39 Expel Mana 37-39 Manipulate Mana 15-18
Earth Aspect Mana 10 14. Air Aspect Mana 10 12. Inject Mana 13 14. Deception 15 16. Sword 10 13. Hammer 20 21. Precise Cut 10 13. Precise Blow 10 11. Heat Resistance 1 3. Danger Sense 1 5. Chapter 34 I woke up the following morning at a very early hour. I was still very tired but, I guess, subconsciously I wanted to see what my new stats had in store. For the second time, my stat screen opened without me prompting it to do so. Name, Ajax. Level, 12. Experience, 5350-12100. Traits, Prodigal Apprentice, Divine Witness. Health, 180-180. Mana, 280-270. Stamina, 270-270. Vitality, 18.50. Strength, 23.70. Endurance, 27.85. Dexterity, 23.03. Intellect, 38.70. Wisdom, 30.32. Mind, 28.99. Perception, 21.01. .01. Stat points, 242. Skills. Common, frowny face mathematics LVL 22, stealth LVL 21, drawing LVL 30, athleticism LVL 20, running LVL 22, reading LVL 20, writing LVL 20, cooking LVL 20, sewing LVL 20, cleaning LVL 12, haggling LVL 19, Gardening LVL 20, Axes LVL 29, Hammers LVL 21, Deception LVL 16, Sword LVL 13, Shield LVL 10, Bow LVL 10, Spear LVL 10, Throwing LVL 10, Persuasion LVL 10, Unarmed Combat LVL 12, Knives 20, Skinning LVL 10, Tanning LVL 10, Dismantle LVL 10, Climbing LVL 5, Tracking LVL 4, Heat Resistance LVL-3 Poison Resistance LVL-4 Uncommon, Frowny Face Meditation LVL-36 Sense Mana LVL-39 Expel Mana LVL-39 Sprinting LVL-13 Mining LVL-10 Lumberjack LVL-10 Smelting LVL-10 Blacksmithing LVL-10 Chanting LVL-10 Mana Farming LVL-10 Increase Price LVL-10 Lower Price LVL-10 Danger Sense LVL 5, Leatherworking LVL 10, Alchemy LVL 10, Mana Milling LVL 6, Precise, Cut LVL 13, Precise, Blow LVL 11, Judge Threat LVL 2, Piercing Shot LVL 1, Rare, Manipulate Mana LVL 18, Water Aspect Mana LVL 10, Fire Aspect Mana LVL 10, Air Aspect Mana LVL 12, Earth Aspect Mana LVL 14, Inject Mana LVL 14, Spot Weakness LVL 4, Residue Recognition LVL 1. Epic, Mana Augmentation LVL 5. With the expiration of the child trait, all my stats went up 2 points, I wonder if I will be able to feel the difference? I then pulled up the new trait, to see what I had in store. Prodigal Apprentice, Temporary Trait. Status points allocated increased by 20%. Aging stopped for the duration. Ease of forcibly increasing stat points, greatly increased. Experience earned for doing skill-related activities, slightly increased. Ease of adapting to increase in stat points, massively increased. Ease of unlocking new skills on the basis of skills earned, before gaining this trait slightly increased. Status becomes harder to reveal, or approximate making appraisal, and scan abilities harder to use. Time remaining, 75 cycles. While that was quite a bit to take in, I focused a bit to see what the difference was between my version and the normal one. Firstly, the increase in spent points jumped from 10% to 20%. Secondly, I don't have increased fertility, something I was glad for since I wasn't looking to start a family right now, but I didn't see how that was an upgrade. The greatly increased forcibly raised stats was a step better. The biggest change was the last one, at least in my opinion. 
The increased ease to unlock higher tier skills based on the ones I already had was something I was looking forward to. Adding this to my already increased affinity with all skills meant I could look forward to a few more rare epic and maybe even legendary skills. I then closed the screen with the trade explanation and moved on to try closing the stat screen as well when a different prompt appeared. Warning. Closing the stat screen without assigning free points will result in the loss of said points. I freaked out for a second but slowly closed the warning and continued looking at the screen. What was the best choice for how to spend my free points? Should I consult my brother? I guess I see why dad always had this talk the night before the system opened, it needed to be fresh in our minds for when we woke up. I decided to try minimizing it, after all quite a few of my stats were past the halfway into upgrading, I especially didn't want to put any points in mind right now. As expected minimizing the stat window managed to bypass the forced spending of the points, though the lightly flashing icon in the bottom left of my vision will take some getting used to. I slowly got dressed. Drowsiness coming back to me now that the exciting part of my morning was done and the boring butcher work was coming up. I could slightly tell the difference in my increased stats, but I had perfect control of the increase, most likely thanks to the new trait. As I was almost down the stairs I yawned and missed the final step, almost tripping. Whoa, their Ajax, Tom, was already up, despite the early hour. I know it's tempting to not spend your points with the increase to the exercise way of raising them, but you can't walk around with the status open all the time. Tom came up to me, put his hands on my shoulder, and led me to sit down at the table. He was right, I realized, most people couldn't not spend their points without hampering themselves so they spent them or lost them. I on the other hand, could hold on to them and get as much growth naturally as I could squeeze out. How many points do people usually get that way during their apprenticeship? I asked Tom. Depending on how quickly they level and how well they planned for it, they can get anywhere from 40 to 60 usually, I managed to get 57, he said. How about nobles, don't they get more? Nope, they actually get less, they have less time as they tend to level faster than us. Most gain anywhere from 20 to 40, but some even less. He sat down to explain it to me. Increasing stats like that gets harder and harder the higher they are, since nobles level more as children their stats are higher and harder to grow. This left me sitting at the table, contemplating what I should do now. Kate and Tom both left, since they were on duty, before I had decided, thinking I was still spending my points. All they said was a quick goodbye. In the end I decided I will hold on to the points, I could spend them whenever I wanted and right now having low stats will not only help me raise them but also raise my skills faster. There was no danger forcing me to spend them, well besides the possible vampire, but he was level 70 or higher, I doubted 26 to 27 levels worth of stats would help me if I ran into something like that. Making my decision I got up and headed in the basement to begin my work on the deer I bagged yesterday. The work was relaxing, having higher level skills and stats compared to when I last did any butcher work made it much easier. Two hours later I had the meat separated and put in the ice cooler, ready for tonight when Kate and I would salt most of it to help it last. As I finished up the pulsing icon got the better of me and I pulled up my stats again, to no surprise nothing had changed. I had the same stats and none of my skills had gone up. Before I closed it though, I caught a glimpse of something odd. My EXP total was different, it had grown by 100. Even this amount of easy safe work was enough to grant me the same amount of EXP as gaining two skill levels as a child, no wonder people quickly leveled as soon as they reached apprentice. Done with my work, I wondered what I should do now. It was too late to go start a day at the guard courtyard and everyone I knew in the city was busy. This left me with two options, exploring by myself and reading the book on vampires my brother helpfully brought out yesterday. My curiosity over the legendary species, as well as my self-preservation instinct, won out and I headed back upstairs, grabbed the book and laid on the bed to read. The book was a heavy tome, it covered a lot of different creatures, a bestiary of sorts. A few of the creatures caught my eye as I scanned the index, but I decided to focus on the immediate danger first. Vampires were, according to the book, one of the best-case scenarios. 
They were very rare, however, due to their creation process. A vampire was a beast-type monster. Contrary to the humanoid presentation, a vampire came about when the runt of the litter in a bat swarm managed to be the one to evolve from creature to monster. They were always very weak for their level, usually only having the direct combat ability of a monster half their level. This piece of information finally explained why the city wasn't in a panic, sure the vampire was level 70, but a level 40 could probably kill it in a 1v1 fight. The biggest challenge when dealing with vampires was catching them. They were intelligent, possessed shape-shifting abilities as well as detection camouflage. The only time their specific magic signature could be detected was when they were fighting or feeding. The rest of the time they could pass for humans or elves. I personally saw no reason why one of the top 10 squads in the kingdom would be hunting down a level 71, they had to outlevel it heavily, maybe even double. That changed as I read the last bit on their section. Vampires needed to feed on blood to survive and could turn their victims into lessar vampires. Their hunting patterns were infiltration of a community and a slow turning of it into food and army. Their skills also included strong illusion magic which let them hunt higher level prey through ambush tactics, with night being their preferred hunting time. What all of this told me was that I would, under no circumstances, be outside the house at any time after the sun went down. I could see now why Tom insisted on escorting Judy and Alana yesterday as well as why he joined a patrol on the way back. Being in a group was the best way to stay safe. I got up as I headed downstairs to start setting up for lunch. I was expecting Judy, Alana, Tom and Kate to all show up. Today I will plan out the rest of my stay. I was expecting at least a month, as I would head back only once the subjugation force returned. Chapter 35 We all sat down to eat venison with a side of an earth vegetable that very much resembled a potato but was a lot larger and green when ripe. Tom was on a break and transitioning from workout in the courtyard to patrol. Kate just finished her stint in the healing tent and will be going to the healing union. Apparently, the guard had worked out a deal for their trainees to learn the basics there. I didn't know about Alana and Judy's plans yet. This is very good, you managed to make this with just what you found here? Kate exclaimed after taking a bite, her tail was swishing gently behind her. Yeah, I had a bit of time after I butchered it so I took my time prepping it. I said. What's your plan for the rest of the day? Judy asked me. I was thinking of exploring the town, at least before nightfall. I read that book on vampires Tom told me about and I am not taking chances with a level 71 around here. I said. Level what? Judy exploded. Well, that explains why you were so insistent on escorting us yesterday, Judy said more calmly, but her face betrayed her surprise at the news. Yeah, we are informing people that a vampire is suspected to have entered the city. We will be keeping quiet about its level, and don't want to cause a panic. Tom said, the implication that we shouldn't spread the level around clear. The more I thought about this the stranger it seemed, why would a commander offer up that information to me in the street, but keep it from the general public? This was clearly some sort of test. My only question was, am I the one being tested? Or was I just being paranoid and he was testing Tom for possible recruiting? Tom. Do you think the commander telling us about the level yesterday is some sort of test? I asked, I was done being so paranoid with my family. What do you mean, he said surprised, the others looking at me intrigued. The last thing he added on yesterday was the level, I am pretty sure he did it as a test I explained my theory I am just not sure if it's a test meant for me, since I scanned him, or for you since you are trying to join his squad after you're done as a trainee. It definitely sounds like a test, Alana said as she frowned. It's most likely for Tom, Kate said, I've healed a part of his squad before. While they are tight-lipped with us healers, they are less so with their own squad mates. Having enhanced hearing, I picked up a few things. His team seems to be kept in the loop on more things than they should so he is probably testing his ability to keep relevant information to himself as well as convince others to do so as well. Well that's good, since this doesn't seem to be centered on you, and you had the day free, how about joining us for the rest of the day? 
Judy said, looking at me, you'll get to see how we do business in the city, and may even unload your own wares at a good price while we're at it. After we finished eating Judy and Alana dragged me with them while Tom and Kate prepped the rest of the meat for storage before heading to their next assignment. Just so you know, both me and Alana have a contract in place with our organization. A part of that contract is that we can't lie. Having you with us might be a bit suspicious, but you can answer some questions and lie to cover. Judy said, clearly the herbs, cause a bigger stir than I thought. We collected all of our merchandise without any issues from the warehouse and headed off to a different part of the city to sell them. The people we were selling them to were connections to bigger cities that paid a good premium but still part of the same organization. This was a win-win as we got good prices and the organization managed to keep items in stock in a high-demand market. Most of the things they were selling off were parts of monsters that showed up at any of the villages en route to the city. Since the caravan only came once every two months and most parts like bones and teeth had no use in a village, they had a few. That, along with anything else they picked up that they thought would have a better market in a bigger busier city. I was mostly ignored as part of the group. Despite my impressive size, I kept my beard well trimmed. This showed off my young features and most of the merchants ignored me or filed me as a new apprentice learning the ropes. My curious looks and small questions on everything that was selling couldn't have hurt their presumptions. As we were approaching the herbs trader, my sister whispered to me. You mind letting us handle this one? You will get a bit of a better deal with us negotiating and it will take a bit of the suspicion off you having mana? There seemed to be no downsides. Also knowing the real value of the plants will likely help me understand prices of anything I wanted to buy that used them as ingredients. I was definitely going to be selling most of anything that I sold through my sister as I grew up so letting her deal with it early was a good first step. Yeah, sure, since you both already know, I thought it might just be better to do all my deals through you. It will not only get me a better price, but also help you with some rarer goods. I said. So long as my identity is hidden, Judy just smiled and nodded at that then proceeded to step forward and start laying down all the plants I grew in the past six months for inspection. While the trader was examining them I could see his eyes growing wider and his eyebrows rising higher. This let me know that I was about to make out with a lot of money. Judy and Alana seemed to have both grown quite a bit, and if I was not mistaken, they must have had some sort of skill that let them cooperate to grow the price further as they negotiated it as a team rather. In the end, I ended up making close to 15 times my normal asking price. This made me a bit sad, thinking about all the money I lost in the previous years. Then again those were all sold to a merchant who just unloaded them all for a profit two villages down the road so that at least didn't blow my cover as a mana user. I would have to take this precaution if I was dealing in anything I infused with mana in the future, so it was a price I was, well not happy but certainly willing to pay. As we turned to walk, I was happy that all went well, I didn't notice somebody approaching us. He was very well dressed with a sharp look in his eyes and a business smile plastered on his face. Judy, Alana, is this the mysterious merchant friend of yours? Or perhaps is he the man of farmer that grew these plants, he asked, while the words seemed polite his tone suggested that he was looking for any weakness. I was more than prepared for the first question. Knowing that they couldn't lie, and that their fast growth in the organization gained them some enemies, they prepared me for this. His second question took me by surprise, and it was all I could do to not let it show on my face. While my sister seemed to have the same reaction to the questions Alana started giggling a little. Jeffrey, meet Ajax. Ajax is Judy's brother. She didn't even miss a beat as she answered. Oh, to have someone so talented in your own family, he continued prodding for information. Ajax here is a hunter. He's visiting his brother Tom and decided to join us for today, while Tom is on patrol. Alana said. This quickly brought a frown on Jeffrey's face, and he excused himself as he beat a hastily retreat. Thanks for that. I whispered to Alana. She gave me a wide smile and said, no worries. The rest of the afternoon, I got to watch them in action, going from stall to stall looking for opportunities. 
I quickly picked up a pattern, a pattern that the earlier conversation heavily supported. While they were both good at haggling, and even played off one another to get a better deal, they each had their own roles. Judy was the talent, she was great at identifying undervalued or odd items. Sometimes even just getting a feeling and landing in front of something somewhat valuable. Alana was the brains, she was quick on the uptake and made connections I didn't even see until she pointed them out. This trip was an eye-opener and I started looking at Alana very differently. As we returned to Tom's place I decided to make them an offer. Do you two think you can handle anything else I might want to sell? Judy quickly threw a quick glance at Alana. Clearly she was on board with the idea but didn't want to volunteer her friend for free work. Sure, with your skills you're bound to come up with some interesting stuff now and then, just moving it is bound to get us some better connections. Alana said. After we had dinner I headed upstairs feeling quite restless. A full day of not using mana felt odd after years of daily practice. I was looking forward to tomorrow. Even if it was just cleaning the courtyard I was going to be able to examine all sorts of different magic. Chapter 46 What would I want from a dragon? This was not a chance I could get more than once, should I hold on to the favor, maybe she will save me one time when I need it. Rather than making a half-baked decision, having a get-out-of-jail-free card seemed to be my best bet. Just to be clear, I won't break the contract to help you. Your help prevented me from the smallest of infractions, there would be no point in owing you this favor should it come with the same punishment I avoided. Well, that puts a damper on things. The contract prevented her from using her power to interact with humans on human lands unprovoked and completely prevented her from doing anything other than passing through a city. She couldn't even help me survive a beast attack as that would be her interfering with a human, me. You've seen me practice my magic on the way here right, an idea came to me. At her nod I pressed on. I can't get schooling in the caster way of fighting, could this favor be you helping me with gaining magic gear so that I can use my mana without ruining it? After all, this was one of the biggest obstacles for me to progress. There was no way I was going to get myself magic equipment, but with a dragon's help that might not be the case. And how would you like me to do that? she asked. I'll leave that up to you. I have barely started learning anything about it, whereas you've probably spent more time wielding mana than my parents have been alive. Well, that is a smart request, very well. I shall help you, when I have your gear I'll come find you, she said standing up. In the next moment, the chair under me gave way, and I landed on the ground. By the time I looked up the clearing was empty, the dragon, shifter, and even the table was gone. Deciding I had spent enough time on my little outing I returned to the caravan. It had taken us three days longer to make the trip back than it did going to the city. The caravan was filled with food so we moved quite a bit slower. During this time I just practiced my skills. The practice barely made a dent in my skills but the experience wasn't bad. The only headache I had was the new mana siphon skill. Unlike humans, the presence of mana is what turned beasts into monsters so even the few beasts that I did run into were no good for it. The only option I did have was to try it out on the other members of the caravan, and that was not something I was willing to do. Maybe if I knew that it was harmless I would have convinced myself, but I couldn't even properly remember getting the skill and using it for the first time. As we finally made it out of the forest we could finally see the village. Off to one side must have been where the army had set up camp, it was a wide field that used to have quite a few trees covering it. This would be prime real estate, it would be sold for quite a bit, if it wasn't already, to a farmer. Next spring all that cleared land would make for a perfect field. After finally reaching the caravan setup area Alana, Judy and I all left the caravan to the drivers to set up. Judy and I headed for our house while Alana went towards hers. It had only been seven weeks since I left home, and I had been unconscious for two of them, but it felt like a lot longer. I was also dreading the conversation I was going to have to have with my parents, but I had kept this from them for too long. As we entered the home, they were setting up the table for dinner. Luckily, it seemed that mom had made stew. I guess the original plan was for it to last them two days, but with four of us it was probably going to be gone by the end of the evening. 
Judy. Ajax. You're back. Mom was out of her seat as we entered the house. Made it back a lot sooner than we were expecting. Those soldiers sure can move fast, Dad said a lot more composed as Mom went from hugging Judy to hugging me. So, how was the city? Mom asked as we took two bowls and sat down to join them. The dinner continued peacefully with Judy and I explaining around time in the city, we steered clear of my mana and the vampire, those would come after dinner. Mom, Dad, I have something to tell you. I said as we cleared away the plates. What is it? Mom asked. I haven't been completely honest with you. For a while, now I have had the, sense mana, and, expel mana, skills. I finally came clean. They both sat there, in stunned silence. Dad was the first one to speak. It's not that I am upset that you kept that to yourself, but why didn't you tell us? Well, I remember back when Judy got her rare skill, Mom made a big fuss about keeping such things quiet. I also didn't want anyone else in the village to know about it, so I just practiced it by myself. Dad gave me a small smile, but Mom just looked at me a little lost. But where could you have practiced it? I know we didn't stay together the whole time, but you couldn't have had that much time. She was talking more to herself, piecing things together. Wait, your garden. She now looked me in the eyes. Is that where you were practicing? Is that why everything you were growing there came out so much bigger and better? I didn't even get a chance to answer, and she just kept going, Ajax, you can't do that, you were selling those plants. Those can be identified as having been grown with mana. You'll expose yourself to people you really don't want knowing about your mana. She went from confused to focused and now panicked in only a few seconds. It's okay mom, I know that now. I got lucky, the sleazy merchant I was selling them to was just passing them one village away from twice the cost. I lost quite a bit of money to him, but thankfully nobody found out. That is actually how Alana and I found out he had mana. Our appraiser looked at them and told us they were grown by a mana user, not a particularly good one, but definitely a mana user. Judy contributed. Alana thought quickly enough to cover up the fact that he was the mana user, so for now, I don't think anyone outside the family knows he has mana. Besides Hatchet I murmured. Well at least you are okay. Now that we know, your mother and I can do our best to help keep this under wraps, Dad said as he breathed out a long sigh. Ajax, I know that you're already past ten years old, and it may be a little late to start, but, if you want, I can get in contact with my family. We might not get along that well, but I'm sure that they would be willing to help. If you want to go to an academy, to help train in using your mana, we can do that. She seemed quite upset, most likely at her parents' disapproval of her young marriage, but the look in her eyes was determined. There is no need for that, I have found my own way to use mana. It's actually probably best that I practice here, where there is nobody really looking for mana users. I might even get Hatchet to help me out. You told Hatchet? Dad asked, he seemed disappointed. I didn't tell him, but I used a quick healing spell after the fight with the kobolds. When I made it to the city, Tom told me he looked into who he was before he came here. Apparently, he used to be an adventurer, a pretty good one at that. He definitely has, detect mana, so he knows. So, what is your plan now? Dad asked me, it seems he figured I wouldn't be staying in the village. I think that I will be training here with Hatchet for my apprentice. After that I will most likely go to join the Adventurers Guild, they are one of the few places that can offer me protection from the nobles, hunting monsters seems like something I'd like to do. Where did you even encounter a monster to get that idea? The kobolds and wolf you saw don't count, Hatchet took care of them, Dad said. This led into a long explanation about what happened with the vampire. It was a long night after that. Mom stayed up hugging me for another good hour or so, all the while lamenting why she hadn't been there to take care of me. The fact that there was nothing she could have done didn't seem to make one bit of difference. After seeing them react like that to the vampire, I decided not to bring up the dragon tonight. The whole encounter still seemed unreal to me. I half doubted that it even happened. If I was going to tell them about it, I would do it after I got my new gear. I didn't want them to think I had gone crazy after my encounter with the vampire. 
The next morning, after breakfast, I changed into my hunting gear and headed towards the edge of the village. As I came up to the solitary house standing a little separated from the rest I found Hatchet in his backyard chopping firewood. So, you know? I started off. He turned back to look at me. He stayed silent for a few moments that might as well have been a few years before he responded with a simple I know. Are you still willing to train me? I asked. What do you want me to train you in? Hunting, I answered straight away, but after a brief moment I continued deciding it was best he get the full picture. And adventuring, I plan to go join the guild in a few years. I can't teach you magic, I can barely get a hint of what you're doing with mana. That's okay, I plan on figuring out magic for myself, maybe you could give me a few pointers from experience. Fine then, go do your warm-up while I finish here, after that we go hunting. Chapter 46 what would I want from a dragon? This was not a chance I could get more than once, should I hold on to the favor, maybe she will save me one time when I need it. Rather than making a half-baked decision, having a get-out-of-jail-free card seemed to be my best bet. Just to be clear, I won't break the contract to help you. Your help prevented me from the smallest of infractions, there would be no point in owing you this favor should it come with the same punishment I avoided. Well, that puts a damper on things. The contract prevented her from using her power to interact with humans on human lands unprovoked and completely prevented her from doing anything other than passing through a city. She couldn't even help me survive a beast attack as that would be her interfering with a human, me. You've seen me practice my magic on the way here, right? An idea came to me. At her nod, I pressed on. I can't get schooling in the caster way of fighting. Could this favor be you helping me with gaining magic gear so that I can use my mana without ruining it? After all, this was one of the biggest obstacles for me to progress. There was no way I was going to get myself magic equipment, but with a dragon's help, that might not be the case. And how would you like me to do that? she asked. I'll leave that up to you, I have barely started learning anything about it, whereas you probably spent more time wielding mana than my parents have been alive. Well, that is a smart request, very well. I shall help you, when I have your gear I'll come find you, she said standing up. In the next moment, the chair under me gave way, and I landed on the ground. By the time I looked up the clearing was empty, the dragon, shifter, and even the table was gone. Deciding I had spent enough time on my little outing I returned to the caravan. It had taken us three days longer to make the trip back than it did going to the city. The caravan was filled with food, so we moved quite a bit slower. During this time, I just practiced my skills. The practice barely made a dent in my skills, but the experience wasn't bad. The only headache I had was the new, mana siphon, skill. Unlike humans, the presence of mana is what turned beasts into monsters, so even the few beasts that I did run into were no good for it. The only option I did have was to try it out on the other members of the caravan and that was not something I was willing to do. Maybe if I knew that it was harmless I would have convinced myself, but I couldn't even properly remember getting the skill and using it for the first time. As we finally made it out of the forest, we could finally see the village. Off to one side must have been where the army had set up camp, it was a wide field that used to have quite a few trees covering it. This would be prime real estate, it would be sold for quite a bit, if it wasn't already, to a farmer. Next spring all that cleared land would make for a perfect field. After finally reaching the caravan setup area Alana, Judy and I all left the caravan to the drivers to set up. Judy and I headed for our house while Alana went towards hers. It had only been seven weeks since I left home and I had been unconscious for two of them, but it felt like a lot longer. I was also dreading the conversation I was going to have to have with my parents but I had kept this from them for too long. As we entered the home, they were setting up the table for dinner. Luckily, it seemed that mom had made stew. I guess the original plan was for it to last them two days, but with four of us it was probably going to be gone by the end of the evening. Judy. Ajax. You're back. Mom was out of her seat as we entered the house. Made it back a lot sooner than we were expecting. Those soldiers sure can move fast, Dad said a lot more composed as Mom went from hugging Judy to hugging me. 
So, how was the city? Mom asked as we took two bowls and sat down to join them. The dinner continued peacefully with Judy and I explaining around time in the city, we steered clear of my mana and the vampire, those would come after dinner. Mom, Dad, I have something to tell you. I said as we cleared away the plates. What is it? Mom asked. I haven't been completely honest with you. For a while, now I have had the sense mana and expel mana skills. I finally came clean. They both sat there in stunned silence. Dad was the first one to speak. It's not that I am upset that you kept that to yourself, but why didn't you tell us? Well, I remember back when Judy got her rare skill, Mom made a big fuss about keeping such things quiet. I also didn't want anyone else in the village to know about it, so I just practiced it by myself. Dad gave me a small smile, but Mom just looked at me a little lost. But where could you have practiced it? I know we didn't stay together the whole time, but you couldn't have had that much time. She was talking more to herself, piecing things together. Wait, your garden. She now looked me in the eyes. Is that where you were practicing? Is that why everything you were growing there came out so much bigger and better? I didn't even get a chance to answer, and she just kept going, Ajax, you can't do that, you were selling those plants. Those can be identified as having been grown with mana. You'll expose yourself to people you really don't want knowing about your mana. She went from confused to focused and now panicked in only a few seconds. It's okay mom, I know that now. I got lucky, the sleazy merchant I was selling them to was just passing them one village away from twice the cost. I lost quite a bit of money to him, but thankfully nobody found out. That is actually how Alana and I found out he had mana. Our appraiser looked at them and told us they were grown by a mana user, not a particularly good one, but definitely a mana user. Judy contributed. Alana thought quickly enough to cover up the fact that he was the mana user, so for now, I don't think anyone outside the family knows he has mana. Besides Hatchet I murmured. Well at least you are okay. Now that we know, your mother and I can do our best to help keep this under wraps dad said as he breathed out a long sigh. Ajax, I know that you're already past ten years old and it may be a little late to start, but, if you want, I can get in contact with my family. We might not get along that well, but I'm sure that they would be willing to help. If you want to go to an academy to help train in using your mana, we can do that. She seemed quite upset, most likely at her parents' disapproval of her young marriage, but the look in her eyes was determined. There is no need for that, I have found my own way to use mana. It's actually probably best that I practice here, where there is nobody really looking for mana users. I might even get Hatchet to help me out. You told Hatchet? Dad asked, he seemed disappointed. I didn't tell him, but I used a quick healing spell after the fight with the Cobalts. When I made it to the city, Tom told me he looked into who he was before he came here. Apparently, he used to be an adventurer, a pretty good one at that. He definitely has, detect mana, so he knows. So, what is your plan now? Dad asked me, it seems he figured I wouldn't be staying in the village. I think that I will be training here with Hatchet for my apprentice. After that I will most likely go to join the Adventurers Guild, they are one of the few places that can offer me protection from the nobles, hunting monsters seems like something I'd like to do. Where did you even encounter a monster to get that idea? The kobolds and wolf you saw don't count, Hatchet took care of them, Dad said. This led into a long explanation about what happened with the vampire. It was a long night after that. Mom stayed up hugging me for another good hour or so, all the while lamenting why she hadn't been there to take care of me. The fact that there was nothing she could have done didn't seem to make one bit of difference. After seeing them react like that to the vampire, I decided not to bring up the dragon tonight. The whole encounter still seemed unreal to me. I half doubted that it even happened. If I was going to tell them about it I would do it after I got my new gear, I didn't want them to think I had gone crazy after my encounter with the vampire. The next morning, after breakfast, I changed into my hunting gear and headed towards the edge of the village. As I came up to the solitary house standing a little separated from the rest I found Hatchet in his backyard chopping firewood. So, you know? 
I started off. He turned back to look at me. He stayed silent for a few moments that might as well have been a few years before he responded with a simple I know. Are you still willing to train me? I asked. What do you want me to train you in? Hunting, I answered straight away, but after a brief moment I continued deciding it was best he get the full picture. And adventuring, I plan to go join the guild in a few years. I can't teach you magic, I can barely get a hint of what you're doing with mana. That's okay, I plan on figuring out magic for myself, maybe you could give me a few pointers from experience. Fine then, go do your war I'm up while I feeny sh here, after that we go hunting. Chapter 48 I don't remember anything from yesterday after the long day of hunting and the beating I got from Hatchet. What had I done that seems to have upset him so much, to the point that he will beat me within a few points of my health, if with no long-term damage being done? Getting out of bed and going to eat I remember a faint timeline for last night. It was a quiet affair. I had dinner with my parents, them asking questions about my day and me answering in short vague sentences. Judy spent the night with Alana at her house, we were expecting them to spend tonight here, before leaving for the city tomorrow morning. Their presence apparently saved the village a 30% price rise that the other merchants would have tried to push through. Mom, Dad, are you here? Judy and Alana came through the door as we were all finishing up with breakfast. Just finished eating sweetheart, would you like me to warm something up for you? Mom asked. No, no, it's just that the caravan got done unloading, the night crew pulled an all-nighter and finished up a day early. We are leaving in an hour, two at the most. Judy said. I see, that's to be expected though. You stayed here for a few months before you took your brother to the city. Dad said calmly. This brought to the forefront something else I had been considering. I thought I would have had time until tonight but it seems I had to make the decision now. My previous life had made it abundantly clear what I should do, it was just that I wasn't all that sure that the same would apply here. What will the two of you be doing in the city now? I asked, trying to gather a bit more information. All I got to see you do is go get things appraised and take part in one auction on the organization's dime. We did well in that auction. Judy smiled at me. I forgot to tell you since it happened while you were still out of it, we both got promoted. Now that we are going back, they are going to push us through the training our new positions need. It's usually done right as the promotion happens, but they made an exception for us since this trip was already planned for. We're going to join one of the senior members and travel in between cities. Alana said, Isn't that what you are doing now? Mom asked. No, this is a bit different. Instead of buying and selling things we will just go and mark things for delivery. We will be going by horse-drawn carriage, it'll take only two or three day to cover a distance similar to the one from here to Les Sis. Once we arrive at a new city, we will take a look at what they have and make orders of where to buy it and have it sent to. Judy was clearly very excited about this. Well at least the official representative will. We will be there to observe the procedure for when we will start doing the same thing. We will have to cultivate our own contacts and transport people before that happens though. Alana seemed a bit more subdued about their trip, I could empathize as it sounded boring to me. This helped me make my decision, so I headed back into my room and collected a rather hefty bag before I came back to sit at the table. I opened it up, took a single gold coin from inside before placing it in front of the both of them. I've been thinking about this on our way back here. I have this small fortune that was gifted to me and nothing much to spend it on right now. So I was thinking, especially since all you will be doing for the next little while is observing, how about you have some money to work with should an opportunity arise? I left the bag with 99 gold coins in between them. You're just giving this to us? Judy asked, Alana also frowned at that. Not as such, I am asking you to invest it. I will give you the coins to use as capital, when I am ready to join the Adventurers Guild I will come back for them. At that time you will give me back the 99 original coins and half the profit that you managed to make using them. I explained. They both stood there looking at the bag of money, 
Investing wasn't something that was done here as rich people mostly bought out companies and managed them as an organization and everyone else would be robbed blind by anyone asked to handle their investments. But having your money make more money for you was a lesson I picked up in my previous life. What do you mean? Judy still seemed a bit confused about the process. Well let's say that I give you the 99 coins here, in 5 years you grow them into 1000, then I get 549 of them. I felt a smile form on my face at the extravagant example, I had full faith that they could pull off something like that in such a big time frame. Aren't you taking a bit too much, mom said, you are taking more than half while doing none of the work. But he carries all of the risk. If me and Judy lose the 99 gold, he takes the loss. Alana figured me out and shared a look with Judy. With a quick nod, she turned back to me and picked up the pouch. We accept. With that taken care of I headed off towards Hatchet's hut with a weight off my shoulders. Now I only had what seemed to be brutal training to worry about, at least if yesterday was any indication. You got here quite late. He said as I walked up to the door. My sister and Alana are leaving today instead, so we said our goodbyes. He nodded and motioned for us to go to the sparring ring we used yesterday evening. I could already guess what was about to happen, and I wasn't looking forward to it. But if this is what it took to improve, then I was going to do it. The session ended a lot sooner than yesterday, as I still had half my health points remaining. It was quite the skill he demonstrated by having all the hits inflict a decent dose of pain, shave my health off by a few points, and leave nearly no mark on me. By the end of the session I had unlocked the pain resistance skill. This should be enough. Start bringing your health back up slowly with that healing spell you know. Hatchet said he hadn't even broken a sweat knocking me around for the last hour. Hatchet, is there something I did to upset you? I was sure something was bothering him now. Why did you even choose to be a hunter? Why not go learn to cast if you were going to put most of your points into your mental stats? He answered my question with a question of his own. So that's what this was about, I could see how it seemed from his point of view, I claimed to want to be a hunter, used my own mana in different way, but spent all my points for something that is lackluster for someone who should be at least level 8 from the skill he knows. I decided that if I was going to trust him with my magic I should trust him with my points too. He could probably work out a way to maximize everything if he had all the information. I don't want to be a mage, at least not like the ones I have seen. The reason that I haven't put any points in my physical stats is because I haven't spent any of my points. I came clean. What do you mean, he frowned at me, you lost the points? No, I can assign them at any time, I just figured out a way to hold off on using them. How did you manage to do that, his eyebrows had chased his receding hairline at that. Instead of closing the window that notified me of my level up I just made it very small and moved it to the bottom corner of my vision, there it will stay until right before my apprentice trade ends or an emergency happens. I am doing this for two reasons. One is so I can get as many forced free points as possible without giving up the boost to assigned points apprentice offers, and the second is to gain as many levels as possible until then. Experience is also influenced by difficulty. My brother got to level 10 very quickly when he started as a guard, level 15 came by decently fast, level 18 was slow, level 20 was a crawl. By keeping low stats points I am hoping to have higher experience gain while hunting these spots. He didn't say anything for over a minute, just staring at me like I was some sort of weird unique creature. He then frowned slightly and started tapping his pointing finger on the bottom of his chin. Yes, it is certainly true that you can't very well maintain experience gain without having a dungeon that we could use. The increase in forced stat points is a great asset to boot as well. But are you aware of the drawbacks? he asked. Yes, I know that if I am caught unaware without spending my points, they would all go to waste. Not that drawback, that one is obvious. What other drawback is there? By not spending your points, you are limiting your growth. Well, not limiting, but constraining it for the time being. Regardless, this will in turn affect your skills. With only low stats, to work with your skills will plateau. 
Depending on how much you manage to gain in forced stat points, you might be able to have your skill reach level 40 before any gains all but stall. This was something I hadn't considered. I suppose it made sense, there was only so far you could take something with lower stats. It was also a sacrifice worth making. Apprentice didn't increase my skill growth, it did increase my experience and stat point gains. Yes, I am willing to accept that as well. Very well then, I will adjust your training to reflect this. Despite the ominous words a brief smirk made its way onto his face. Chapter 49 For a whole year after I came back everything was peaceful. I spent most of my time training with Hatchet and learning about hunting practices. After the first few days, we had to cut back on the amount of game we hunted. The cobalt infestation had done a number on the local ecosystem and we needed to let it rebuild for probably another year. This meant that it was going to be another year where most of the meat in our village's diet would come from the merchants. This didn't affect me all that much since my family was well off in Judy and Alana had made two trips with the caravan back home to ensure that we had all the meat we could want. The other hunters were not used to this. They were used to being the main provider of meat and as such also having preferential treatment on distribution. The butcher was also heavily affected as most of his business had dried up, almost all of the delivered meat was already preserved and butchered. This turned our hunting trips more into expeditions, the butcher even joined in with the other hunters. While this little problem had resulted in a lack of meat it did produce something else. The soldiers had dealt with the kobolds, meaning the killed and burned the bodies. This meat that everything else the kobolds had brought out of the mine was left to be scavenged. When I asked Hatchet why the soldiers didn't take it with them, he told me that it was intentional to help the village get through the problems caused. Hunters were now turned scavengers, with a butcher for a porter. That's not to say that it was safe. While the large kobold force was no more, you could always find some stragglers that had suddenly become rich in resources from the extermination of their group. While nobody had died, we had a few close calls with the poison those little buggers used. Hatchet had no problems dealing with them and after a few months I could take on up to two or three at a time. It was the odd high-level kobold, caster, or ambushes that were the problem. My progress was steady and I did see some high increases in my stats since unlocking my stats. Name, Ajax. Level, 17. Experience. 5255-20800 Traits, Prodigal Apprentice, Divine Witness Health, 330-330 Mana, 420-420 Stamina, 400-400 Vitality, 33.40 Strength, 34.98 Endurance, 40.86 Dexterity, 35.35. Intellect, 50.77. Wisdom, 43.45. Mind, 42.19. Perception, 34.30. Stat points, 352. Skills, common, frowny face mathematics LVL 22, stealth LVL 23, drawing LVL 30, athleticism LVL 23. Running LVL 24, reading LVL 20, writing LVL 20, cooking LVL 20, sewing LVL 20, cleaning LVL 13, haggling LVL 19, gardening LVL 20, axes LVL 30, hammers LVL 27, deception LVL 16, sword LVL 20, shield LVL 20, bow LVL 20, spear LVL 20, throwing LVL 20, persuasion LVL 10, unarmed combat LVL 20, Knives 25, skinning LVL 10, tanning LVL 10, dismantle LVL 10, climbing LVL 10, tracking LVL 13, heat resistance LVL 6, poison resistance LVL 16, pain resistance LVL 5, trapping LVL 10, uncommon, frowny face meditation LVL 40, sense mana LVL 41, expel mana LVL 39, sprinting LVL 20, mining LVL 10, Lumberjack LVL 10, Smelting LVL 10, Blacksmithing LVL 10, Chanting LVL 10, Mana Farming LVL 10, Increase Price LVL 10, Lower Price LVL 10, Danger Sense LVL 8, 
Leatherworking LVL10, Alchemy LVL10, Mana Milling LVL6, Precise, Cut LVL20, Precise, Blow LVL20, Judge Threat LVL10, Piercing Shot LVL10, Rare, Manipulate Mana LVL22, Water Aspect Mana LVL20, Fire Aspect Mana LVL20, Air Aspect Mana LVL20, Earth Aspect Mana LVL21, Inject Mana LVL17, Spot Weakness LVL10, Residue Recognition LVL3, Light Aspect Mana LVL7, Shadow Aspect Mana LVL10. Epic, Mana Augmentation LVL15. Legendary, Mana Siphon LVL1. New. Pain Resistance 0 5. Trapping 0 10. Upgrades. Shadow Mana 1 10. Light Mana 1 7. Bow 10 11. Spear 11 12. Throwing 10 11. Mana Augmentation 6 15. Judge Threat 2 10. Spot Weakness 4 10. Inject Mana 14 17. Meditation 38 40. Expel Mana 39 40. Manipulate Mana 18 22. Water Mana LVL 11 20. Fire Mana LVL 11 20. Earth Mana LVL 14 21. Air Mana LVL 12 20. Danger Sense 5 8. Precise Cut 13 20. Precise Blow 11 20. Piercing Shot 1 10. Sprinting 13 20. Climbing 5 10. Tracking 4 13. Heat Resistance 3 6. Running 22 24. Athleticism 20 23. Hammers 24 27. Knives 21 25. Swords 14 20. Bows 11 20. Shield 12 20. Throwing 11 20. Unarmed Combat 13 20. Spear 12 20. Stealth 21 23. So far, I hadn't done much experimenting with new magic. Hatchet had kept me doing a lot of practice with my old stuff to help ramp up my skills and increase my stats before going for any new experiments. He was very pleased with my progress. I still remember the conversation when he found out my level. We had just finished with a hunt when I hit level 17. Finally, levels are taking more and more experience. I said. Not only that, but experience should be a lot harder to pick up here. He said what level did you get to? 17. What? How are you level 17 already? To say he was surprised would have been an understatement. Well I haven, T had such a big drop in experience yet, it just takes more of it to level. I went with my logic. No, there should definitely be a big drop in experience as you level, everything gets a lot easier, he stopped short of finishing that point. You aren't spending your points, this means that even as you level your stats aren't starting to dwarf the level 10 and 11 you can probably keep up a similar experience gain. It's almost like you are advancing through a dungeon. This was the second time that I heard about dungeons. The first time was from the dragon. It was also a good idea to question what they were. What are dungeons? It's not the first time I heard about them, but nobody explained what they are to me. Oh, that. I doubt anyone knows exactly what dungeons are. They are an opening in space, a tear in the world. Once you enter, you will find a floor. Each dungeon has a different average level on their first floor. Basically, it's a space where adventurers go to kill things in a bit more controlled of an environment. The levels of creatures are more stable. So what happens if nobody clears a dungeon in a long time? I had read a few books that touched on the topic of dungeons in another world. I wondered which one had it right. Clear? You can't clear a dungeon. If nobody enters for a while nothing happens. But aren't dungeons a danger for villages near them? They can be yes. How does that make any sense? You just said nothing happens if people don't enter. 
They are a danger because of what happens when people do enter, he said. How so? Each group that enters has to maintain contact as they do. Fifty groups can enter and they would all be in their own version of the dungeon. Okay so it was instanced, you can't go hunt someone down and then just blame them for having died in the dungeon. That was good to know. Every floor only has one entrance and a few exits. Every exit leads to the next floor and the entrance always leads back outside the dungeon. All exits are guarded by a trap or a stronger monster. They usually have keys to the door blocking you from advancing. The levels of each floor are on average 10 higher than they were on the previous one. Now that's not to say that some dungeons don't have an average level increase of 20 between floors or of something smaller like 7. Each creature is also bound to their own floor. Once you exit a floor it disappears. You can't return to it and all monsters still there disappear. But if all monsters disappear, how could a dungeon prove a danger? This made no sense. Because that only happens when you exit a floor. As I told you, there are more exits, but only one entrance to a floor. The entrance is always the point where you first enter the floor and is always unguarded. The only way to exit the dungeon is to go out through the entrance of the floor you are on. The only problem with this is you aren't the only one leaving. Every other creature on that floor is also leaving the dungeon with you. Do you see where this might be a problem? He asked. I can see there might be some issues, but it doesn't sound that dangerous. I mean, yeah, some creatures coming out could be problematic, but that didn't seem like such a big deal. They are also released if your whole party should die. That could be a problem with people who are overconfident. Backslash. It is also a problem with people who get lucky. It has happened a lot more than once that a team is almost wiped out by an exit guardian only to have one or two members grab the key and escape to the next floor to get away from the creature. They then leave the dungeon since they can't handle the increased difficulty and the whole floor is released. If this happens to the strongest people in the village or town, this would be a death sentence. Right now, most high floor gap dungeons are a wide breath from any settlements, while low floor gap dungeons have great cities near them. The one next to the capital is a seventh floor gap. But if they are so dangerous, why would you have built the capital there? Because of how they regulate adventurers. For the dungeons close to cities, a team has to be lower in level by more than the floor gap compared to the team guarding the dungeon. This way, if something happens, the monsters can be killed by the protectors. Chapter 50 Knowing about how dungeons worked made a huge difference. Hatchet agreed with me that at the rate I was going, chances are dungeons would be the only reasonably safe spot for me to level in once I spent all of my points. There were of course going to be plenty of other areas where I could find the level of opponents I would need to advance. The only problem is... In the open world once you got past level 15 you would only see monsters as part of a pack. Now this in, and of itself, didn't make them all that dangerous. The problem was that the leader of the pack was always quite a bit stronger than the rest. In some species, there were small examples of their two or maybe three pack leaders, but that was hard to find. Leveling would mean either to go hunting packs for the one monster in it that would actually present a challenge, or start hunting packs where if the leader found you, you were dead. All of the practice I was getting in my skills had started to make me question the system. Was there some sort of unmentioned buff to the child trait? My stats as they are now dwarfed what any child could get, yet they were not enough to move any of my skills past the level cap. Was there no requirement cap for skill as a child? It made sense, otherwise nobody would get anything past 20. It was as I was going through my usual practice that I felt a presence appear behind me. It was an uncomfortable feeling, I always checked to make sure nobody from the village followed me when I went to practice. Somebody creeping up on me like this made me feel very vulnerable. Turning around I finally saw why I could sense them. Standing not 10 feet behind me is the dragon. It's good to see that you made some progress. Your skills have improved quite a bit, and so did your level. Why your stats have increased so little is a tad bit surprising, she said as a form of greeting. 
The idea that there were skills out there that let you not only see someone else's level, but also their skills and stats was definitely inching me towards the paranoid self I had been for most of my life. Hello, you're back. The statement felt lackluster and awkward but didn't seem to bother the dragon. I very much look forward to having my debt removed before anything happens to you. What good would a piece of magic gear you have no idea how to use be to you if something should attack your village? That would then make my debt force me to get you out alive and have me punished for meddling in human affairs, much better to have everything squared away, she explained. Nice to see you care so much, sarcasm probably wasn't the best idea, but it was how I dealt with awkwardness in my past life. So far, there hadn't been all that many awkward encounters here, to find a better way of dealing with them. I take it, my gear is ready then? She produced two fingerless gloves that the back of the hands were covered by a metal plate with a small dent in the center. Here you go, these will definitely help you, she said, tossing them to me. I caught them, looked them over then returned my gaze to her. Was this a joke, a pair of gloves with what seemed like an enchantment on the defensive plate all my favor got me? Don't look so disappointed. The enchantment there requires any sort of mana core to function. The better ones will take less to expire. It is there to hide you away from others. Your secrecy was important to you in the time you spent around my son. If that is only there for cover, then what do these do? Clearly there was something I was missing. Beneath that enchanted metal are studded refined and enchanted mana stones. Mana stones are quite a bother to get, the ones that size are a bit easier, anything bigger than a pebble and you have some real scouring to do. Yes, but what does that do? I am self-taught, how do these help me? Oh, that's what you meant. She at least had the decency to be a bit embarrassed. They will fix the problem you mentioned when you asked me for magic gear. The enchanting and refining were done with this item in mind. The reason there are so many stones that it took both gloves to fit them all is because I tried to get as many different aspects of mana as I could. From now on when you look to infuse your mana into your items, first pass it through the gloves. They should give you a small increase in output, but the important part is that the mana stone will take the burden, since the mana you will be using will match the stone it won't cause any degradation to your items. Well, that changed everything, I would no longer have to practice with wooden weapons in order to preserve my actual ones. Not to mention that from the way she mentioned multiple aspects I might be able to find some more aspects to glean just by messing with the gauntlet. Thank you, this will definitely be very useful. I said, while I was very appreciative of my gift, it seemed lackluster compared to the dragon in front of me. All of the magic I could feel from her items came from big jewelry. Don't look at me like that. With the way you are using mana, these will give you the versatility you need as well as make sure that you can keep them. I thought about getting you something else, but you use too many weapons. If I were to get you a few enchanted weapons, the moment you leave this backwater village someone would take them from you. The gloves can be passed off as some family heirloom with little importance she scoffed at me, clearly being able to tell what I was thinking. Her point was also a good one. Anything really good that the dragon would have gotten me would force me to hide it or have it appropriated by some noble for one offense or another. This at least until I could get myself to be strong enough so that wouldn't happen. Thank why dash I looked back up to find that I was alone again. The dragon had given me the gift and left. Since I was anyway out here to practice, I might as well try these out. The gloves were surprisingly comfortable. I almost couldn't feel their presence. To start things off, I infused some raw mana into them to get a feel of what was there. With mana infused my sense mana, was able to pick up a lot more than six aspects of mana I could use. The gloves covered every aspect I had felt back in the guard courtyard and more. I stopped the diffusion and decided to start with some small application of earth mana. It had been what started me on my journey on the path of magic, so I might as well continue with it. The first thing I found out was that it was easier said than done to first feed my mana through the gloves. I had never had an intermediary like this before, so it was definitely something that was going to take a while to get used to. It took ten attempts for me to finally be able to get the damn things to work. 
The result was a lot stronger than the small hole I was hoping to make in the ground. The result was more than twice as big as the biggest hole I could make. At least the biggest hole I could make at a moment's notice. If I had time to gather my mana before pumping it all it would be a different picture altogether. These gloves clearly did a lot more amplification than I gave them credit for, so I decided to see just what I could do with a full power attack. I drew the wooden sword I had for practice and infused the wind augmentation through the gloves. It only took three tries to get this one to work, but the result was much stronger than my usual enhancement. It managed to cut clean through the barrack of a tree. The resistance I felt didn't match up to my expectations though. The amplification I felt with the earth was a lot stronger than the one I felt with the wind. Was it that these gloves had different rates for each element? I gave each of my mana aspects a try, getting shadow to work through the gloves took more attempts than even earth, despite the experience I had. Fire went through on the first try, the wooden sword was hot enough to light a tree on fire with a glancing touch. After going through all the different aspects I figured out that it wasn't a matter of different amplification values. The gloves didn't amplify my magic, it increased it. The difference may be subtle between the two in wording but made a world of difference in practice. The change to my spells was additive, not multiplicative, meaning that the increase wouldn't grow the more power I had. What the hell happened here, the angry voice of Hatchet came from behind me. I thought I told you to be discreet when practicing your magic, what about this is discreet to you? I could almost hear you from the village. The grouping of trees I was practicing in became a clearing, the few felled trees was probably what he managed to hear. I looked sheepishly at him. How do I explain this to him now? Chapter 51 Explaining to Hatchet all that had happened with the dragon went a lot soother than he expected. He just listened to everything without once interrupting. He did give a rather interesting glance at the gloves once he explained what they were, how they worked and that he totaled the area by trying some of his weaker moves. So you're telling me that you saved a disguised dragon ling while in the city and as thanks for that its mother made you a pair of enchanted gloves, his tone sounded exasperated. Yeah, pretty much I answered, I think it's a good thing you are going to become an adventurer once you decide to spend your stat points don't think the village will survive you staying, he mumbled under his breath. On the upside, these will at least let you be somewhat safe around here, without always having a minder. With that explanation out of the way, he told me to move a little further away from the village and continue my demolition so that other hunters wouldn't stumble upon me. They had become rather jealous of us since with Hatchet's high level we tended to venture out further and actually find something to hunt, they would be quick to share news of my magic for a reward. Getting used to the gloves was not all that difficult, I did learn that some of my tricks were best not put through the glove. The first time I tried to speed myself up by using the earth to give me a boost I launched myself into a tree. Right now, with the values of my physical stats any enhancement that affected me directly was best used without the glove's amplification. The impact from the tree was mitigated by the shield, it was the big bruise on my left leg that let me know that my magic still followed some of the rules of physics. Any push that launched me forward had to be withstood by my own legs. After a week of playing around with my new boost and power hatchet, decided that I was finally ready to go by myself for a little while. This didn't mean that I would go all by myself out in the forest, simply that we could now split up to cover more ground while staying in range to call for help. Though if he was calling for help it meant either he needed some healing after a bad fight or I should go start the evacuation. On the third time we split up I found myself a small group of kobolds. They must have survived the raid on their camp and retreated towards the caves before being scared back in this direction by the salamanders that forced them out in the first place. There were only three of them which made this a good change for me to fight something that could give me a challenge. I took aim and infused a shadow arrow to start and fired at the one holding a staff. I wasn't ready for a fight including magic coming at me so I had to take that one out first. The arrow was fully covered in a thin dark membrane and flew silently right on target. My adage of piercing shot meant that the headshot was an instant kill. Unlike any of the other pack creatures I had hunted before kobolds were at least somewhat intelligent and proficient in tool use. 
This meant that while they had no way of noticing the arrow approaching, once it landed, they could figure out where it came from by the angle it hit their companion. This quick thinking was the first thing that made me realize that these kobolds were different from the ones I had seen the past year. Their size was a bit bigger and bulkier, but a quick, judge threat on them told me they were a lot stronger than the mage I had just taken out. These were the elites that had tried to retreat when the army took out their base. The armored one of the two charged towards me. It not only used mana to speed itself very similarly to what I did, I could also feel his mana core infuse his whole body with mana. While this seemed a bit costly to do, the effect was something that I had been searching for. Mana strengthening, I had been trying for a while to figure out how I could use mana to boost my physical strength and I finally had an example. I pulled as much mana as I could through the glove into the sword and launched a quick wind slice towards the cobalt's neck. My use of mana clearly caught it by surprise, as did the power boost from the gauntlet as the strike took its head clean off its shoulders. The downside for me was that I hadn't thought through everything when I launched my attack. Sure, my opponent was dead the moment I took his head off, the problem was that a clean cut with a wind slice provided no stopping power. All the momentum the kobold used to launch himself at me was still pushing his corpse forwards, and the headless body slammed me into the tree at my back. Quite a bit of blood got on me at this point when I saw the last kobold pick up the staff of its fallen comrade. I hadn't thought of the possibility of there being two caster. Even worse, Judge Threat marked this one as being the strongest of the two. I didn't want to give it a chance to launch a spell, so I tried to copy the mana enhancement. As mana filled my body so did the most excruciating pain I have felt. The only thing that could compare to it was when the vampire ripped my arm off. Luckily, I had started with only a small amount of mana so that I would be in control of my body, depending on the boost. The pain dissipated as quickly as it came, I sagged down and breathed a sigh of relief. Something had definitely gone wrong there, I felt the earth shift under me as it wrapped around my feet. This kobold clearly knew what it was doing. Instead of going for a big attack, it first went to snare me in place. Funnily enough my own stupidity did the same thing, so had it gone for an attack it would have most likely landed it. I tried using my own earth manipulation to free myself, but for the first time my attempts did nothing. Even with the boost from the gauntlet I couldn't overpower the kobold with the boost from his own staff. I was also running out of time as I saw a ball of fire blaze to life in front of the staff. Feeling out of options I went to the last thing I could try. I used mana siphon to remove the mana keeping the earth strong around my legs. The feeling that came with it was surprising, not only did I manage to break myself free from the earth, but I also rolled completely out of the way of the fireball. A quick look at my own body with mana sense told me that I was in a similar state to the second kobold for a quick moment there. I had somehow enhanced my body using mana. The annoyed snarl coming from the kobold broke me out of my reverie. I could go about pondering and testing things after I dealt with him and I was no longer in danger. I drew a second arrow in my bow and infused it with air. I didn't need the stealth provided by shadow so I went for penetration. The arrow made quick work of the cobalt much like the first. At the same time I felt the earth grip me again. The cobalt had gone for a repeat of the first attack, hoping to pin me in place for a second fireball, most likely one that he will never get to launch now. Instead of quickly freeing myself I instead tried to enhance my body with my own mana once more. This time I focused the enhancement only on one arm just in case it had the same outcome. That proved to be a wise choice as I felt the agony shoot up my arm. Despite using the same method as the cobalt mana enhancement didn't seem to work like this for me. My second test consisted of using mana siphon to free myself once more. This time however, I not only siphoned the mana at a much slower rate, but I also looked carefully at the process with mana sense. I could clearly see the mana in the earth change as it got absorbed into me. Once there I felt myself enhanced once again. The enhancement was also weaker than it was the first time, it did however last through the siphoning process and an instant more after it finished. This was an odd discovery, could I only enhance myself in a fight against another mage? 
As a test, I used Expel Mana to release a small amount of my mana into the area around me. I then used Mana Siphon to draw it all back in. I could see my mana change as it got sucked back into my body. I'm not sure how my legendary skill works, but it clearly doesn't take the mana to top up my own reserves. As the new mana drew into my body, I felt myself grow stronger and faster once more. This was a great discovery, though the fact that it took quite a bit of my focus just to use Mana Siphon meant that I was not ready to use this in combat on my own mana. It was a starting point. Hopefully in the future I would be able to subconsciously use both Expel Mana and Mana Siphon together to keep myself enhanced. The excitement filling me up spent me along to loot the kobolds and continue my patrol. Starting tomorrow, my training is going to change once more. Chapter 52 Hatchet POV It might have taken almost five years of constant training, but the kid's dedication sure paid off. Despite not having placed any points his stats were all at least above 50, at least from what I had been able to figure out. It was hard to get a read on the exact levels, considering the use of skills. Today he was training alone. The glove being from a dragon still bothers me, but I guess dragons aren't something you can decline a gift from either. At least he didn't ask it to teach him. It seemed that common sense taught him enough to not invite a dragon to stick around for longer than necessary. Your friend, Hatchet. I whispered softly as I finished the letter. I don't know how long it would take for Ajax to end up in the capital and deliver it, but writing it had certainly eased some of the guilt I had been carrying since the day I ran. For all the kid claimed he wanted to be a hunter he had no talent for it. The skill was there off course, but he was impatient, easily bored and always pushing himself further. Any lands he hunted would be stripped clean of game if he wasn't carefully watched. No, he was a born adventurer, most of his training for the last three years had been focused on that rather than hunting. Soon he will be leaving, I wonder if I will miss him? Ajax POV The last few years of training had made massive leaps in terms of my magic versatility. With the help of the gems and the gauntlet, I was able to unlock quite a few more aspects, though some gems still eluded me. One of the biggest gains had to be the mana conjuration skill. With it I could finally throw around pure elemental magic. It took me far longer than I would like to admit since coming to a magical world with immense talent to learn to throw a fireball, but I got there. It wasn't very powerful, though that was probably not going to change until I spent my stat points I could finally use my mana independently. Before even when I was making holes or ridges in the ground I would have to always take a step and activate mana augmentation to get it to work. Now I could conjure things from nothing but my mana. I was a little disappointed when I figured out that 15 minutes was as long as anything conjured would last, putting any hopes I had of making a stone castle rise out of the ground to rest. Name, Ajax. Level, 24. Experience, 105-35500. Traits, Prodigal Apprentice, Divine Witness. Health, 330-330. Mana, 420-420. Stamina, 400-400. Vitality, 33.40-65.12. Strength, 34.98-63.42. Endurance, 40.86-65.17. Dexterity, 35.35-64.26. Intellect, 50.77-70.06 Wisdom, 43.45-68.43 Mind, 42.19-67.99 Perception, 34.30-65.65 Stat points, 506 Skills Common, Frowny Face Mathematics LVL22, Stealth LVL23 Drawing LVL 30, Athleticism LVL 23, Running LVL 24, Reading LVL 20, Writing LVL 20, Cooking LVL 20, Sewing LVL 20, Cleaning LVL 13, Haggling LVL 19. Uncommon, Frowny Face Meditation LVL 40, Sense Mana LVL 41, Expel Mana LVL 40, Sprinting LVL 22, Mining LVL 10, 
Lumberjack LVL-10, Smelting LVL-10, Blacksmithing LVL-10, Chanting LVL-11, Mana Farming LVL-12, Increase Price LVL-10, Lower Price LVL-10, Danger Sense LVL-10, Rare, Manipulate Mana LVL-30, Water Aspect Mana LVL-23, Fire Aspect Mana LVL-23, Air Aspect Mana LVL-24, Earth Aspect Mana LVL-25, Inject Mana LVL-24, Spot Weakness LVL-13, Residue Recognition LVL-10, Light Aspect Mana LVL-22, Shadow Aspect Mana LVL-22, Ambush LVL-12. Epic, Mana Augmentation LVL-20, Mana Conjuration LVL-20, Lightning Aspect Mana LVL-10, Metal Aspect Mana LVL-10, Ice Aspect Mana LVL-10, Magma Aspect Mana LVL-7, Holy Aspect Mana LVL-1, Void Aspect Mana LVL-3. Legendary, Mana Siphon LVL-14. New. Expel Mana, plus Manipulate Mana, Dash Mana Conjuration 0, Dash 20. Air Aspect Mana, Dash Lightning Aspect Mana 0, Dash 10. Earth Aspect, Mana, Dash Metal Aspect Mana 0, Dash 10. Water Aspect Mana, Dash Ice Aspect Mana 0, Dash 10. Earth Aspect Mana, plus Fire Aspect Mana, Dash Magma Aspect Mana 0, Dash 7. Stealth, plus Spot Weakness, Dash Ambush 0, Dash 12. Light Aspect Mana, Dash Holy Aspect Mana 0, Dash 1. Shadow Aspect Mana, Dash Void Aspect Mana 0, Dash 3. Upgrades. Mana Siphon 1, Dash 14. Mana Augmentation 15, Dash 22. Shadow Aspect Mana 10, Dash 22. Light Aspect Mana 7, Dash 20. Residue Recognition 3, Dash 10. Spot Weakness 10, Dash 13. Earth Aspect, Mana 21, Dash 25. Air Aspect Mana 20-24. Fire Aspect Mana 20-23. Water Aspect Mana 20-23. Manipulate Mana 22-30. Inject Mana 17-24. Piercing Shot 10-20. Judge Threat 10-13. Danger Sense 8-10. Chanting 10-11. Mana Farming 10-12 Sprinting 20-22 Trapping 10-12 Poison Resistance 16-18 Pain Resistance 5-10 Heat Resistance 6-10 Tracking 13-20 Climbing 10-15 Dismantle 10-20 Running 24-25 Looking at my status I have to say was both rewarding and frustrating at the same time. The amount of stats and skills I had gained was a testament to my hard work. The skill thresholds combined with stat requirements meant that my physical skills had remained stuck for the past few years despite me improving slightly. I was convinced that the child trait had a hidden effect, mainly that skills could grow independent of stats. No way anyone could get a skill to level 50 before 10 years old otherwise. Right now I was focused on getting my mind to 68. It was the last stat I could realistically improve in the 15 days I had remaining of my apprentice trait. As soon as I got that final point I would spend my stockpile and use the remaining days to take advantage of the increased adjustment speed. The last thing I wanted was to spend my points and end up not being able to stand up without headbutting the ceiling. My latest focus had been on the recently acquired mana aspect. Before a month ago, every aspect I had gained I had felt someone or something use before, even the holy aspect that I couldn't seem to increase despite being able to form it for close to a year. Void was something else though. Being used in conjuration did nothing but summon a small, but very mana-intensive floating black orb. Where void seemed to really shine was with mana augmentation. The first time I tried to strike with it nothing seemed out of the ordinary, the slight increase in power was about the same as Shadow, despite not having its stealth characteristics. My perception on the skill changed during a light spar with my dad. Dad had been coming with me to help me spar whenever he could lately. 
He knew I would be leaving soon and wanted to do what he could for me while I was still home. Due to his higher stats he was still a great sparring partner, even if he lacked in comparison to Hatchet. It was far from the first time I had used my void during spars when the incident happened. I was using my hammer and wound a big strike that I chose to infuse with void. The blow landed squarely on Dad's shield with a dull thump. I was surprised and caught completely off guard by the scream he released a moment after. It seems void attacks, while not all that much stronger from regular ones, are very special. Special by being able to bypass obstacles so long as they are in contact with the intended target. My blow made contact with his shield but carried little of the power onto it, to the point that his slight shield thrust had knocked my hammer and hand out of the way at the moment of impact. The power from my strike completely bypassed the shield and landed squarely on his arm. The bruise he had afterwards told me I was not far from breaking his arm with that blow. Since that day Hatchet and I spent quite a bit of time working out just how effective Void is. Turns out that shields are not the only thing Void can bypass, armor, scales, fur, even skin and muscle are all fair game. Though live tissue seems to take a lot more mana to get around compared to objects. A slight rustle of leaves brought me back to the present. The wolves I had been hunting had finally returned to their cave. This was a lot of what I had been doing lately. Ambush was one of the skills I could still level and the dire wolves that seemed to have taken residence in the new opening near the caves of our village were the perfect prey. At around level 10 to 15 for each wolf, they were weak enough that I could take them yet too strong to be left alive around the village. The fight that ensued after my opening volley was an exercise in futility for them. Despite them being a very real danger for me. My skills and mana, combined with all my practice and use of the tight spacing in the cliffs, meant it was a relatively easy fight. By funneling them through a small corridor between the rocks I kept them from surrounding me. The slight incline meant that they also had to try to reach up to fight me, and the rather thick sheen of ice I covered the choke point and meant their agility wasn't all that dangerous. Ten minutes later all of the wolves were dead. I was rather proud of myself when I noticed something strange. Instead of just one flickering box in the corner of my vision, there were now two. My status screen was forever pulsing slightly in an attempt to get me to spend my points, so much so that I had grown to ignore it. This second one must be something else, I wonder what other things I gained. So I opened it. Retribution. Repeated and extended fighting and killing against much lower levels has been noticed. This is strongly discouraged, punishment, bullying I applied. Bullying I, all experience and skill gains from fighting substantially weaker enemies reduced by 20%. A substantially weaker enemy is considered from your level, with a baseline. A creature with less than 90% of your level, yet no less than 5 levels below you, is substantially weaker. Chapter 53 The appearance of the punishment was a great surprise to Ajax. Despite the fact that this punishment will be all but obsolete in the coming weeks, with him spending his free stats any experience he was going to get from fighting things that far below his level would have been shot from the extreme lack of difficulty and danger. This was not to say that this was something to take lightly. A decrease in experience earned, especially one as large as a fifth, was definitely concerning, so he quickly gutted and collected the wolf corpses and made for the village to talk about this with Hatchet. The way back was uneventful having done multiple such trips, before the only thing he regretted was not bringing the cart out with him. It wasn't so much the weight of all he had to carry as the amount of space they took up. He nevertheless made good time and dropped the corpses off with the tanner before making for the secluded hut. He found Hatchet outside of his house fletching arrows. Hey Hatchet, he said, trying to sound unconcerned. Something happened, he asked with a frown on his face. Somehow he had managed to pick up the ability to read Ajax in the last few years. You could say that. Ajax shifted awkwardly. What do you know about retributions and punishments? Hatchet froze, his eyes flew open and his eyebrows made a break for his hairline. He stood silent for almost a full minute before coming back to himself and turning to Ajax. Tell me everything, his cold tone made it clear it wasn't a request. 
Ajax proceeded to tell him about the hunt. Despite the lack of patience Hatchet was under right now, he listened carefully and didn't try to speed him along. He knew, not from personal experience, but he had seen aftermaths, retributions, and punishments could be a death sentence. As Ajax described his retribution and punishment, Hatchet made his first contributions to the talk in a while. He wanted to know the exact wording of both the retribution and the punishment. Once he had both of those and thought about them for a short while he finally relaxed. All right, the good news is that there is nothing for us to worry about right now. Your punishment is one of the lightest ones. The bigger problem comes in the form of your retribution. That is something that you will have to be mindful of from now on, he breathed out a sigh of relief. What are these punishments and retributions? Ajax asked concerned. Besides stats skills and traits, the system deals with three more types of interference. The first you have already experienced is the retribution and punishments. Whenever something goes against the way of the system, retributions and punishments are used to try and correct that behavior. In your case, the level difference in your advantage is something the system dislikes, he explained. If retributions and punishments are two of them, what is the last one? Ajax asked. No, no. Retributions is one of them, punishments are just a result of retributions. On the other side, we have achievements. Much like they sound, achievements are things that follow the same principle as retributions, but instead are there to mark the approval of the system. The biggest difference between achievements and retributions is repetitive gain. For example, there is an achievement for killing an enemy without help that is both twice your level and 30 levels above you. It is somewhat well known and nobles try to get it from their children by scouting out favorable matchups. Very much like your own retribution, this is based purely on the levels of those involved. The knowledge of their being achievements and him not having been told anything about them was something Ajax very much didn't like. He did also file away the requirements for the achievement and marked it as something he should get by the time he reached level 30. Now the difference between the two of them comes when looking to get another in the same vein. For the achievement, you would have to go to the next step up. For this one it is killing something three times your level with the same level 30 requirement. You can also have one other person helping you so long as they also fill the requirements. Anyway you get the point, the increase in difficulty in gaining them. For retributions, that is not the case. You got yours for fighting wolves that were 10 to 15 levels below you. Even if you were to now only fight wolves that were 6 levels below the retribution will come into effect and most likely increase in severity. So you are saying I shouldn't engage with any more creatures lower level than me? Ajax asked, clearly concerned with the restrictions this would place upon him. Not as such, you are to refrain from confronting only creatures lower level than you. As long as somewhere in the pack of creatures you are facing, there is at least one that fits the requirements, your punishments will not activate. Okay, I will be careful from now on. You really don't need to worry about the one you have. It is mostly a warning one. Despite the fact that you will accrue the 2 through V versions of the punishment with increasing speed if you don't stop fighting below your level, it's not like it will hinder you all that much. At level V it will simply stop providing you with experience. The big problems come after that. See once a punishment has reached a full course one of two things happen, and there is no way to know which it will be. Either the punishment grows further, from a hindrance to a cost. Such as your reduction in experience changing to loss in experience for every combat with enemies below your level. Or, it can be fully random. This is the problematic version of the change, as you can receive the first tier of punishment for any other retribution. Ajax calmed down knowing that he would have ample warning from the four more tiers of the punishment before anything dangerous happened. Well at least my situation is not dire. Are there any really bad punishments that you know? I have seen one that reveals your status to anyone focusing on you. I have no idea what the person did to get it, but it is something best avoided. Ajax shivered at the thought of such a punishment. Besides retributions and achievements, there are also discoveries. There is a good chance that you already have had one or maybe even two of these. 
Discoveries are things that you discover about the system by yourself. It can't be something that you are informed of by someone else, directly or through writing. There is one for finding out about punishments, which you most likely have gained, and one for achievements you can no longer gain. The system will not actively acknowledge you making a discovery unless it is a discovery that hasn't been made before by your race type, for you that would mean discovering something no other humanoid has before. Discoveries is the main excuse nobles use for hoarding information from the general populace. As you see, some achievements come with a required number of discoveries in order to claim the rewards. After the lengthy explanation Ajax just made small talk trying to digest the information bomb that was just dropped on him. A lot of frustration at the system itself being one of them. Despite missing out on such important information, he could understand why people didn't just give it out randomly. Not long after Hatchet finished explaining all about the Retribution's achievements and discoveries Ajax made his way back home. He took one more look at his stats and determined that spending his points would come after Mind finally ticked over to 68. All of the rest of his stats were too far away to make it to the next whole point before his trade expired. After using Expel Mana, quickly to dumb quite a bit of his mana out in the hopes of reaching that next point faster, he finished his meal and went to bed. He woke up the following morning with a new communication from the system blinking in the bottom left of his vision. He carefully opened while feeling not an insignificant amount of dread after getting his punishment yesterday. Achievement, Born Hoarder Spend your first 15 years without spending a single stat point. Reward, plus 10 to all stats. Lesser versions of the achievement can no longer be obtained. Hoarder. Spend 15 consecutive years without spending a single stat point. Reward, plus 5 to all stats. Forced Hoarder. Spend 15 consecutive years at 0 stat points. Reward, plus 2 to all stats. Chapter 54. Ajax was quite miffed at the achievement. He was also a little upset that he wouldn't get the weaker version of the plus 5 to all stats as well as the plus 10. Even so the amount of stats he gained was 4 levels worth so he was definitely glad about it. That was not the only notice to be flashing for attention, as he took a look at his second one. Achievement, the carrot and the stick. Suffer a retribution and earn an achievement. Requires 2 discoveries to earn. Child trait suppresses skill stat barriers. Has been discovered by others before you. The existence of retributions. Has been discovered by others before you. Reward, plus one to all stats. Plus one thousand experience. This was definitely a pleasant surprise. Not one but two achievements. At this point, he was kicking himself for asking Hatchet about all of this yesterday. If he had waited for just one more day, he would have earned the discovery for achievements as well. The discovery method also somewhat explained why despite the fact that humans have been clearly developing for thousands and thousands of years with magic, no great strides in technology have been made. People were just not that willing to share or receive help from others in the hope of making discoveries for themselves. Pulling up his status screen to take a look at his new values, he was slightly taken aback. Name, Ajax. Level, 24. Experience, 1150-35500. Traits, Prodigal Apprentice, Divine Witness. Health, 760-760. Mana, 790-790. Stamina, 760-760. Vitality, 65.12-76.00. Strength, 63.42-74.00 Endurance, 65.17-76.00 Dexterity, 64.26-75.00 Intellect, 70.06-81.00 Wisdom, 68.43-79.00 Mind, 67.99-79.00 Perception, 65.65-76.00 Stat Points, 506 Skills, 
Common, Frowny Face Mathematics LDL 22, Stealth LDL 23, Drawing LDL 30, Athleticism LDL 23, Running LDL 24, Reading LDL 20, Writing LDL 20, Cooking LDL 20, Sewing LDL 20, Cleaning LDL 13, Haggling LDL 19, Gardening LDL 20, Axes LDL 30, Hammers LDL 27, Deception LDL 16, Sword LVL 20, Shield LVL 20, Bow LVL 20, Spear LVL 20, Throwing LVL 20, Persuasion LVL 10, Unarmed Combat LVL 20, Knives 25, Skinning LVL 10, Tanning LVL 10, Dismantle LVL 20, Climbing LVL 15, Tracking LVL 20, Heat Resistance LVL 10, Poison Resistance LVL 18, Pain Resistance LVL 10, Trapping LVL 12, Uncommon, Frowny Face Meditation, LVL 40, Sense Mana LVL 41, Expel Mana LVL 40, Sprinting LVL 22, Mining LVL 10, Lumberjack LVL 10, Smelting LVL 10, Blacksmithing LVL 10, Chanting LVL 11, Mana Farming LVL 12, Increase Price LVL 10, Lower Price LVL 10, Danger Sense LVL 10, Leatherworking LVL 10, Alchemy LVL 10, Mana Milling LVL 6, Precise, Cut LVL 20, Precise, Blow LVL 20, Judge Threat LVL 13, Piercing Shot LVL 20, Rare, Manipulate Mana LVL 30, Water Aspect Mana LVL 23, Fire Aspect Mana LVL 23, Air Aspect Mana LVL 24, Earth Aspect Mana LVL 25, Inject Mana LVL 24, Spot Weakness LVL 13, Residue Recognition LVL 10, Light Aspect Mana LVL 22, Shadow Aspect Mana LVL 22. Epic, Mana Augmentation LVL 20, Mana Conjuration LVL 20, Lightning Aspect Mana LVL 10, Metal Aspect Mana LVL 10, Ice Aspect Mana LVL 10, Magma Aspect Mana LVL 7. Holy Aspect Mana LVL 1, Void Aspect Mana LVL 3. Legendary, Mana Siphon LVL 14. It seems like these stat increases weren't awarded the same way, his child trait had added 10 points to all his stats over the years. Instead, it was treated as a point increase and leveling up to the next whole number. The only bright side to this was that his mind seemed to have passed the threshold sometime before he got the achievements. He didn't really care about the rest of the partial points since those would have been lost anyway as he didn't have the time to wait any longer before spending his own points. Seeing as the system had already decided to start upgrading his stats, why should he wait? He then proceeded to spend all of his saved up points. This was something he had discussed with Hatchet for quite a while during his training. Overall, he wanted to have a balanced build, that being said due to the way his, mana siphon, allowed him to increase his physical stats he thought that a bit of a more magic stat investment would work out better for him. A 60-40 split was the best way to achieve this. Vitality, mind, intellect, and wisdom each got 75 points while strength, edurance, dexterity, and perception got 50 each. His apprentice trait increased the gains to 90 and 60 respectively. Name, Ajax. Level, 24. Experience, 1150-35500. Traits, Prodigal Apprentice, Divine Witness. Health, 1660-1660. Mana, 1690-1690. Stamina, 1360-1360. Vitality, 166. Strength, 134. Endurance, 136. Dexterity, 135. Intellect, 171. Wisdom, 169. Mind, 169. Perception, 132. Stat points, 6. He was left over with 6 points. A small part of him wanted to use those six points to try and even add a few of his stats to nice multiples of five. However, he knew well that as long as five of them went into one single stat, he would get an extra point there from the 20% boost. The amount of limitations that he suffered, especially at the start of his training and his time in the city, led him to shove all six points into vitality. 
With a final score of 173 and his stat points counter showing zero, he finally closed his stat screen for the first time in almost five years allowing the changes to take place. For an instant, he couldn't even tell the difference. He was soon assaulted by an incredible amount of information coming in from his senses. His perception effectively having doubled lead to a sensory overload, this combined with his mental capabilities, being able to keep up with the stream of information meant he only got a nasty headache for about three seconds. The downside was that with his mind being able to process things so quickly now, along with the pain those three seconds felt like a lot more. The pain caused his arm to swing reflexively downward. It made contact with the nightstand that he had beside his bed and left a decent dent in it. Realizing what he had just done, he moved to stand up. This resulted in launching himself off the bed and headbutting the ceiling. As he very carefully started to stand up, putting as little power into every motion, then increasing it slowly until it could have the desired effect, he was finally on two legs. He looked a lot like a newborn fawn. His legs troubled, not from weakness, but instead from uncertainty. For the next hour, he just walked around the room and carefully picked up anything and everything. An hour was usually quite a bit long for someone to get used to his stats after spending his points. Most people however didn't suffer increases into the hundreds by doubling every stat. He took another hour before he finally had a decent handle on everything, despite the supposed stronger increases trait provided to adaptation, compared to the regular apprentice. After finally being comfortable moving he got changed and headed over to Hatchet, he even skipped breakfast. Morning he greeted the old hunter, his voice much louder than he intended, coming across as yelling. Morning Hatchet frowned at him for a moment, before a look of realization crossed his features. You finally decided to spend your points? I did, yes. Ajax replied, it still came out a bit loud, but much quieter compared to his initial greeting. I even got an achievement for holding off for 15 years. Yes, I suppose the two points in each attribute would be much more useful at your age. Hatchet contemplated. I didn't get only two points, I got ten in each attribute. Ajax said with a grin forming on his face. Ten? I wonder why, he frowned at the information. Not two, yet not fourteen either, I wonder what makes the difference. Why would you think that I would get fourteen? That was something Ajax also wanted to know, if he had somehow missed out on thirty-two points, he was going to be pissed. You are not the first person to not spend any points since birth. Though the others that have done so were imprisoned since birth and have never had the chance to level past level 1 before their 15 years. He said. That's the thing with one-off achievements, getting one stops you from receiving the bonus from any of the others that are part of the same group. Thinking about this it made sense. Sure they might be rare, but there had to be people who didn't level since birth so he clearly wasn't the first to get the born hoarder achievement, the only question was. Why did they get 14 points and he only got 10? Maybe it's because they completed all of the achievements at once. He whispered under his breath. What do you mean? Hatchet clearly heard the mumbled words. The only reason I can see as to why others would have gained more than 10 points is that they completed all of the lower achievements. The look he received for those words made him expand a little on what he meant. I didn't meet the requirements for the lowest one, since my stat points weren't zero for 15 years. As he explained what each of the three achievements were and their requirements, he also thought about how they got to the number 14. Perhaps you also get half the reward for all lesser achievements if you complement all of them. It was the only thing that made sense to him. The total of the other achievements would be 7, if you rounded up half of that and added it to the 10 you would get the 14 the others had gotten. It might have to do with getting them all at the same time, maybe receiving half the reward for all the lesser versions, Hatchet echoed his own thoughts on the matter. Regardless, this is a matter for another day. For the next few weeks before you leave to join the Adventurer's Guild, we have to get you used to your new level of power. Chapter 55 With his new punishment, in effect Ajax found himself a lot more restrained. This worked out very well for his new training regiment. Hatchet took the time that whole first day in sparring with him to ensure that he wouldn't hurt people accidentally with his new strength. 
Most level 24s had around 650 total stats, with the elites pushing 700. He had 661 points just in his mental stats. Add to that the 600-point infusion in one day, and he was liable to injure some of the younger villagers who hadn't reached that point in their stats. A deeper look into his punishment came with the answer to his training. He would once again accompany Hatchet as he went out. But instead of Hatchet being there to look out for him, he was just there to finish the fights. His new mission was now to engage with the low-level creatures without killing them. The first thing he noticed after the first day was the noticeable increase in control the new training granted him. He could now apply as much strength as he wanted without having to slowly build up to it. The second was the noticeable drop in experience earned. Previously, he would gain anywhere from 50 to 100 EXP a day at the least. The last two days of hunting got him a grand total of five. It became obvious to him why his brother had slowed down to a crawl in his own leveling. That's to say nothing of his parents. As he was fighting off two bears, he found himself still missing his fine control mid-battle. The bears were weak, level 12 at most according to his skills. He didn't even need to use mana siphon anymore, instead he had to limit his barehanded strike so as to not break their necks. Well, it seems that you have the limiting control of your abilities well in hand, said Hatched as he walked over and put down the bigger of the two bears. We'll leave this one be, I spotted a few cubs running around and I don't want to leave the bears that have just finished returning to the area to be exterminated. I simply nodded along and proceeded to carry the bear carcass over to the butcher. Bear meat turned out to be a bit of an acquired taste but with little else in options during the repopulation of the forest following the cobalt infestation, the village had grown to really enjoy it. It seemed odd for us to be returning so soon, it wasn't even noon yet. I wonder what Hatchet has planned. He knows that I will be leaving a day or two after my apprentice trait ends. Surely he knows that I will have plenty of time to rest on my trip over to Lessis. After dropping off the big bear and getting assurances of the specific cuts to be set aside for the both of us I followed after Hatchet. For the first time since I started training under him, he led me out towards the eastern side of the village. So far we've only worked towards helping you control yourself with your newfound strength, he said as we entered one of the many caves that opened on the side of the mountain. With you leaving in a little over a week, I think it's time to help you find out just how far you can push your new powers without restraint. We exited the cramped tunnel into a massive open space. There were a few targets set up on one side of the wall, but the large cavern looked a lot like an arena. Here we have the space, structural integrity, and privacy for you to go all out without having to worry. Hatchet continued as he started to stretch. You're going to be fighting me for real now. We'll start with you not using your mana, so you can get a good feel for your physical stats. He handed me blunted versions of the weapons I was used to carrying. While he wanted me to get a good idea of my power and push me he still wanted to make it as safe as possible without compromising the effectiveness. We squared off against each other, circling, I was looking for a weak point to exploit. Thinking, I finally saw an opening I charged. Hatchet POV. The kid came charging at me. He was a lot faster now than at any point in the past week. Clearly, he had been restraining himself when adjusting to his increase in stats, the speed he had seemed to surprise even him as he almost crashed into the wall after I stepped out of the way. We were looking to train him, so I stayed on the defensive for the first twenty minutes of the fight. I could see him gaining more and more control as the fight progressed. I could also get a feel for how high his stats now were. His strength, dexterity, and endurance seemed pretty balanced, they were somewhere around 125, maybe a bit higher on account of him still getting used to them maybe in the mid-130s. His perception was also at least at 100, though I couldn't get more accurate than that, it could be quite a bit higher. He never told me what his stats were, but if he started from around the mid-50s, he would have to have spent at least 230 points in strength dexterity and endurance. A physical-focused build, a slight bit different than the even split we had discussed, but definitely strong. A few retaliation strikes let me know that his vitality was even sturdier, north of 150. 
Despite my initial doubts about his path and surprising ability to not spend his stats, it clearly worked out for him. He fought exactly as I would expect of a level 24. This despite having lower leveled skills than they usually do by this point. So despite his not neglected mental stats, he still surpasses a physically focused warrior in physical stats. This might not be the case as he continues to level and split his points, but it should allow him to get himself established in the Adventurer's Guild and gain their protection before revealing his abilities with mana. Deciding this was a good place to stop, I sped up and with a well-placed strike from behind him sent him tumbling to the ground. That was good, I said as he quickly got back up. Let's take a break and then we can see what you can really do. With how well this trick of yours seems to have worked out, I almost think you wasted those points you spent in your mental stats. All people needed to spend points into vitality and perception. After passing level 50, you started to need to drop a few points in stats opposite your focus, just so your body could keep up. I am really starting to think he wasted his potential by splitting his focus like this. You ready? I asked after a good half an hour break. He simply nodded at me, and I felt the distinct presence of mana being expelled from him. It wasn't anything massive, but it was a constant trickle. It also seemed to not be moving away from him, instead it was somehow being fed back into him. He took a step forward, and I felt mana spread throughout the ground of our arena. An instant later the ground beneath my feet started to give way. I quickly regained my footing and looked back at him. I was lucky to look up just in time as he was almost upon me. He is a lot faster now than he was before. Whatever he was doing with his mana increased his speed and strength considerably. I managed to dodge the slash by the skin of my teeth and back away looking to create space. As soon as I jump, though, he releases a quick burst of lightning from the end of his blade. The bolt is comparatively weak to what I have seen back in my adventuring days. That he was able to release it right after charging an opponent and without having to speak any more than made up for it, however. The biggest problem casters had when in combat was that their spells had their target locked at the beginning of the chant. Mages needed to know where their quarry would be a few moments before it got there. This let other warriors of similar level to them have a chance in one-on-one -on -one combat by reacting and being unpredictable every time a chant started. This was not a problem that he would have however. The bolt took me in the chest and I felt my muscle spasm once or twice and the current went through my system. He seemed to be pleased with that and kept charging after me, not leaving me a moment to come up with a plan. This was definitely an anomaly, I was level 52. Being a scout, I focused more heavily on perception and vitality, but I should still have a combat strength comparable to a level 45. That he was pushing me back at level 24 was astounding. My early carelessness let him get the upper hand and he used it to land a few lightning spells on me. My body was a lot less responsive than I would have liked. It took everything I had to finally get a good strike in and be able to call an end to the spar. That was really something. I managed to get out after a good few lungfuls. We're going to be doing this for the rest of the days before you leave. We'll keep up your physical only training as well. I would suggest you keep your mana under wraps until you have spent a few weeks or months in the Adventurer's Guild. He barely nodded at me from the floor. Despite the high cost of his fighting style, he nearly took out an adventurer over twice his level. To think that I had thought him splitting his stats was a waste of potential. He would probably be able to defeat me in a few months now that he could also increase his skills with the stat caps removed. Chapter 56 I was breathing hard from the floor of the cavern where we had our little spar. For the first time ever, Judge Threat had given me no indication of anything. Before I spent my free stat points it used to give me a sure death feeling when used on hatchet but now it returned absolutely nothing. This was something that I was going to ask him about once I caught my breath. Looking at my stat values I noticed that the 10 minute fight at the end really took a lot out of me. My mana was sitting at 200-1690, and my stamina even lower at 30-1360. My health was very high in comparison at 750-1730. This clearly showed me that depending on the situation, sometimes it was worth taking the hit instead of spreading the resources to dodge it. I ran through the fight in my mind again. 
thinking of how it started with a medium drain on my mana constantly running throughout using mana siphon to upgrade my physical stats. That alone counted for about 900 of the mana I had drained during the entire fight. The rest was split between my mana augmentation and mana conjuration, with the former using close to 400 and the latter 200. During the fight a few things were made painfully obvious to me by fighting a high-level scout. First and foremost was how useless a lot of the elements I had access to were offensively against a high-level scout. True, fire magma and ice could work decently defensively, but someone on his level could easily outlast me if I decided to go that route. What was effective was the combination of earth and water. The mud was clearly a problem for him to get through. Sadly, it also posed the same challenges for me any time I entered the fray. Lightning on the other hand was both fast enough to make contact, damaging and even had the added benefit of limiting his speed and movement. This was definitely something that I would be looking to lean into in a speed matchup. I would just have to make sure it doesn't become a crutch that something immune to lightning would use to beat me. With my stats evenly spread as they were, I found that I actually overpowered Hatchet quite a bit with the power boost from Mana Siphon. Considering that he was quite a bit faster than me, this led me to believe that I had about the same total when considering only strength endurance and dexterity. While it would take a bit more experimenting, I think I would stand a better chance against him if I was to increase the amount of mana I fed into Mana Siphon. The only downside being that I wouldn't even be able to keep that up for 10 minutes. If he caught on and just fought defensively, he could most likely outlast me. He was also very likely going to be a lot more careful of my lightning in any other spar we were going to have. I have a question. I rasped out after a few minutes of laying on the floor waiting for my stamina and mana to regenerate. Why does my judge threat not give me any idea about you anymore? That's because of my privacy skill, he answered but it used to be responsive to you before I spent my stats. I argued, yes, but all it told you then was that I could kill you any time I want with little to no effort, he said. Now that the answer is a bit more ambiguous it falls within the bounds of my privacy skill. As you level up, judge threat, to close the gap you will start to receive some information. Though most of it will be ambiguous at the start. Is the privacy skill something a lot of higher level people have? He asked, thinking back to the time the commander picked up on him using a skill on him. That's a tough question. Most people above level 50 have it. A bit earlier, if they are a spy or any type of stealth and infiltration specialist. The most useful part of it is being able to pick up on anybody using any sort of inspect skill on you. It will also always let you know if it succeeded or failed in blocking it, he said as he stretched and finally had a full range of movement again. Thinking about it, this was something he should most definitely look into getting. Sadly he was a long way off level 50. Even if he didn't have any penalty against fighting creatures at level 25 or 30, they would still be quite a bit weaker than him and he wouldn't have the increased experience from difficulty and danger he has had so far. With a helping hand from Hatchet, he finally picked himself up from the cavern floor, and together, they headed back out to the village. There he headed straight home to find that his father was still out back working in the smithy, and his mother was also not at home. He paid it little mind, and quickly grabbed a quick bite, before all, but falling into bed to rest and recover his spent resources. The following week followed a much different schedule. He would spar with Hatchet twice a day once in the morning and once in the evening after they both had time to replenish the spent stamina and in his case mana. They forewent any hunting at this time as they knew it was of little consequence and he would be leaving shortly. During the entire week, the only time he ever got so close to winning as he did in that first match was when he forewent any caution and front-loaded his mana into mana siphon, eating though his entire man pool in just about three minutes. During the entire time, he pushed Hatchet hard defensively and had managed to get a good number of hits in. Sadly none of them were decisive enough and after he had spent all of his mana and a good portion of his stamina to keep up the aggression, he simply collapsed. The power of Mana Siphon was clearly a double-edged sword so long as he was up against someone that didn't use spells themselves. He also hesitated to try and directly use it on other people 
or even creatures, and had only used it on spells, and used, by the kobolds, and his own mana. The fear of being identified as a vampire was still something that he hadn't gotten past just yet. The day before his official 15th birthday, as he knew from the hoarder achievement that even the system considered his birthday to be two weeks prior, the merchant caravan rolled into town with an apology message from his sister and Alana about not being able to make it back for the celebration. It also carried a gift from each of them as well as one from Kate and Tom. The gifts consisted of a healing scroll, created by Kate herself as she had made some decent strides in healing magic in the past five years. It wasn't something that would heal any wound, but it could definitely turn a lethal one into something more manageable. His sister had sent him a detailed map, containing a lot of information about the various known dungeons and adventuring spots in the kingdom, something that would prove very useful in the future. The last gift came from Alana. He received a set of rather expensive clothes. Something he hadn't owned before. It was a set of clothes that one would wear if they ever went to an event hosted by nobles. His relationship with Alana had progressed very strangely over the past few years. Their mutual interest in each other seemed to be genuine, but it wasn't more than physical. The next time she and his sister had come back into town, she had gotten rather drunk and they had ended up sleeping together. This became a common occurrence thereafter with them trying at a relationship, but quickly figuring out that they worked better as friends and continuing a friends with benefits relationship every time she returned to the village, much to the displeasure of Johnny who had somehow figured out what had happened. As he woke up on the morning of his birthday, he found himself with two more notifications. This was definitely odd since he had asked Hatchet if there was anything else that he should be on the lookout for about the end of his apprentice trait, so as to not miss out on any benefits. He quickly opened them and was pleasantly surprised by what he found. Achievement, Physically Gifted End Apprentice Trait with more than 500 points in physical stats. Reward, Berserker Achievement, Archmage Hopeful End Apprentice Trait with more than 600 points in mental stats. Reward, Mana Skin Looking at the two odd new skills he gained and their odd presentation in their message, he slowly went from ecstatic to annoyed. His, Berserker, skill was an uncommon skill, whereas, Mana Skin was a rare skill. This led him to the conclusion that every 100 points would have pushed his reward up a tier. Had he spent all his points on his magical stats, he would now be the proud owner of a mythic skill. Chapter 57 Thinking through what the most recent achievements he received meant I calmed down a lot. It seemed that 500 was the minimal threshold for which someone would receive an achievement like this. Getting a total of 504 of the stats by the end of the apprentice trait didn't seem that difficult to him. But that was just his own perception from experience. On average a normal person would average around 15 in their stats. So before adding anything extra, they would have a base of 60. The next issue came with them only raising up those stats through levels meant that they would gain at most 40 stats, forcibly upgrading them. That left people with a total 400 stats to make up for. Including the 10% boost from the apprentice trait, they would need 380 stat points to spend, meaning being level 20. Most people made it to level 15 in their apprenticeship, those who got to 18 were very rare and dedicated. His brother had made it to 17 and was viewed favorably in the guard because of it. This meant that the knowledge of such breakpoints at the end of apprentice was something that was kept under wraps by the nobility. To be honest, this was probably a good thing as all but absolute talents or people with a cheat like him had no chance of reaching it, so it only served as a way for people to skew their spent points in hope of a miracle leveling speed. After thinking that whole thing through, he took another look at the rewarded skills. They showed up differently in his status, both, Berserker, and, Mana Skin, had a different font than the rest of the skills. As he focused on mana skin, he suddenly had an instinctual idea of what the skill did and how to use it. The skill could create a membrane of mana around any portion of his chosen body, he could encase his hand, arm, or his full body. The patch could be as little as his palm. The other choice he could make was on whether he would use the skill with a set amount of mana, or link it to his mana pool. This was different from all other skills he had ever gained. 
Usually gaining a skill didn't come with knowledge of how to use it since you had to have completed an action to gain it. Even his, mana siphon, skill, which he gained in a moment of desperation, still worked the same way. He then focused on his other skill, Berserker, this skill worked differently. This skill could be used only upon receiving an attack, it would then amply that attack against you slightly in return for generating stamina. This could be very useful when facing quick weak enemies, or wave-style tactics meant to run someone's resources dry before killing them. Being quite pleased with his rewards, he got out of bed and headed in the kitchen for breakfast. There he found his parents, and after a congratulatory meal he spent the rest of the day with either one of them as he was looking to leave tomorrow. The next day, after breakfast and a more emotional goodbye from his parents than he would like to admit, he headed over to say his goodbye and thanks to Hatchet before leaving. Morning Hatchet, he said. Morning, he responded, you heading out? Yeah, I came to say goodbye, and to thank you for putting up with me for the last five years, I know I can't have been the easiest of apprentices. That you weren't. Wondered why I ever accepted you more than once or twice, but I'm glad I did, as he said this he had walked over to the house and grabbed something by the front door. I would have given this to you yesterday, but when I came by you were spending time with your parents so I didn't want to interrupt. He extended a rather large old-looking backpack. From all respects it looked just like an old backpack, if one that had been maintained in good condition. Examining it with his sense mana, he felt a large and complex rune inscribed on the inside of the pack. What is this? I asked, I can feel a rune on the inside. The pack is enchanted to increase the amount of space on the inside. It won't do anything for the weight of whatever you want to carry, but it should be large enough for you to carry a whole cart's worth of things. Thinking back to the amount of bags and packs he had left over by his front gate in preparation for the trip, he gripped the gift slightly tighter. Not wanting to waste two weeks on a trip again, he planned on heading to Les Sis by himself. This would let him make full use of his stats, and should probably shorten the trip to three days. Making two overnight stays in the villages along the route, he should arrive a little past noon in the city. This will definitely come in useful. He said with a dumb smile, spreading across his face. A little bit of advice, make sure whatever you put inside of it is clean, washing it out is a real pain. Hatchet leaned in to whisper. Speaking of advice, I got an achievement this morning that related to my completing the apprentice period. It gave me a skill, but it's unlike any skill I've had before. Do you know anything about that? This was the final question he had for his mentor, before he would be ready to strike out on his own. Hatchet frowned a little at this, before his eyes went wide as he continued to listen. You got a reward skill? A reward skill. If it is what it sounds like then yes. Ajax ventured with an easy guess. I don't mean that you got it as a reward. Hatchet was slightly exasperated as he gestured with his hands. Reward skills or active skills, they are called both, since the only way to get them is from achievements. They show up differently in your status, you have an instinctual knowledge about their base uses, and they aren't a passive effect, like other skills. Yeah, that's what I got, but why call them both reward and active skills, he confirmed with a nod, because you can also be awarded non-active skills, but all active skills are rewards, that doesn't matter right now. You should keep them to yourself. Reward skills are thought to be a whole tier higher than their shown tier and a lot of people will likely question you thoroughly on how you managed to get them, he said, his tone dropping as he delivered the warning. With his final explanations about the skills and his affairs in order Ajax headed back to his home and easily fit all of his bags and supplies inside the backpack with room to spare, his mother noticing him doing this came out to check on him. Once she found out that he had space to spare she went and got a whole heap of things to take to his brother and sister. All in all the amount of space taken up increased by almost half, if the weight only by about a fifth. With all this, he gave his mom a final hug and headed on towards the road with his gifted gloves on his hand, a small hatchet at his hip for self-defense and as a memento to his teacher and a backpack on his shoulders. As he exited the village he caught a glimpse of a group of rather finely dressed people as well as some wearing armor, all riding horses, 
waiting in the space for the caravan while another armored person holding the reins to his horse talked to the headman. As they didn't seem like the kind to cause trouble while active so diplomatically, he continued on his way out of the village and broke into a jog once he exited. The road to Lessis was not noteworthy. Unlike his last two trips on it, he had no problem the whole way, and even easily traded the deer and boar he hunted on the way at the two villages in exchange for a house, for the night, and cooked food. He arrived at Lessis, as expected, at around noon, but was met with a long line at the gate. He had to wait around for a few hours until he finally got his turn with one of the few guards who were handling the intake. Reason for visiting, the guard said before even looking at him. As he finished the words and glanced at him his eyes sparked with a slight touch of recognition. You're Tom's brother, Jax, right? No, Ajax. Yeah, that's me. He thought the guard's face looked familiar, but he couldn't place it or remember his name. He looked a little around before he made a quick get-on-with-it motion. In you go, tell your brother that Darren sends his regards. Ajax nodded his thanks and entered the city considering the time he decided to first head over to the Adventurer's Guild hoping to get there before it closed, being excited to finally become a member and only after go by his brother's place. After only getting lost once and getting directions from a friendly shop owner Ajax made it to the Adventurer's Guild Hall. It was a rather large building that was made of fine materials, but sported a half-bar, half-reception on its bottom floor. The bar was slated perpendicular to the help desk, with most of the floor being taken up by tables. After being given a quick glance by everybody in the building, he was promptly ignored as he made his way to the desk. Welcome to the Adventurer's Guild, how can I help you? A beautiful perky young woman greeted him. I'm looking to join the guild. Ajax said while trying to restrain his enthusiasm. Her smile faltered and her eyes dashed off to the person sitting on the stool closest to the desk at the bar. Her eyes returned to Ajax and with a slightly defeated and irritated voice she said I'm sorry to say but we haven't been allowed to take on new members for the past three days. Just as soon as she finished her words the man that had been sitting on the stool had come up to the side and standing in a formal stance said hello, by order of the Lord you are hereby conscripted. You are to present yourself to the guard hall in two days' time. Chapter 58 Hello, by order of the Lord you are hereby conscripted, you are to present yourself to the guard hall in two days' time. The words ring in my ears, I stay there motionless, trying to comprehend what the man is saying. It all seems so surreal to me. After all this effort I spent trying to stay under the radar of the nobility, I ended up conscripted. I take another look at the man who found it fit to put my life in jeopardy. He's a short pudgy man, with slimy brown hair that he's had trimmed in a military fashion and a rather noticeable gut hanging a little over his belt. As I fully take in the meaning of what he's told me, the guilty expression on the receptionist's face makes a lot of sense to me. Members of the Adventurer's Guild can't be conscripted without the express request of the current ruling monarch. The guilds can however be forced to stop accepting members, clearly this guy was left here to pick off anyone who thought they could get out of it by joining the guild. Now Mr. Ajax, if you would please sign this form I can give you your token. You had also best take care not to lose it as without it you won't be given any of the standard gear from the quartermaster. The man continues saying. How do you know my name? I frown as soon as he addresses me. I had been practicing gathering information with my higher perception as I moved through the city and hadn't noticed anyone following me from the gate, which is the only place I gave my name. I have a simple inspection skill that allows me to inspect the name, age and species of anyone or anything that doesn't have something to mask it. It's why I am in charge of recruitment, it's much easier to catch deserters if you have their name and age along with their appearance. The smugness of his tone makes it clear how high he thinks of himself for having the skill. This makes me relax a little as he probably doesn't know anything else about or he would have definitely shared it. From the way he keeps glancing at the receptionist it is clear that he is trying to impress her. Realizing that there isn't much I can do in this situation I go ahead and grab the document and start reading it. You just have to sign it, all it says is what I told you, he says as he waves his hand in an impatient manner. Reading something before signing it is something that my mother has drilled into me, 
and something that has been a sticking point in any story shared by both Judy and Alana over the past few years. Getting him to wait on me was just a perk as far as I was concerned. The document itself was very much what he had said it was. The front of it explained in big letters that the Baron was calling forth conscripts for an undetermined amount of time and spelled out what the punishment for desertion was, a long fifty years in jail. That is until you turned it over, on the back of the document was a whole list of reasons for exemptions to conscription. There were quite a few reasons why somebody might be exempt from conscription. Having two children under the age of twelve, being under the age of fifteen, or being widowed were all reasons mentioned. Also mentioned was that for them to apply a person had to refuse conscription when it was called and not later. While all of that made me think a lot less of the recruiter, there wasn't anything there that would help me avoid the draft, so I continued reading. Halfway through the document was a small box stating, mark this box if you wish to receive monetary compensation instead of keeping the provided gear. 10 Gold 10 gold was a lot more than most people made in a few years working. I wonder why it would be placed there. The reminder of the document described the gear that was to be provided for us. The gear didn't sound like much, all in all it was probably worth no more than 2 gold, so I decided to question it. Is there something missing from the description of the provided gear? I asked the recruiter. My dad is a blacksmith, and an order like this is worth about 2 gold, 3 at the most. Nothing is missing, he says with a hint of irritation, replacing the smug smile he's had since the beginning. How am I supposed to mark this then? I would like to make sure I get my ten gold. I had no use for their provided gear after all of this was over. Anything but leaving it blank would do, he says as he starts to put forth an emotionless expression. I also catch a quick smirk that vanishes as soon as it appears on the recessionitis face. I sign the document, pick up the coin, and give a nod to the receptionist, before I start heading for the exit. I take no more than two steps, before a thought occurs to me. If I was going to get fucked over by something like this, I might as well go down swinging, so I turn back. Excuse me miss, I am expecting a friend of mine, to pass through here sometime in the next few days. Any chance I could leave him a message? I ask, feigning having just remembered something. She gives me a questioning look with a raised eyebrow, but responds with a terse, sure. I walk over to the bar, grab a small empty blackboard stand that rests there, I see a few more spread out listing out drink prices throughout the hall, as well as a piece of chalk, do you mind if I borrow this? I ask the bartender who has been following the situation, but didn't seem all that interested until I approached him and responded with a lazy nod. I fill the board in the biggest letters I can fit and move to place it on the receptionist's desk. Sir, she asks, confused, not having seen the message. My friend is a very private person, he wouldn't feel comfortable with me giving out his name, I'm sure he will get the message if I just leave it here. I say, placing the board on the reception desk. The board has the words, to my friend, always read the back of a contract written on it. As the receptionist reads the board a small chuckle escapes her as I also hear the recruiter gnashing his teeth. The receptionist schools her face before stating, I'm sorry to say that you can't just leave a message like this for your friend, the recruiter's face breaking out into a smug smile again. To leave a message like this in the guild would have to qualify as a request. One as simple as this will need no filing, but it still requires payment, she continues as she breaks her professional expression to show a smile. If you would pay the cost of one copper I will make sure the message is promptly displayed for you friend. Taking the coin out of my pocket and placing it on the desk I give her a quick nod and head for the exit and my brother's house looking to talk to him and Kate about this unforeseen predicament. Commander Grievous, POV the last few days had been a clusterfuck of paperwork. The recruitment had sent the entire city into disarray. Considering that this was the fourth one in the last twenty years, you would think that they would be at least a little more prepared for it. This was a simple dispute between barons over a newly discovered silver deposit that sat on the boundary line between their territories. It wasn't even that large. What it was was an excuse for these small little skirmishes to happen. The whole reason it was allowed was because the king himself encouraged his nobles to have them once every thirty years. 
they were relatively low in terms of casualties, at most 3%. It also provided his citizens with some combat experience should he ever need to call on them for a real war. The reason why Baron Stillwater was such an eager participant was a different reason entirely. He would offer leadership positions to the sons and daughters of higher nobles. He would ingratiate himself and his family to theirs, and their sons and daughters would gain experience as commanders on a battlefield. That he had spent the last nine years without participating in one was a small miracle. This was also the only time that I felt my complete rejection of noble ass kissing was a detriment to my troops. As all the other commanders would ingratiate themselves to the baron, I would always be the one called up as the mandatory guard regiment to join the skirmish. Despite this I always made sure to take care of my men and in the last three encounters we had not lost anyone. And I will make sure to extend that streak. As I was looking over the contested area map to plan any engagements I heard a quick knock at the door. Come in I called expecting my assistant. I have the new conscript list for you, sir. Roger said as he slid an almost filled page over to me across the desk. Most of the conscripts were rounded up in the first two days, with only stragglers being brought in later. I take a cursory glance at the names when I get a familiar feeling about one of them. I stare at the entry of one Ajax 15 and why I should recognize it. Ajax was a fairly unique name after all. It took only a few seconds to remember the vampire incident from five years ago. It was likely that this Ajax was the same as the one back then. He was the brother of one of the most promising recruits into my unit, being level 24 at only 23 years of age. Walter, Wayland is being excused from this conscription on the account of his recent newborn, isn't he? I asked my assistant. Yes, sir, he is. A questioning tone in his voice. Have this Ajax moved over to take his place? I say underlining the name. If I may ask, sir, why? Do you know this Ajax? Dot. Roger was a good assistant, if a little too inquisitive for his own good. It was still quite a challenge to grab him from under the noses of the other commander, his skill to identify level making him quite a catch. You know Tom, don't you? He's most likely his younger brother. I say a little anger, creeping into my voice. Tom had mentioned his brother might be coming into town, I was going to look into it and make sure whatever guard had conscripted him upon entering the city would join the expedition and be on latrine duty. Tom is quite talented, but are you sure about this? he asks. A good question, if one he should be voicing. I also know there is a lot more to be gained by offering the spot to the son of an influential merchant, despite my dislike for it. Tom being his brother is all the reason I need. I say, feeling that if I can help out one of my men by just moving an assignment like this I always would. But if you need further reason, Kate is his sister-in-law. Walter's face changes to a look of surprise. Kate is arguably one of the best healers in the guard right now, the only ones who can match her being near retirement, building goodwill with her is worth a lot more than any merchant in this backwater town would be willing to pay. I see my assistant nod in understanding before saluting and leaving the room. Ajax, how unlucky can this kid be? He was caught up in the vampire incident a few years ago, and now he shows up two days before conscription ends. Chapter 59 As Ajax started to walk away from the amused receptionist and the fuming recruiter a wave of laughter broke out from the tables across the room. All of the attendees were adventurers, and despite their merry attitude and drinking, they all had enough perception and innate curiosity to pay attention to the conversation to catch the last few exchanges. One or two of the older ones went so far as to give Ajax a pat on the shoulder as he passed by their tables. Knowing what was going on now helped Ajax put things together with the change in the atmosphere he witnessed as he walked to the adventurers' guild. There were barely any food stands left in the streets they were replaced in turn by stalls selling long-term provisions. You could hardly go more than a few streets without seeing someone selling some type of jerky or another. The other thing being sold throughout was armor and weapons. From the look of what was on sale and how people were going about buying it Ajax could tell that this was clearly not the first time many of them were called up like this and that the gear he will be provided as part of conscription wasn't going to be very good. 
Spears seemed to be going for quite a premium. While he would understand why the army would be looking to outfit and conscript with Spears, seeing as they took the lowest amount of time and skill to use at a decent level, why would the people be looking to buy them as well? Wanting to satisfy his curiosity, he approached the next weapons merchant on his way to Tom's house. Excuse me, sir. I was wondering why it is that spears are being sold at such a higher price? He decided to be upfront about what he wanted to know. If there was a good reason for it any half-decent merchant would take the time to explain it in hopes of making a sale. Good eye there, young man. Indeed, spears are the thing to get right now, he complimented, while trying to draw attention to one of his more expensive spears. Equipment Ajax ignored since the gear he already had made by his father outstripped almost everything he had seen on his walk in the city. The reason why people want to buy spears is safety. If they are looking for safety wouldn't a shield be a much better choice? He had barely seen more than one or two stalls selling shields. Oh no. That would be a very bad idea if one was looking to be safe. The merchant looked a little outraged by the idea that getting a shield for safety was a good idea. Seeing his confusion he began to explain. You see, while it may have been a few years since the last little skirmish, the baron has dragged us all in, anyone over thirty years of age has seen at least two of them before. Since one of the baron's sons left the city a few days ago going towards the mountain range, this conscription is for a squabble over one resource or another with a neighboring baron. Very few people tend to die in these engagements, half of those that do come from foolhardy young people charging veteran soldiers. Now because the conscripts they have will be low on training, the most used tactic will be a shield wall with a row of spears behind them. Anyone bringing a better-looking spear with them than what they are provided is more likely to be part of the second row, whereas a good shield will see you on the front lines. Taking in the information Ajax just nodded his thanks and started to walk in the direction of his brother's house once more, without even glancing at the wares to the disappointment of the merchant. Ajax was a little confused about what the vendor meant about charging soldiers, but those were questions he could ask his brother. Thanks to his increased perception Ajax was able to notice the change in lighting a lot easier, despite the amount of light needed for him to see being lower. After the last experience he had in the city after dark he decided to get to his brother's house, before then, despite the lack of vampires in the city. As he got there he knocked on the door and waited. The door started to open a few seconds later. Yes, how can I he Ajax? Kate's voice started off bored before growing welcoming as she registered who was at the door. Please come in. Evening Kate. Ajax greeted her back and was a little surprised at how she was hurrying him inside. Contrary to how it had been before, when Ajax walked into the kitchen he found the table to be stacked high with all sorts of different vials of liquid and bandages instead of the usual evening meal. Please excuse the mess. We're going to be deploying for this skirmish in a few days, and I was still getting everything ready. She brought up a few packs and started emptying the table. Don't worry about it, I will probably need to be doing the same thing. I just got conscripted. Ajax just waved away her apology and complained about the bothersome situation. You got conscripted? Did you happen to catch the name of the guard who let you into the city, her voice going cold and carrying a promise of violence? Darren, I think his name was, said to tell Tom he sends his regards. Throughout their talk, the table was quickly emptied of medical provisions and filled with food that still needed to cool for a little while longer. Darren did what? After all the regulations he let people skim by while on patrol he goes and records you, her pitch and volume rising before her voice going into a quiet whisper he barely caught. When I get my claws on him. Oh no, he didn't recruit me. He just waved me on into the city. I went to apply to the Adventurers Guild before coming here hoping to get there before they closed. Turns out they have a recruitment ban and some recruiter there approached me. Hearing his words the fire in Kate died and she slid into a chair and put her head in her hands. How much bad luck can one kid have? In fact I asked a bit around town about whatever is going on and people don't really seem as worried about the conscription as I thought they would be. 
One of the vendors even said that half of the deaths would come from foolhardy people charging soldiers, he decided to get a better idea of what was going on. Well he's not wrong about that, she muttered to herself before looking back to Ajax and started explaining. You see, this skirmish is going to be a small campaign against another baron over a resource or another. Since they are part of the same dukedom if not under the same viscount, they aren't really looking to have people die in combat. The whole thing won't take longer than four months as the harvest will need to be harvested and they won't be willing to risk that. The conscription barely covers three cities on each side so I doubt there will be more than 20,000 people altogether. As for the part about charging soldiers, that refers to the guards. Each of the cities also sends a contingent of guards along. There always are a few brave and stupid people thinking they can just charge to a quick victory and end up trying to ambush or charge a bunch of armed guards. Even with that the death toll is rather low, though the injuries sustained give healers a thorough workout. As she finished speaking, they both heard the door open, followed by Tom's voice carrying through. Quite a bit anxious about going. Tom said. It'll all be fine, we've been through this before and have yet to lose anyone. The new voice wasn't one that Ajax recognized. I'm home Kate. Tom called out a few seconds before entering the room. Ajax. Welcome, when did you get here? Hey, Tom. Ajax said as he moved and gave his brother a hug I actually just got here a few minutes ago. Well Ajax, I'd like you to meet Captain Rogers. He's been my direct superior since I joined Commander Grievous. Pleasure to meet you. Ajax said politely, offering his hand. Likewise, I've heard a bit about you already, though you're quite a bit bigger than I expected when Tom said he had a younger brother, the captain replied while taking the offered hand. Congratulations on finally reaching the age of majority. Tom continued, Normally I would say we should go out to a restaurant to celebrate, though it would be best if you stayed inside until all this conscription business is sorted. Sadly, that ship has already sailed, said Kate, drawing everyone's attention. Chapter 60 After Kate dropped that bombshell Ajax went through explaining everything that happened again and how he got conscripted. It was quite heartening to see that the captain had the same reaction when he thought that a member of the guard conscripted him as Tom did, both having been very similar to Kate's. He did a much better job of pointing out that it wasn't Darren that got him conscripted this time. Now that his brother was also here, he went much more in depth and explained the interaction he had with the recruiter he met at the guild branch. While Kate and Tom weren't all that happy about him drawing the ire of the recruiter, Captain Rogers found the whole thing hilarious. Normally something like this wouldn't be so underhanded, the older guard explained. You see, these skirmishes are actually encouraged by the royal family in order to keep a somewhat competent militia. With that they also enforce a minimum paid wage for them as a way to subsidize the population and the nobles don't really complain about it all that much. Our case is a little bit different from the norm however, you see Baron Stillwater is quite a bit more aggressive than other nobles. This stems from both his lack or resources in his territory as well as a dedication for his family to rise in status. This leads to him participating in a lot more than the one skirmish every quarter century or so. The fact that we have had nine years since the last one is in fact surprising, and most likely because there has been no excuse for it. How do these skirmishes help his family rise in status? This was not something that Ajax could understand. Conflict with other nobles didn't usually lead to a rise in status. That's because he always has his heir be one of the commanders and then offers the other spots to heirs of other greater families in hopes of building connections while getting them combat experience. This does lead him to run into financial issues however, and to underhanded methods of getting around the minimum payment required by law, he grimaced slightly when he mentioned the noble heirs leading the war. Sounds like you've been through this a few times already. Ajax remarked. Oh, I have. This will be my sixth one already, he said brightly as if he was talking about a party rather than battle. Now while only one commander is sent out from each city with the idea of keeping the guards ready for war and not leaving the city lawless, our case is once again a little special. 
If by special, you mean that Commander Grievous has a serious aversion to mingling with nobles more than necessary, and as such always ends up being the one going, then yes we are a little special. Kate scoffed, this was something that had clearly been mentioned already, with that the conversation changed to some much lighter topics. Mostly, Tom, Ajax, and Kate catching up with each other after five year while enjoying the meal. It was right as the meal ended, however, that a knock at the door could be heard. Thinking it was odd for someone to be coming by at this hour, Tom went to open the door, the captain behind him on his way out with Kate and Ajax following behind. Opening the door, they found a guard from the night shift with an official-looking scroll. Evening Tom, Captain Rogers. The guard gave Tom a light greeting and shot off a salute after noting the captain. I'm here to deliver this to a one Ajax, 15 year of age, I was told I was likely to find him here. I'm Ajax. Ajax said from behind and moved forward to receive the scroll. After delivering the message, the guard saluted the captain and with a nod to Tom left. Ajax proceeded to open the scroll and read through it. The message seemed to be rather short, but the fro on Ajax's face seemed to worry both Tom and Kate. What's it say? Tom asked apprehensively. It says that instead of reporting in the city square tomorrow morning I should instead report to the guard compound at noon, it also suggests that I should bring my bow. Ajax reread the message while sharing the information. The old man still moves as fast as ever. Captain Rogers shook his head ruefully with a smile at the information. As he was greeted by three questioning looks, he decided to expand. It seems the commander caught wind of your conscription and moved you over into our unit. The news seemed to click and both Tom's and Kate's eyes went wide as their eyebrows rose. I think Wayland is exempt from conscription on account of his recently born daughter and you're filling his spot. I hope you know how to hunt since you'll most likely be doing that instead of keeping watch, the captain said with a teasing grin. Much to the captain's surprise Ajax returned the grin at the news that he will be hunting. I've been a hunter for my village for the last five years, before I headed over here to join the Adventurers Guild. A few more months as a hunter won't be anything I can't handle. With that the captain left and the three all headed off to bed, tomorrow was going to be their last day to prepare. After waking up and eating breakfast, the day got a lot more busy than any of them would have expected. The news that Ajax had an enchanted backpack came as a bit of a surprise to both Kate and Tom, especially after seeing the size it could store. With all this extra space, Kate went into overdrive and had sent both of them all over the city to gather things for all sorts of rare situations that she had disregarded because of not having the space to take them into account. The extra rations take up quite a bit of space in case they were ever separated from the supply line at any point. All three of them had thought that being cut off from supplies was something that would be very unlikely yet last night, they were brought in one the fact that while Commander Grievous would still be in charge of all of them, he would have to go along with the plans decided by whatever nobles were running the show. It was then that Ajax thought to just have Judy quickly gather everything for them, she could probably do it faster and cheaper than all three of them working together. Sadly, he was told that both she and Alana were out of the city on a job from their organization. After inquiring about it, Tom shared that both had been sent out of town specifically to miss out on the recruitment and would return a day or two after it ended. This news was bittersweet for Ajax as he didn't have to worry about them while at the same time meaning he wouldn't see them until the end of this whole thing. With all their preparations completed, they went to bed early and were some of the first ones to present themselves in the guard courtyard the following day after a hearty breakfast. They all mingled with the incoming members of the unit, Tom and Kate introducing Ajax to their colleagues. While Tom was part of the soldier makeup of the unit, Kate was with the so-called support group. Healers were far too scarce and valuable for them to be risked in this kind of unimportant skirmish with serious repercussions should one kill a healer on the enemy side. As noon came Commander Grievous finally arrived on top of a magnificent horse and decked out in some eye-catching armor. A once-over with, since mana, told Ajax that the gear was enchanted, even spotting a mana core used to power said enchants here and there on the gear. As soon as the commander arrived the whole company began to move. 
The reason they only started at noon was because guards were expected to move a lot quicker than the conscripted soldier. Something they did catching up to them long before nightfall. Setting up the tents was a relatively quick operation for the guards, though the rest of the force seemed to have some troubles with it. It was at this spot that they would meet up with their new noble commanders, tomorrow, and set up their main supply point relay. Ajax was exempt from camp setup as he headed out to hunt as soon as they reached the point. None of the guards complained about it as the chance at fresh meat, instead of rations, was one they all welcomed. Tom, POV. While Ajax went off to hunt, Kate and I decided to pay a visit to the commander and thank him for having Ajax move over to our unit. Knowing he was going to be with us for any of the fighting made it much better for me. As Kate and I entered the small tent the commander insisted on having, so as to not draw fire in case of enemy raids, we formally greeted him. Lay off the formalities, Commander Grievous said the moment the formal greeting finished. We just wanted to thank you for having Ajax move to this unit. I said. Think nothing of it, the commander waved off our thanks. I have to say I was surprised to hear you have a twin brother Tom, said Walter. His statement made all of us turn towards with a questioning look. Ajax is my younger brother, not my twin Walter. I said. Wow, he must be really talented then. After all, he caught up in level with you. His light statement rendered the room silent for a few long seconds. He what? Kate, the commander, and myself all exploded after we processed what Walter just said. Chapter 61 Tom, POV Wow, he must be really talented then. After all, he caught up in level with you. His light statement rendered the room silent for a few long seconds. He what? Kate, the commander, and myself all exploded after we processed what Walter just said. How do you even know this? I quickly followed up. The information left me stumped. I know for a fact that even if Ajax really is already level 24, there is no chance he would even think about sharing that piece of information with anyone. Even Kate and myself would probably have to notice something off and ask about it before he would share it with us. Walter was an alright guy, he was two years ahead of me and got promoted to be the commander's aide one year after he joined the unit, but he was definitely not someone Ajax would share any personal information with. I can see it. Walter chose to answer me after a few seconds recovering from the shock of our reactions. It's why I got promoted so quickly, I have the ability to tell the level of any being. Sadly anything else such as name, age, Stats or skills is not available, but it still makes for a great ability, especially since the ability comes with some innate privacy penetration. That piece of knowledge was the second bomb dropped in the span of a 10 seconds, any type of scanning skill that had privacy penetration was a rare skill. So why is he being so open about it? It took me a few seconds to put it together and a quick look at Kate let me know we came to the same realization. His ability was already documented as part of his file, so us knowing meant nothing with so many others already aware of it. In fact many had known about him for a while and this had led to him receiving privileges, that could be why he was so nonchalant about sharing Ajax's level. That and I doubt he was aware of just how young Ajax was, he was a decent bit taller than me after all. Commander, would it be alright for me to ask to keep Ajax's level private? Kate seemed to be a lot quicker to come to a decision and ask the commander. Hmm, yes, I can see why that would be appropriate. While I have no problem with doing that he will not get to skimp out on his duties, both as a hunter and as part of this unit should we be involved in any skirmishes, the commander rubbed his chin as he thought everything through. Both Kate and I let out a heavy sign and slumped down a little. With that out of the way all that was left was to inform Ajax of all this. Though a skin Ajax to be secretive about himself was a lot like asking water to be wet. But that's all I will do, the commander continued. I've been told that beside Baron Stillwater's heir, we will be having two others invited over for this excitement. I don't know who they are, but if any of the brats come with someone that can pick him out, there's nothing I can do. His words were like a bucket of cold water. He was right nonetheless. 
It was in fact highly likely that whoever else was coming here to lead will have someone with the ability to view people's levels, we just had to hope they couldn't see their age as well. His words also seemed to have a different effect on the other person in the room. I will follow your orders, sir. But can I ask why we are keeping this all a secret? We've been all but shouting about how talented Tom here is for the past two years. His brother being a bit more talented shouldn't matter all that much. You're both right and wrong there Walter, the commander gently said. Yes we've been bragging a little about Tom's potential and talent, but Ajax is more than just a bit more talented. If I'm not remembering wrong from five years ago Ajax should have turned 15 just last week. Oh, he is a bit younger than I thought, but being level 24 at the age of 20 shouldn't be that big of a deal that it would need to be kept quiet. Walter seemed to have misunderstood. You misunderstand, Walter. I said. The commander met Ajax when he was ten years old. He turned fifteen last week, and he is eight years younger than me. Walter's eyes went wide at this, and he finally put together why Kate and I were so worried about his level getting out. The fact that Ajax was participating at the age of fifteen was downright common. That a level twenty-four was taking part in this skirmish was actually a little below the average, as most people recruited for this were around level twenty-seven. That a fifteen-year-old was level twenty-four, however, was a big deal. I could only imagine what chaos it would cause if they found out he could actually wield mana as well. He's level twenty-four at fifteen years old Walter all but shouted and I turned a worried look towards the entrance of the tent while Kate gave him a look colder than ice. Yes, and I would appreciate it if you tried to keep that to yourself and not announce it to the whole camp, the general said while shaking his head. Thank you once again commander, I said as both Kate and myself bowed our heads in gratitude. Oh. Enough of that. Let's just go out and get something to eat, the commander waved us off. As we exited the tent it was already getting dark out and all the small fires did more to light up the camp than the last few rays of Sunday. As we were approaching what would be the mess tent I could see the three other hunters of our unit all sitting around on makeshift chairs while the cooks were nearby busy preparing what looked like a deer and two boars for dinner, it would seem that the commander would have to wait a bit for dinner to be ready. At this point I was looking around for Ajax, I knew he left an hour earlier than the other hunters and that was three hours ago. It took me five minutes to spot him and when I did he was only now returning to camp empty-handed. The only thing he was carrying was the oversized backpack that only seemed appropriate because of Ajax's own size. Well, well, well. It seemed we picked up a dud hunter for a ride along. Spencer said right as Ajax approached the mess area. I'm sorry that the other hunters will have to overwork themselves without Wayland here. Spencer is the narcissistic asshole who took a liking to Kate. He is also the third-born son of a first-generation landed knight. Despite his mother only being a concubine, or perhaps because of it, he seemed to have a discriminatory view on commoners. That Kate would rather choose to be with me rather than him seemed to have needled him some and after three years of getting nowhere with me, he was looking to take that out on Ajax now. The other hunters threw dirty looks at his statement though they didn't throw any friendly ones towards Ajax either, considering he did in fact come back empty-handed. For all the commotion Ajax didn't seem to do anything other than take in the area, throw a scowl in Spencer's direction and head towards the cooks who were butchering the animals. After getting to the cook's workstation, he proceeded to take off and open his backpack a few feet away. He then pulled out the body of a deer, a large boar that couldn't have been lower than level 17 and to the surprise of everyone a bear. They were all already gutted and skinned as well as bagged in something leak-proof. Where would you like me to put these? I would like to have the bags back before tomorrow as carrying corpses without them makes the pack all dirty and it's a pain to wash out. Ajax said. Vlad, you take the boar and the deer and start making dinner, we're behind schedule as it is, Eddie you keep butchering the rest of these and start preserving them, I'll handle the bear. The head cook quickly took in the situation and gave instructions. I'll make sure to have the bags cleaned and ready for you in the morning, thanks for butchering them yourself. Seeing Ajax just nod he continued, I have to say, I am curious as to why you would bring in a bear though. 
Ah, uh, Ajax seemed to blush a little at this, to the good-natured amusement of the guards who took in the scene. My village had to let deer and boar population build back up after a cobalt group entered our hunting grounds. They never made it to the village, but bear was the only thing we could hunt for ourselves for a while so I kind of got a taste for it. Well then, I'll make sure to have a big bear steak ready for you tonight, the cook said and he patted Ajax on the shoulder twice before dragging the bagged bear after Vlad towards the kitchen tent. Following that Ajax took a quick look around and his eyes stopped once they landed on me. As soon as he saw me, he pulled the pack up on his shoulders with considerably less weight than it had before and headed straight for me. Much to my and a few others' amusement he passed the slack-jawed Spencer without so much as sparring him a glance. I left before accommodations were put up, do you know where I can lay down my pack? As he said this, he also leaned in for a quick hug which I thought was a little out of character for him. As he wrapped his arms around me and squeezed slightly for a quick hug, he also whispered in my ear. I also have the body of a level 25 bear still on me, but I'd rather not draw that much attention to myself. I looked at him wide-eyed for a brief moment before shaking my head. Yeah come with me, I think we can figure this out. This was more like the paranoid Ajax I remembered, a quick nod to the commander and Kate and I led Ajax off in the direction of our three-person tent. Now I had to figure out how we would deal with the butchered corpse of a level 25 bear. Chapter 62 The guards working under Commander Grievous managed to set up a much better camp than I expected. After all, this was only just a one-night stop before we would reach the meeting place where the Baron's son and whatever other noble commanders would join us and the rest of the conscripts. The terrain where we would fight was specifically chosen so that a river, a forest, an open plain and a small pass were all included in the approximate geography. To me, this seemed like an odd place for the skirmish to take place considering all the different ways it could backfire, but I wasn't part of the command structure, and if I was lucky, I wouldn't be noticed by it either. After not realizing this was a one-night stop and going back out to collect the traps I laid down I returned without much fanfare and passed the second bear corpse on to the cooks after removing its mana core. While I did receive some good-natured jokes from them on the topic, they left it at that. Clearly, I wasn't the only one with too much enthusiasm and too little paying attention. The cooks were all good at their job. Unlike all the army food stereotypes I was expecting from my previous life, I received a juicy bear steak, though some decently leveled skills probably had something to do with that. After finally turning in for the night, happy with the fact that neither I, nor Kate, had to take a night shift for the camp's protection, we stayed up a little longer while Tom went straight to sleep. So, who was that asshole that tried to pick a fight with me earlier? I asked Kate. That was Spencer, she said as a frown flashed over her face. He is the first generation son of a landed knight. He isn't the heir of the estate either, but has adopted the commoners are beneath him attitude despite that he will most likely end up as just a common branch family with the title of noble in name only. We had met about four and a half years ago, a little after your visit in fact, when Tom was getting scouted to join this unit. We didn't really interact much and just kept our distance from him without much problems. All of this changed when we finally entered the unit three years ago. You see, healers are quite rare for the guard so their assignment into units isn't really formalized. Most of us don't join units, usually preferring to work the barracks. My wanting to join a unit combined with my talent caused quite the stir for a few months. You see it was customary for a healer to join the same unit as their spouse should they have one in a unit. The other commanders weren't happy not to be able to grab and use me for political advancement with the local nobility. It was at this time that Spencer realized his love for me and expected me to just rush into his arms at the chance to join a noble. That obviously didn't happen and he has had it out for Tom ever since. He must have picked up on the resemblance between the two of you and decided to cause trouble. I just shook my head at the situation, it didn't even deserve words to acknowledge how stupid it was. But that's nothing more than an inconvenience. The thing you should be more worried about is the fact that you are level 24 at the age of 15. She changed the subject to something I wasn't expecting. I looked surprised at her for a few moments. 
Though the fact that she had this information certainly made Tom's subdued reaction at my killing a level 25 bear make a lot more sense. How do you know my level? The recruiter who enlisted me didn't have an inspect skill that could see levels. I asked, curiously. While I was surprised at her knowing this, it wasn't something that I should be paranoid about, she had much more sensitive information about me than my level. The commander's aide, Walter, also has an inspect skill. His can only find out the level, but mistook you and Tom for being much closer in age and just let it slip. Thankfully only Tom, the commander, and I were with him when he did, and the commander told him to keep it to himself. I sighed with relief as she finished speaking. I'll have to thank him for that. I mumbled. You probably should, but that is not urgent. While the commander is going to keep his aid from spilling the beans about your surprising level and age combination that is all he is going to do. When we meet up with the main forces tomorrow, there is a chance that whatever nobles got invited here might have someone with them that also has the inspect skill, she brought up a good point I hadn't realized. Thanks for the heads up. I'll try to make it so that I am always busy and gone somewhere in the forest should they make their way through camp. I started with the foundations of what could only be a shaky plan. This was even more true, considering my interaction with the other hunters. Shortly after I delivered my second bear, to the cooks, the three of them all had a quick word with me. Unlike Spencer, they all seemed genuinely happy with my competence to hunt and congratulated me on my kills, they also let me know not to bring in that much food at once if it's not requested, since it would either overwork the cooks or send the unit into a food coma and those were not mutually exclusive. If you don't mind me asking, how did you get to level 24 so quickly? I am barely at 23, she said. Hmm, I took a few seconds to ponder how I would answer that. You don't have to tell me if you don't want to. Just forget I asked. She quickly said when she noticed me not answering. It's fine, you already know quite a bit about me and have already proven trustworthy with that information, so I might as well tell you. I reassure her. Would you mind if I explained on the trip tomorrow? It's a bit of a lengthy explanation, and I'm going to tell Tom as well so I'd rather only do it once, with that out of the way we both went to sleep. The following morning, the speed with which the camp got packed up and we started moving surprised me. Everyone had put in an hour's work, packing up, before people started having a meat-heavy breakfast in small groups. It wasn't more than two hours before we were fully packed up and already moving. As we moved Kate, Tom and I got a bit of space between us and the group as I started to explain to them how exactly I leveled so high and about my extra stats. They had proven trustworthy so sharing that with them was a good step towards letting go of my paranoia. So you're saying you already have more than 1,000 stats total? Kate asked me after I finished the overview of my explanation. Yep. I answered in fact, since you are a caster, that means you probably split your stats with only a few points going into any physical ones, besides vitality. If we could somehow get you to also be able to save points to spend later, I think you could squeeze out a few more forced points in them. This idea had only occurred to me after seeing how heavily she was breathing despite the relative light weight she had on her back for the duration of the march. You know, that's not a bad idea. It's not like I use those stats for anything really, so any point I can avoid spending in them is another one I can put towards another stat. She seemed positively giddy at the idea. Do you think you could teach me about that as well? asked Tom. I might be able to, but I don't see any real benefits in it for you. Even if you save up the points, it will be decades before you even raise a single point in any of your physical stats, so I highly doubt saving them will help you since you will be very weak for your level if you do. I pointed it out to him. Won't that be the same case for Kate, about the time it takes, he asked a bit downcast. Not really, since her physical stats are not that high, she will have a lot of an easier time raising them. With them in the 30s range, I am guessing, based on this track, it might take her a month or two of a strict workout regimen in order to gain one or two points that should be sustainable until she reaches the late 40s. Kate's mood lifted considerably at the idea that she could still work to gain almost two levels worth of stats, 
It was almost like she took a stamina boost and had pushed through a march to the meeting point without taking a break on the wagons like the mages of the unit. Once we made it close to the meeting point, we all spent the next hour setting up our permanent spot. Our tents were specifically made so we managed to combine the six that we had, counting the spares Kate insisted we take with us, into a large tent with three compartments. Two for them and I to sleep in and another we would use as a living room. Not three minutes after we were done, someone, Walter I suspect from the look he was giving me, showed up at our tent. Tom, you are to report to the commander now, he nodded to Tom who started walking towards the command tent. Kate, Ajax, he said you could join him if you want since this will probably affect you too. Chapter 63 As Walliter led the three towards their commander's tent they all exchanged some worried looks. After the conversation he had with Kate the previous night as well as the talk through their whole march Ajax was feeling rather good about this whole situation. Sure being conscripted was not exactly how he had planned to spend his time, but he could use it to bring his skill levels up to where they should be for someone of his stats. This new development was something that he hadn't expected. What reason would the commander have for Tom specifically to join him right after they had started setting up their main camp? Not to mention the ominous warning that he and Kate might be affected by it as well. As they reached the large command tent the two guards acting as sentries didn't so much as nod to them as they moved past. As they entered they took in the scene. The tent looked large from the outside but once inside the space seemed a lot more cramped. In the middle of the tent stood a rather realistic map that had what Ajax assumed to be the terrain nearby fully fleshed out. You're all here. Good, the commander said as he looked up from setting up certain figurines on the map. Reporting, Sir both Tom and Kate straightened into a salute at the commander's acknowledgement or their presence with Ajax a moment behind copying their actions. As their salutes were waved off the commander went and took a seat at the table in the room that was filled with food and waved for them to join him. Rather than sit at the head of the table, he took the seat on one side with Walter sitting behind him as Tom sat opposite him with Kate and Ajax taking a seat beside him. I know you are all probably wondering why I called you here so soon. The commander started talking as he also put some food on his plate and offered them some water. The reason for that is that I just received word, from multiple sources, on who the other noble commanders for this skirmish are going to be. This information made all of them freeze as they politely took the offered drink and a few bits of food here and there. The nobles were probably the last person any of them wanted to get noticed by. While Ajax may be the most prominent of the three, all of them were rather talented and being herded into a retinue of one noble or another this early into their development would either see their potential stifled or chained to said noble house. I understand your reactions, sadly there is nothing I can realistically do about this. One of the two has already arrived. He is the son of an unimportant baron a few ways off whose father Baron Stillwater owed a favor to. The second has not yet arrived is the reason why you are here. The commander's face looked tired as he spoke about this. The second noble is a daughter of Archduke Goldmancer. He stopped there as he let all of them take in that information. It was a good thing he did as all four of them, Walter included, had their eyes wide as plates at the new. There were always only three archdukes, all selected from the prominent dukes of the kingdom, to fill three specific roles. Their family names of the selected are always being overwritten, but they kept their house sigil for as long as they kept the position. House Goldmancer always represented the richest, most affluent of the dukes, House Silvertongue the politically connected and House Steelblade the strongest military. When you say a daughter of Archduke Goldmancer, you mean the daughter of Archduke Goldmancer? The one to break the silence was surprising Walter, him clearly being as taken aback by the news as all of them. Yes, the commander nodded, while Tom and Kate frowned at the news, Ajax had no idea why that specification was necessary. Catching on to the dilemma Ajax was caught in, the commander decided to accommodate him. While Kate and Tom think over the implication, Walter, why don't you explain to young Ajax here what the problem is? Walter quickly nodded and turned to Ajax to speak, if in a slightly lesser volume. 
The current Archduke Goldmanser has risen to prominence a few hundred years ago and has maintained the position longer than any other Goldmanser in history. The added legal scrutiny has always led the position to be a temporary one as other dukes amassed more wealth. Archduke Goldmanser has somehow managed to bring his family into the position at an early age, back when his father was the head of the house. This accomplishment led to him being named heir ahead of his fellow siblings. The surprising and worrisome part is that he only took a single wife in all this time and fathered only one child 18 years ago. His position as head of the house was well established, but with the recent birth of a potential heir, especially as he has been getting on in age, has led to several of his nephews and grandnephews to try and assassinate the girl in hopes of a chance at taking position as the new head of the house. The girl herself is said to be more than a little talented, any information regarding just how talented however is being strictly regulated by the Archduke. That is the reason that I called you here for, Tom, Commander Grievous said. A recent failed attempt on her life has led the Archduke to do a thorough cleansing of his household. During this time, the girl was sent here, with nothing but a single loyal guard and a friend of hers. Your position as our unofficial unit mascot makes you uniquely qualified to be our unit's official liaison with the noble commanders. You are talented and sufficiently well-known as to not be an insult, yet also weak enough as to not pose any credible threat. And, as if this situation wasn't enough of a spin already, the commander seemed to be as frustrated by the troublesome situation as the rest of them, the friend she has brought with her, is the granddaughter of Duke Manashaper. At hearing the name Ajax showed more recognition than either his brother or his sister-in-law. Duke Manashaper was a name he had not only heard about, but actively looked into. He was the only person in the kingdom with an openly known legendary skill. The name of the skill was kept secret, but its effect, supposedly, worked as sort of an automatic reflex that allowed the duke to go on a sort of autopilot to protect himself. While this skill wouldn't seem all that powerful at first glance, it enabled the very reason he was granted the rank of duke. Duke Manashaper was in the unique position of being the only unland duke, he was instead the headmaster of the academy for the simple fact that he could try out new spell incantations without worrying for his own safety as his skill would stop the cast should it be harmful to him. It was widely believed that the man had multiple spell books that he kept to himself thanks to his ability to discover and record new ones. That is, that is quite a lot to take in, Tom admitted, before he steeled himself. What would my new position require? The position itself is actually quite enviable. Walter picked up, his reverie at the incoming information, broken by Tom's question. Outside of unit combat, you are to stay ready at all times to be sent to deliver a message. This means you are exempt from certain duties such as nightwatch or latrine. The only downside is the added scrutiny on you and anyone close to you by the noble and their guards. Tom knew well enough that he should in fact be ecstatic to receive this position. Not only would he receive less work around camp, but also more time to train as his schedule would be kept open should he need to deliver a message. He knew full well his talent, while above average, wasn't special enough to warrant dedicated recruiting by noble houses. The same could not be said about Kate, let alone Ajax. If it does bring any consolation outside of Walter here, and perhaps any of the Archduke company, none of the people on our side of the skirmish have any inspect skill. The commander tried to smooth things over. Your brother's circumstances should stay under wraps easily enough. With the new assignment given, the commander dismissed them and the three of them headed towards their shared tent. Do you think I should move to a separate tent? Ajax broke the silence as they slowly moved through the camp. That might not be a bad idea, Dash Tom started to say. No, someone sharing a tent with their brother and sister in law is normal. Someone changing that arrangement after the liaison position being given to his brother would only invite further scrutiny. Kate interrupted Tom. The best we can do is just stick to our jobs and try not to draw attention to ourselves. Anything else we will just have to react to. Chapter 64 As they were finishing setting up their tent, one of the two guards they saw at the command tent came over to grab Tom. Tom, you are to get ready to meet the nobles. 
It seems the final group will arrive at the base camp in a few minutes, he said. Tom nodded and proceeded to get changed into his armor, after all he had to look presentable as the main liaison. He got dressed very quickly with the help of Kate, showing that he had plenty of experience putting the armor on and taking it off. After he left Kate joined Ajax in their common area where they set up a table. Just before she took a seat she took a quick glance out the tent to make sure nobody was eavesdropping. There is one more thing you need to be aware of Ajax. Since nobody knows about your ability to wield mana you weren't pulled aside for this. You see, despite the fact of there being more than a dozen mages on each side we are not to use our powers offensively against the other side. Kate explained. But why not? Ajax asked, isn't magic the easiest way to deal with groups of people? Hatchet had drilled into him what the advantages of wielding magic were. Yes they are, but the purpose of this skirmish isn't to kill the enemy, it isn't even to secure the resources for the Baron. The purpose is to get some training for the conscripted so that should a real war break out they will have a better chance of survival and prove more useful. But then in a real war wouldn't mages actually go around attacking like this, why wouldn't you prepare for such a scenario if it was that devastating? Yes and no, she replied. Yes in a real war mages would do devastating damage, but in a real war the amount of troops will be much bigger and the number of people able to detect and protect from such spells would be enough so as to counteract this. The only thing you need to be on the lookout for are mage ambush groups that might be looking to infiltrate and destroy the camp supplies, she explained, you see, unlike the conscripted, guard units like ours are also here for training, just of a different type. While the normal conscripted are to face each other in open field, we are to run infiltration, hit and run as well as ambush tactics. They are mainly to be targeted at the other guard units on the other side, but they can also target the main enemy camp. The only suggestion is to avoid any lethal blows, as killing each other is not the point of this exercise whenever engaging the enemy looks to be to land a few blows to signify your victory and then let them retreat, they should do likewise to you. This made a lot of sense, after all in terms of actual combat between people of the same level and skills the fight could swing from one moment to the next, such rules of engagement would definitely prove useful as long as they didn't become a habit in a real war. After Kate was done with her explanation Ajax was called out by his fellow hunters, where they took to explaining his immediate tasks. We are going to split the forest into four for now. As the food storage tent has just been set up, we are cleared to go out and start filling it. The plan is that each of us will take one of the areas, and not only hunt there, but also lay down some traps. These traps aren't to catch anything, but instead to signal, should anyone be passing through. For the next four days, we will all have a chance to go through each of the areas. As such, we will also practice dodging each other's traps for when we need to infiltrate enemy territory. Any questions? The oldest of the hunters asked. Ajax had no questions for them. While all of them were not only much older than him, they were also higher level, with the high end of the army being at around level 40. Surpassing that point while staying as a guard got very difficult even with decades spent on the job because of the slowdown in experience gain. As he made his way through his assigned area Ajax laid down quite a few traps. Though signal traps were not the main ones he was taught by Hatchet for the past five year he had been shown how to put them and managed to adapt most of the different types he knew to do the same. At first, he also wondered why they wouldn't also be putting down other types of traps after setting up the fifth one. It only then occurred to him that they might only do that after they each had a chance to experience all the zones. Why not take advantage of the first few days and get some practice on dodge and traps without being afraid of stepping into any dangerous ones? This realization made him think that the other side might be looking at things the same way. If that was the case, wouldn't now be the best time to try and infiltrate the enemy camp? With this idea in mind Ajax finished setting up his traps, hunted down a bikar, and started planning his activities for tonight. The rest of the day was uneventful, with him just spending time practicing his non-mana skills before dinner and waiting for the sun to go down. He did explain his plan to Kate that he was looking to try and plant one of the listening enchanted items they were provided in the enemy command tent on the first night. 
he would have talked it over with Tom as well, but he hadn't returned yet. Surprisingly Kate seemed to think this was a great idea, since spies that were caught were only imprisoned, him getting caught might actually be a good outcome for staying low during this time. The only downside being that he will be wasting all his time for the reminder of the skirmish. After the sun fully set he headed out. It was a short 30-minute run to the main camp and then he took a longer route through the mountain pass to get to the enemy side. It might take twice as long compared to passing through the open field but that was just asking to get spotted and captured. It was around midnight when he finally reached the enemy camp. Getting in was surprisingly easy as their sentries were all still busy setting up watchtowers. In all honesty, he thought that watchtowers were a great idea, one that he hadn't seen over in his camp, but leaving the camp almost unguarded while setting them up was just asking for trouble. It took him almost no time at all to find the command tent, similar to the one in the camp his side had, it was the biggest tent close to three other big tents, most likely the ones housing the leading nobles for this side. Using his earth magic, he quickly tunneled and crawled his way into the tent from the side so as to avoid the guards sitting at the entrance. Thankfully nobody had stayed behind on the first day, so he had an easy time hiding the listening device. The only question was where to place it. Almost anything could be removed from here. In the end, he decided to hide it under the small tent on the map, covering the large temple representing the enemy base. After all, how often would that piece be moved? Getting out was done through the same tunnel, and afterwards he sealed it back up and used siphon mana to clear away any residue of magic. Just as he started walking towards the edge of the camp and looking to make a quick getaway, he heard a voice call out from behind him. Hey, you, what are you doing here? A soldier on patrol said as he approached him. Ajax had two options now, one to take out the soldier, this was the less useful one as the presence of a spy would be noted and the listening device found, or he could maybe trick him into thinking he was part of their army. Me? he asked, trying his best not to show how surprised he was by the patrol, not being at all on guard against him. I'm just out for a walk. Why are you taking a walk at this hour? We were all told to get a good night's rest, because we are starting some drills tomorrow morning. One of my tent neighbors snores louder than a rooster. I am hoping to tire myself out so I can get some sleep before morning. Hearing the explanation and taking another look at his common clothes, the patrolman gives him a pitying look before he lets him get on with it. He does mention that he should carry on with his walk away from the noble quarters, disturbing one of their sleep is just asking for trouble. On the way back Ajax was ecstatic at his success, he was just deciding how and to whom he should report that he already managed to sneak a bug into the enemy main tactic room. Chapter 65 Ajax was conflicted about how to go about reporting that the bug had been placed. On the one hand, he didn't want to draw any more attention to himself than absolutely necessary, on the other hand he wanted this whole thing to end as quickly as possible, which is why he went to plant the bug in the first place. In the end, he decided that getting to sleep and discussing this with Kate and Tom in the morning was the best course of action, since he was on an obscure path and had been using his stealth skills for the past twenty minutes he decided to spend his mana and pumped siphon mana as well as his stamina, to get back to camp as quickly as possible. With his full stats, the three-hour journey was shortened to twenty minutes. As he got back, both his stamina and his mana were hovering around the one hundred mark. He knew that they would replenish fast enough to be almost filled by mid-morning so he quickly changed out of his gear while catching his breath and crashed into his cot. Kate woke him up later than usual, the following morning, to get ready for breakfast. His stamina had fully recovered after a good night's rest, but his mana still had a few hundred points to go. He quickly got back into his gear and went to the mess tent where he quickly joined Kate and Tom at their table after he picked up his food, luckily they were alone. Morning, he greeted them after he took a seat. Morning, Tom answered back with Kate giving a nod as she took a sip of an herbal drink that was supposed to wake you up. It wasn't coffee, the green coloring sweet taste and slightly syrupy consistency sent that message to him when he first heard of a morning pick-me-up drink. 
How did you little night raid go? Kate asked with a joking tone. Night raid? Tom asked, surprised. What is this about a night raid? Restless here wanted to go on a night raid before they had a chance to properly set up, she explained. And you let him go through with it? Tom asked as Ajax was downing a mug of the herbal drink. He was too out of it, so he decided to wait until they reached a point where they needed his input. Well, why not? Kate said. What do you mean why not? Tom was getting a little worked up. Well, either he gets caught or he doesn't. If he gets caught all that's going to happen is that he will spend the rest of this skirmish as a prisoner. It's not like that puts him in a position to get found out, she just waved him off. But, Tom trailed off, not finding a point to argue. So, how did it go? Kate asked again, giving Ajax a smirk as her ears twitched on top of her head. Better than I could have hoped for, he said as he put down the empty mug. So well in fact that I don't know if I should be reporting it. Oh that well? Tom laughed, just what did you manage to do, get a look at their assault plan? I planted a bug in their war room. Ajax ignored the good-natured ribbing from his brother. I hid it under the piece representing their main camp on their map of the area. This answer wiped both the conspiratory look on Kate's face and the sarcastic one off Tom and replaced them with serious ones. They both knew the importance of what he claimed to have done, and it was big. That type of inside information could swing this skirmish wildly from the start. Since the ones to get the credit and suffer the humiliation should that happen would be the nobles in charge of both sides the spy who did this would be put under a lot of scrutiny. Are you serious? Tom asked, though his tone assured him that the question was rhetorical. To respond Ajax just placed the listening end of the device on the table. So, what do you think I should do with this? Ajax asked, both of them. I would say get rid of it, you definitely don't want that kind of focus centered on you. Kate said, knowing that his level, age and capacity for mana could be found out quickly by any motivated noble with an axe to grind. Wait a moment. Tom cut in. How did you manage to sneak in and plant this? At my confused look, he decided to expand on his question. Did you use your mana in any way? I used it when I returned to cut down on the travel time and catch up on my sleep. Otherwise, stealth and deception are the only skills I used to get in and out of their camp without being noticed. Ajax said. Tom was slightly nodding his head as he got a faraway look in his eyes. Let's bring this up to the commander then, he could probably make use of it without revealing your involvement. Tom said after a few seconds of thinking. Ajax and Kate both exchanged a rather skeptical look, but in the end Tom was the one who knew the commander best and Ajax wanted to trust him after the help in not only being moved to this unit, but also concealing his level. With only a slow nod from both of them the three quickly finished their breakfast and headed towards the command tent. As they reached the command tent Walter was just exiting with a set of empty plates, probably from the commander's breakfast. He stopped after two paces when he saw the three of them walking up to the tent and Tom's determined look. Morning, he greeted them, how can I help you? Can you get us in to talk to the commander? We have something he will want to hear. Tom said drawing strange looks not only from Walter but also the two guards standing at attention at the entrance. All right, he said slowly and returned to the tent only to come back out a few seconds later without the plates. Come on in. When they entered, they found the commander looking standing over the map table. It was similar to the one where Ajax planted the device. Considering that there should also be one in their own main camp's command tent Ajax deduced that they must have used this area quite often for such skirmishes. Unlike the enemy's map, which only had their main camp placed, this one also had the three smaller guard unit camps placed on it. You three again, what is it this time, he said. Tom had warned the both of them as they finished their breakfast and on the way over that the Baron's son had thrown his weight around yesterday after he introduced himself as the liaison and sent him back with some nonsensical orders just to put on a show for the Archduke's party. Well, sir, we wanted your help to deal with a bit of a situation. Tom said as his eyes flickered over to Ajax. Ah, uh, the commander groaned while rubbing his temple. He then addressed Ajax. 
Get it out then, what did you manage to do this early into this mess? After I finished setting out some traps last night, I went to scout the enemy base. Since they were in disarray setting up watchtowers, I was able to infiltrate their camp and place a bug in their command tent. Ajax said as he placed the listening device on the table between him and the commander. The issue is that I don't really want to deal with both the negative and positive fallout should it be known that I am the one who placed it. Both the commander and Walter stared at the device on the table. Where did you place it? Walter was the first one to break out of his shock. Under the piece representing their main camp, it was the only one that was placed in position. Walter looked like he wanted to ask something else, but he was stopped in his tracks by a booming laughter coming from the commander. Now this, this is a problem I am happy to have, he got out between laughs. Leave that with us here and both you and Kate can head on out and carry on with your tasks. Tom, you might as well wait here since I will be sending you over to the main camp with a message very soon. The commander moved over to the table and started writing out a letter. Both Kate and Ajax gave a quick salute and moved towards the exit of the tent when the commander called out to them again. Don't worry about this, I'll keep your name out of it and make sure you get the reward for this. Chapter 66 The rest of the day Ajax spent doing the same tasks as all the other hunters. As he got assigned to another of the quadrants that they had split the surrounding area into and proceeded to hunt for a few boars. The area was relatively full of them and by the end of his time, there he had killed four of them. He could have gotten a lot more of them, but the hunter team as a whole decided not to change the ecosystem of the forest so much. The other part of his job there was to set up new traps. Despite having trained in setting up traps, before doing so, here was a whole different experience. Not only did he have to set up traps in an area that was already trapped, those traps were placed there by his allies. This gave him a lot more freedom. In the first area where he put traps he had to make sure that the traps themselves were self-sufficient to alert the presence of the enemy or a significantly dangerous animal. Here he had a lot more freedom. The first few hours of his time in the quadrant consisted solely of investigating and analyzing the traps laid down by his fellow hunter. The traps were all the usual variants that Hatchet had taught him for the last five years so it didn't take long to see how they worked. One thing he did pick up on was that while this hunter traps were not all that different from his, in fact they were less reliable in differentiating between animals and spies, they were a lot better hidden with a much more sensitive trigger. He took quite a bit of time, but he wasn't able to find out how it was that these traps blended in so much better than his own. If it wasn't for his relatively high perception and stealth skill, he would have missed a few of them entirely. In fact, he wasn't fully confident that he hadn't missed and maybe even triggered a few of them already. Thinking back this area was the one that the lead hunter was in charge of the day before. With these different traps already present here, he had a much wider field of options. A full third of the traps he placed today had been much smaller in scope, this was because the trap's result was not to alert the base but in fact trigger one of these other traps. This was not to say that he didn't have trap chains in his first setup. But because the result would be to always alert the camp he couldn't be as stealthy. He fully planned on discussing and learning from this hunter before the end of this conflict. On the way back to the camp he climbed up high on one of the trees near the edge of the forest so that he could get a good look down at the main camp. From there he saw that not only was the setup much more complete than the day before, but also that they had started to build their own watchtowers. His report from this morning about their presence in the enemy camp must have moved up the timeline for his own leadership. Looking carefully, he worked out that the soonest the first engagement would happen will be two days from now. No way they would be ready to march out before then. As he descended, he headed back and dropped off his butchered kills to the cooks. All of them were very thankful for his extra attention to butcher the animal in the field, this let them have a few blood-drained portions they could start preparing for dinner. He didn't see either Kate or Tom for dinner, he mostly kept to himself, before the other hunters joined him at his table. All right, let's talk about how everyone's day went today. The leader started. The conversation was rather bland and had focused mostly on how many times each hunter had triggered the traps of their fellows throughout the day. Ajax himself had triggered a few of them as he had suspected while he was out there, 
but only a few. In total, he had triggered three, one of which he had even noticed towards the end when he climbed the tree. The other three hunters consisted of two older hunters, the team leader and a veteran who triggered none and one respectively, and a younger hunter who looked to be about Tom's age that triggered five. It seems that the veteran hunter had been through Ajax's section and had even complimented him. He had noticed the trap he triggered right as he did, but there was nothing he could do to stop it from alerting the camp. As he got back to his tent, he found Kate and Tom already there, they had had dinner before him. Hey, do you know what happened with the bug in the end? He greeted his brother, but was understandably a little on edge about the whole thing. Hey. Tom returned the greeting. Yeah, it seems like it will all be all right, at least for now. The commander sent me a message for Baron Stillwater's heir, instead of the whole leadership. He is looking to impress the higher nobles so he didn't even look into it once he got the news that we have a bug placed. You mean he didn't ask about who put it there? Kate asked. No, the commander just said that we have access to a bug already, and he just went with it. The archduke's daughter and the duke's granddaughter did look like they might look into it, but it won't happen right now. As soon as the duke realized what we had he got a shift together to be listening at all times. They are even building a small shed outside the camp that will just be in range to pick up, since these things have such limited range. Well, that was slightly concerning. Ajax didn't know whether it was better or worse to be on the radar of a higher tier noble. Unlike the low nobles, they almost always had people lining up to join their house willingly, so there was no need to kidnap others. On the other hand, they had a much stronger pull to get away with it. What impression did the high nobles give you? The archduke's daughter is very competitive, always out to prove herself. The commander thinks this is because she has always been coddled by having a high number of guards, being the only direct heir of a 600-year-old archduke with countless older cousins and nephews makes that a must. This is probably the first time she got to go out with only one guard. Tom said. She seemed very decisive and active in the strategy meetings I saw. The duke's granddaughter on the other hand is a lot more withdrawn. She didn't seem at all interested in most of the things that were discussed. She also seemed a little shy, mainly keeping to herself and the archduke's daughter. The only time she got involved was when it had anything to do with magic, she seemed very enthusiastic about it, he explained. According to the commander, with her grandfather being who he is, she could have only turned out one of two ways, obsessed with magic, or completely over it. If she finds out that you are a 15-year-old level 24 commoner with access to mana, it might be a problem. Doubly so if she finds out about the way you use it in your fighting, he warned. What does that mean? Kate asked. She had heard that he had access to mana, but didn't know that he took a different approach to its use from the conventional ones. I don't use runic engravings or chanting. Ajax said. He uses mana a lot more like a monster does. He imbues actions directly or keeps a steady flow in a specific effect. Tom explained. It is a lot less mana efficient and the output is also lower, but the speed and versatility he has with it is quite something. But then how will you take part in combat if you can't use your mana without drawing so much unwanted attention? Kate asked. I'll just simply fight without it. According to Hatchet, I fight around level 26 without my mana, a bit more work in my skills, and I can push a bit further. Ajax said. Wait, how strong are you otherwise? Kate asked. While Ajax had mentioned that he had stockpiled some points without spending them for the duration of his apprenticeship, he never told them how high his stats had gotten. Right now, around level 42 or 43. But Hatchet thinks I could push that 50 with my fighting style once I get more used to the new stats. Said Ajax, while he had gotten used to his stats with normal activities, morphing his whole style to accommodate for doubled stats was always going to take more than a week of sparring. Well, that and getting my skills leveled. At that bomb, both looked at him with wide eyes. They had expected him to be stronger than average for all his hard work, but neither had expected him to be able to hit above twice his level. Chapter 67 That discussion had ended with both Tom and Kate taking their time to comprehend his situation. 
Ajax was most likely one of the top five fighters in this unit and could make the push to get into the top three, which was not something they had expected. Tom knew that both the commander and his right-hand man were both over level 50, despite not knowing their exact level. With Ajax being one of the strongest people around in this skirmish, Tom felt a lot more relieved, this meant there was little chance he would get hurt. In the meantime Ajax had finished his breakfast and went to meet with the hunters. All right everyone. Today is going to be quite packed, the leader started. We will first of all go around our original zones to replace all the old traps that got triggered yesterday. Do not place down any new ones, this exercise is not only to increase your knowledge at placing traps, but also to find the best infiltrators for the upcoming months. As such we need to make sure the playing field stays even throughout this testing, afterwards we will all be moving on to a new area. He continued without missing a beat. We are under a time crunch today as we have to get all of this done as well as catching something to eat by the third hour afternoon. After that we all have to report for training, with the entire army moving in as little as two days the commanders want to have the army moving through its paces. With his orders received Ajax just nodded and went off to reset the traps. The process of resetting the traps was rather easy, though he did have to take very special care and follow a map to dodge the new traps placed there by his fellow hunter the previous day. With the small amount of time available Ajax barely had the time to set new traps in the area he was assigned while also only catching a single bear, even then he only had time to gut and skin without the time to properly drain it of blood leaving that for the cooks. It seems that their presence has scared off the local fauna so they will be needing to venture further, as he made it back to camp and prepared to head off to join the rest of the unit at the main base for the military training he found out that he had joined the lead hunter in not triggering a single trap that day, whereas the veteran hunter triggered two and the rookie a total of six. Not only that, but all three of the other hunters complained about the lack of game and that they will be needing to head out further. These complaints were cut short by the leader saying that they will be heading out further after their traps have been set up as a group. As they arrived at the military compound, he saw some halfway organized marching taking place in the fields. The hunters all split up and went their separate ways to join their friends in the unit. Ajax himself made his way over to Tom as Kate was in the center of a mob of conscripts who had gotten injured during the training. Her and the other five healers had quite a bit to deal with it seems. The group he kept the closest watch on as he made his way over were the mages. Unlike the expected dozen or so mages from three guard companies, there were almost three times that many gathered at the firing range. He knew he would need to be very careful as any one of them would easily catch him if he wasn't careful when using his mana. Hey, Tom, he greeted his brother as he finally found him, though doing this brought him a lot closer to the command group than he would have liked. How come there are so many mages, has Lessis been really unlucky in recruiting? This was a fair question as it seemed that each of the cities had one or two healers, but the number of mages was unexpectedly large. Tom returned his greeting with a nod before he responded. No, each guard unit brought four mages with them, the rest of them come from the two baron's retainers, he said. Since the archduke's daughter only brought herself, her friend and one bodyguard, we will be down in numbers during this battle. Your bug actually evens the playing field, if not turning it to our advantage. The reason we are moving out in three days is because of information we picked up on their formation. The rest of the day saw the guard units sticking separately in the groups they came in as they all drilled on how to move silently through a forest. This was something that Hatchet had ensured Ajax knew how to do early on in his training, so it was more just a refresher course for him. How come we are training on stealth? Ajax asked Tom. We're technically not supposed to share this, but Tom quietly whispered as he looked around quickly. The information we picked up on was that they will be using multiple flanks for their initial engagement. In response, we will be sending out our guard units to intercept and delay the flanks while winning the main engagement with a number superiority. This plan sounded very well thought out to him, so he continued practicing for the rest of the day while also helping out Tom, for once he was more knowledgeable than his older brother. With Ajax's help Tom quickly became one of the stealthier people in the unit, 
even going so far as to unlock the silent movement skill. A weaker version of Ajax's own stealth skill that was gained by those who put in time and effort but didn't quite have the talent to unlock stealth. How did those noble girls seem to you? Ajax asked once they were taking a break following their last drill of the day. Why are you asking about that? Tom asked with a slightly befuddled look. Wasn't he supposed to stay under the radar of nobles, why would he go about asking about them? I heard in the last two days around the camp that they are very talented, not only that they are similar in age to me, I want to know how I compare with some of the more talented nobles around my age. Ajax explained his curiosity. That makes sense. Tom nodded. Sadly I haven't seen either of them in action, both of them have been a lot more focused on the strategic side of the battle as that is what they came here to practice in the first place. It also seems they might be looking to give you a reward. He added on. Their bodyguard started to ask me about the spy who planted the bug before air, Stillwater, chased me out and looked to focus attention back on himself. He didn't follow me as he doesn't seem to leave the girl's side for anything. Ajax didn't know how to feel about this. He was both happy at being recognized and offered a reward for his initiative. At the same time he was a bit distressed at having not one, but two noble families at least looking into him. The biggest regret he had was this all having happened too early. If he could have at least made it to level 35, or better yet 40, he would have felt more confident in the spotlight. As he was he was strong enough to get noticed, but too weak to stand up for himself. If only this conscription had happened in a few years, he lamented silently. I guess the best I can hope for is to kick the kin down the road. Ajax said as he shook his head, silently lamenting the use of the odd turn of phrase. It did indeed sound quite odd in the local language as opposed to English and he could see Tom frown and open his mouth to ask about it when it happened. A large explosion reached his ears from the direction of the firing range, close, followed by a weak air blast. He reflexively placed his shield between himself and the source of the blast as well as putting himself in position to guard Tom as well. Shockley, however that was not where his preparations ended as he also seemed to have triggered his mana skin, skill by accident, it briefly covering his whole body in a protective layer of mana. As he lowered his shield a little he saw the back of the girl standing close to the firing range, one had deep blue hair while the other a platinum blonde. They were holding hands while extending their free hands in front towards the blast zone. Next to them, he could see a heavily armored knight in expensive equipment. He quickly guessed at their identity and looked around in case he had blown his cover. Luckily, they were surrounded by the other mages in his unit who mostly seemed to have put up a quick raw mana shield, so his activation got lost in the crowd. I'll head back first, was all he said to Tom, before heading back towards the camp. Tom nodded wordlessly, he had also caught a brief glimpse of a light blue sheen covering Ajax's skin for a second as he covered him and knew he was in danger of revealing his mana. As Tom watched Ajax leave neither of them noticed the pair of emerald green eyes that also followed Ajax. The duke's daughter turned his way after feeling one of the fastest and briefest mana responses she had felt from a human. Chapter 68 Tom, POV I watched as Ajax quickly left the main camp and made for ours. I was surprised to see how quick he reacted and managed to put a defensive position not just for himself but also for me. The speed with which his mana reacted was what surprised me the most. I had never seen a mage use mana that quickly when caught unprepared, and that was the time until I saw the blue sheen on his skin, just how fast is he at bringing it up. I turned back towards the firing range, where I see Commander Grievous as well as two similarly dressed people, most likely the commanders of the other guard units, speaking with the two noble girls who just caused the commotion. While I hadn't been around the commander all that long, with my new position as mascot he did introduce me to a few of the nobles in our city before. I could clearly see he now wore an expression I have seen time and time again. It was one that told he was pissed off and couldn't even show that to the person he was talking to. The other commanders seemed to be doing a better job of masking their emotions, but it was pretty clear that all three of them were pretty annoyed at having a false alarm after having to help drill civilians into shape for the upcoming battles. 
looking at the noble girls the blonde one, granddaughter to the duke, assumed a meek position and at least seemed contrite, the navy-haired one, daughter of the archduke, had an aloof expression that all but said it was a minor matter and she might make a repeat performance if it strikes her fancy. I quickly moved to help rearrange some of the dropped training racks that got thrown around in reaction to the explosion as soon as I saw the commander separate from the group. It was best if I made myself look busy as I didn't want his attention on me right now, if I could help it. Thankfully everything just blew over and the camp got itself into the normal rhythm once again. In fact, after the big commotion, the display of power actually improved the troops' morale. The next day was a repeat of the previous only difference being training started in the morning. As our unit finished with our drills I left to stick next to the commander, my job as liaison meant I was almost always on call in case he needed a message delivered. The meeting concluded quickly with all parties agreeing that the plan they had made needed no changes unless the enemy made some of their own. Excuse me, Sir Tom, the Duke's daughter, called out to me. I am not a knight, milady, but how could I help you? I answered as politely as I could at being addressed directly. Already fending off glares from the two future barons about being addressed as a noble. Oh, she seemed to take notice of them as well and gave me an apologetic smile. Is there something I can do for you? I prodded her back on track after a few seconds. Ah, yes. She came back to herself. There was someone in your group yesterday that wasn't here today, a young man with a rather large shield, do you happen to know who and where he is? My thoughts freezed at the question, I could bet my house that she was looking for Ajax, the only question now was why. Could it be that her guard had a strong inspect type skill? Or maybe she won and managed to pick up on him when he came to the main camp yesterday. I didn't get a chance to organize my thoughts and respond before her friend cut in. Really, Lex? she asked. I thought I convinced you that there was no way someone mounted a spell in less than a second yesterday. What you felt was most likely just some expelled mana from a startled mage that just so happened around him. This confirmed to me that they were talking about Ajax. Not only me, but even the commander who had turned around as he was about to exit to see what they wanted with me, gave me a brief but pointed look that told me I would have to answer some questions on this topic and that he put it together Ajax was the focus as well. This is a guard regiment, no way a mage would have a shield, air still water filled in, all guard mages wear robes and use staffs. Though you not seeing him here today does bring up some concerns, are your men neglecting their duty commander? The only people who were not here today are the hunters of our unit, milady. If you're looking for a young man with a shield it must be Ajax. I tried as best as I could to hide my fear, but it seems that I didn't do all that great a job as they picked up on it. Any reason her looking into this Ajax would trouble you? The guard whom I had never heard speak a word since the start of this campaign asked me as his hand went around the hilt of his sword. Ajax is not part of our unit. The commander answered, luckily for me as I didn't have an answer ready. He is one of the conscripts, barely fifteen, and came into the city to join the Adventurer's Guild. He was a hunter for one of the villages on the other side of Les Cis, and we dragged him into our unit to make up for one of ours who was exempted. His explanation took the attention of the people off me, but it seems it wasn't enough to put guard at ease, in fact he tightened his grip on the blade further. This still doesn't explain his apprehension you knowing so much about this actually makes it even more suspicious. He hissed out. Ajax happens to be his little brother, the commander continued and also seemed to flash something, perhaps a sigil, to the guard. I wasn't quick enough to see it, but the guard relaxed and took his hand off the hilt. See, there you have it. The archduke's daughter said. He's a hunter. Anything else we should know about him, commander? Despite looking to put the whole incident behind her, the girl is surprisingly sharp. How she picked up that there might be more there I don't know, but I sure was glad the commander didn't know about Ajax's magic since lying to a superior is a crime. Yes, there is, the commander's words, froze the blood in my veins, did he know about Ajax? He is the person who planted the bug into the enemy camp. It took everything in me not to give a sigh of relief. The girl seemed satisfied with the answer and both me and the commander exited the tent after the duke's daughter, Lex, promised a reward for his accomplishment.
we'll talk about whatever this is tomorrow morning, talk to your brother and Kate tonight, but know that I want some answers, the commander growled, before he made a wave, to dismiss me. I quickly made my way back towards the unit, but bumped into Kate, along the way. We both took a little detour out of sight, where I explained to her what happened. Oh, my poor boy, she purred. You look so stressed, let's see if I can help with that. She grabbed onto my arm and pulled me towards the bushes as her ears flicked and her tail wrapped around my waist. After Kate helped release my stress we both got dressed and headed our separate ways. I was surprised to find our unit all clustered in one place with boisterous laughter being heard. What on earth had happened this time? As I made my way over I could see only Spencer and his buddies were sitting away from the main group with annoyed looks on their faces. She sure doesn't seem to like you. I heard the voice of the lead hunter, signifying that the hunters had returned. I dreaded thinking what had Ajax done this time. I have to say, I feel sorry for you, if this is how females react to you. The laughter picked up at that and I started to force my way into the group to see what the fuss was all about. In the center, being given a good two feet of room was Ajax and he seemed to be wrestling with a rather large cat. The cat was clawing and hissing at him, though she was too weak to be anything more than an annoyance for him. Ajax, what did you do? I asked as I approached him. He was jumped by a grown version of one of these, he killed it and chose to take the pup. Doesn't seem like she likes him though. The youngest hunter barely formed a coherent answer through his laughter. As I approached the struggling duo to get a close look the cat froze and turned her head towards me. Before either of us could react, she released a small puff of smoke and disappeared from Ajax's hands only to appear on my shoulders. She sniffed me and rubbed her head into my neck before pulling back to look into my eyes. Before I could do anything else a system screen popped up for me. Companion Bond Shadow Cat would like to form a companion bond with you. Except, Chapter 69 Ajax was extremely pleased with how today had gone, it was the final day of their solo trapping and he had managed to not alert the camp of his movements in the area. That is not to say that he didn't trip any of the traps, he knew he wasn't good enough for that, so instead he worked his way through by not letting them fire off a signal. In the end the combined efforts of the three even had the lead hunter trip a signal back something they hadn't managed before, so all of them were pleased with their traps and they replaced them after the exercise. Not only that they also shared all the locations with each other, before adding some more damaging components to them. With that out of the way, and them still having a few hours, thanks to them being some of the first to awake in the camp they decided to go on a small scouting expedition into the forest to check the spots for some more boars deers and bears. This all came to a head when Ajax and the two veteran hunters felt the use of mana nearby, the young hunter still hadn't achieved his, detect mana. The mana had come from a big puma-like creature that could teleport short distances or make use of the shadows for some longer jumps. Ajax was its first target but it hadn't managed to land a single blow since its mana signature gave it away and was quickly put down by the group. That's impressive. Said the leader, you're too young to have, detect mana, how did you know it was coming? I didn't, said Ajax, but I knew something was, I have, danger sense. Ajax decided that it was fine to share that much. He was also slightly distracted as he was sensing a second source of mana very similar to the cats only much weaker. As they were taking a break, following the fight with a mana creature he broke off and decided to investigate only to find a small cub hidden in a burrow. A stealthy ambusher is a great partner to have for an adventurer, one acute senses even more so, so he decided to collect the cub and try for a companion. As he returned to their resting spot, with the struggling cub in his arms all three of the hunters turned to look at him. What do you have there? asked one of them. Found this little guy nearby. I think I'll take it with me, who knows, maybe it'll make for a good companion. With that their little expedition was over and they headed toward the main camp, hopefully they would make it before lunch was over and afternoon training continued. The entire way back they had not seen a single creature, though of course that could be because of the loud hairball that its displeasure was known far and wide the entire way back. They did in fact make it back before lunch, where most of the unit, 
with the exception of Spencer and his lackeys, got in on both congratulating him and the ribbing about the cat's dislike for him. It was then that Tom arrived and the cat settled down before jumping onto him. The entire area fell into silence. Tom was dumbstruck at the screen, Ajax by the cat's reaction to his brother, the rest of the people by the display of mana. Even monsters would give birth to normal beast versions of themselves that would need to grow and level before gaining access to power. That the cat was already capable of teleporting meant that this was a true magical creature and not a monster. The cat then curled around Tom's neck and began purring as a shit-eating grin split Tom's face. This didn't last for more than a second, however, as he gave Ajax a very guilty look. Did it just form a bond with you? Ajax asked as he put two and two together. She his brother corrected almost instinctively, but, yes she offered me a bond and I took it. Sorry, I was so dash dot. Don't worry about it. Ajax waved off the apology. Sure, he would have preferred to gain the companion himself, but considering just how much his brother had done for him, this was also a good outcome. Especially considering how much the pup seemed to dislike him. Didn't seem to like me much anyway. With the new development, Tom knew he would have to go report this to the commander, so he pulled Ajax aside so he could get the magic thing over with as well. Ajax silently cursed as he heard how the girl had picked him out because he was too quick to suppress his mana. I guess we can let him in on my ability to use mana, but we are not telling him about my stats. Ajax finally decided after a few minutes of thinking. With that decision made, they first went to talk to Kate before heading over to the commander. Kate had also just finished up on her last patient as they arrived. She gave Ajax a quick hug as she didn't see him this morning, before turning to Tom. She was a bit shorter than Tom, and as he was standing behind Ajax when she turned to him she was staring into a pair of feline eyes, similar to her own. Tom, she said after a few seconds of just staring at the new addition, what is that? Who is that? Tom corrected, he found himself feeling instinctively protective of his bond, must be a result of their connection. I haven't given her a name yet, Ajax found her in the forest and she offered to bond with me. And you took it? She was slightly upset at the fact. Even a normal bound feline would be worth quite a bit, but this is a true magical creature. It's fine. Ajax cut her off, before she could ramp up. You both have done a lot for me both last time I was in the city, and this time, not to mention, before bonding with Tom, the little thing seemed to enjoy using me as a scratch post rather than a possible bond. This seemed to calm her as she also healed up the scratch marks on Ajax's arms. They also discussed their upcoming talk with the commander and agreed that just letting him know Ajax could use mana but didn't have any formal training and didn't want it as a result of what that attention could bring him with the current situation of the nobles. Before we go, let's head over to the cooks. Ajax said, still hungry? Tom asked suspiciously after having seen Ajax polish off two plates of food no more than ten minutes ago. No, but now that they finished preparing lunch, they might be butchering our future dinner. I didn't feed the little monster when we got back and thought it might be a good idea to pick up some of the things they discard since I think she will need a meat-rich diet. Ajax said as he petted the cat, happy that it wasn't trying to bite and claw him as he did it. That's not a bad idea. Kate said as they changed the course to the cooking tent. When they arrived, the cooks were surprised to see Ajax there as they knew the hunters shouldn't be bringing back anything today. It was by their request, since they had quite a bit stocked up and didn't want it to go bad. Once they explained the situation, and the cooks each got a few mandatory pets of what seemed to be the future mascot of the entire unit by the people's reaction to her, they headed down into the small hole dug to make a makeshift cellar. It was rather dark there, and for this time, they would just have to wait a few minutes for the cat to eat some of its fill. The cooks assured them they will have a portion ready for her at meals from now on. Wow! Tom exclaimed after a minute looking deeper into the dark cellar. What? Both Ajax and Kate reacted. I just got the night vision skill. Tom said excitedly as he went over and started to affectionately pet his eating bond. I've read that bonds can influence skill gain. Said Kate. 
though I am surprised that this happened so fast, usually it takes a while. I was going to discuss with you later about spending some points in your mental stats as the bond might allow you to develop mana skills. That certainly is interesting, but I doubt I will. Said Tom. Splitting my focus will make me weaker and that's not something I can do on just a chance that it will happen. With the cat fed they headed to look for the commander. They found him rather quickly in his guest quarters in the main camp. Outside were two guards who both gave odd looks to the cat that acted as Tom's new scarf, but to their credit ignored it and soon they were entering the tent. I appreciate that you decided to handle this quickly and not wait until more. The commander started as they entered the tent but he drifted off as he looked at the cat around Tom's neck. Oh what is it now, we've been here less than a week. For someone looking to pass through this unnoticed, you sure attract a lot of attention. He rubbed his forehead as he shot Ajax, a look that said he all but knew he was somehow involved with the creature. I have gained a companion, sir. Tom saluted as he reported. I haven't had a chance to think of a name yet, but she is a shadow cat. She is young, but already able to teleport short distances. As if to illustrate this point, the cat teleported from around Tom's neck to the table where the remains of the commander's lunch were and started to eat again. Well now, this is interesting, he waved Tom off as he was about to apologize and grab the cat. Instead, he examined it while it ate. Chapter 70 As the shadow cat polished off the reminder of the food, the commander inspected it. He seemed to also be looking for something specific. How do you know that this is a shadow cat? he finally asked. The prompt I got for forming the bond said that a shadow cat wanted to form a bond with me. Tom replied. Hmm, you did indeed get lucky with this, the commander said as he finally stopped scrutinizing the cat and turned back to us. Magical creatures that can innately use mana at this young age are quite special. Did you gain anything else from the bond when it was initiated? Calling the cat young was something rather odd since the thing was bigger than any house cat he had seen on earth and was the size of one of the bigger dog breeds. Then again considering that its parent was the size of a small pony, young was likely a good description. Not right away. Tom answered, the commander frowned at the wording and nodded for him to continue. Before coming to report we passed by the cook's tent to try to feed her, clearly not enough. But while we went into their makeshift cellar, I got the night vision skill. You happen across a magical creature, it bonds with you almost immediately, and it's a growth type, he mumbled as he shook his head. This is something you won't find being shared openly with the public, and you will all keep to yourselves as well, he said as he gave us a warning glare. Magic companion bonds come in three forms. The first is basic, it is no different from a monster bond around 80% of them are like this. Empowered is the second. They usually grant one or two skills to their partner upon bonding but have no further effect on their bond, around 15% of them are like this. The most rare is growth type, only happens in 5% of cases, and the bonds share affinity for skill gain. This is often seen in the first few days after the bonding when you gain certain very specific skills, very much like you, night vision. But why is this information restricted? Ajax asked, not seeing a point to restricting this from common people as it would have no consequence should it be widely spread, because it's not restricted only to commoners. It is also restricted from lower nobles who would be too short-sighted and could end up trying to form bonds, kill the bonded creature and repeat with a new one just to make up for a deficit in their air. As he said this, the commander's face frowned heavily, and for the first time since he met him Ajax could see that while he looked only around his late thirties to early forties he was probably a lot older than that. That's horrible, Kate gasped as she covered her mouth with one hand. That's not even the worst part of it. The process of bonding with a creature only for it to be killed repeatedly turns the human into a sadistic psychopath. One that would now not only have access to greater skills, but also end up as a ruler in due time. He left the rest unsaid and all three of them vowed in their hearts not to leak this information. But if it is so restricted, why are you telling us? Tom questioned. Because you've got a growth type, can't have you advertising its abilities as that might lead some people to discover the empowered type for themselves, trying to recreate your success. 
Well, that's enough on that topic. What about the other thing I asked you about, have an answer for me yet, the commander moved on. We do. Tom nodded. I have access to my mana, and can make decent use of it. Ajax continued. Ideally, I would like to keep the specifics to myself as the reason I chose not to focus only on magic was the drawbacks that someone with my background would have doing so. I can respect that. However, I will ask one question. The commander seemed understanding, but his voice turned strict. I need to know how strong your healing abilities are. Covering your access to mana might cost us this exercise, but that is something I am willing to risk. I will not cover for you, should it cost one of my men their lives. I have very weak healing. Alzanoth is as far as it goes. Ajax understood that point of view and had no qualms sharing his very stunted healing potential. Okay, go on back to training, the commander said. Oh, and since you use a bow, have one of them give you the rundown on bow usage during engagements. I'll explain it to him. Kate volunteered. Time to go, buddy. Tom called out to his bond as they made for the exit of the tent. The shadow cat slowly and reluctantly stopped licking the plate and made to follow them. As they exited the tent with Tom in the lead, they came face to face with the four nobles leading their small army as well as the other two commanders. They were approaching the tent at a slightly quick pace, meaning there must have been a development they wanted to discuss with Commander Grievous now. As they all exited, Lexa's eyes instantly stuck to Ajax, recognizing him from yesterday. Just as she was about to approach him, they all saw the shadow cat push open the tent flap and make a small hop. As it reached its apex, it disappeared only to appear on Tom's shoulders. What the hell? That's so cool. What is that thing? What's her name? The reactions from the nobles were split with the girls having positive ones and the boys being confused. The bodyguards and commanders were much more experienced and showed no outward reaction. Seeing the nobles surround Tom, both Kate and Ajax traded a quick glance and presented a united front. They quickly made their retreat and used him as a distraction so as to avoid any attention. As they left, they threw quick pitying looks at him as he was being dragged back into the commander's tent to do his job. Okay, so what are the regulations for archers? Ajax asked once they were a bit away. Since the point of this war is training and not meaningless slaughter, and since the only archers used are highly trained they have restrictions placed on them. All shots are to be limited from the knees down, the belly, and the arms. Kate said. I know it might seem counterintuitive to shoot for the belly instead of the things but getting hit in the belly is likely to result in large amounts of pain only. That is something that will take a while to kill you so healers will have plenty of time to fix you up. A deep cut on the inner thigh, however, can result in heavy bleeding. Ajax understood as the information from his past life molded with his knowledge of magic. As long as the arrow wasn't removed a shot in the belly will take a while to kill someone, whereas bleeding out would happen almost as quickly to people as it happened in his old life at least to people under level 50. With that they each went their separate way, with Kate heading to the healers, and Ajax, going to join the rest of the unit in training drills. Not one hour late, the commander also came down to the training field. Our role for tomorrow has been decided. We will be the unit that will intercept the enemy cavalry detachment, the commander announced. This was followed by multiple groans from the unit. Yes, I know that they are the most skilled and dangerous to engage, but as the most experienced unit it falls to us. The commander cut the complaints short. Anyone with any ideas on how to approach, that is to come to me and the captain as we discuss the ambush point. With that both him and the captain took a seat at a big table and laid out a map. Ajax, confused, asked one of the others why they were the most experienced. Because our commander is unique in that he doesn't care about politics and ass kissing. This means that we always end up joining these skirmishes, whereas the other guard units have to join once every three, one of the older guards who heard his question said. Seeing an excited mage all but run towards the table, Ajax decided to close in and listen in on the strategy in hopes of learning about war magic. Tom also approached Ajax, having arrived at the commander's side. Sir, I have a spell, to amplify my voice, 
the mage couldn't hold on his excitement and blurted out right after saluting. So, the captain asked skeptically, their horses come from the neighboring baron. They are known for their war horses, the excited mage continued, but at this point the captain's frown deepened and the commander was starting to sport one too. I know their trained command to stop. We can start our ambush by having me call it out while magnifying my voice. It might not cause all of them to stop, but if even half of them stop on the spot it will give us our best opening to start the ambush. After hearing him out both the captain and the commander seemed to be very much on board with the idea. Ajax on the other hand turned to Tom. Wouldn't the enemy take precautions against this? he asked. No, voice amplification is not a common spell, it is quite rare in fact. Tom said. Then how come one of the guards has it? Ajax was confused about this, weren't guards only taught the widely known spells. He learned it from his father. His father is sworn to a noble house, however most of the mages working willingly with noble houses include in the contract the ability to teach their own children and exclusive spells the house posses, with the only restraint being their children to be under oath not to reveal it to others besides their children, and so on. Chapter 71 The next morning, the entire unit woke up early. We moved together and headed to set up our ambush. It could have been argued that our tactic of using the horse-trained commands and an amplification spell to get the cavalry to stop and run into each other was an unfair move, but the commands could have been picked up by a spy so it was only towing the line. The biggest hope of the battle fought today was to even out the numbers on both sides. It seems that the opponents conscripted four cities to our three. This meant that they not only had a big number advantage when it came to the conscripts, but also when it came to the guard units. They could be big turning points. With the information gathered from the bug, we hoped to swing the number advantage to our side. Especially since troops that surrender are just allowed to go back home, meaning there will be no fighting to the last breath. For our work in setting up, the hunters were taking the lead in scouting to make sure there were no enemy scouts to spot our ambush. Surprisingly since getting Fluffy, name chosen by Katie and Fluffy herself as she simply refused to respond to anything else once she heard it, Tom was also assigned to spotting as he could see through the darkness before the sun came up better than anyone. Fluffy was left back at the healer camp as taking part will most likely mean she would be killed with her low level 3 power and that none of our opponents had any incentive to let her live. There she enjoyed her lavish lifestyle of eating and being fawned over by healers until the first casualties would come in. Once getting into position we waited. The enemy came a bit faster than we were expecting, but well within our margin of error. The riders outnumbered us three to one, but we weren't looking to take them out in an open battle, hell we weren't looking to even win. All we were trying to do was to delay them and take out as many as we could safely. As I drew my first arrow and pulled it back waiting for the loud yell I knew was coming, I was scanning the troops for anyone who looked to be in command. The confusion we were about to throw them into was our biggest advantage, so taking out the leadership would prolong that for a while longer. The odd shout came and a lot more than half the horses did a full stop in the next few steps. Many horses sent their inexperienced riders out of the saddle into the ass of the horse in front. Around three-quarters of the horses stopped with many of the remaining crashing into the others, causing a pileup the likes of which I had never seen back on earth. Thankfully I knew that these people, and even horses, were a lot more resilient so it shouldn't have resulted in any deaths. Unsurprisingly, the people I was aiming for didn't stop or run into their own comrades, these were experienced fighters who had built up a connection with their horses. I loosed my first arrow and saw it hit the belly of the man I was aiming for. Sadly, it seems like he was wearing quite a bit of under armor as the arrow hardly penetrated despite hitting the gap in the plate. Thankfully the shot had enough power that combined with the element of surprise it knocked him off his horse and left him dodging the incoming traffic, unable to take control of the situation. So I drew another arrow and looked for my next target. I knew that at this range I had no chance of doing much damage to them without using my mana, but I was only looking to distract them and be a nuisance. 
I managed to almost empty my entire quiver by the time they regained a semblance of order and having lost almost a tenth of their forces in the initial ambush, they proceeded to chase after us. We on the other hand had no intention staying to fight, the longer they chased after us the better it would be so I started setting up a delay tacting. A slippery smelly substance, I still don't know the name of, was sitting in barrels at the top of the small hill we ambushed them from. I proceed to start poking holes in barrels and rolling them down the hill. All the while waiting for the order to retreat. Pull back, the commander's right-hand man started calling out. This was the first surprise our side had that day. It was supposed to be the commander who would give the call for starting the retreat. My own position as an archer allowed me some time to look around and see what was going on before I had to take off. Looking in the direction the commander was supposed to be, I noticed he was locked in combat with a man that seemed even older than him. Both were moving a lot faster than I could even with full use of my mana. Not only that their glancing blows were almost enough to cut apart the trees we had hit among, suffice it to say that I now knew why the commander had let his right-hand man take over leadership. Thankfully it seemed that everyone from both sides agreed that getting involved with that fight was a good way to get yourself taken out so we all gave them a wide breadth. With the order to retreat the chase was on. Since it would be a waste of time to try getting the horses up the side of the slippery hill, they chased after us on foot. For the first time I started to feel the fact that I was only level 24. With everyone else being close to level 30. Exceptions being Spencer and Tom, who were nowhere close so as to not present a weak point in the formation, I ran along and watched as soldier after soldier outran me. It wasn't even that their skills were higher than mine as I had asked and running was a bitch to level up, it was all down to pure stats. Fifteen minutes into the chase we started reaching the small canyon that had formed in the rocks. During this time I had fallen further and further behind almost being relegated to the last layer. The faster people had already started setting up a defensive position just inside the mouth of the canyon. We all knew it was a dead end and that they could just sit there and wait us out if they wanted, but that was time they didn't have. Our small force would be taking up the time of one three times larger, and at least two of the enemy guard units if I was judging from the people I saw chasing after us. As we closed ranks into the choke point I ended up in the third row of the ranks. The first row, having locked their shields, took a knee and allowed the second row to cover them. I was handed a spear and expected to use it to keep the enemy away more than deal any damage. Our instructions during training were very similar to the ones Kate gave me about shooting, we were to aim for the limbs and belly, but a lot more leeway was given to melee combat about people aiming correctly. It was then that I saw the enemy troops part in a scene reminiscent of the old cartoon about Moses. A few seconds later, the two commanders were seen coming through that space and it instantly made a lot of sense as to why nobody wanted to be there. Commander Grievous seemed to have taken the original upper hand from the wounds that marked the other's feet and arms but was now focused on just retreating. Just as I was wondering why wouldn't he just stand and fight I sensed mana. In the next moment I saw spells heading for the battling duo. It all made sense. Our own mages were focused on giving us as much of an advantage in retreating and were most likely already out of mana, but we had seen very little spells coming from the enemy. This was most likely because having mages firing into clumps of army was regulated against so they were relegated to manipulating the environment or taking their chances at the big shots. The enemy probably used quite some mana undoing our own side's work, but now they were pressuring the commander, but it didn't seem like it would be enough. My prediction ended up being right, and the two broke away once they reached the halfway line between the two front lines that had formed. We were left with a stare down that lasted all of two seconds, before the enemy started to make their way back to their horses. I could see the annoyance on the face of the commander and even heard his voice as he swore loudly after giving the order to retreat. I got together with Tom and we started carrying the wounded over to the healer. It was a good day as we suffered no fatalities and only about three major injuries with a dozen medium ones. There is going to be quite a few arguments at their camp later today. I recognized the voice of that commander of theirs. He was one of the ones who thought going for multiple flanks was a bad idea, he said while chuckling. Chapter 72 
As Ajax and the rest of his unit made it back to the main campgrounds, they reunited with the other two guard units that were thwarting flanks. They had an even larger success than we did as while their flanks were larger in number, they were also on foot and only contained one guard unit instead of two. With all of us eventually being beaten back, it still gave the main army enough time to capture and remove from the fight enough of the enemy, conscripted that we were now even in numbers. A real success even if we are still a bit on the back foot and a head-to-head -head fight due to their higher number of trained guards. With the battle over we were all given the rest of the day to go back and rest for the next fight. Seeing how badly they lost this first round, while still maintaining the overall lead the commander was talking about a second fight where they changed tactics might be imminent so we should get our rest. Getting back to their tent Ajax and Tom find Kate there feeding Fluffy. By now Ajax has noticed that Fluffy must have eaten at least a few times her own body weight since he found her. He knows that this is extremely odd thanks to his previous experience on Earth so he decides to ask about it knowing it has something to do with magic. Do either of you know why Fluffy is eating so much? he asked. She must have eaten two times her own body weight since we got her yesterday. Yeah, I was worried about that too and asked some of the older healers earlier. Kate fills in. It has to do with being a true magical creature. Young and weak creatures like Fluffy here still need to use mana in order to keep up their abilities in time with their growth but are unable to generate their own mana. Right now, she can still substitute food for mana thanks to her mother's milk still being in her system, but that will only last her for another month at best. According to him, her diet will need to consist of meat from other true magical creatures in order to maintain her mana generation until she forms her own core. It will also help if she keeps that up afterwards, but won't be as vital. Another option is to supplement a normal carnivore diet with cores from monsters. The amount of mana she needs to progress will also ramp up as she grows older. From needing one core a week now she will probably need one a day when she is around level 15 and close to forming her own core. How the fuck are we going to afford this? Even if we could find the cores to buy on the market, which is no easy feat, how will we afford them? Tom laments the upkeep costs of his new bond. I think you might need to talk with Judy about this Ajax suggested. She might be in the best position to help you with this until I can get into a dungeon. Ajax, hearing about the requirements, also took out one of the few monster cores he had managed to pick up during the five years he spent training with Hatchet that he kept in an inside pocket warded against scrying. The old scout had insisted that he keep all the cores but not sell them as he might one day find a better use for them. As soon as Ajax took out the core from the spatially expanded backpack, fluffy size, locked onto the small crystal, she jumped up into Ajax's lap and became the friendliest he had ever seen her, with him at least, while occasionally sniffing around his closed fist, containing the core. Seeing her get nowhere with that approach, she went over to Tom and started meowing while throwing glances at his closed fist. What you got there, Ajax? Tom asks, getting a clear idea that Fluffy wanted whatever was in his hand through the bond. Hatchet took me hunting deeper into the forest during these past five years. I managed to gather around 30 monster cores during this time. He helped me take them down but insisted I keep the cores and not sell them. The closest I have been to facing a monster without him actually was Fluffy's mother though she hadn't formed her core yet and her magic was a lot less concentrated than Fluffy's is now. That must be because she didn't get enough mana while growing up. Kate mentioned. It should also explain why you were able to fight a magic creature around your level without help or using your own mana, they are usually very strong for their level. I have about two dozen of them, they should be enough to last you for the next six months but I suggest you send a letter out to Judy as quickly as possible, just in case this whole thing ends up taking longer than two months like it's supposed to. You want to make sure you have a stockpile waiting for you as you return. Ajax suggested as he fed the core to the purring cat. A few minutes after finishing the core Fluffy's mana signature spiked with strength showing that the core had its intended effect and that Fluffy had been a bit malnourished in terms of mana already. 
This made Kate think that Fluffy was an even stronger and more rare creature than they initially thought because of this incorrect magic reading, and they fed her a second to make up for any shortage she might have suffered so far. Rooting through his bag Ajax found that he had another twenty-five cores and decided to join Tom in giving them to the commander for safekeeping. They both knew that the spike in the magical potency of Fluffy would be noticed by all the other mages and were wary of their tent getting robbed while they were out. What is it now? The commander complained when he saw them gather again. And what the hell happened to your bond, the mage that was just about to leave the commander's tent after discussing his performance in today's fight exclaimed, sensing the new potency of the cat's mana. The commander frowned deeply at the new discovery knowing that the cat, while rare as all magical creatures were, was not all that uncommon among its kind after being inspected. This is why we are here. We found out about Fluffy Sneed for a mana-rich diet. Tom said, Ajax has a few cores on him from his time training deep into the forest and we wanted to ask if you would be willing to hold on to them for the duration of this war. You think someone would steal them from your tent? The commander asked. I'm not suspecting people from our unit, but all the mages in the main camp got a good look at Fluffy yesterday. I imagine that quite a few of them would have no problem in swiping them from our tent and they are a necessity if we want Fluffy to grow into her full potential. The commander reluctantly nodded and agreed to hold the cores and give one a week to what he knew would soon become the unit's official mascot from the people's reaction to her after only a few days. He was also very surprised to see that they had more than two dozen cores on them and understood why they might be a little paranoid with that much wealth being left unprotected while also advertised by the cat's mana signature. You both best head on back to sleep. Tomorrow will be another battle and this time we will actually be fighting not just ambushing and retreating. The enemy thinks that we are overly wary and will try to get into a better position by bluffing a small charge with part of its force. We will hit back hard and try to use their new tactic to get a numbers advantage. Why do you not seem happy about that, sir? Ajax asked, seeing the frustration on the commander's face. Even if the plan works all it will do is give us a decent advantage, their troops will be close enough to reinforce before we get too much of a decisive lead. It won't end this little war. It will for sure give away the fact that we have a bug in place. The chances that they won't find it after this is practically none. I was hoping we would be able to abuse it to end this whole thing in under a month, but it seems that's not in the cards. All three of the people nodded along with the commander's words, they were also a bit saddened by the fact that more of their time would be taken up with this unproductive war. They all made their way out of the tent to get a good night's sleep before their first real battle. Oh. And one more thing, the commander, called out as they were about to exit. Why the fuck would you name a future shadowy killing machine, Fluffy? The cat turning to give him an incredulous look after hearing his name and comprehending some of the questions through the bond with Tom. Chapter 73 After a good night's sleep, the whole army came together early. They started marching right as the sun began to rise. Everyone that was going to fight today had been told to go to sleep early, and those that stayed behind had to pull a double shift on the lookout. Not only that, but they were also quite busy, each of the guard camps had caught at least two and as many as four spies trying to infiltrate. The main camp had caught ten, and after a quick interrogation, to make sure there were no more they were all promptly stuffed together in a tent. The tent was quite spacious even for the almost twenty people, but it would start getting really cramped if another wave of spies was caught. Their meals also consisted of bland rations and water, not something they would be enjoying, but at least they no longer had to take part as they were considered killed. Because both sides were inexperienced archers wouldn't take part in the main battles as the death toll would grow too large. This meant that Ajax was going to fight in melee today unlike yesterday. Luckily, because of his young age and low level both him and Tom were placed in the reserves. Their job was to take the place of fallen warriors and ensure the line was not breached. This also meant they were in the least amount of danger and would also be given a chance to watch the battlefield as a whole until they were needed. As expected since yesterday, the first thing they ran into was an army only half their size, the rest of the enemy soldiers being split off as they weren't expecting a reckless charge after the vigilance shown only a day before. 
As soon as they were close enough that they could see reinforcements for the enemy were nowhere close and that they would have enough time to deal some damage to the enemy forces the orders came in concert. They started from the back where the nobles were and echoed from officers all the way to the front. Charge! 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 The army had been practicing this since they arrived and managed to somewhat keep in step with each other and not break formation as they rushed their unprepared opponents. Ajax could see from his vantage point just how unprepared the enemy were for this development. Despite their leadership reacting accordingly and sounding the retreat, this was easier said than done. He had learned a lot about the fight-or-flight response that humans have even back on Earth, yet what they didn't teach was there was a third option one that was useless yet very much a possibility, and quite likely the reason why these little wars were accepted and even encouraged. Half of the enemy troops retreated cautiously and in formation. A fifth just turned and ran away for all, they were worth seeing the number difference, while a tenth charged forward to meet the enemy head-on. The remaining fifth just froze. It wasn't until the fastest of the ones running to fight had been taken down that the ones who froze broke out of their stupor and made the sensible decision to retreat and quite a few of the ones eager to fight turned around. Yet all this meant that their formation was broken, and Ajax's side had plenty of time and numbers to get a partial surround on the enemy force. Watching in the distance Ajax and the leaders could also see the surge of troops rushing from the forest. The enemy had reacted quicker than anticipated and quickly came to reinforce once their tactic was seen through. As the enemy reunited with their reinforcements, the fight became a lot more even and both sides started taking casualties. With this development Ajax didn't have the luxury to watch as he was called up to the front where he pulled out a spear and started to work on looking for opportunities to impale the enemy. The fight was a lot different than anything he had experienced before. He was locked in place by the men in front, behind, to the left and right. Where he usually had the freedom to move now, all he could do was twist and duck when an enemy spear broke past. He wouldn't even have that much time to react as they were not aimed at him, but those in front, so he would only see them as his own allies, dodged out the way. The first time this happened, he barely moved his head out of the way in time and ended up with a nasty, if shallow, cut on his shoulder limiting his range of motion a little. Despite managing to form a proper united line, the enemy were still pushed back all the way to the trees, and the advantage in troops had swapped over from just about even to decently on their side since the start of the skirmish. The repetitive motions were starting to get to him as the muscles in his shoulders hurt from keeping the spear moving backwards and forwards. This all came to a head as the soldier in front of him took a spear to the gut and dropped down. Ajax didn't hesitate to drop his spear and quickly launched forward to reinforce the shield wall. As part of the wall, he didn't do all that much attacking, which let his dominant arm get some rest only swinging the sword when he had a clear shot or to parry. His shield arm however was taking a heavy pounding from people with higher physical stats than him, this on top of the cut to his shoulder that was starting to present an issue. Despite all this Ajax struggled onward pressing the enemy and advancing in time with his allies. That is until his superior senses heard a commotion coming from behind him, a few screams of agony, came a quick succession, before some loud swearing that took his attention. This distracted him enough that he didn't notice he had advanced too quickly and broke the line stepping up alone in front of the enemy and took a shallow slice to his sword arm and a deeper one on his shin before he backed up into formation. Pull back. Pull back. The orders were heard from the officers around him. The line collectively came to a dead stop before starting to disengage as they retreated from the engagement. Ajax however couldn't help but be a little troubled by the fact that the order to retreat had come in a much lower frequency and disorganized as compared to the one to charge. As the army pulled back, they picked up prisoners and wounded allies alike and made their way back to their camp. Ajax himself also headed to the healer's tent, looking to get his cuts taken care of. Ajax, what happened? Kate quickly rushed to him and helped him limp over to a bed as soon as he entered the tent with Fluffy hot on her heels even if it was to provide comfort in the way of something to mindlessly pet while he got healed. I was a little surprised. Reacting to a spear is a lot harder if you only see it after the person in front of you dodges it. 
Ajax said, not mentioning that he also got distracted and charged in front like an idiot. Tom, POV. I saw Ajax limp over to the healer's tent and felt the urge to follow him and make sure he was okay. At least this was not to be, as I hadn't gotten injured at all and was following Commander Grievous to the post-battle meeting. The atmosphere among the leadership was tense. Apparently an enemy assassin had dropped down from the trees and targeted the invited Baron's son. He didn't quite manage to take out the noble even for the intents and purposes of the war, but half of his guard sported wounds close to their necks and were as such removed from any further combat. The atmosphere was thick with animosity as despite the assassin being slowed by the archduke's daughter and taken out by her guard the baron's son called for the retreat out of fear and brought an end to the advantageous fight we had on the relatively open field. I took my place behind the commander's chair as the nobles and other commanders took a seat at the main table in the center of which was the receiver from the bug Ajax had planted. Despite the annoyed looks on the commanders and the noble girls' faces, they were all eager to listen to what the enemy thought before having their own discussion. I told you we shouldn't have split the army a second time. The voice of the man who fought Commander Grievous yesterday came loudly. How was I to expect that they would stop being at all cautious from one day to the next, a much younger voice complained. Because I told you so, the first voice roared, followed by the sound of metal impact and numerous things falling. You don't have to kick the table, the second voice sounded after a short silence. Hey what do you? SHHHH, the whooshing sound, came from multiple sources. Oh lay off it and tell me what that is, the second voice said, sounding a lot angrier. Wait. Is that a bug? Yes, you idiot, it's a bug. One we now can't use to give them false information, because you told them we found it. The first voice roared so loudly, I could almost swear we didn't need the bug to hear it. Chapter 74 Ajax was mindlessly petting Fluffy while Kate was finishing up on his wounds. Both the cut on his arm and shoulder were fully healed, while the one on his shin was halfway there as well. This is as much as I can do for now. Kate said as she bandaged his leg. According to orders, we have to be focused on the most injured and just do a quick patch job on everyone else. I'll finish healing this tonight for you. I get it. Ajax said dejectedly, knowing he will have to spend a few hours with a limp because of regulations and that he couldn't heal it up himself. By the way do you know what happened? As he asked the question he was also looking and pointed at the row of bunks that housed a dozen well-equipped mages and knights that seemed to have been the first ones treated. Enemy assassin tried to ambush the leadership from the trees. He didn't manage to get any of the nobles, but took out enough of them and scared him enough to call for an early retreat. She said. Hearing the wording, the enemy assassin actually relaxed Ajax. He and Kate were among the few that knew there might be real assassins looking to kill the Archduke's daughter, so news that this was just part of the war helped ease his concerns. That explains the disorganized call, to fall back, he mumbled, and quickly looked away when he noticed a few of the laid-up guards turned to glare at him, clearly having heard him. At least with this leg I'll be exempt from duties until it's fixed. With that he picked up a crutch and headed out to make space for someone else as a line of injured was starting to form, though they were all superficial injuries. Make sure to eat well. Healing takes a toll on your body and you need the fuel. She called out after him. Fluffy had heard the word food and had volunteered to escort Ajax to the food tent without a second thought. Ajax had gotten a hearty portion from the cooks once they saw his injured and treated leg. They knew that if an injury persisted after initial healing, he needed to eat more to keep up with the healing. Fluffy had also gotten a supersized serving after a few indignant meows following the small portion placed for her. Ajax didn't have much of an appetite as he focused on reliving the combat and on where he could improve for next time. With food as only an afterthought, he barely got through half before Tom came and took a seat next to him. You okay? he asked. Me? Oh, yeah, just trying to think where I messed up and why so I can fix it for next time. Ajax said, pointing at his bandaged leg. How did that happen? I thought hunters were always supposed to watch their environment. Tom asked. 
When the assassin hit I was distracted and moved in front of the rest of the line. I'm not used to working so closely with others, he explained. Yeah, that would make sense. Tom acknowledged. That assassin of theirs is worth his weight in gold. Not only did he take out quite a few high-level individuals, he also made us retreat early by scaring one of the nobles. He's sure to get quite the reward after all this is over. How about you? How come you are only getting here now? You don't seem like you got wounded. Ajax asked. I went to the leadership meeting. Tom said then leaned in to whisper, Now that I have a powerful growth-type bond as well as a future adventurer brother and merchant sister, to help make sure I can feed it well on top of my above-average talents, the commander is looking to train me for command. Ajax could understand. Tom had worked hard to join this unit and even made a bit of a name for himself before. With his wife being a talented healer and now also having a growth-type bond, he would be moved up the ranks faster. Anything interesting happen? Ajax was curious what all the nobles were doing. Oh, yeah, it seems the enemy found your bug. And let me tell you boy were they pissed. Especially when one of their nobles let us know they found it so they couldn't use it against us. What followed was a good two minutes of expletives before they killed the bug. Tom said, shaking his head. Well, it was good while it lasted. Ajax toasted with the mug of ale that seemed to have been passed out to everyone in the tent. It was. Tom toasted with him. Also, all those that fought today and yesterday will have the rest of the day and tomorrow to rest. It was agreed that the enemy also can't keep up the fighting so the troops get to rest. That was some of the best news Ajax heard so far and he was going to make full use out of tomorrow exploring the forest. Considering a shadow cat stuck around here, there was bound to be something valuable. The war is also looking like it is going to slow down. Tom followed up. What do you mean? Ajax asked. I didn't quite understand it when they were discussing it, but the commander explained it to me. Tom said, apparently with the latest engagement, we now have a strong numbers advantage. Proportional to what they had before yesterday. But with the loss of the bug and the contrary strategies, the enemy used it also means we have no idea what the enemy will be trying next. This will usually just mean normal battle. But in our case, the leadership is two Baron heirs and one Archduke heir. This changes things a bit. Isn't there a Duke's granddaughter as well? Ajax interrupted. Technically yes but she is part of the Archduke's daughter's retinue and not here independently, so she doesn't get a vote on the leadership direction. Tom answered. Now we have just flipped the odds from a low chance to win this to a low chance to lose. Sadly, this also means that if we lose from this position after losing the bug it will reflect very poorly on the two Baron heirs. They are very likely to be extremely reactive and risk-averse so that they don't leave a bad impression. With the granddaughter of the dean of the academy here, they are even more scared of making a bad impression, since they both have access to magic and are hoping to enroll there. They are still hoping to enroll? Aren't they too old for that? Ajax asked, since it seemed that unlike the two noble girls who were still in their teens, the other two nobles seemed close to their thirties. The limit to enroll in the academy is actually level 35 regardless of age and they are both in their low thirties and looking to enroll after making a good impression. This was an interesting opportunity. The reason Ajax avoided the academy was because it would be like serving himself up to the nobility if he was to enroll. Even if they couldn't touch him while he was enrolled it was known that your level didn't increase much during your time there, instead you gained all sorts of useful skills. He decided to skip it since he could gain the skills on his own without the risk. Knowing he could enter when he was close to level 35 was different. He would have no problem waiting until he was level 34 or 35 before enrolling. By that point not only would he be a member of the Adventurer's Guild, but he should be able to take on level 50s or maybe even 55s. I know that look, what are you thinking? Tom asked after Ajax sat in silence for more than 10 seconds. I'm thinking that I might enroll in the academy once I reach level 34. Ajax answered. You have your work cut out for you then. The enrollment fee is 1,000 gold coins. 
The only other way is to get a scholarship, but I doubt you want to take part in that test, with all the attention it will draw to you. Tom smirked. Ajax couldn't deny that even with the protection of the guild and his higher levels Tom was right. He was too paranoid to try gaining a scholarship. They finished the rest of their meal in silence. Both thinking about how they would spend their day off as well as how they will make money in the future. One to afford the academy, and the other, to feed the little glutton that sat purring in his lap. After dinner, Tom gave Ajax a helping hand back to the tent where he waited for Kate. He didn't have to wait much longer before she returned and finished healing up his leg before collapsing straight into bed. She was asleep before her head hit the pillow. The amount of magic she used to heal not only our own troops but also the enemy captured took a toll on her. With everything taken care of Ajax tries to fall asleep himself while ignoring the itching he felt all over his leg from the fast healing. It turns out there are some side effects to speed healing some deeper wounds. Chapter 75 Ajax woke up late in the morning, he had a hard time going to sleep from the itching, not only that but his stamina was near bottomed out from the day of fighting. He was used to spending his stamina but not with the repeated use of it for an entire day was something else that left him drained. As he got out of bed he noticed that Kate and Tom had already left. Only Fluffy was still in the tent sleeping on her improvised bed in the common area. He scratched the sleeping feline in greeting before heading for the food tent. He had a scavenger hunt to go on and that wouldn't do on an empty stomach. He only took two steps away before the cat nimbly jumped on his shoulders, not wanting to remain alone, and most likely wanting some food as well. Ajax was glad for the company as Fluffy might be able to act as a detector for whatever the shadow cat wanted as long as he brought her close enough. Together, they headed off to breakfast. The tent was relatively deserted with piles of food being served buffet style. It seems that despite his late wake-up a lot more people were sleeping in longer on their off day. After finishing their second helping, and receiving a glare from the cook when they looked like they might go for a third they headed off into the woods. Once they were a decent way from the camp and Ajax was sure there was nobody else there to spy on him he started using siphon mana to pick up the pace. Once they reached the area where he had first found the shadow cat he slowed down and started looking for any old tracks in case he could backtrack her steps for anything valuable. Despite the tracks having to be at least four days old at this point, he didn't lose hope as it hadn't rained at all so the chances of finding some were still high. After searching for almost an hour, with nothing to show for it, he was thinking about giving up on looking for tracks. This was still a decently leveled, stealthy creature, with a natural inclination towards shadow mana. Finding old tracks was never going to be easy, but he didn't expect it to be so hard. Just as he decided to forego looking for tracks and head out in a random direction, Fluffy jumped off his shoulders and started slowly into the direction of a bush. Her nose was stuck to the ground so he guessed she was following a scent. As he followed the cat past the thick bush, he found the first reliable tracks that had to be left by her mother almost 100 feet from where he fought it. He supposed this also made sense since. As he was the prey at the start of that encounter, the hunter would have been careful stalking up to him, he also chided himself for not thinking of this sooner. Finally having some tracks to follow, he picked Fluffy up and moved at a faster pace. The tracks led him all the way to a big burrow they must have been using for shelter. Inside, he found the body of an even bigger shadow cat that lay in a pool of dried blood. Further examination showed that this cat was male probably the father of the small cub on his shoulders, as well as being covered with various wounds. Most were deep claw marks, but its front feet showed severe crush damage as well. He carefully packed up the body and stored it in his backpack. He was eager to loot it for anything useful, especially the core it must have formed, but would wait to do that once Fluffy was no longer with him. With that taken care of he gave the burrow a good once-over, but found nothing else of value in it so he exited and looked for tracks leading in a different direction than the one he came from. He spent a good three hours running down different directions the tracks had led in. Each one turned out to be a wash with the track cutting off at some point and a scene with some dried blood being found about fifty yards from that point where the shadow cats had probably caught a meal. One such site also had the broken tusk of a boar left over. 
something he picked up, but this was not the prize he was looking for. All of the tracks he had picked up so far had all ended less than half a mile away from the burrow. He knew that whatever he was looking for had to be further away as no smart predator would nest next to a valuable resource unless it knew for sure it could defend it from others looking to partake. These cats were strong but still only around level 20, maybe in the high 20s for the big one he found dead in their home, not high enough to monopolize anything in this forest. It took a while, but he finally found a set of tracks that led on for longer than a mile. As he followed them, he also noticed quite an uptick in overgrown vegetation. The grass was almost halfway up his shins. This made him slow down and start paying close attention to his surroundings. Whatever it was that stayed here was dangerous enough that herbivores would avoid the plentiful food. Luckily, the increased vegetation also gave him more clear markers for following tracks, though they reduced the accuracy of what he was tracking. More than once he had to stop when the shadow cat tracks met with another's and spend a good few minutes differentiating between the two. As he followed the tracks for another mile, he finally found something. A massive clearing in the trees opened up to a small lake. It was about ten times the size of an Olympic swimming pool back on Earth. Most importantly his, sense mana, was picking a deep concentration of pure mana in the water. As he carefully approached the edge of the pond, as this wasn't big enough to call a lake as he could easily see the shore on the other side, Fluffy was much more relaxed and eagerly jumped down from his shoulders to start drinking from the clear water. A few seconds after he started drinking, the mana signature started picking up in intensity, nowhere close to how it did when he chowed down on a mana core, but this was just a few sips of water already making a difference. He looked towards the center of the pond on a small patch of land where a tree not much taller than the rest of the forest, but four times as thick took up nearly all the space. Roots thicker than his legs could be clearly seen making their way into the water. On a closer look, he could also spot numerous fruits on its branches, from the size and green color as well as the season they were in he could tell they weren't ripe yet. With nothing else to do, he quickly emptied nine of the ten water skins he was carrying and started filling them up at the edge next to the thirsty feline. He wouldn't dare drink any himself as he didn't know what effect pure mana like this would have on a human if ingested. As he finished capping the eighth flask and reached for the ninth, danger sense spiked. He dropped the flask infused, siphon mana, and jumped back grabbing Fluffy with his free hand a moment before something smashed into the bank of the pond. He didn't see what it was even after the impact, but could barely make out some scales from the mud that stuck to whatever appendage had been used to attack them. Just as he lowered the mana skin, he had activated on instinct a jet of water shot off towards him. Since he was already on edge, he had no problem dodging out of the way without taking his eyes off the water. In the water, he could now clearly see a big fish with a long tube-like tail. He recognized it as a trap fish. Hatchet had given him the rundown on a lot of odd creatures that adventurers should be wary of, and this was one of them. The fish was more of a nuisance at lower levels, but once it gained access to mana he would use it to camouflage himself for a surprise attack with his tail followed by a long-range water jet should its target survive. Having switched his mana from the stealth to water manipulation did leave it without its stealth. Ajax instantly used Judge Threat as soon as he laid eyes on it. What he got in return surprised him. For the first time since he spent his stat points something other than Hatchet came back as dangerous to him. Now while the feeling was a bit weaker than the one he got from using the skill on Hatchet it still marked the fish as being in the mid to high 40s. Chapter 76 both Ajax and the fish were locked in a stalemate. The fish was not as strong as Hatchet and Ajax had gotten pretty close in power to him so with the difference in strength it should be an alright risk to take under normal circumstances. But these weren't normal circumstances. Not only was the fish in water, an environment that Ajax couldn't bring his full power to bear in, the water was also heavily mana-infused. While that would be neither useful nor harmful to him, he couldn't say the same about the fish, for sure. On top of all that he also had to take care of Fluffy, if he left her by the side the fish could still target her, and if she ran off in the woods another monster could kill her. The fish was also in a similar situation. He had the upper hand as long as he was within the pond, 
but while he could go on land, for limited time his strength would suffer. As such both were left staring at one another for a few seconds. These few seconds turned into a minute before Ajax felt that something was amiss. This was an ambush predator, so why would he not go back into stealth? With increase in level, came an increase in intelligence, even if not sapience. A hiss from Fluffy, followed by the sound of a snapping twig, alerted Ajax to something behind him. A massive brown bear with fur so dark it was almost black was charging at him. The bear wasn't too quick, but was by no means slow, so Ajax wanted to use Judge Threat on him to see what he was up against. Before he even got a chance, Danger Sense acted up again. He didn't even turn to look as he dodged a second water jet that came from the fish. Suddenly it all started to make sense. The wounds on the big shadow cat were from these two, the fish crushed its front paws while the bear tore into it with its claws. A quick, judge threat, let him know that the bear was even stronger than the fish was. Luckily for him the bear was focused on strength endurance and vitality, making it slow enough that he could outrun it. Ajax didn't even think twice before he started running. With a bear on his trail, already he kept clear of the woods as another monster ambushing could delay him too much. Despite the danger that running alongside the small river that flowed down from the pond post from the fish that had disappeared Ajax still chose that over running in the woods as a clear path also let him bring his full speed to get away from the bear. For the first time Ajax had also understood the true meaning of the old saying better the devil you know as he looked into the woods wary of anything else deciding to join. A quarter of an hour later, he had finally lost the bear and there had been no sign of the fish. With no immediate threat he took a bit of distance from the water and finally stopped to catch his breath adrenaline was still running through him from the near-death experience. He explored his surroundings with his mana sense, but found nothing dangerous. One thing that did stick out to him was that the water running in the river was a lot less potent than it had been in the pond. He could finally see the food chain take place in this forest. Neither the bear nor the fish could have monopolized the pond at the start, but together they ran off every other animal. This resulted in them both growing strong enough to not really need the other's help, but as one was dominant on land and the other in the water, they couldn't forcibly take the prize for themselves. Thinking about this, Ajax was even more impressed by the shadow cat he had seen. Sure, it had died in the end, but it managed to get away after being ambushed by both the fish and the bear. Back when he got fluffy he could only take the core of the shadow cat and the cub as the rest of the body went to the other hunters as they all went as a party. Now he had the fangs and claws of an even stronger specimen to give a smith for making weapons for him. The only sad part being that the fur was too damaged for him to make armor out of, a few snug coats was the most he could hope for. After resting for another ten minutes, he finally got to work getting his bearings. It was starting to get late, and he wanted to make it back to camp, before it got dark. It took a half hour, but he finally found a reliable point when he spotted the mine the entire war was fought over in the distance. The river had flowed into a tight caver a few hundred feet back, so he was now coming down the hill and heading for a road that should be able to take him all the way back to camp. When he was half a mile off the road he heard the sound of rushing water return, so he decided a quick look wouldn't hurt, after all the pond and river weren't placed on the map and they would surely be important resources, it was best to have all the information when reporting about them. As he closed in on the sound, he found a small outpost of armed men surrounding the small spring. All the men wore the colors and insignia of a noble house, one that seemed familiar, but Ajax didn't know the name of. Focusing his senses on the water he could tell that it had lost even more of its mana potency as it ran all the way here, it was down to a third of what it had held back in the bond, but it was all being collected by the outpost into barrels. Deciding not to approach things he turned back around and made his way back to the camp. On the way there, he finally remembered why the sigil had seemed so familiar. It was the house sigil of the noble, leading the other side of this conflict. It seems that he has found another resource close to the disputed silver mine and decided to keep quiet about it. Not only that according to Tom, the leadership was surprised to see that the other side had conscripted four cities and not only three as the fourth was quite a ways off from here, but if you considered that he had hoped for a quick victory to hide the presence of a mana-infused spring it all added up, 
Ajax's first instinct was to go and report his finding to the commander, after all he has been helping him for a while now. But as the camp got closer and Ajax thought more about it, that didn't seem like the best course of action for himself. Reporting the find of the pond so soon after everything with the bug had just blown over was sure to place a spotlight on him. That was something he would rather avoid, so he decided it would be best to keep all of this to himself and only report it towards the end of the conflict. Not only that, but he also wanted to try his luck against the bear and fish again. Sure, he stood no chance against both of them, but the fish was bound to the pond. He could take his time hunting the bear, even if he was not strong enough to bring him down in one-on-one -on -one, he could use his skills with a bow and mana to slowly build up damage before killing the bear and then moving on to the fish. Both of them should have some valuable corpses, considering they were both closing in on level 50, though he wouldn't admit it to himself Ajax wanted to be the one to kill the bear and the fish for another reason, that was the purring warm blanket of fur that rested on his shoulders. Though he had only killed her mother in self-defense, he still felt a bit guilty about it, but there was nothing he could do. Now that he had a chance to personally avenge her other parent, however, he was surely going to take it. The bear and the fish also presented him with a chance to push himself to his limits, something he couldn't really do in the war. It also allowed him to secretly work on his mana skills in a dangerous situation, pushing his experience gain out of the funk it had been in for the last few weeks since spending his free points. Chapter 77 The trip back to the camp took quite a while longer than Ajax would have liked. The sun was already starting to go down, despite him leaving late in the morning. It wasn't something that could have been helped however. Had he known about the location of everything, it would have been a much shorter trip, but with all the investigating it had dragged on for hours on end. He was also limited to his physical stats while traveling along the road, despite being a fair way from the camp using his mana, to speed back would have been asking to get found out. Still the discoveries he made were definitely worth it, a source of natural mana to supplement the course for Fluffy strong opponents that he could use to train his magic as well as a distant reward for reporting on the location of the pond after the whole thing was over. Not only that, but since it looked like his side would win now that they had the upper hand, the fact that the other baron knew but didn't report the existence of the spring would most likely prevent him from challenging again over the whole pond. He should definitely take a recording item the next time he came out to ensure he had the necessary proof. The last thing he wanted was for his brother to get called up again a few weeks after all this. Protecting his brother was one of the main reasons why he didn't just get himself captured and wait out the war as a prisoner. That and the loose regulation regarding any equipment the prisoners have on them, losing his gloves over a greedy overseer, was definitely not worth it. As he entered the defensive perimeter of the camp, he started to relax his guard. Now that he didn't have to be so vigilant over his environment, he started to plan out his hunt for the empowered bear. This was definitely not an opponent he would be able to beat straight up. The combination of strength, endurance, and vitality would be too much for him to take down all at once safely. A few engagements from afar with his bow and mana infused arrows should let him weaken the bear enough to be able to kill it. The fight against the fish would not be so straightforward the fish had sufficient stealth that the same tactic would not work on it, and despite it being weak enough to finish in a single fight, he wasn't certain about his prowess while fighting in water. Well, that would be a problem to figure out later first things first, he had to deal with the bear. As he arrived, the guards on watch duty were a bit suspicious about someone returning alone at such a late hour. Funnily enough, having Fluffy with him cleared it all up as everyone recognized the shadow cat that had recently joined their unit and knew it wouldn't be accompanying a spy so they just waved him through. Not having eaten since breakfast and having exhausted a good amount of his stamina and mana he headed off to eat, grabbing a large portion for both himself and Fluffy before spotting Tom and Kate and going to join them. Well look who it is. Tom mocked, good-naturedly. After sleeping in you just decided to disappear without a word and now you come back when it's time to eat. I thought it was supposed to be the person that bonded who would start taking on the traits of the bond, not their brother. You seem more like a stray cat though. Kate piled on, though the smile on her face made it clear she didn't mean anything by it. Yeah, the day kind of got away from me there. Ajax said with a bit of embarrassment. 
I do have something to show for it though, he patted the backpack with a bit of pride. Ajax had planned to let both Kate and Tom in on the water, but not the guardians. He didn't want them to worry about him when he was hunting them. Oh, and what would that be? The gravelly voice of Commander Grievous sounded behind him. Oh, well, Ajax turned around flustered. The commander wasn't the person he wanted to see right now. I can feel some mana radiating off whatever it is, he mused. That was also the reason he had come over. Feeling some unknown mana coming from the pack from someone that was gone all day raised some red flags. I went back into the forest near where I found Fluffy here, he said scratching the cat that had returned to Tom's side since it laid eyes on him. I thought I might be able to find something that would have drawn the shadow cat here. And did you, not only the commander, but Kate and Tom were also looking at him expectantly. I found the burrow they were staying in. Ajax answered, careful not to lie just in case there was a skill that could pick up on those things. Ajax pulled the pack closer to an empty table and took out the corpse of the big shadow cat. All three were surprised to see another shadow cat, but they got really interested once they saw the wounds it presented with. I found it already dead in the burrow. I thought that we could maybe make ourselves three cloaks from its fur since the chance of getting some armor out of it is close to zero. There was nothing else close to it, I checked, he said as he stepped away and let the three of them and some of the other soldiers that were eating examine the wounds. Ajax was very careful with his answers, he hoped to be able to keep the pawn to himself for a while longer, if the war lasted enough time he might even be able to claim a few of the fruits from the tree in the middle once they ripened before he reported it, something strong definitely killed this. But its speed shouldn't be all that high. Look at how it crushed its legs yet it still wasn't able to chase it down to kill it. We definitely need to set up a perimeter, don't want any of us to run into whatever did this unprepared, the lead hunter said. He came to look when he saw another shadow cat, he had snagged the claws from the last one, but was also coveting something made of the soft fur it possessed. That's an understatement. From now on all pat rolls are to be made up of three people minimum. Put as much of a description as you can manage from the wounds here and tell people to be on their toes, the commander said. After making the announcement, he pulled Ajax to the side, knowing that there was something he needed to discuss with him. You did a good job bringing this to our attention, and you will be able to keep the spoils for yourself this time, he nodded his head towards the greedy look some of the guards were giving the valuable beast. But since you obtained it on your own free time, you still have to pay your taxes on it. It would be a lot cheaper to just pay using part of the loot rather than its value as something like this is pretty rare in this region. Is there a part of it you would be willing to part with? Ajax was a little surprised at this. So many years away from Earth and the relatable quotes all came back to him. Two things are definitely certain in this world, and it seems not even dying once is enough to get you rid of taxes. Would its claws and teeth be enough? I hope to use the fur to make some cloaks for Tom Kate and myself. As for the core, I think Fluffy would get the most out of it since it's already attuned to his magic type. Ajax asked. It's a little close, but an argument could be made that the pelt is worth less since it's all torn up. With the information it provided us about there being another large predator, I'll push it through, the commander said then headed towards the table. Once he made his way through the crowd, he carefully pulled out his knife and dug out the core without damaging the pelt any further. He tossed it to Ajax and carefully repacked the body. I'll take this to be examined. Our leather worker was pretty excited about the bones from the other one. I'm sure he'll be willing to make your cloaks in exchange for keeping them. Does that work for you? He asked Ajax. Ajax nodded. He knew the bones would usually be worth quite a bit more, but more than half of them had to be broken from the fight with the bear, keeping that in mind trading them like this seemed like a great deal to him. Chapter 78 With the new loot being taken care of, Ajax proceeded to enjoy his meal. There was quite a bit he wanted to talk about with Tom and Kate, but all of that would need to wait until they were in private. Despite the rarity of the shadow cat its presence was little more than a short interest to the rest of the unit after the presence of Fluffy. The other hunters were taking it a bit harder since they missed out on the loot by not going to check the area on their first day off thinking they would get to it tomorrow with the rest of the squad. 
As they got back to the tent Ajax was starting to feel the fatigue from the battle and the long day of searching started to crawl up on him. Despite wanting to talk about what he found with Tom and Kate it would be best if he was rested. As he walked inside the tent he noticed a rather large book that had been left open on the table. That wasn't there before, he mentioned while pointing to the book. The commander gave it to Tom, it should help him understand what is going to happen with his new bond. Kate said in a kind voice, before turning to Tom to frown, that is if he would read it. You already started, you can just give me the highlights. Tom said while giving her a hug and brushing her hair and cat ears. Ajax just nodded and asked them to wake him up if he slept in again. He also mentioned that he would like to talk to them early in the morning. With that he crawled onto his lumpy mattress, but he couldn't care about it and just passed out. Surprisingly, he didn't need anyone to wake him and was feeling quite refreshed the next morning. Both Tom and Kate were already up. Tom was already in his gear as he would need to leave a bit earlier for his duties as the liaison. Morning. He greeted them before going into the heart of the matter. I have some, hypothetical questions, to ask about something related to this skirmish. Tom stopped trying to fasten the last strap of his gear and turned to give him a look that said, not again. Kate on the other hand looked a lot more excited by the prospect of something interesting happening, this was understandable given that all she would do even in a battlefield was sit in the back and heal, what did you do this time? Tom complained, forgetting all about his gear and taking a seat next to Kate while motioning him to take the one on the opposite side of the table. Oh, hush you. Kate said while giving him a gentle flick to the shoulder. I never see anything interesting. She wasn't wrong either, even harming a healer in their little war carried a hefty criminal punishment, let alone killing one. They were just too rare and too useful, so they were protected. Now this is all hypothetical Ajax repeated to try and cover any lie regulations there may be, but what would happen should one side discover another natural resource, one of maybe even greater value than the one being fought over mean? Great, just fucking great. Tom already threw both hands up in the air. It depends on its importance. Kate was more calm and explained. But seeing as how both of the barons serve different vicons, if the resource was important enough a whole other skirmish would be set up with much larger armies. If this one had not yet ended, both armies would receive reinforcements and the skirmish would be extended. Skirmishes between viscounts usually last upward of a year. Even Kate started to look a little bothered at the admission. After all, an entire year of just sitting back in a tent and healing wounded fighters while living in this camp was not something she would be looking forward to. Ajax just nodded and processed what they were saying. All right, and what if, hypothetically of course, one side knew about the resource and didn't report it? Ajax started but was quickly interrupted. Oh no, you are not going to be sitting on this. It could land you in so much trouble. Tom instantly spoke up. Let me finish. Ajax said with a mild tone. What if one side knew about the resource, didn't share its existence, and also recruited a bigger-than-normal army for the skirmish? Not only that, but they still lost the fight, what would happen then? Tom and Kate both froze as soon as Ajax finished speaking. They turned to each other, but didn't speak a word. It was like they were communicating with their eyes only, but both changed from their relatively relaxed pictures to being on edge. If there was proof that something like this had happened, then the winning side would be able to keep the resource as a bonus, but if there is no proof the other side can re-challenge over it. Tom said after a long pause. With this being the case I think we dashed Tom continued but stopped after Kate gave his arm a squeeze. You need to get going, I'll find out everything else there is, and we'll both take today to think on this. Clearly it isn't something that has to be handled immediately so we can take our time. Kate said while helping him secure the last latch. Tom just nodded and started heading for the exit while deep in thought. While it may seem that because of its importance that something should be done right away about the situation, even if they were to lose the skirmish they could re-challenge since they already knew where the more important resource was. Not only that, 
but since a conscript found it they could use this to their advantage, to forego another battle over it if they just kept quiet about the discovery and just gathered a bit of evidence. Now since you are only conscripted and not part of the guard unit, we have a few choices in how we handle this. Kate explained once Tom was gone. First of all you can't tell any of us anything about any resource. Ajax looked a bit troubled at that statement, but Kate picked up on his worry and quickly followed it up. Should you hypothetically find one of course, a naughty smile spreading across her face showing off only one of her more pronounced canines. Next, as a hunter and the spy who managed to plant the bug I don't think anyone would find it suspicious that you would take a recording device, should you happen upon some evidence that needs to be recorded in the future. She continued, and Ajax nodded, happy that his forethought to make everything a hypothetical was covering their asses. With that the discussion was closed. Kate would rather not risk a slip of the tongue limiting their options. She was well aware of the skills that would be used in the investigation of this matter and they wouldn't be able to get away with a lie there, luckily the questions they could ask were limited as well so as to not abuse their power. Questions like, did you suspect anything were excluded, and she made sure Ajax knew the rules as well. Ajax was not happy just quite yet though, so he thought of how else he could ask the other questions he had. He realized that he could give Kate a bit more knowledge without actually telling her anything and went to rifle through his pack. Once he grabbed one of the water skins he filled up yesterday, he grabbed a bowl and served Fluffy. What is with the mana infused in that water? Where did you g-kate stared at the bowl Fluffy was sipping from with wide eyes, but managed to cut her question off once she realized the implications. Actually, never mind. Did you happen to grab any more of it? It would be a great supplement, besides the cores to make sure she grows up well. I have a few more water skins. Ajax admitted, but then moved on to what he really wanted to know. What would happen if a human was to eat or drink something that was so heavily infused with mana? Kate frowned at the question. It depends. If a humanoid that didn't have access to their mana was to do, so they would die from mana overload. If their humanoid did have access to their mana, however, it is a bit more complicated. She tapped the table thinking of the best way to explain this. There are multiple factors that we would need to take into consideration. First of all, unlike mana creatures and monsters humans don't have and can't form a core. This means that any massive spike of natural mana would kill them from exposure. However low amounts of exposure from something like mana-infused water could help the regeneration of mana should their pool be depleted. Chapter 79 The last two weeks had been an exercise in frustration for both the conscripts and the guard units. Ever since they lost the bugs, the two future barons had formed a firm front to take every precaution before accepting a battle. This had lost them almost all of the ground they had gained with the initial two victories. According to Tom the Archduke's daughter was starting to get fed up with their indecisiveness, but there was nothing she could do about it. Her friend had joined her as part of her retinue and not an outright leader. That added to the fact that the only other person she brought with her was a single bodyguard meant that she didn't have the manpower or the votes to influence the other nobles. The other two nobles were now more afraid of a trap than anything else. Unlike in the beginning when they were outnumbered and a defeat was not just suspected, but in fact likely, they were now timid with any engagements. A defeat now after the loss of the bug would signify their lack of leadership to the higher-ranked noble with them something they wanted to avoid at all costs. What this meant for Ajax and a lot of other soldiers was a lot of forming up, marching followed by staring down the enemy army before slowly retreating and ceding a little ground every time. With his higher perception stat Ajax knew that despite the annoying repetitive movement for his side, the enemy was actually more affected by this lack of engagements than they were. Clearly the enemy knew that should they suffer a defeat similar to either of the first two it would mean an end to the skirmish with their loss. This led them to creating all sorts of static defenses to give them a leg up before every potential engagement. Building spike walls, digging pits and trenches day after day was really starting to wear down the enemy. Despite their somewhat loose formation most of them were leaning on their tower shields and spears to keep standing. What did this mean for the hunters? 
Basically, they all went out to hunt as a group every three or four days in order to keep up with consumption and not tax their supplies too much. This also meant that Ajax had no free time in which he could take off into the woods to try and spot the bear. Their first real break came once the enemy made it a good way out of the forest and started to build a small fort in the open plains. They knew there was no way to attack into it or anywhere near it as the defensive advantage would be too big. The advantage they did get was in their manpower. With that many people working on building the fort right after weeks of trudging through digging ditches and forming up for any charges meant that the enemy was tired. Ajax's side took advantage of this by giving a lot of their people two days off. They also sent a few spies to try and damage the enemy supplies. Ajax's physical stats were still on the low side for the army so he was also starting to feel the fatigue from the strenuous marching, training, and hunting. He took advantage of the announced days off by crashing without eating dinner the night before. Even with all that he barely woke up at dawn to go grab breakfast. Since he wasn't going exploring this time, he only took the bare necessities. Starting with leaving his large pack in the tent, all he grabbed were a bow, arrows, and a short mace for anything else he encountered out there. The non-combat equipment was also very bare bones. A few water skins he intended to fill up from the river as Fluffy had been drinking his fill as well as a recording device in order to gather the evidence that would prevent another skirmish challenge from going down. Having eaten a hearty breakfast, he headed out carefully fully utilizing his stealth skills. The last thing he wanted was to be followed. He also took the direct route that went through their traps as he knew their positions. Once he was a fair distance from the camp and hidden by the trees, he took off at a faster pace with the help of his mana. Having plotted out the locations on the map since his last trip, it only took him two hours of running to make it back near the pond. Once he got there he slowed down and started looking for tracks in order to find the bear. For the first time since he started his training as a hunter, he ran into an unexpected problem. There were too many tracks. Usually, two different tracks could overlap, but here there were as many as five. This meant that he had to take his time to find the freshest ones, all the while being on full alert. Despite this finding the bear didn't prove as difficult as he expected when he started looking at the track. The reason was quite simple, he wasn't hiding. When you want to preserve a precious resource, you base your home around and are the strongest thing around by an order of magnitude you announce your presence to the surroundings. The bear's intelligence could be seen on full display as it used a piece of dented bark he stripped off a tree to carry water from the pond to a berry bush. Clearly he didn't trust the fish enough to swim all the way to the tree so he was spreading mana to his food sources. Quickly climbing up into a tree, the first thing Ajax did was plan his escape route. At best, he would be able to fire five or six arrows before the bear locked onto him and he would have to start running. With that out of the way, he drew the first arrow back. He started with shadow mana as that would keep his location hidden for the first shot. The arrow flew straight taking out one the bear's eyes, but not being able to punch any deeper than that. From there, he switched to a combination of metal and magma. With his next two arrows, he tried taking out the other eye, to little success. His shots were close, but all he managed were two cuts on his snout. As he fired the fourth arrow, aiming for the neck, the bear finally found him. He rose on two legs as he released a challenging roar. This took the arrow off aim and ended up with it hitting its stomach. As he started his own escape Ajax felt a shift in the bear's mana. Instead of the even spread it had before it was now concentrated around its remaining eye. It didn't compromise on its chest or neck either, but this left its limbs a lot more exposed. With a vested interest in slowing it down Ajax started focusing on the joints with lightning and ice mana. Of the six arrows he shot, five hit the bear's front paws sending it face first into the ground. Using this change Ajax took the opportunity to fire a final metal-infused arrow into the bear's neck before finally retreating. It wasn't that he didn't have the opportunity to shoot any more arrows, but the fact that his mana was already running low. Considering the amount he would need for a quick run back, he would be dropping below the level he would have liked, reaching into his final 20%. Constantly using his mana for, siphon mana, as well as, mana augmentation, was a big drain. 
Getting the five water skins filled up was fairly uneventful, though nerve-wracking. He kept his eyes on every movement of the water, just in case the fish decided to take a swim downriver. They had gone through nine similar ones in the past fifteen days, so these would be enough to tide them over for another week and a half at best. The results were also clear and very much worth it. Fluffy's mana had grown a lot denser, and she had started shadow, jumping slightly bigger distances. The biggest change however came after she had been given her father's core. With that jump in mana, as well as the constant intake of water she had started smoking, not the drag from a pipe kind, but releasing a constant sheen of dark mist from her fur. It was very thin and disappeared completely half an inch away from her fur, but left a deep impression on both the commander and the nobles. The final part of his expedition also went smoothly. It took very little effort to gather the recording of the spring. He also noticed that there were at best half the guards stationed around here as there were last time. The war taking a turn for the worse seemed to have resulted in a few men being pulled away from guard duty to try to secure victory. After all, what was the point of keeping this place secret if they were forced to reveal it to get a second chance at a challenge? Chapter 80 A large commotion had broken the quiet of the night. Ajax hadn't expected anything to be happening since one side was offering rest days while the other should have been building a fort. He quickly threw on his gear and grabbed his sword. Kate and Tom both looked just as surprised by the commotion. Either of you have any idea what is going on? he asked. None, Kate responded while Tom just shook his head while yawning. The guards were quick to respond to the wake-up call. Thankfully, the commotion was only a round-up before an emergency deployment and not an attack on their camp. As they marched towards the main camp, Tom took the opportunity to approach the commander and try to find out anything about what was going on. Ajax had joined the line at the front of the formation before the commander's aide came to pull him back. Apparently, even the commander didn't know exactly what was going on, but it seemed like he had a pretty strong guess. What is going on? Ajax asked. The Archduke's daughter and her friend really disliked the passive way the future barons were choosing to play out this war, but there was simply no good reason to forcefully go against their tactics, he responded while leading Ajax towards the back. The decision to give two days off to the troops was the final straw. The two of them took direct command of one of the other two guard units. She sent off their hunters and a few of the higher-leveled personnel to cause some more damage to the enemy supply depots in the main camp. The attack was planned for right after dusk. According to the information we had they had split their supplies into five different storage tents, but the spies only managed to set two of them ablaze. It seemed that this had the desired effect, however as quite a few of the forces pulled back from the front lines to trap the saboteurs. Soon after they left the partially built fort the two nobles, their bodyguard and the remainder of the guard unit launched a sneak attack. Their plan was to use as many of their mages to level the skeleton of the fort. The commander even agreed with their plan as apparently letting the fort actually get built would have been all but a nail in the coffin for us. That made sense, Ajax had also doubted the plan to just let the fort get set up uncontested but didn't think it was all that important since they wouldn't be able to get any wards so a few well-timed spells from the two nobles girls should have been enough to make it a non-issue. Why go to all this risk? Couldn't they just lob spells at it in night raids? he asked. After all, if they brought it down with magic, harassing it continually might be a better answer. Once the fort was built it would have counted as a completed camp. Due to the regulations to prevent mass casualties from magic, destructive spells can only be used on the environment. A half-built fort qualifies, but a fully established one would be protected. Hearing this, Ajax almost stopped rooted on the spot. What the hell were the two future barons thinking even considering letting the fort be established? It would have all but assured the open plain would be controlled by the enemy making any plan their side had at victory take longer than a year of shallow skirmishes, though he could see the appeal from the two of them at this approach, it practically guaranteed them a long time in the presence of the important nobles while the girls were still young, both around seventeen or eighteen. Okay, but then why pull me away from the front lines? It made no sense that the commander would ask for him specifically. 
One of the enemy noble families specializes in illusion magic. They have a habit of sending their men after healers in these mock battles whenever rushed engagements like this one happen, the aide said. That still doesn't answer my question. Ajax said. The commander has made me aware of your situation, he whispered while lightly mimicking a casting motion with his hands. You usually wouldn't be relied upon, but the circumstances right now are a bit special. Ajax was only slightly surprised to see that the man knew he could cast magic. He honestly had expected it after the commander found out. It was a lot easier to keep a lid on things if the aide knew, otherwise the commander personally interacting with him would have brought a lot more scrutiny and the man already knew about his abnormal level and age combination. Since the strike force also took most of the images with them in order to take down the fort, we are left with few mana users to keep the assassins in check. Detect mana is known to be unreliable when dealing with illusion magic whereas, sense mana, isn't so you will be part of the healer guards for this battle. He whispered this second part so as to not let others eavesdrop. As a hunter Ajax quickly got to work setting up detection traps all around the tent before building himself a small raised chair resembling a lifeguards at the beach to keep an eye on the surrounding as well as the battle. Ajax was glad to see two people wearing robes were also stationed to guard the tent along with a squad of guards. He then finally climbed up on his chair and looked towards the imminent battle. From up there, he could see the group retreating towards their force and being chased by a large army. The retreating force was a lot bigger than he had expected, it seems like the guard unit only had a quarter of their numbers lost on this mission. He had expected them to lose at least half. After all, despite it being an ambush, the small group did need to take quite some time to dismantle even the bare bones of the fort that had been set up. This gave him a good impression of the two noble girls as leaders of the army. They had realized the need to take out the fort and took the matter into their own hands when they saw the future barons would not budge not only that, but they completed the mission with surprisingly few losses. As he watched, he also saw three imposing figures in close pursuit almost reaching the stragglers from the retreating force. Of them, he only recognized two of them as the commanders of the guard units they had routed during the first engagement of the skirmish. The third one was presumably a third commander and they were about to catch up. He knew that their force would take substantial losses when that happened as the commanders seemed to be above level 50. Not quite to the level of their own commander, but only a few levels off, and there were three of them. That's when he saw someone turn to meet them head on. He thought the idea was good, sacrificing a few to buy time for the many to get away. The execution was bad though, as a single person wouldn't be able to buy enough time. He was shocked to find out how wrong he was. The person who turned around was quick, so quick in fact, he had trouble keeping his eyes locked on him. The man charged and used some sort of fire spell to obscure his movements, effectively slowing the three commanders to a crawl all by himself. Ajax thought he recognized the man after watching him for a minute. Though he had only seen him once, he suspected him to be the bodyguard that was following the two noble girls. He ballparked his level close to 55 and that was only considering his physical stats and the little magic he had shown. He was probably a lot stronger than that as most humans who had access to mana would prioritize mental stats over physical ones. It was in fact likely the man was over level 100 but had his strength limited when affecting the skirmish directly. He was after all, the only guard an archduke sent to guard his only teenage heir. He didn't get a chance to examine the interesting fight any longer, despite wanting to see how someone would mix both physical and magical aspects in a fight. One of the traps had been triggered, despite him seeing nobody close to where he had placed it. Even more suspicious was that the trigger was under a pile of leaves that looked untouched and he couldn't sense any mana in that direction. He still trusted his instincts and traps and threw a dagger towards the location. His sudden movement put the rest of the guards on edge instantly. Their gazes were in the process of forming glares as they heard the sound of metal striking metal and a man wearing chainmail suddenly appeared from nowhere with a dagger fallen at his feet. Chapter 81 The dagger striking seemed to be the trigger as five more people became visible. Unlike the first one, they seemed to have dropped from a slightly raised platform about two inches off the ground. 
With the stealth spell, Gon Ajax and the other mages were able to clearly pick out that the person struck with the knife was a caster and the others merely cloaked by his spell. Ajax knew full well that this didn't mean they weren't casters themselves as he also hid in plain sight by simply not using his mana where others could detect it. That combined with the odd mismatch of gear the five war meant that there could be another caster. Among the six, there were only three with clearly defined roles. The initial caster wore some rather form-fitting robes, one was decked out in full plate and a third had leather gear with a bow and daggers on his belt. The remaining three all had loose cloaks covering their bodies and hoods above their heads. One thing was clearly obvious, these people were all above the average level found in the skirmish. A quick use of judge threat gave him a quick rundown. The caster, while probably decently high level, was clearly a bad matchup against him so he was scored as a low threat. For more were ranked as a mild threat with the final cloaked figure being a decent threat. Not only that, but the last one also jerked his head to look at Ajax the moment he used the skill. This might seem like good news, but it was in fact quite bad. The people were around level 35 to 40 meaning engaging them without his mana was suicide. On the upside, he wasn't here alone. His side had more than twice, the people giving him a good reason to bow out of the fight. The cloaked one on the left seems to be the strongest, but I can't get a read on the mage, he called out to the stunned defenders, which seemed to have broken them out of their shock. All but the two physically blocking the entrance of the tent moved to engage them. They had superior numbers, with two casters on their side, victory was all but guaranteed now that they removed the element of surprise. Their levels are all well above mine, he continued, I'll retreat and keep a lookout. Chances are this isn't the only group they sent. He kept in mind that the people posted here could very well have a lie detection skill, so he used level as a reason for avoiding the fight. Getting a quick confirmation nod from one of the more decorated soldiers, he started to back away. That he narrowly managed to hit the deck a moment after the strongest cloaked figure dashed out of his line of sight with the help danger sense, let him know he was most likely correct about there being another group. That or they wanted him out of the picture so they could disengage and use their caster stealth again. He saw a second knife coming towards him, but this was intercepted by one of his comrades. This was one of the veterans who had given him an annoyed look when he first showed up, thinking he got the post due to nepotism or bribery. That look was long gone, transformed into an excited smirk. He gave Ajax a quick nod to get out of range, before he focused on the enemy and started to advance with everyone else. Feeling at ease with the group being handled, Ajax dropped back and took another look at the direction they must have come from. Surprisingly, he could now make out tracks in the dead leaves he had spread around. With this, he narrowed their stealth spell to one which produced an illusion and prevented noise from escaping. This is why they triggered the trap as it was activated by the weight stepping on it. Knowing what to look for now, he scooped up some earth, crushed it into small rocks and started tossing them around, looking carefully at whether or not they stopped or disappeared for no reason. With an overwhelming numbers advantage, the battle had quickly ended without too much fanfare. On the ground tied up were the six infiltrators as well as one of the guards. Why is he sitting down too? Ajax asked. Unlike the weak conscripted, we don't need the threat of possible death to motivate us to fight. This also means that we stop before delivering any strong debilitating blows, taking the loss and stepping out for the rest of the war. This helps prevent any unlucky deaths when people of similar level fight, the same veteran explained. So he was taken out? Then why are the others tied up? Ajax asked. Because we didn't kill them, technically. Sure, marking them as dead would mean that they have to stay out of the fighting for the rest of this war, but we also can't interrogate them. Considering how the skirmish has gone, since we lost the bug, I'd say it's worth risking them getting freed to get some extra information. The veteran seemed a lot more patient with the young hunter now. You had the right of it, kid, the one sitting down said. That one really was tough, he's the reason I'm dead. Hearing the praise seemed to improve the mood of the cloaked man though this only means that his scowl lessened. The next few hours were peaceful, 
Ajax still repeatedly tossed some crushed up earth in random directions, but focused on the battle in the distance. Unlike their previous engagements, it was their army that was now on the back foot. Not only were they rushed into position, they were also missing most of their mages as their mana was spent taking out the fort. The group of guards and mages had been finally absorbed into the main army and the careful retreat was finally beginning. Unlike the previous retreats where the other side all but turned back and ran or both armies stepped away without an engagement beginning this one was done with the help of the few leftover mages. They were casting long spells, preparing to create a big ditch between the two armies that would give us time to retreat without having our men run down. As the spell was finally released Ajax was absorbed in watching. Feeling the mana from all the way here and watching as the multiple mages worked together to power one single action, this was definitely a strength that only chanting magic had. Sure Runic could also do the same thing with multiple people having items designed to work together, but those lacked the flexibility to adapt to anything but the ideal scenario. As he was focused on the aftermath of the spell, he suddenly felt one of his traps trigger. He felt a chill run down his back at his own stupidity. How could he have let his guard down just because the armies have started to disengage? Even if all of the assassins that had come for the healers would be taken out this was a trade the enemy was more than happy to make. A real downside of this skirmish was that such suicide attack didn't require the mental condition of throwing away your life as death merely meant spending the rest of the war in poor living conditions. His hand instantly went to the knife at his belt drawing it as he was turning ready to throw. Thanks to his trap layout, he didn't even need to be looking at the target to know the general area he needed to aim for. He wasn't going to see anything anyway. As he was about to release the knife, he felt a strong grip take hold of his hand. Whoa, easy there, the same veteran that seems to have taken a liking to him and had been sticking closer to him since the ambush said. Ajax's reply died in his throat as he turned and noticed people carrying injured towards the tent were what had triggered his trap. Had he not been stopped, it was likely he would have harmed one of his own, maybe even killed, depending on where the knife hit. So that's how you did it? The tied-up mage exclaimed. What do you mean? The dangerous cloaked man I now identified as the leader of the hit squad asked. I was thinking how it didn't add up. He managed to see through my spell, but couldn't gouge my level of power, but had no problem with you. It just didn't add up. If he had enough skill with spells, he should have had no problems. It was just a double-layered trap, the leaves were masking strings, and I just stepped on one. He continued to silently curse his misfortune. A trickle quickly turned into a stream and the tent was filled up in no time. This led to quickly forming arguments from some of the people in one of the future barons' entourage, demanding that space be made for them before the commoners. A frustrated one with a decent slash on his arm fumed as he angrily kicked the ground breaking up the ground and leaving a small creator. The rubble exploded in every direction with the sound of the impact drawing everyone's attention. A few of the pieces seemed to hit an invisible wall no more than five feet from the entrance of the tent. Three daggers joined Ajax's in striking the same spot where a man clad in plate armor appeared a moment later before all hell broke loose. Chapter 82 Ajax POV A moment after the first man appeared, so did two more. The three were basically at the entrance of the tent. I could clearly see the bulky plate-covered man and the four daggers that had bounced off his plated chest piece at the ground by his feet. Behind him I could just about make out the form of a cloaked caster with a similar design to the one that was tied up, but anything below his neck was blocked off by the plated shoulders of the first man. The final man was covered in a similar cloak to the first three that had similar outfits in the first group. In the downtime after the first ambush, they had told me the reason for the cloaks, it was so they would cover the noble house, the people represented, attacks on healers didn't make people popular, so they were allowed to keep the cloaks on even after on the condition that they gave up everything on them similar to a search. The third man was also the one I locked onto, he already had a foot past the entrance of the tent when he appeared, likely waiting for the cloth to be pulled back when the next person entered so he could sneak in. I was slow responding to the situation, taking time not only to analyze the men but also waiting until all of them had their stealth removed. 
The more experienced soldiers were already close to them, most likely having started moving even before the knives connected. I finally started sprinting towards the action. The armored man turned and stood his ground looking to block people off as the mage spread his hands. The mouth mask moved as he whispered the incantation before two blasts of wind knocked aside the surprised guards standing on either side of the tent. As the two were getting ready to block the exit, the third tried to spread the flaps and gain entrance. As his hand touched the cloth, I felt a surge of mana whirl through the tent and spawn a small weak barrier to surround it. It finally made sense why neither of the guards had opened the way for the patients and always waited on a doctor to move up and do it. There was a fail-safe that triggered a barrier should someone touch it from the outside. This was probably a well-known tactic that also explained why neither of the two groups had attempted to enter the tent by making a new entrance in the sides or the back as well as why they were waiting for someone to open them a path despite the illusion aspect of their spell. Not only that, I could feel that the barrier was actually weakest at the front, likely a known weakness that allowed them to strengthen the rest of the barrier as a trade-off giving only one easy point of entry and as such one place to guard. The woman, as I took a better look at her, didn't even seem surprised about the appearance of the barrier. She was also most likely cursing the previous four patients, all of whom were not only hefty but also needed to lean on someone to walk, meaning she had no chance to squeeze in with them when they were let in. She pulled out an evil-looking black knife with some red runes drawn on the blade and proceeded to start cutting away at the barrier. For the first time since I came to this world I finally felt runic magic being used. Unlike the simple enchantments placed on gear that could use mana from any source to use their effects I could clearly feel the difference here. The knife held two runes one side with a bigger one on the other. I could clearly feel different amounts of mana going from her to the runes. The knife got coated in mana. I could almost feel the sharpness of the mana through my senses as she started to tear at the barrier. The first three men had already made contact with the armored man, all three having smashed into the tower shield he had pulled from his back. This style of fighting meant that it was only a matter of time until he went down with no chance of doing any damage to his attacker, what it did do however was by time. This time was quickly put to use not only by the woman tearing at the barrier, but also by the caster who had already started muttering his next spell. I could feel the mana gathering even before he was finished chanting, this was something I came to recognize as a clear sign of a powerful spell coming. It worked a lot like the warning that came from beasts when they were using their mana. Unlike a beast however, he wasn't summoning it early because it would take time for him to channel it into the desired effect. No he was summoning it because the amount required for the spell was too much for it to be pulled from his body directly. Something big is coming, one of the mages stationed here called out. He had obviously noticed the same thing I did. The other had also noticed, but didn't bother to notify the rest of us. Instead I felt his mana flow freeze as his mouth stopped moving for a split second before it started again launching a quick one-word spell towards the enemy mage. The blast was odd to me, the mana I felt was similar to the one I felt coming from the pond water if slightly more concentrated, not only that its motion was odd only mimicking a directed blast. The blast knocked two of our guys off their feet as collateral damage, they were too close to the caster and slightly in the line between him and his target. I could feel the spell lose power noticeably as it traveled, it had not only sent the two guys airborne but also spinning from the power of the blast but as it reached its intended target it did little more than knock him backwards off his feet. Despite the small amount of damage inflicted it did fulfill its purpose of stopping the man from finishing his chant. The look of surprise not only on the enemy mage's face, but also on the other mage said that this spell was, if not powerful, at least well known and desired by others. Even the runic caster stopped hacking away at the barrier and turned to look at him in surprise. The mage stalemate disappeared as quickly as it appeared with the two stunned mages starting to cast once more and the woman turning back to hack at the barrier. Not only that, but the plate-covered warrior chose this as his moment to shine as he flung off all three people that were pushing against his shield. The man fell down on one knee afterwards, his shield arm hanging lifelessly by his side as I almost tripped over one of the people sent flying like ragdolls. Most noticeably, I hadn't felt any mana before this, this had to have been a rare or higher physical skill. 
most likely only rare as it not only cost quite a bit of stamina, judging by the breathing and the fact that he dropped to one knee afterwards, but also inflicted damage on the user, the arm either being broken or the muscles torn. As the men were starting to get back up and surround the pair I charged straight through, ignoring the startled looks of the others as I dashed past them, only slowing down to dash out of the way of the wind blast I felt coming from the enemy mage. Almost all my focus was on chasing down the runic mage that had finally sped right into the tent. I was only a second or so entering behind her, but already I could see she had wasted no time. The glowing runes of her dagger shone brightly as he pressed it against another barrier, one whose mana signature I recognized. Unlike most of the other young healers taking part in this war, Kate had learned a few defensive spells from her parents and was not solely reliant on the free knowledge coming from the healing union. This allowed her to ready a defensive spell once she realized something had gone wrong. A blow was all it took for the runic mage to make the decision that trying to break through the barrier was too much of a hassle. Instead, she quickly moved away and charged the next closest healer while also lifting her other arm to point a ring at another healer while barely sparing me a glance. By the time I reached her, she had already left a dent cut on the shoulder of the healer she charged and sent another to his knees with the eclectic blast coming from the ring. Engaging with her gave me an odd feeling. For the first time, when facing someone I found myself on the opposite side of a situation I had been intimately familiar with soon after awakening the system. She definitely had higher level combat skills than I did, most likely low rarity as only those also counted vitality as a physical stat sufficient for breaking the level limit, but she was woefully understated in terms of strength dexterity and endurance. The only thing that stopped me from simply abusing my stats to smash her into the ground from close range was the rune dagger that had chipped a good part of my blade from only a glancing parry. As I tried to maneuver around her enchanted blade I only managed to score some shallow cuts on her arms and legs. This was hardly enough to pin her down, luckily I caught a glimpse of other people charging into the tent. Sadly, I wasn't the only one to notice this as she flung her knife into the shoulder of another healer close by before I could realize what she was doing and restrain her. Chapter 83 as the commotion finally died down with all of the infiltrators secured Ajax, let one of the other guards take care of the prisoner as he went over to Kate, not only to ascertain that she was okay, but also to have her patch up the one cut he did get after the dagger cut through his sword and left a nasty cut on his arm. You okay? he asked her. Yeah, she didn't manage to get through my barrier. Kate said before quickly getting to work on the bleeding cut. Am I captured or dead, a melodious voice, came from behind him. It was different than any other Ajax had heard before and somehow also sounded distinctly inhuman. Captured, the guard responded while securing the restraints. Ajax was no longer concerned with her arms and feet though. He looked pointedly at the silver hair and the pointed ears he could see now, with the hood of the cloak taken down. It was the first time Ajax had ever seen an elf, unlike beastkin and dwarves elves tended to stick to nature as such he saw none in the city. She had a beautiful naturally symmetrical face with violet eyes. She had also noticed the way Ajax seemed to have turned and started to stare at him so she returned the favor. What's with you? Didn't expect that a woman could cut you, she retorted scathingly. Despite the system making gender a much smaller issue when it came to strength compared to earth, sexism still existed. That's not it. Kate answered when she saw Ajax not saying anything. You're just the first elf he's ever seen. Yeah, right, she huffed. No, it's true. He was a hunter in a secluded village before all this. Kate said without any ill will, they managed to conscript him before he joined the Adventurers Guild. This was enough for Ajax to break out of his shock and stop staring at her. Sorry, he mumbled as he turned away from her face and focused on the ring on her finger he had seen send the lightning bolt. The ring on her finger is ruined, he pointed out to the guard securing her. Since she was a prisoner, it was well within the rules for her to try to escape or use it even once restrained. That is runic magic and cannot be seized under the rules of this skirmish, she quickly spoke when the guard moved to take the ring. The guard stopped and looked to the older one that had entered the tent in the meantime. Then in accordance with said rule and the cloak you wear, 
consider yourself searched and all runic items confiscated, the older one said while also returning the dagger she had thrown at the end of the battle. After returning the dagger, he turned to the three healers that had been hit either by blade or bolt. He quickly examined the cut and puncture wound before saying, The three of you are considered dead. Both of the knife wounds were intentionally non-lethal and direct magic hits from runic gear are considered kills as use of lethal runic gear like that is not allowed. Patch yourselves up and then continue treating only other people that have been removed from the skirmish. Take her to the other prisoners, he told the guard who had finished securing her arms before he turned back to Ajax. Good job following after her so quickly, she might have taken another three or four of our healers down otherwise. Consider yourself relieved of duty and get yourself patched up. Nicely done kid. Ajax had taken the order to heart and spent the rest of the night getting patched up before getting a serving of rations. He hadn't even been halfway through his meal when they all started making their way back to the camp. It was already close to morning when he and Kate crashed in the chairs at the table inside their tent. Both were wiped from a long night but wanted to wait for Tom to also return before going to sleep. Neither had seen him since the start of the battle and they were starting to get worried he might have been captured. They were both also trying their hardest to silence the small pessimistic voice in the back of their head that said he might have been killed. You're both still up? Tom asked as he walked in almost an hour and a half after them. They both let out a sigh of relief seeing him with nothing worse than some scratch marks on his armor. How bad was it? Kate asked. She had figured out the reason he was late was most likely the post-combat meeting the leaders held after the battle. Not that bad actually. Tom said. We lost a lot less people in the operation than we expected, not only that but we traded them for quite a few of the guards they had stationed to defend the would-be fort. The battle afterwards was pretty even in terms of losses. What about mages? Kate asked. I know I treated a few that had some evidently non-lethal wounds. They probably have quite a small mage advantage, but it's not that big. We managed to get a few of theirs that they were using to build the fort in the first place. Tom shook his head. The biggest loss has to be the removal of the guard from the Archduke's employ. Ajax clearly remembered the man who managed to keep three commanders off the stragglers as they retreated. Not only that, but the man had access to mana as well. Considering human nature Ajax was willing to eat his shoes if the man wasn't above level 100. Why is that? Ajax asked, the other side complained. Apparently, he is too strong to be taking part in this skirmish. They even tried to say we cheated by having him take part even with a few restrictions in place. Tom said. This is why the meeting took so long. No way they would accept this result. Kate said confidently. They must have asked for more than just his exclusion, since he wasn't meant to be here at all in the first place. They tried. Tom nodded. The fact that they brought four cities worth of people instead of the agreed upon three, for reasons we may or may not suspect. He gave Ajax a pointed look. That and the fact that he is the only person beside the duke's granddaughter to be part of the people joining one about three noble forces was enough to limit the fallout. With that Tom crashed into his chair in front of the plate that they prepared for him and proceeded to eat. Or more accurately proceed to battle Fluffy for the food on the plate. Fluffy had been left with the commander before the battle so she returned with Tom and was also hungry. Any idea what is happening tomorrow? Ajax asked, already starting to stand and wanting to go to sleep. Or maybe I should say today, it's almost morning already? We are all being given the day off. Even the harshest drill sergeant has to know some of us would be able to stand on our feet after being woken up in the middle of the night to go fight a battle. Tom said around a mouthful of food. We and the other guard unit are going to be quite a bit busy for the week after that though. Any specific reason as to why? Kate asked, apparently the future barons were a lot more against the idea of stopping the fort than I thought. They went so far as to block the Archduke's daughter from ordering the guard division to join with her plan, the selfish idiots. Tom said. 
It took her promising them a whole week off and a gold coin each before they agreed to join her. This means that we and the other guard unit will be having to cover for them during this time, so get rested. On that note Ajax bid the two good night and headed off to bed. He was feeling the exhaustion of the battle, but at the same time, he finally had the peace and quiet to think back on all the different interesting things he saw today. The way the Archduke's daughter's bodyguard had been casting spells that seemed to leave some excess mana running that comboed into the next spell. The brief glimpses of runic magic he had gotten, as well as the oddly simple but surprisingly powerful spell the mage used with a single word. What shocked Ajax the most thinking back on that spell was what he felt. It was as if the spell wasn't just a simple chant. The whole action of speaking and pointing seemed to be part of launching the spell. What he had learned so far was that gesturing was just useful to help the mind aim the spell correctly by having a constant point of reference regardless of the time and place you cast. This time however, it seemed like the gesture was part of the chant almost as if the word defined the power and the action, the direction of the blast of pure mana. Considering the reactions from the others, however, it didn't seem like this would be a topic he would be given answers on if he asked. Chapter 84 Ajax woke up around noon. Despite the time being late, he was still one of the first not on duty to wake up and headed over to eat breakfast by himself. He had heard Kate and Tom get busy last night before getting to sleep, so he decided not to disturb them so early. Fluffy on the other hand had no trouble getting up and following him despite the midnight snack he had. Before heading out, he poured the shadow cat a small bowl of mana-infused water as they had gotten into the rhythm of doing so every morning. Despite her usual lazy nature, she finished the bowl in the time it took for him to place the water skin back into his concealed space in the travel pack. He got his serving and went over to a table and started to eat. Halfway through his meal, however someone joined him at the table. Morning, Rookie. The headhunter greeted him as he took a seat across from him and Fluffy. Morning. Ajax kept his greeting short as he usually did with the people of the unit, considering he wasn't going to be sticking around once this whole mess was over with. Now, usually I would have addressed this last night but there were too many people here when you were eating, and then the whole thing with the battle happened so I never got around to it, the old man rambled on. Anyway, we should discuss your extracurricular activities. What do you mean by that? Ajax asked, tensing up a little. No need to get all worked up. You're not in trouble yet. With having joined our unit, you skipped the conscripted orientation, since it wasn't all that pertinent. As such you have been given no warnings yet on anything, which is what I am here to do. In the interest of openness I should also mention that I have a weak skill that helps me spot through lies, most older guards do. At this reveal Ajax started patting himself on the back for all the effort he took with technical truths he had used throughout his time with the guards unit. Now, like I said you're in no trouble just yet. But let's just say I think you found something out in the woods, something you have been keeping to yourself. The accusation rang out in his ears, seeming a lot louder than the words were spoken. First taking a look around to check for anyone else, he decided to take this face on. What gave you that idea? You might be good at erasing your tracks kid, but you have ventured out farther than the perimeter of the camp three times total since the start of us setting up camp here. He said, holding out his hand ready to count on his fingers. First was with the entire group, even then you somehow found the cub and mother. The second time you went by yourself and found an even more impressive specimen. This by itself would not amount to much since it would be a reasonable deduction for a hunter to search for a nest, especially since you found out the true rarity of the creature before us. Where it doesn't add up is that on your next day off you headed out again by yourself, all determined. Not only that, but you came back apparently empty-handed, but not looking angry or displeased. Instead you looked pleased. He lowered his hand and his relaxed look turned serious. You see how something like this might be cause for suspicion? Even if I am the only one to figure it out so far. Ajax froze a little at the explanation. It was true, due to his low amount of free time, he hadn't thought about the perception of his actions would look if someone took a closer look. Seeing how the man didn't go to report this up the line, but decided to confront him instead Ajax had already discussed with Kate and Tom what he should do if someone came up to him like this. 
The only reason they didn't spread this around was that one corrupt soldier or turcoat would ruin everything if they found out. I will admit that I looked into what should happen with any untapped resources found surrounding the contested area. I will also say that I have no intention of hoarding them for my own profit. If I should find something and not report it immediately there is a reason, beneficial to our side, for why I would act how I act. He and Kate had both worked for over an hour to construct this specific answer, one that will not be marked as a lie by any truth skill and also not reveal enough that their plan to have the pond and stream be part of their winnings of this war. It was his turn to see the veteran hunter and guard freeze and think about what he said. The statements about hoarding were both true, though they didn't mention the benefits he was keeping for himself in the form of the water fed to Fluffy or the training against the bear and the fish. Hmm, that's an interesting statement, he grinned but turned serious a moment later. But I will ask this, can whatever you are planning blow back badly on us? No, Ajax was quick to answer. After all, there was no real downside. The only cost to his plan was the amount of time the other baron had to monopolize the spring. That seemed a fair price to pay in exchange for a decent chance to claim both the spring and the pond without another skirmish starting. With a simple nod, he was now again sitting at the table with only Fluffy to keep him company. The feeling of his deception skill going up a rank coming in made him take a look at his status, interested to see just how far his skills had progressed. Name, Ajax. Level, 24. Experience, 6320-35500. Traits, Divine Witness. Health, 1730-1730. Mana, 1690-1690. Stamina, 1360-1360. Vitality, 173. Strength, 134. Endurance, 136. Dexterity, 135. Intellect, 171. Wisdom, 169. Mind, 169. Perception, 132. Stat points, shocked. Skills, common, frowny face mathematics LVL 22, stealth LVL 26, drawing LVL 30. Athleticism LVL 26, running LVL 26, reading LVL 20, writing LVL 20, cooking LVL 20, sewing LVL 20, cleaning LVL 15, haggling LVL 19, gardening LVL 20, axes LVL 31, hammers LVL 30, deception LVL 20, sword LVL 24, shield LVL 24, bow LVL 24, spear LVL 25, Throwing LVL, 22, Persuasion LVL, 10, Unarmed Combat LVL, 21, Knives LVL, 26, Skinning LVL, 12, Tanning LVL, 10, Dismantle LVL, 20, Climbing LVL, 17, Tracking LVL, 23, Heat Resistance LVL, 10, Poison Resistance LVL, 19, Pain Resistance LVL, 10, Trapping LVL, 17, Uncommon, Frowny Face Meditation LVL, 40, Sense Mana LVL 41, Expel Mana LVL 40, Sprinting LVL 25, Mining LVL 10, Lumberjack LVL 10, Smelting LVL 10, Blacksmithing LVL 10, Chanting LVL 11, Mana Farming LVL 12, Increase Price LVL 10, Lower Price LVL 10, Danger Sense LVL 15, Leatherworking LVL 10, Alchemy LVL 10, Mana Milling LVL 6, Precise Cut LVL 22, Precise Blow, LVL 22, Judge Threat LVL 18, Piercing Shot LVL 22, Berserker LVL 1, Rare, Manipulate Mana LVL 30, Water Aspect Mana LVL 23, Fire Aspect Mana LVL 23, Air Aspect Mana LVL 24, Earth Aspect Mana LVL 25, Inject Mana LVL 24, Spot Weakness LVL 15, Residue Recognition LVL 10, Light Aspect Mana LVL, 22, Shadow Aspect Mana LVL, 22, Mana Skin LVL 2. Epic, Mana Augmentation LVL 20, Mana Conjuration LVL 20, Lightning Aspect Mana LVL 10, Metal Aspect Mana LVL 10, Ice Aspect Mana LVL 10, Magma Aspect Mana LVL 7, Holy Aspect Mana LVL 1, 
Void Aspect Mana LVL3 Legendary Mana Siphon LVL16 New Berserker 0-1 Mana Skin 0-2 Upgrades Stealth 23-26 Athleticism 23-26 Running 24-26 Cleaning 13-15 Axes 30-31 Hammers 27-30 Deception 16-20 Sword 20-24 Shield 20-24 Bow 20-24 Spear 20-25 Throwing 20-22 Unarmed Combat 20-21 Knives 25-26 Skinning 10-12 Climbing 15-17 Tracking 20-23 Poison Resistance 18-19 Trapping 12-17 Sprinting 22-25 Danger Sense 10-15 Precise Cut 20-22 Precise Blow 20-22 Judge Threat 13-18 Piercing Shot 20-22 Spot Weakness 13-15 Mana Siphon 14-16 The status showed clearly the lack of improvement in most of his mana skills. The fact that he only used a few in the second combat with the bear, besides, Mana Siphon, meant it wasn't enough for them to grow. That said he could also see the difference in how the skills that he used often and in new ways differed from those that he just kept up with. Poison Resistance, being the obvious standout as one that he had been training for a long while with very little improvement as his own natural resistance independent of the skill started to grow to the poisons he had access to. The amount of experience was also something he was glad for. A little less than half of the amount gained had come from the two encounters with the bear and fish, showing that his constant combat with the two would lead to maybe even getting to level 25 by the time he defeated them both. Chapter 85 the battle for the fort was the last big strategic battle that was fought for well over two months. It wasn't because neither of the forces wanted to try to get the upper hand, rather it was because both were cautious of that happening. This resulted in eight different large engagements taking place. All of these engagements ended up being straight up with no tactical advantage, with lots of standoffs in between. At the end of the two months, both Focus saw their armies ground down by about 7,000 men of what they had after the battle for the fort. The biggest loss for both sides were their scouts, as in preparation for their many engagements a lot of scouts were sacrificed in getting a read in time to retreat out of an unfavorable position. With both armies down losing such a large part of their forces the numerical advantage that Ajax's side had started to grow bigger and bigger as they traded evenly in forces. This let them take ever-increasingly risky engagements and trust that their numbers would carry them through. Of the eight engagements four had happened in the last two weeks. Throughout this time Ajax had made a point of going hunting alone or with the other hunters at every opportunity. This was in order to stop others from putting together the same pieces that the hunter leader did about his discovery of the pond. Doing so meant that he was only able to take five more trips to collect water for Fluffy and weaken the bear. On his last trip fifteen days ago he was finally prepared to kill the bear but had found it drinking water by the pond. He was nowhere near ready to engage with the fish and the bear together so he just swallowed his annoyance and returned back with a few filled water skins from downriver and a rather large boar, most of which was given over to the cooks. The repeated engagements had also started to affect both armies, and at this point both were on the verge of mutiny from lack of rest. Ajax's clearest way to track this was the 0.02 gain in endurance he noticed on his status. This meant that in just under two months he had made more than a 1% progress on a feat that should take well over 10 years to achieve. It was clearly a pace that could not be kept up especially for the mages of both sides. Both sides were faced together again. A mile separating the first lines, with both armies directing their fury more at their own commanders than the enemy at this point. An attitude that was getting picked up by the officers. 
As Ajax waited for his orders, he could hear the veterans of his unit discussing the situation. His unit, being made up of mostly veterans, having participated in multiple similar skirmishes before, were less on edge than the conscripted force. What do you think is happening? One of the younger members asked as he pointed towards the center of the enemy army. If they are smart, they will call a ceasefire for a few days before they have a revolt on their hands, one of the veterans answered him. Looking where he was pointing, Ajax could see a triangle formed of white flags moving forward from the enemy army. In the center, he could just make out seven riders with some flashy looking gear. The response from their side was similar with a triangle of white flags forming around eight riders and a few other unmounted aides heading over. Even over the distance from the left flank Ajax could clearly make out his brother as he followed behind the commander. Isn't asking for a ceasefire in this situation odd? Ajax asked, he had learned that ceasefires were usually only agreed to after a battle or before both armies got into position. Neither side has the advantage here, the veteran replied. Since this hill gives the enemy an advantage and our numbers give us an advantage, they most likely don't want to continue the battle of attrition today, so they will offer champion combat to settle who owns the position. Our side isn't dumb enough to accept that however, another continued. Ever since that Archduke's daughter has taken charge after the battle for the fort, we haven't taken any unfavorable fights. Her only seeming weakness seems to be her experience. Yeah, but that could end up costing her and us everything. If she doesn't give the conscripts a few days off soon we just might end up losing this whole thing, the first veteran nodded. The discussion happening once the two groups met was taking place too far away from any of them to make out what was happening yet the veteran's prediction had been on point as a minute into the discussion our side had started lowering the white flags and made to return. Only to be called back to the discussion halfway through. Tom, POV. I was still quite nervous to be here. Despite the months I had to get used to the presence of nobles, I couldn't help it with so many of them and their bodyguards ready to jump at each other. Thankfully I wasn't the only one, my emotions were mimicked by both of the aides from the other two guard units on our side and by the four aides on the enemy side. Out of everyone here, the only person who seemed relaxed was the bodyguard of the future Archduchess. However, I would also probably be relaxing if I knew I was double the level of the next strongest person beside me. There might be some merit to taking this proxy fight, the future Baron Stillwater suggested. I trust Commander Grievous to take on any of their commanders. I am inclined to agree with you here, the noble girl said after taking a moment to think about it. After watching the last engagements I don't think any of their guard commanders is his equal in terms of strength. Don't, her friend said. I had spent quite a lot of time listening in on their strategy sessions, and this is one of the few times that the quiet granddaughter of the Duke spoke. She usually just listened and nodded along with the party she agreed with. Her choosing to go against what seemed to be an agreed-upon decision of the other three nobles was a first. Why? the other baron asked. We stand too much to lose, she answered, but upon noticing the confused looks on all three of their faces, she chose to continue. Our side was caught out of position this time when they took the hill, before we got here. Did you question why? At this even her friend frowned at her. We got the scouting information in time to get here and contest the high ground, but they were already set up. We've been working our foot soldiers too hard, they are tired and resentful, especially after the last two weeks. It's why we were so slow to get moving after getting the report. If we take the champion duel here and lose, they could choose to chase and engage us after a full retreat demanded by the loss. Not only that, but the damage to the army's morale would be substantial. That just means that we have to win, Stillwater pressed forward. I can't see Commander Grievous losing to any of the other commanders, the Archduke's daughter agreed. I don't either, her friend agreed. Yet one of their nobles is a viscount, taking a chance that one of his bodyguards can't win is too risky. Especially after we set the precedent of having strong bodyguards enter the fray to turn the side of battle, even if his interventions were banned thereafter. She gave a quick glance to the writer not taking part in the meeting and placing himself between his charge and the enemy army. What should we do then, take the battle? I think we should give up the position, she said. 
What? The accusation in the voice of the future baron was clear, and even I was confused by the proposition. We have been running our army ragged chasing them to fight for the last two weeks, give up the hill in exchange for a three-day ceasefire, so our men can rest. Would they even agree to something like this? One of the commanders finally asked. I think they would. For a reason I can't understand, they seem to be reluctant to have our armies clash here, she said after taking an extended glance at the other side. This was something surprising. Taking a look over I could see that she was right. It wasn't so much the nobles that were showing their anxiety, well besides their leading future baron. It was the four commanders. That's when it clicked. We were quite far in the direction Ajax said he went hunting on his own in. This meant that whatever source of mana water the other side wanted to keep secret had to be nearby and a large engagement might lead to scouts discovering it. This was why they wouldn't want to fight here. My outlook on the shy quiet girl changed. This level of observation and perception explained why she had been so close to picking up on Ajax's mana. In fact I was almost worried that she had asked the bodyguard to investigate him after that incident and we just hadn't noticed. 